Hey, Tiff, Ulrich, thanks a lot for joining, Tom. Good to see you. Um, give me just a couple minutes if you guys do a little uh, chit chat and we'll get direct. And uh, we're waiting for Astral and we are waiting for uh, Cortex Zero. Hey, guys, uh, thanks for having me up here tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation. And I really like that you added to the format having, uh, having skeptical believers. Uh, on the panel because I feel like that gives people more uh, information, like more perspectives on uh, to come to their own, like use their own discernment. Uh, it's best to have both sides uh, in a, in, in a non-toxic manner. So that's pretty cool. Um, Good point. Yeah. Uh, tip for when we, when we get to speakers, do you want to be the one who calls on them and I'll just keep track of stuff and you just throw me in when you, when you want me to throw in. We're actually going to, I think we're going to move um, some of the speakers down once we get things rolling and then we'll okay. just keep it to the panel uh, and uh, afterwards we'll open it up a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's perfect. But I have no, uh, just let me know if you uh, need to go silent at all and I'll do my best to. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. I'm super pumped for, for tonight. I see we have Tom up here direct. Hello, Randy. Thanks for popping up. All right. So we have direct. We have Tom. Um, we'll just wait for, I mean, we don't have to wait too long. Oh, there's Astral. Astral's here. Let's like, let's at least wait for Astral to get up here so we at least have our uh, skeptic voice joining the space. Um, if everyone could please uh, retweet the space. I did change my picture just a couple hours ago, and we know it can be challenging and a little confusing. Um, when that first happens for people. All right, we have Astral here. So we have Astral, Tom, and Direct. That's, I think that's good to start with the two co-hosts. I think we have uh, Cortex Zero, Tom Thompson coming up. Um, I think that was it. So thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks for uh, popping in. Again, please retweet the space. Um, I'd like, I think the information we're gonna talk about today is really important and I would really love um, for everybody to be able to join in and just keep an open mind and maybe hear some stuff that is a little out there, might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but if you just file it away for the future and, you know, a year or five years from now, you might say, oh my gosh, I heard those crazy, crazy people talking in that UFO Twitter space, but it turns out that the information um, might actually be valuable. So um, the recording will be available for anyone who can't join in, um, but please retweet the space and so we can get as many people in here as possible. We'll also get um, some questions going uh, shortly after the panel discussion. Um, so Astral, thanks for joining today. Astral, for anybody who doesn't know, which I can't imagine there's people who don't know Astral, in the community, but Astral's basically our a UFO Twitter dad. He keeps the community grounded, brings us together every week for spaces. He organizes UFO Twitter week. So I really appreciate you joining today, Astral. Um, you know, just just to have, I know, I, Astral, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but I think you're just a little skeptical on whether there's a negative side to the phenomenon. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm very open to it. I look a lot at the research to it. Um, but I'm, I, even though my name is Astro, I feel like I'm a lot more skeptical. I like the science of it. Um, but I'm also like an experiencer. I consider myself an experiencer. So I'm, I'm very open to it, but I'm also skeptical. And, and I think that to me, it's a, like a challenge, like the skeptical side of it and the science side, like that's the challenge that I think it needs to be addressed. Um, so, you know, I, a lot of my perspectives come from that side of it. But thanks for having me on. This is going to be an awesome discussion. I'm just going to listen a lot of the time. My power just went out, so my connection might be spotty. Oh, man. Yeah, weather. I think weather's hitting the whole country right now. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Astro's not a debunker. He's just a skeptic, and he wants to see data, and he likes to, you know, have data and tests and stuff like that, which is totally understandable. Um, so I appreciate you, Astro. Thank you so much. Um so today we're just going to talk about uh, discernment between positive and negative aliens and discerning alien disinformation. Um, these topics are very much related and there's a lot of overlap. Our guest speaker today is Tom. Uh, Tom has a website. It is www.montauk.net. Anyone who's not familiar with Tom's work, uh, very briefly, 
He's an experiencer, a researcher, and an author. I've posted his website and just a very short bio uh, down in the chat for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, Tom, you're in Florida right now. How's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good. The uh, weather's, I'm sure, warmer than it is in most of the places you guys are at. But uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. All right, awesome. So it's holding up. No tornadoes so far for you? No, luckily not. And no hurricanes either for the past 10 years. So we got really lucky. Oh, awesome. Well, I, Tom, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. I've been bugging you for a bit to do a space. I know you haven't done any. Um, I think you, you know, you do a lot of podcasts, but this will be the first uh, Twitter space you're speaking in. And I hope it turns out, I hope it turns into a really good experience and that you'll be joining us in the future. So thank you so much for being here. Um, just a little housekeeping today. We're going to keep it to a panel discussion um, just for the first bit while we speak on the topics. And then after that, we're going to open it up to uh, speakers and questions. Feel free to post any questions down in the chat. Um, I already do have a page of questions, but post down in the chat if you have a question, um, and we'll try to get to it um, before the end of the space. Um, obviously, we're not going to have any UFO Twitter drama, and then we're just going to try to today just to avoid politics and COVID, if you all don't mind. And the reason being for that is I'm already asking people to keep an open mind and to entertain some information that might be kind of out there, maybe even uncomfortable. And I think the information is just way too important um, for anyone to get triggered by those kind of divisive topics. So people uh, hear those kind of topics, they just automatically shut down, and then there's not a lot of space for entertaining or investigating the topics we're discussing today. And the bottom line is, is the phenomenon does not care uh, which side of politics we're on or whether we're vaccinated. They, they just, it just doesn't care. <laughs> as long as we pick a side and fight really hard um, and keep ourselves distracted from what's actually happening right under our noses, that's actually um, part of the agenda. So just if we can, you know, it's not uh, forbidden. It's just if we can try to avoid that kind of stuff. Uh, for the panel, please feel free to jump in, ask questions, share your ideas. Uh, we don't need any hands unless it gets crazy um, or unless we have a lot of um, overlap and unintentional interruption. So, Tom, um, I was thinking, well, wait, actually, let me get my fangirl stuff over. Do you mind if I give you two uh, sentences of fangirl before we start? Uh, sure, go for it. We can actually not hear you, Fringe. Is Tom, Tom's not talking anymore, right? Oh, yeah, because I, I failed to unmute my mic. And my and Tom, just for housekeeping purposes, um, when you're not speaking, um, mute your mic, which is that lower left-hand corner. Got so it. It, it can get kind of confusing. Yeah, there you go. If you're not speaking, try to mute. I mean, sometimes we accidentally leave open, and that's okay. But if you're not talking, try to mute. So about October of last year, I had hit a dark night of the soul, I realized the aliens were not our space brothers. A lot of people might not realize this, but um, I used to think the aliens were our space brothers. I did not start out in the camp I now find myself in. Um, I had become completely disillusioned with religion. I was neck deep in uh, probably actually drowning in prison planet stuff, and I just was not in a good space at all. Um, I came across Tom's website, and it just literally saved my sanity. So... I didn't initially, I didn't go too deep down the rabbit hole, but when I first saw it, I just thought, oh my gosh, there's somebody who's thinking exactly like I'm thinking. Um, everything was just laid out almost as if I had written it, but in a much, much more comprehensive and much more in-depth than anything I could ever put together. So Tom is basically my spirit animal, only smarter and much more articulate. So, um, you know, people could call that just... Uh, confirmation bias. Um, and that's okay. I call it confirmation because it just felt like kind of coming home and it was just an anchor in the storm. So I really appreciate you, Tom. Thank you again for being here. So when we get into this topic, I was thinking, um, if it works for you, maybe we could start out just going on a basic overview of what are these so-called aliens and maybe the different types of beings and a hierarchy just to get started before we get into the traits yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we should definitely get into that to kind of set the groundwork for what we'll be talking about. Now, first of all, let me preface this by, well, first of all, let me say thank you to that person who commented on finding my site. I'm really glad that it helped him. And, you know, I, I kind of come from that perspective, too, because 
back when I was researching the uh, back when I started to research ufology in the early 90s. Uh, I was 13. That's when I started reading all the UFO books that I could at the local library. Well, I wasn't, you know, like a lot of us, I didn't have a lot of context for it in terms of research, you know, because I mean, we all have to start from somewhere. So for there were a number of years where I fell for the the, the pro alien pro gray agenda like hook line and sinker you know just based on some of the mainstream books that I had read and so by the time I got into ninth grade like you know I was wearing six seven eight different alien t shirts I was I was a huge fan of the grays I was thinking that they were here to enlighten humanity but you know something didn't sit right with me and it wasn't until I started researching some of the more um, not, not to say that I'm a huge fan of Zechariah Sitchin, but just in terms of food for thought, it started getting me thinking, well, what if what if aliens have been here all along? And what if they've been here even longer than humanity itself? And what if they had a hand in either genetically modifying us or you know creating these bodies? Then what if what was happening back then with the Neanderthals and the, the archaic Homo, uh, Homo sapien you know, predecessor species, what if what if that's happening nowadays with the gray alien hybrid breeding program? And what if we are to be replaced? So that start that I remember that exact day when that thought started going through my mind and just the sense of doom, like, you know, it all kind of started coming together. And so I I was, I was researching everything that I could related to that in the years that followed and my mindset shifted. So I was no longer the, this, uh, naive pro gray alien noob, like it was starting out. Uh, and it wasn't until right around 1997, when I was 17, that I, I started to connect it more with uh, the political, uh, historical, sociological side of things. The kind of things that William Bramley, in his book, The Gods of Eden, uh, wrote about quite extensively. And I didn't read that book until many years afterwards. So actually, a lot of the things, a lot of the sources that I cite, they're sources that I found after the fact. So, so typically, I go on my experiences, things that other experiencers have told me, and then I... I generally just try to shoot holes in it and try to figure out, are there other sources that correlate with it? Uh, Are there sources that contradict it? Uh, And that then leads to a bigger picture. Because to be honest, uh, I'm I'm pretty much a skeptic myself. You know, I went to college four years doing physics and electrical electrical engineering. So I'm familiar with the scientific method and what's involved in that. But I also recognize that in order to deal with this, this mystery, this weird phenomenon, this, uh, this non-human element, the, the standard scientific process isn't sometimes enough to really dig into it. You know, I mean, a lot of the times you have to think more like a detective than a scientist because a scientist is more interested in the facts and, you know, building models to predict things, whereas a detective is also interested in motives, uh, deception, and uh, just like the, the hidden overlooked clues that to a scientist, those would just be statistical outliers you know those are just noisy data that you discard so you could focus on on the bulk pattern of the data well if you look at the fringes of that if you look at these these little anomalies sometimes they reveal a lot and sometimes those are the chinks in the armor of deception that you have to look at in order to kind of penetrate through to the next level so that's sort of where i'm coming from and um if you wanted to fringe if you wanted to zoom in on uh, more specific parts of the alien phenomenon, uh, just uh, just ask me, and I'll go there. Yeah, no, I think that's a great introduction, and I try to tell people. Um, I know it just sounds maybe a little off, but I think that part of the reason that I was able to figure out um, the whole deceptive side of this alien agenda was because I was a detective and I was in law enforcement for so many years. And I was used to investigating cases and listening to all sides and trying to put the puzzle pieces together and not just taking things at face value. Now, some people could say, well, that just makes you, you know, only looking at the negative side of things. But I think I'm just always looking to put a puzzle together from all different sides and all different angles. So I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I was thinking if we could start out just... um, What do you see as your basic types of beings and then perhaps a hierarchy on the negative and the positive side? Okay, yeah, that's a huge topic, so I'll be be speaking for a while, but (laughs) you guys will have your chance to chime in on us. So my my personal experience with this is uh, I I would include my own personal experiences as maybe 30 to 40% of the base of what I believe in. 
And then another 40% comes from experiences that others have shared with me. And then the remainder is uh, the literature out there, you know, all the books that you guys would have access to as well. But just to point out that, like a lot of experiencers, we have, we have personal proof that is very difficult to share. Because it's not like scientific proof where you can just take a video of it or put it in a bottle and send it off for analysis. We're dealing with intelligent phenomena that you can't put into a controlled setting. You know, it's not always replicable. Now, there are many patterns amongst many different, uh, many different experiencers that match up. But, you know, it forces you to do more of a, a probabilistic um, pattern finding thing versus the, the typical, like, you know, show me just one case that proves to me that aliens are real. Well, it's not just one case. It's hundreds, if not thousands of cases that you analyze and then you get like a, I don't know, like a 90 to 95% confidence that something is going on. So if you don't have the experiences yourself, you might have to be content with only an 80 or 90% probability. And as long as you have that, then you can really work with it. So given that preface, in my experience, I've dealt with demons. I've dealt with what people would colloquially call aliens, whatever they actually are. And I've dealt with, um, to a minor degree, with beings that we might call angels. And also, I've had some uh, military abduction experiences as well, which started up after I attended a, um, it's a, it's sort of a boys' leadership camp in Iowa. It's called Boys State. It's held in Des Moines, I think, at one of the military bases there. And being there, I don't know, I was there for a week, and afterwards, my I noticed weird militaristic mindsets kind of creeping in and other symptoms of my lab abductions, which then added to the previous alien stuff I had already going on. So I noticed that there was a subtle difference between the two. Um, and then I've met others who have also had military abductions and they also told me details of their experiences that matched my own. So I suspected that there were also military things going on and I don't want to get fully into detail on that, but just to say that I've had a sort of a, an experience that spans the gamut of the, the common players, I guess you could say. So to kind of get into it, uh, the first thing I've dealt with in life earliest when I was a kid was dealing with demons. Um, now, it was, was it just a kid imagination? Well, not necessarily. So for example, one of the experiences that I had was I remember being up at night watching television with my mother. We were sitting on the couch watching TV and I could feel something in the back of my head, you know, something behind me really staring at me very intensely. And this didn't happen any other night. This happened only this particular night. So I kept on feeling it, and I kept on turning around to look at the dining room behind me. And the light was on, so I, you know, I didn't see anything. But, but over and over again, I kept feeling it, and it kept getting stronger and stronger. So at one point, my mom, she says, okay, you know, Tom, um, this was in Germany in, in the early 80s. She goes up to the kitchen to get me some candy. And as she was in the kitchen, I felt it again, but the strongest it was ever. I turned around. And there it was. It was what I estimate to be between a seven and eight foot tall shadow being with red orange glowing eyes, just like staring down at me very maliciously. Now, of course, me being a little kid, I freaked out and I dove underneath the covers. And, and my mom heard me screaming from the kitchen. So she comes running in and she has to slap me on the butt to wait to, to snap me out of it because I was hysterical seeing this thing. And then she pulled the covers off and uh, the mom, whatever this thing was, it was gone. And, but I was still crying, and I asked her to you know, take, take me the heck out of there. So she brought me to the bedroom, and I remember looking over her shoulder at the dining room area, and yeah, still there was nothing there. So that was one of the first ones I've had. I've had other more alien-related experiences. Uh, one of the first ones was where I was in a crib. I was about six or seven months old. Uh, I was still in the crib on my back. And I was probably younger than that because you know, I couldn't even crawl yet. But I remember looking up at the spinning thing above me, this mobile above me with a little light on it. And all of a sudden, over the side of the crib, in the, from the darkness, this gray face peers over the edge and just stares down at me. And it was like a gray face, uh, black, black as coal eyes. Not huge eyes. They're like smaller and rounder. And the face, I, I remember it was kind of wrinkly. So it looked, it looked like if you, if you crossed a very old woman with, without hair, like a bald old woman with like a gray alien. That's what it looked like. And every, every time I did that, I would scream at the top of my lungs, Geist! Geist, because, you know, I was a little German kid, so uh, I yelled ghost at the top of my lungs, and that was my first word. Uh, and then my parents would come running in, and by that point, this thing had, had gone. But this would happen over, over many nights. Uh, and I've had other alien abduction experiences as well. But what I learned from all of it is that demons, for the most part, as far as I can tell, they are 
they are non-physical. Okay, they don't have bodies; they don't have tangibility. Now they have telekinetic abilities, so they can throw objects around if they're particularly strong. They can leave uh, uh, telekinetic bruises on your body and welts. And we see that all the time if you go into the field of like demonic possession. Uh, a lot of these researchers, like uh, what, what are their names? Well, you know, Father Malachi Martin, the uh, the Warrens from the Conjuring movies. Well, you know, they're actual historical people, um, and and a few others. Paul Eno, I think his name is. They they talk about demonic possession and, and all the, the the traits that go with it. And what you find across the board is that it, we're dealing with non physical entities that have telekinetic and occult powers. Okay, unlike aliens who also have a, a corporeal or material element to them, even if they can, even if they can dematerialize, you know, they still have that extra component that demons, in my experience, don't. And I'm talking about the everyday garden variety demons that uh, a lot of people encounter, you know, whether they know it or not. Uh, now, the, another thing about demons is that they are all malevolent, just by definition. You know, just like when we talk about serial killers or pedophiles, it's 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 it's, it's a crime. It's ethically wrong, just by definition of that term. So demons are non-physical, they're all malevolent, um, and therefore they have a unified agenda, which tends to be to feed on the soul, to corrupt the soul as much as they can, and ultimately to destroy it. It's, it's almost like a form of spiritual stalking, and, and that's a, you know, the whole demon thing is a whole subject in itself. Uh, there are other nuances, like the fact that demons can be around 24-7 in your home, almost like, like they, they built like a, like a home base, like a nest in your home. Whereas in my experience, when it comes to aliens, they, they, they can be gone for periods of time where they're dealing with other things. And they might only have a, a remote telepathic connection checking in on you periodically. Um, but it's not like they're always in your home constantly, like these occult entities are. So there's some, those are some differences. And if we're talking just about aliens, from all my research and all my experience, well, uh, they are either physical or they're non-physical, or most commonly, they are quasi or paraphysical, which means that they can shift states between being material here and in this 3D space-time that we occupy, or they can shift out of it. Now, when they shift out of it, what, what does that mean? Like, like, do they just disappear into the ethers? Well, not necessarily. They could be shifting into a parallel space-time. So if you, were, if you were to go with them, they would be solid to you and you'd be solid with them, but both of you would be invisible uh, and non, non-physical to the people that you left behind in the other realm. So this whole idea of uh, variable physicality or quasi-physicality, I think, is one of the keys to understanding the alien phenomenon because, if you, because cause otherwise... If we expect that all aliens are necessarily, let's say, extraterrestrial, according to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, then as soon as we get even just one counterexample to that, where, oh, it dematerialized or it walked through a wall, well, then we have to discount that hypothesis. And we could say, we could say that, oh, the extraterrestrial hypothesis isn't viable, so therefore it has to be interdimensional. Therefore, they are non-physical. Therefore, they are ghosts. Well, not necessarily. It doesn't have to be black or white like that. It can also be this in-between state where they can shift between this realm and another realm, or between a, a more material state and a less material state. So that's one thing that they have over demons. This is the thing that we'll be talking about tonight, which is that, in my opinion, I don't believe that all aliens share the same monolithic agenda. I don't believe that they all, that, you know, like, like with Jacques Vallée, for example, his, his main thesis is um, that we're, we're dealing with a, an interdimensional incomprehensible nebulous intelligence that has something up his sleeves and that this intelligence is projecting different forms of absurdity, different, you know, gray aliens, this alien, you know, goofy aliens, whatever to, to not only confuse us, but also, or play games, but uh, to act as a, as a weird subliminal control system that is here to manage the, the collective consciousness of humanity and guide its trajectory into the future. And while that may be the case, I do think that there are actual factions or groups with their own individual agendas that don't necessarily fit what Jacques Vallée is, uh, is, is theorizing. And then I base that on just a number of cases and my own personal experiences and everyone that's reported their own experiences to me. There, there do seem to be competing agendas amongst what we call alien beings, and some are definitely more malevolent, and others are relatively more benevolent. Now, I'm not talking about in terms of absolute ethical system or frameworks here. I'm just talking about what is relative to our well-being and our future. You know, you have some groups that seem to be more totalitarian, that want to alter us genetically, that want to um, 
that want to massage world history and world powers, you know, different political powers and current events towards a future that serves their interests. And meanwhile, you have other groups that seem to be opposed to it. And actually, they come right out and say it. They come right out and, and, and talk about some of these negative alien groups and what they're up to and give advice and warning on how to deal with it, right? So I don't think it's all monolithic. I don't think that um, it's necessarily all aliens playing good cop and bad cop because there are there, there's, a, there's a small fragment of it, like a, a core of what seems to me to be genuine benevolence that is helping people expose a lot of it. And that doesn't make sense if, you know, like, like why would a good cop and a bad cop scenario involve good cops that talk about the good cop, bad cop scenario and the Trojan horse scenario and give, give advice on discernment, you know, and give advice on what groups are good or bad or whatever. And, and even to be cautious of them, you know, because some of them could be bad as well, like, you know, other beings that look like them but aren't necessarily benevolent. So I do think there's a, there's a core of benevolence here, but it's very difficult to pick out from a lot of the imposters that are out there, especially in the new age channeling field, especially also in the abduction and contactee field where these beings, just because they are perceived as positive, doesn't mean that they necessarily are. So that's just an introduction to demons and aliens. And as far as like angels go, you know, they're, they're like the, the opposite counterpart to demons. Like they're not physical. So they're, they're completely non-physical, but they can project physical form if they want to. And they can do it in a hundred percent perfect way without limitation. So whereas, for example, in the whole theory of variable physicality of aliens, when they project a physical form, it generally, it, it resembles what they are in this other state. So, you're not going to have, as far as I can tell, you're not going to have, let's say, a Nordic type being project here into 3D as a gray alien. Uh, you're not going to have a reptilian manifesting as a gray or as a as a, as a mantid or something like that. They they generally stick to their archetypal form, um, unless unless it's something more obvious, like you know you're facing a reptilian face to face and they're telepathically jacking into your mind and therefore projecting the illusion of a person. I mean, that, that happens too. There's just some cases of that. But point being, they're not as adept at creating physical forms for themselves as angels are because angels are operating almost outside of space-time and they're, they're charged with, uh, not to get religious, but they're charged with a kind of divine authority that gives them a deeper level of uh, permissions access to this operating system that we call reality. Okay, so they're they're able to project things way more, um, almost like a like an administrative level access, you know. So they can they can do that just just better than aliens can because aliens seem to be still within this this reality, whatever this is. You know, you can call it a simulation, you can call it like a matrix or a collective dream or whatever you want. Um, the whole alien component seems to be occupying the spectrum between where humans are. And where angels are, or where humans are, and where demons are. So, so in that little space between those two things, that's where some of these quasi-physical, quasi-humanoid uh, beings seem to reside. So that's that's something that I remember uh, Fringe talked about recently on her on her timeline as well. And uh, I think even the Vatican, to some degree, has has given that viewpoint that aliens occupy the space between humans and the ultimate spiritual powers and the ultimate uh, demonic powers. Um, yeah, so that's okay, sort of like a um, basic overview. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real quick. Awesome. That's a great overview. Um, Astro has his hand up. So real quick, you would say then uh, that we have aliens and that we have something uh, in between in the demonic type realm, and I'm only on the negative side at this point. And then what's what's um, after demons on the negative side? What would you call that? Well, I would call that the ultimate ultra-terrestrial negative powers. So this brings up another subject, which is something that you've talked about, uh, Gang has talked about, I've talked about it, uh, which is the idea that if you go up the hierarchy of the the alien command chain, and this is based just on um, this is based just on abductee and contactee testimony. Okay, if you go up that chain to the very top of that totem pole, you start getting to increasingly less physical powers. All right, so we, we've got, for example, Greys, who I mean they're the frontline task workers who get sent here. To, uh, to abduct people. So, so they're the most physical in a sense, like the most uh, material, probably because they're made from biological materials from our realm, you know, whether it's cattle mutilations or, or human fluids or whatever. They seem to be made of materials that are harvested here from 3D. Okay? But if you go up the chain, uh, eventually you get 
to what seem to be the mantid type beings, like mantis beings. And typically they are observed to be in a supervisory role. Uh, and and they, they're also the ones that are the most t- uh, telepathic, the most telekinetic, and just the overall most powerful, and also the least physical, or at least the, the, the least um, adept at phys- physical existence. So you don't see them as much in uh, 3D physical material state, like in your home or something, as you would, let's say, the greys. All right. But, so if you keep on going beyond that, I think you would get into the realm of demonic ultra-terrestrial powers who also head up the demonic chain as well, the demonic hierarchy. Because the thing about demons is the more powerful they become, the more uh, telekinetic they become, like the more they can interact with physicality and drain people's energy and just you know cause a lot of havoc. So it stands to reason that the, the upper-level demons who have the most amount of power, they also would have the most amount of uh, grip or power or um, influence over physicality itself, which makes them no longer just purely non-physical beings, but beings who are equivalent in a way to what the what the lower level aliens aliens are in terms of their variable physicality right so that's where the line between the demonic and the alien begins to blur because the 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 alien ones they become less physical and the demonic ones they become more physical and the two just kind of like merge us together into the top of this pyramid so i think that's what the gnostics would call the archons for example but that's all just semantics you know you can call them whatever you want all right awesome uh let's get to astral uh astral go ahead yeah, no, that was interesting. And it, I, I don't know, it's just tough for me to like hear that hierarchy and like how that is figured out, you know, like how the information trickles down to us. It's almost like, you know, like how would we know that hierarchy taking place? But I, I actually had a question for you, Tom, and what you were talking about, because I think a lot of the perspective on the intention is from the non human intelligence perspective. But I was wondering, like, for the experiencers themselves, the people that are going through this and that are regularly having these experiences, is there any rhyme or reason why these entities are picking these specific people? Is it because they see in the future, like, after the experience, they're going to do something or, like, play something out for them? Or are they just, like, fucking with us? Or, like, why why are specific people having these experiences? Yeah, thanks. That's a really great question. So from what I've seen with all the people that have contacted me over the years, uh, so on my website, you know, people email me. I've, I've been in chat rooms before. I've, you know, done personal interactions with people a lot of times as well, meeting, meeting them in person. Um, so I've dealt with probably, I would say, over a thousand experiencers by this point over the past 20 years. And I've, I've dealt with like 30 to 40,000 emails. So just I have like a lot of data under my belt and I wish I could share all of it. But, you know, some of it's just, you, you know, they don't allow you to share it because it's private, you know, so I can't go there. But regarding what you're asking about, who is it that they pick? So from what I can tell, they pick people that are either threats, that are recruitable, or that are good food, like 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 fun fun toys for them to play with. And this all depends on which intelligence we're talking about. You know, are we talking about demons? Are we talking about aliens of the neutral variety? maybe the more hostile variety or the more benevolent variety. And each one of them has their system of profiles that they go for. So for example, let's, let's pick one of those. Let's pick, um, let's pick covertly hostile aliens and what people they would pick in order to serve their particular agenda. So those kinds would typically pick people who are driven by ego, who have, um, who have a subconscious vulnerability to to being easily manipulable. So someone, someone who uh, would be a good opinion leader, who's, who might one day be influential, whether an author, a speaker, some sort of a leader role. And they pick these people and they groom them from an early age. Like I'm talking toddler, you know, three, four, five years old. They pick them from that age because they can already see the potential based on a genetic profile. I'm just, okay, this part here I'm guessing. But they're doing it based on genetic profile, epigenetic profile, uh, just personality traits that are already visible by that point. Uh, like, for example, when we talk about the Myers-Briggs 16 different personality types, well, they found out that these personality types, for the most part, all are already set in place by the time you're five, six, seven, you know, eight years old. So there's things that are already there that can gauge your future potential. And then these beings are precognitive on top of it. Or possibly time travelers. You know, I'm not totally 100% on board with that, but it's possible. So if they are, then they can already tell like what what the what the butterflies are that can generate hurricanes in the future, and then they would focus in on those people. 
So there's certain people that are more more um, amenable or suitable for becoming disinformation mouthpieces, you know. Like and like I said, those are people that are gullible. They're driven by ego, and they're easily they they have hooks in their subconscious that are easy to tug on. Um, but on top of that, they also have to be smart and capable and eventually influential. So if you look at that profile, I'm sure some of you are thinking of people on the scene who might fit that, who are quite well known in the scene. I don't want to name any names, but there you go. You know, that's one example. But if we're talking about the more benevolent alien types, what can we extrapolate from people that fit that? And this is sort of, I admit, this is actually, it's, it's a difficult thing to pin down because if there are like truly benevolent alien beings, well, first of all, they're not in it to seek attention. They're not in it to be worshipped. So therefore, they prefer uh, being more low-key. Okay, so they're not going to be as out there as the fake ones like the Ashtar Command or you know, some of these other typical, typical figures that we see out there on the New Age scene. So they're not going to be in your face pretending to be good guys. They're going to be in the background, kind of subtle. So you have to really look carefully at the patterns and extrapolate from it. So what kind of people do they go for? Well, even just logically speaking, they go for people who they have to be intelligent. Uh, they have to have integrity. They can't be just total cocky, egotistical uh, maniacs. And they have to be capable of critical thinking and discernment because that seems to be the, the goal that these positive beings want to impart upon humanity. They want to offer a, ca a counter viewpoint. They want to offer knowledge that can increase discernment, increase self-determination, and therefore preserve the, um, the ultimate, ultimately preserve the self-determination of humanity itself. Okay. So just based on those agendas, you know, comparing one that wants to take over humanity into this assimilated, uh, this genetically assimilated totalitarian empire versus the other ones who want to keep that from happening. Well, just based on that alone, you can kind of guess what profiles uh, would, would match that. And in, indeed, you know, that's what I found with all the people that have contacted me and people that I know who I think have had a more positive alien element in their lives. I can tell that those are people that they don't, they don't have the, the, the ego, the gullibility, the lack of integrity and the, um, just, just the, the slick slimy quality that I've seen in some of these more high end alien disinformation personalities out there. So, yeah. Does that help astral or did you have any follow-ups to that? You're good. Okay. And, uh, we're kind of now getting into the differences, I suppose, on, on the being. So if you want to go, Tom, I don't know how it's best for you to do this, but if we could just talk about some traits that are unique to, uh, negative beings. Yeah, sure thing. So it's, it's important to understand that not only do positive aliens have their unique traits, if they exist, and I, I believe they do, but just putting that out there. So it, it's not only about their unique traits, and it's not only about the unique traits of negative aliens, but you see there's also shared traits between them. And that's where I think that's where discernment is truly tested, because it's not necessarily the case that if a particular being has a certain trait that it guarantees that it's negative or guarantees that it's hostile to humanity. There are certain traits that are either positive or negative, depending on the context and depending on the, the, the surrounding clues of it. So let me give you some examples. All right. One example is the, the, the trait that one of these beings will respect or observe or in some way um, honor your free will. Now, on the surface, we would think, hey, that's the law of non-interference. That's a positive being, right? Not necessarily because if you research occultism, demonic possession, one of the key traits of it is the idea that the beings tend to need permission to really get into your soul, to really like get full control over your consciousness. And they ask for it, you know, directly or indirectly. Indirectly, it's through the typical thing like temptation. You know, they, they dangle some temptation before you in your mind, through your thoughts, through your emotions. Uh, it's artificially inseminated through uh, telepathy. And if you go for it, and you do it, you're making a choice. See, you're giving into it, and that's a that's a tiny bit of permission. And if they do it over and over and over and over again, well, after you know 20, 30, 40, 50 choices like that, you're gonna essentially be equivalent to having given over your soul to begin with. And this is just according to uh, spiritual traditions and uh, occultism, mysticism, demonology. That's what they say. So I'm just saying, I'm just drawing a comparison between that and the idea that oh, well, if an alien 
asks for your permission, then therefore it has to be good. Well, not necessarily. Not if there's some sort of legal code or uh, metaphysical protection on your side that's keeping them from doing as much as they want to you. So a lot of what they do seems to be revolving around obtaining permission in some way. And typically they do it through deception. They, they tell you that uh, you're one of them, maybe that you're an, one of those alien souls incarnated here as a human, and now you have to agree to these abductions in order to fulfill your destiny. I've heard that line used quite a bit um, in various sources and, and people. I mean, luckily I've never gotten that, but I can imagine it working on a lot of people just because, just because it plays to a sense of ego and it plays to a sense of specialness. Now, theoretically... Let's say that let's say that some people are indeed alien souls here in human bodies, just you know, for whatever reason. Maybe they wanted to help humanity, and so they incarnated here into human bodies. Well, if if they've done that, but they don't remember exactly who they are, and they only have a vague sense of not being from here and not fitting in and not being like all the other people at school and work and so on, then that vagueness can be played upon by the enemy alien fashion who would convince you that you're one of them, that you need to go back for them. And your own, own amnesia then kind of works against you by, by fooling you into, into supporting the enemy. So just theoretically, that could happen if that were the case, right? So, so just because they ask for permission and try to convince you to, to go along with them because you're one of them, well, that doesn't mean it's true, right? And, and just because they are false doesn't mean that, that there's no truth at all to the idea that alien souls can incarnate as human souls. All right, so let me just put that out there. So that's one example. Another example, as we all know, um, is the idea of healing. So let's say you're an abductee or a contactee. You've got a disease, a broken bone, a blood clot, whatever. You go up there, get abducted, and you come back healed. Does that mean that they are positive? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It can mean either that, yes, you know, you're, you're valuable to them in some way or some form. Maybe they value you because you're like, one of you're you're an asset to them to their agenda, and if the agenda is positive, then sure they're going to look out for you. But if the agenda is negative, they're also going to look out for you, because it's just like a, a farmer looking out for his cattle, right? The farmer doesn't want the cattle to be sick and dying because where's the milk going to come from? You know, like he paid a lot of good money for this cow, he, he invested a lot of money into it, so of course he's going to take care of it. So healing in itself, likewise, isn't necessarily uh, a, a guarantor of uh, of positive intention. Now, if we're talking about spiritual healing, like like someone is um, just you know spiritually broken, and a being kind of helps them become more clear, kind of get back together, be on their feet again, be more self, have more free will, more self determination, be able to think more clearly, then of course that's positive, right? But if we're just talking about healing broken bone or healing cancer, I mean, if if a, if a doctor can do that, then these beings can do it, no matter their orientation. So that's that's another. Other ones include things like improving your financial situation. I know, what was her name? Uh, uh, Lizette Larkins. She had a book calling on extraterrestrials, like 10 Steps to Inviting Your Own Alien Encounters. <laughs> if, you, if you want some good example of questionable advice, right? I think that book would qualify. But it talks about in there how um, when she gave herself over to the greys, her financial situation improved quite a bit. And people could say, well, see, that proves that they're positive because they make your life better. Well, no, of course not. Not if they need you. Not if they would need you to testify for them. Um, of course, they're going to help you in material ways. Like, I've had, well, that, that's a whole subject in itself. But just real quick, my, my stepfather, okay, he, he was kind of sociopathic. He wasn't a nice guy. And whatever he gave to you materially in terms of food and a roof over your head, he would take emotionally and psychologically. And that kind of reminds me of some of these negative alien powers and that they can give you material things, but they take from you your spiritual integrity and the, the strength of your soul. All right. So just keep that in mind. And just a couple more things like um, giving you psychic abilities. Now, that's a, that's an interesting one because the average person confuses psychic powers with spirituality. See, if a person is psychic then it seems to these people that the person, therefore, is also spiritual because they're, they're more than just the material, right? They're plugged into the higher realms. They're, they're plugged into spirit, you know, just the idea that um, that's where they're getting their psychic information from. But that sort of viewpoint, it's lacking nuance. It's lacking the kind of nuance that only extensive experiencers have and also people who have studied the occult or parapsychology have. 
And what the nuance is, is that when, when we talk about realms or abilities that go beyond the physical, that's a whole world. You know, it's not just one thing. There's like different levels to it. There's like the etheric aspect of it, which is the, the closest part of the non-physical realm that is here to the physical. And so when people have psychic powers, a lot of times they're merely tapping into this lower non-physical energy, but it does not mean that their soul or their spirit is connected to the higher realms, you know, in, in terms of like divinity, integrity, uh, higher awareness, things like that. You don't have to have that in order to be psychic. Being psychic in its true and rawest form is a little different from bodybuilding, right? So if you can do 20 pull-ups with a huge weight hanging from you, that doesn't mean you're more spiritual. Well, same thing if you can, you know, if you're precognitive, if you can read someone's mind, it doesn't mean you're more spiritual. So I kind of beat that one on the head because it's, it's an important point that being psychic does not mean necessarily that you're spiritual. Now, there's lots of spiritual people who are psychic, but, you know, you don't want to conflate it 100%. And just one last one, which I just mentioned, is uh, predicting the future, right? So as long as you're psychic, you're going to have some inkling of what's coming up, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a faculty of the psychic ability to tap into data and information that is from beyond the current 3D space-time point that you're in. And that's just a matter of physics and etheric dynamics. It's just the way it works. You can pick up on things that are happening. You can, you can pick up on the future patterns, the future feedback flows that are flowing from the future back here into the present. Or alternatively, you're just picking up on the seeds of the future that are here in the present right now as you could call them quantum wave functions or latent potentialities. You're picking up on that. Um, and that does not mean, of course, that you are a spiritual person with integrity. It just means that you have an extra sense of perception that, uh, you know, that's no different from seeing or hearing or feeling or tasting. So these are examples of things that, that overlap between positive forces and negative forces, and they cannot be relied on to, to indicate which one it is. So then the question, of course, is, well, then what traits are unique to positive forces? What traits are unique to negative ones? And that's uh, you know that's a that's a pretty important point. Uh, uh, Fringe, let me did interrupt you, did... you again, real sure. quick, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to Astro's question. Go ahead, Astro. No, I, I I mean I'd love to get into the negative versus positive too. I wondered, um, Tom. I just wanted to ask you because a lot of what you were talking made me think about the you know the kind of popular statement that aliens live amongst us and i wonder like what's the extent of their reach in terms of you know taking over human bodies and like our society and like influencing us like how do you see like their influence like how far or how deep does it go i uh, shit i just wonder about that Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's an important question because I wonder that too, and I've done a lot of research on this to try to figure it out. Because I mean, th if you think about it, that is, if not one of the most important questions in ufology, because it's the one that that hits closest to home, right? It hits closest to home because it's easy it's easy to be a ufologist who only cares about oh, uh, I study the the you know the early sightings from the fifties. I only care about nuts and bolts stuff, uh, lights in the sky, everything's at an arm's length, and that's nice and comfy looking at it at arm's length. But once you start talking about alien influence in our society right now and how deep it goes, the more you research that, the more you realize that it's not only just in the skies, it's on the ground, it's in the government, it's in our homes, it's in our heads. Not everyone, you know, unilaterally across the board, but I'm saying they have the capability of breaching our own personal sacred boundaries. They have the ability to tinker with people covertly uh, not not 100 percent invisibly because you, you can still detect it, but it's not obvious, right? So, it's, I mean, in, in a way, you could almost say that the over the over focus on NHIs in the skies yeah, that kind of rhymed, but in the distance, it kind of distracts from and covers up the 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 more ubiquitous extent of alien control over society, which is more subtle, it's more pervasive, and it's more insidious. All right, so. Getting to your question, what is the extent that they have? Well, um, just so, so what I'll do is I'll start at the, at the personal level and then kind of expand out from there. So per, at the personal level, here's what I know based on my experience and what everyone else has told me that they can do. All right. So they have the ability to either project their consciousness like a remote viewer would 
or to um, employ what's called phasing technology or cloaking technology to be in your home invisibly. All right? They can use those two to have a presence around you that allows them to not only monitor and see what you're doing, but also, because they're telepathic, to monitor your thoughts, your feelings, and to tweak them, to insert their own telepathic influence into it. Now, let me just say, first of all, that <laughs> where do you draw the line between that and schizophrenic crazy talk, right? Well, luckily, luckily for me, I've heard from a lot of schizophrenics. And I've also heard from a lot of people who have entity issues in their homes, whether it's demons, whether it's aliens, or you know, other, other weird things that they have. And so I can tell the, the nuances between them. And so I can tell that, yes, if we're talking just about alien-type beings that uh, for abductees and contactees, these beings are telepathic, they can be invisible, or they can monitor remotely, and they can influence thoughts and emotions. And that includes also when you're asleep, you know? So when you're sleeping... They can jack into your consciousness. They can manipulate your dreams. And they can... It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to prove this part, but I've, I've seen multiple cases where this may be going on. But they can access a part of your consciousness that you're not normally aware of. I'm talking about your subconscious, or some would call it the higher mind, something like that. They can access that while you're sleeping and program it or, or telepathically communicate with it and so they're manipulating a part of your consciousness energy field that you wouldn't normally be aware of during the day. However, just like with hypnosis, you know, when, when uh, a person at a hypnosis show gets hypnotized and says, you know, next time I clap my hands, you're going to stand up and you're going to cluck like a chicken. Well, they clap their hands and the person stands up. All of a sudden, it has no idea what they're doing and they're starting to cluck like a chicken. Well, these post-hypnotic commands can also be installed while you're sleeping in order to be triggered later either at a certain time or in uh, response to a certain uh, trigger event, for example. And this can be used to manipulate people. So, for example, if you look at Eve Lorgan's work, The Love Bite, The Dark Side of Cupid, in her Love Bite book, she details numerous cases where abductees claim, you know, based on consciously remembered experiences and also some hypnotically regressed experiences and memories, that aliens are capable of shutting someone off emotionally and mentally to their partners, right? So these, these, there's this man and this woman, they're, they're a couple, they go to bed one night, an abduction happens, and the next day, one, one of the two is completely 100% switched off to the other partner, and you know they just break up right then and there with no discernible uh, excuse or reason why that should be, other than a, a look of confusion and a very strong impulse and revulsion at this person, you know, and of course they, they break up, and that leaves the other person in, in you know, total pain, wondering what happened. Well, this sort of thing seems to be going on. Uh, I don't know how common it is, because Eve Lorgan, you know, she's only looked into a couple dozen cases that fit this, and I'm sure many, many more over the years that have come to her for consultations and such. But the point being that these beings seem to be able to manipulate our beliefs if we're not careful. But if we're careful then we can detect some of the signs and maybe I can get into that later. But so that's some of the personal sphere of it, you know, just the fact that they can hang around and manipulate your thoughts and emotions. But if we start thinking about like, well, then what is the bigger implication of that? Well, the bigger implication is if we're talking about politicians, you know, scientists, authors, and what books they choose to write or not write. Well, that kind of leaves the, the question open about what is the extent of the subtle influence on humanity? Yeah. So, Ulrich, I think you had a question. Yeah, Tom, all of this is, is fascinating. Um, ab about that, last two years, I recently went through something where for the first time in my life, I was feeling emotions that were fairly physical that, um, of course, felt physically like, like mine, but didn't even make sense to me. They were sort of divorced from my own own thinking. Um, and and even with, with another person, right, that, that they... You, it, it, and this thing is very blurry, right? There's personality disorders. It's not unusual that people will behave very differently from their personality. And I didn't have any personality changes. But how would you distinguish between something that might be more intrinsic or something that is is coming from, from the phenomenon? Yeah, great question. The way you distinguish it is by eliminating possibilities. So, for example, if that were to happen to me, 
I, I would be looking at dietary deficiencies. I would be looking at, is there something in my life that is, is on my mind that's bothering me? Let's say a financial issue or a relationship issue, you know, something like that. Something that is on my mind, it's weighing on me, but I've sort of pushed it out of the way, but it's still there subconsciously, right? So once you run through this list of different possibilities and you start eliminating them because, well, that can't be it because, you know, I'm taking all my vitamins and everything's good or, or everything's good, like relationship-wise, finances are good. Once you go through that list, just like with Sherlock Holmes, when you eliminate everything that can be the truth, then what remains must be the truth. And some of the times you find that there is no physical explanation, no psychological, social explanation that accounts for it. It's, 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 it's weird. Like, for example, if something comes upon you all of a sudden, just very quickly, and it's very intense, uh, and it has a, a strategic point to it, like for um, so, I used to run a forum between 2004 and 2008. And I was a sole administrator, right? And it was an open forum; like anyone could enroll. Uh, it was an experiment. I wanted to see could you have a fully free and just forum system with as, as minimal intrusion as possible. Well, you can guess what happened, which is that a lot of trolls would show up, and it became a big uh, uh, mental or psychic battling point where. These, these people, the weakest links in the chain, I noticed that they were being co-opted or piloted by something that was non-physical or something that was non-human um, that would pilot them and position them in the exact correct spot at the correct time to cause the most maximum damage. Not only that, but I noticed that in the day or two leading up to it, uh, I myself would get a lot of weird symptoms of uh, like sleep deprivation, nightmares, really amped up energy. Uh, discombobulation of my mental state and it's almost like knocking me off balance just in time for these 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 uh strategically placed trolls to do their thing now funny enough i got good enough at, at predicting when it would happen that i knew exactly what machinations were going on and i could keep myself from playing into it or you know or maybe i could muster even more consciousness and energy to make sure that that this thing wouldn't go off as it was planned. Interestingly enough, when I did that, the people still went through with certain moves that would have only have been possible if I had played my part. It's almost like they were playing out their script even though I had left the stage. You know? And this happened many, many, many times. And the point that I bring this up for is that things can happen if you watch carefully. Like, I'm talking about changes in mood, changes in thoughts, certain thoughts and beliefs and ideas that go into your head that don't have a precedent. It's not, it doesn't follow logically from anything that you've been thinking before. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's important. So yeah. And, and Tom, if I, if I can follow up on that, I love that you quote the Sherlock Holmes quote. I find it, I find it the, the counterpart to Occam's razor and I find it really important. Um, one of the things that's hardest for me is, for, for, for example, what, you took the example of like a romantic relationship, right? Whether it's you losing feelings or feeling something you normally don't feel, you know, during a relationship or after the breakup, why, why, would, why would a regular person or somebody like me, like, why would somebody be targeted like that? Do, do you know what I mean? Like how it, it seems like that kind of targeting would only be for somebody who's like very influential what what kind of thing would make one susceptible to that level of mind or emotional manipulation? So one of the things that we have to keep in mind here, too, is that we're not dealing just with alien entities. We're also dealing with non-physical occult entities, which are by far more common than alien entities. See, because the thing with alien entities is if they are in any way whatsoever physical or even variably physical – they have to deal with the logistics of travel, ships, vehicles, bases, you know, limited personnel. Whereas if we're talking about occult entities, uh, whether it's discarnate humans who didn't pass over to the other side, I'm talking about like earthbound spirits or demons, they're, they're like a dime a dozen. You know, you could probably, I'm sure with for every square block of a city, you could probably find like three, four, five, if not a dozen of these entities just kind of like lurking around. Um, and so they're far more common and they, too, engage in playing games with the incarnated, with the living. Just for sadistic joy, maybe even for energy feeding, if you believe in the whole idea of uh, the louche farm, like energy feeding, like feeding on people's life force and emotional energies. 
Uh, or, you know, it's just sport and sadism or wanting to destroy harmony and peace and tranquility and, and goodness wherever it exists, right? So some of these people that, that report experiencing interference in their lives, it's not always necessarily alien. It can also be occult. It can also be demonic. And these demonic beings, they go after you just because, let's say, you're a good person. You've got a light in you. You know, you're smart. You're capable. Maybe you help other people. And they don't like that. They don't like their having be more goodness or peace or tranquility in the world. And so they do everything in their power to kind of stir things up and uh, make people sick, make people fight, get them suicidal, depressive, uh, basically adding upon the already existing physical and social and financial pressures that people are under. You know, it's not like it's not like all depression is caused by demons or aliens. I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they can amplify it. They can seek it out. They can seek out a person who is vulnerable, you know, someone who maybe has schizophrenic or depressive tendencies in their family, you know, even just genetically, and seek those people out and, and crank away on that. So, yeah, so. Yeah, Tom, th thank you. Thank you so much. And um, you can fit this in later. It doesn't need to be now. But you mentioned you grew up in Germany. I grew up in Germany as well. And whenever you think it's appropriate, if you could sort of just speak briefly on whether that sort of informed or affected how you related to the paranormal, I find Germans to be very good at uh, delineating things, but very bad at recognizing patterns, right? And, and that's just been my perception. But if you can later or weave it into your story of, of dealing, you, you seem to be, you seem to have put a lot of thought into how to think about capturing uh, the paranormal truth and dealing with it in, a, in an analytical way. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll touch on that later. But just, just real quick, uh, my mom, she's from Singapore, so she's Asian. And my dad is German. He's an electrical engineer. So maybe those two things kind of combined to, to, to make me what I am. So I see uh, Astral and Ganga had their hands up too. So I'll, I'll defer to, to them. You can go ahead, Ganga. What's up, man? Hey. Um, hi, Tom. Um, I want to ask you something. When you were talking about that forum that you were running in between 2004 and 2008, did you feel that any of this uh, disruption to your cognition was by some form of remote manipulation or structured activity? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Uh, in fact, one time... All right, so... So one of the phenomena that you can get, as you know, of course, but I'm, I'm saying this for the benefit of others, one of the weird side effects that you can get when you're being monitored or messed with by entities is you can get ear tones, like ear ringings. Not just like permanent tinnitus, but I'm talking about intermittent tinnitus-like ear ringings, okay? I would get those all the time preceding these events. And I would also get other things like a weird clicking in my ear, which I guess is a form of tinnitus if you want to be broad enough. So one time... I was laying down, I was uh, half asleep, I was in a sort of like a semi-astral projected state, and I heard this clicking in my ear, okay? And I decided, well, you know, since I'm sort of semi-out of body, what if I try to use any abilities that I have to kind of remote view it, to focus in on it? So I did that, and I focused in on it, and I projected my consciousness to what the origin of this could be. Now, this could all be you know, just my, my, my imagination, but interestingly enough, I popped in on what appeared to be an underground base. And there was what appeared to be like a psychologist or someone in a chair guiding three psychic people in flotation tanks. Uh, this was like a small room. It was like a military-type base room. But guiding them to, uh, I guess, remote view me or more likely remote influence me. Now, if that's true, then that's one example of a structured thing. But some of the other events that I've had on that forum indicate to me that it was... Well, I think there's a number of different forces going on. I think some of it was alien because especially when the alien topics came up, then the quality, the nuance of it would shift to a different kind of intelligence, a different force, a different methodology. Whereas uh, when I'm dealing with more, uh, I don't know, like, like, uh, like spiritual subjects, then that's when the more typical demonic type activity would pick up in my life. You know, like our cat seeing things and us seeing shadow figures and so on and just a, just a really heavy negative energy around so I think I had a variety of things. Some of it was demonic. Some of it was probably, I'm guessing, breakaway civilization type stuff. And then some of it definitely appeared to be alien. So that's my answer to your question. Astro, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. even before, um, you know, I think about like positive first, negative 
I wonder about like how to even distinguish between what's happening within our mind itself uh, and how to distinguish that from a non-human intelligence that's actually interacting with us. And I wonder like how do you see that taking place? Because even with like things like sleep paralysis and different states that you go through through out-of-body experiences, like how would you be able to, because a lot of the, even near-death experiences talk about a lot of similarities, like how, are, in your opinion, are you able to distinguish from something outside that's affecting us and then a battle that's going on basically within our mind itself? It all comes down to looking at, you have to look at the fine nuances. And I'll give you one example, all right? So, for example, um, well, not relating to this particularly, but just to illustrate the example of nuance, with the idea of getting bodily marks, like bruises and, and, and welts and, and so on, some people say, well, therefore, the entire alien thing is just occult entities. It's just demons or ghosts or whatever doing it. And this whole alien thing is just a, a facade that they're projecting into our minds to make us think as aliens when really it's just this occult phenomenon that's been with humanity for thousands of years. Well, it makes sense on the surface, but if you dig deeper, you find that these bodily markings, they're not just bruises and welts, which can be explained by telekinesis. They're also healed scoop marks or really long cuts and scratches or you know metallic implants that do show up on uh, MRIs and, and, and x-rays like uh, what's his name, Daryl Sims and Roger Lear have, have documented, and man, many others as well. So if you, if you dig deep enough, you start finding the nuances that distinguish between similars. So in your case, you're talking about, okay, well, what's just a, a product of our own mind, you know, our own psychology versus what is an external entity? So it kind of depends on what particular uh, field or, or example or topic you want to talk about. So, for example, like um, sleep paralysis, all right? Sleep paralysis, what is that really? Well, sleep paralysis happens to anyone who falls asleep because it's a safety mechanism to prevent the body from thrashing around when it's dreaming, right? So the body goes into shutdown mode, paralyzes the muscles, and sometimes sometimes you can wake up in a state where that part of your brain that has shut down the control of the muscles hasn't woken up yet. So therefore, you can't move, and because your brain is still in a slightly dreamy state, uh, you can suffer from dreamlike imagery. Uh, they call it hypnopompic imagery. Okay, and it can be voices. It can be, you know, beings that seem to be around, or the classic thing of like a, like a weird imp or a succubus or incubus sitting on your chest, crushing you, and you can't breathe. That's like so common. You know, so many people have reported having that. And if you view it strictly from a biological and psychological viewpoint, then sure, you know, you could dismiss all of it because you can't take a video camera into the astral or the etheric state to prove that there was an entity there. So it's all based on subjective reporting. Okay. But the thing is, if you then also expand your research into fields like occultism, mysticism, esotericism, then you start understanding what sleep paralysis actually is. You understand that it's not just uh, the brain shutting down part of itself to paralyze the muscles. It also involves a dislocation of the astral body or the uh, subtle energy body from the physical, and that also plays into um, that also plays into the paralysis factor. Okay, so there's both a biological and uh, uh, an, an occult or uh, subtle energy component to paralysis. And you also begin to understand that when you start to dislocate yourself from the physical body, you're no longer filtering your consciousness through the, uh, the censoring filters of the biological brain and the five senses, right? So you're starting to be able to tap into extrasensory perception data, which then allows you to perceive, if they're around, actual entities that are in your space. But unfortunately, in that exact same state, you can also have internally projected dream imagery that can get mixed in with that. So then you have to ask yourself, well, with sleep paralysis, was it an entity? Or was it just my imagination? And there are like even more subtle things. Like, for example, if you are in this hypnopompic state and you move your head around or you move your eyes around, the image will follow your field of vision because it's projected internally. Whereas if you're seeing something that is actually external to you uh, in your environment, it's going to stay fixed with the environment as you move your eyes around. So that's um, it's, not it's not like a foolproof method, but I noticed in my experiences and some of the research that I did that, oh, that is one of the patterns. Oh, that's interesting, though. Yeah, I've never heard that. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the question that you had about it 
is exactly the question that I asked myself when I was doing experiments with hypnopompic imagery. Like, is it just my imagination? Is it just dream stuff? And I noticed that, yes, some of it did follow my field of vision. So I would do that field of vision test every single time just to make sure. And some of the, some of the time, yes, it did follow my eyes. So therefore, it was an internal hallucination. But other times, uh, for example, one time I woke up because I felt like there was something in the room. Like, it, it kind of panicked me. I looked up and I looked towards the foot of my bed. And what do you know? Standing there was this like five foot tall blonde girl in like a jumpsuit with like huge googly eyes. I mean, they're bigger than normal human eyes, kind of like just like looking at me. And so I sat up in bed and I said, Hey, what's up? Because I don't know. I don't know why I said that, but I did. And uh, um, right about 10 seconds later, my consciousness, I could feel it kind of like locking back into the physical brain and the physical eyes. And then, you know, she faded out. So, but the thing was, her lighting matched the room perfectly. And she was fixed in space with respect to the bed, even as I was moving my head around and sitting up and so on. So if I didn't know better, I would say that she was actually there. And maybe she was, right? But other times, things moved around from my field of vision, so I automatically discount those. But the other ones, I don't know. I think, I think there could be something to them. Oh, thanks, Tom. So we've got the questions there. I wanted to circle back to one of the motivations, and then we'll get back over to the... Um, the unique traits between the negatives and the positives. So just to go back and cover, you covered uh, motivations between um, the recruitable people, uh, people who could be good food. Um, then you mentioned people who could be threats. And then just for me personally, I've had uh, negative, extremely negative, and then very, very positive experiences. So I get both. I almost feel like a pawn on a chessboard um, between the two. So if you could cover motives on the threats and then people who get both experiences, and then I would like to go back to the, um, unique traits. Cause we, we did cover the shared traits already. So as far as people who are threats go, um, I can only, I can only guess at this based on, based on a number of cases that I know. And I don't know, I mean, sounds egotistical for me to consider myself, but I do have to be impartial and include that in there. Like, why do I get targeting? Is it because I'm useful to them or is it because I'm a threat to some degree or are they just having fun you know, toying with someone? Well, I would like to think uh, that I'm, I'm trying to do my part to put info out there to increase discernment. Okay. So that alone, because I have that motivation, I feel really strongly and passionately about that. Uh, maybe that was picked up. Maybe they could sense that in me already when I was a kid, you know, because I remember when I was a kid, um, I remember how there, I, I had, I had certain, I had a certain, um, almost like a preloaded sense of mission that I don't think was necessarily induced by my alien abductions at the time, because they're more innocent than that. You know, it's not like, Oh, one day you're going to be a, an ambassador to the, to the to planet earth and welcome, these, these visitors to earth. And it's not like that, which is what you normally hear, but, but like simple things. For example, uh, I remember ripping pages out of a mini dictionary and stuffing them in my pocket because I knew that the, these, whatever these, this black stuff was and all the pages, you know, the printed words, I knew deep down that this was so extremely important, that this is so important and that I just had to have it and I need, needed to treasure it and value it. You know, like little kid logic, because we're going off of subconscious impulses that we come here with uh, when we incarnate. And we don't understand it when we're kids, but we, we can still act on them. So we're, we're drawn to certain themes and we're, and when we're kids that are somewhat indicative, perhaps, of what we're here to do in life. Okay, The reason why I bring that up is because if we can already experience that as kids, then I'm very sure that beings who are precognitive and telepathic and can, you know, can probably read your DNA and, and, and know, your, know your personality profile, they can also detect that. And so if they think that one day... Uh, you might be someone who is just a little too observant for their liking or someone who might be given to trying to figure things out, then they might start early on trying to deviate you from that, right? Or, you know, you might not even be an abductee. You might not even be a contactee. You might be someone who just innocently stumbles into the field and you just have to be a smart person who critically thinks, who reads a lot of sources, and you start getting into it and you start thinking, okay, you know what? I'm going to write some books on this. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to spread the word on, um, let's say, the negative alien agenda. You do that, and you'll see what kind of interference you start getting in your life in terms of things trying to you know, block you from, from um, 
putting that out there, depending, depending on how, how strategic it is, right? So anything that you do or anything, any way that you are that in some way can infringe upon certain negative alien agendas would, in theory, get them to be interested in you to clip the wings of that butterfly before it can turn into that hurricane. So I do think that that's happening, and they just look you know, simply at the possibility of interference to their agenda. Uh, I, think, I think that's what it is. I noticed that a lot of people who are very observant, very intelligent and bright, and uh, also open-minded you know, to, to things that are beyond the 3D sphere, they're the ones who tend to get weird experiences. See, I, but I don't know what comes first. I don't know if the paranormal gets attracted to them because they were that way first or if they became more open to it because of the paranormal. You know, maybe it is like a back and forth chicken and egg thing where it's like a big feedback loop where the more they try to interfere with the person, the more the person learns from it and the more they go out and actually try to That's like the hitchhiker others. thing where people, you know, they talk about hitchhiker effect or, you know, even people being interested in it and then people around them are interested in it. Do you think there's something to that is like, you know, the effect around you from exploring this phenomenon? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. And, uh, yeah, I'll just say yes. Yeah, completely. Now, um, Ganga, would you like to say something real quick? Yeah, it's about the hitchhiker effect. In the social circles that you were managing, do you think it's possible to to create a hitchhiker effect between uh, alien, quote-unquote, entities instead of just paranormal entities? Could you, like, clarify, like, a given example of what you mean? For example, if I have contact experiences in uh, Miami and I go online and I talk about my experiences, can I cause other people in Los Angeles to get abducted as well or introduced to alien entities? Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Well, I can verify this. I can verify that if you're someone who, like yourself, who's had experiences that are they are, uh, I mean, they don't, they don't have like top secret classification necessarily, like by that term. But if it's, if it's, let's say, alien classified info that you have and you put it out there and it's very disruptive potentially to the alien agenda, to the future timeline, if you have that and you put that out there, then whoever reads that, I think, can be monitored for it. You know, it's almost like like it's, it's, a, it's a blacklisted info thing, right? So when you read it and you focus in on it, I think these aliens are already focusing on whoever is contacting or whoever is in contact with that information, and then they can check them out, right? So the, these people will, will then start experiencing hitchhiker effect-like uh, phenomena, whether it's paranormal presences in their homes, or uh, if they're careful enough, they can notice that they are getting psychically scanned, an increase in ear ringings, uh, an, increase in, uh, an increase in feeling, well, the symptoms of psychic activation, which you've talked about quite a bit elsewhere, where where it almost feels like your energy field is is uh, mushrooming like a marshmallow in a microwave. It kind of gets puffy and bigger, and you kind of get kind of spacey feeling. There there's a number of symptoms that come with psychic activation, and that would happen if these entities are focusing in on you um, and stimulating you psychically in order to scan you more effectively. It's almost like a stimulated emission, I guess you could say, uh, to to draw like a physics analogy. So that can happen. And what else? And also them, these people just having contact with you. I mean, just the very fact that, that you are, I would say, almost entangling on a quantum level, uh, mentally, emotionally, you know, through your actions, your words, back and forth, impacting each other. Uh, the fact that they get entangled into you and what you've got going on, therefore, kind of draws them in, I think, uh, just by proxy, just by quantum or uh, what do you call it, like uh, mental, psychic, proximity to you so even so even though they are 2,000 3,000 miles away if they're in mental and emotional and uh, actionable proximity to you then therefore they become part of the equation right and so if the aliens want to solve that equation if they want to make that problem go away then these people are going to be experiencing some of that yeah awesome thanks tom okay so could we we spoke about some shared traits or some shared things that could happen between a positive and a negative and you can't really use this uh, for discernment is healings, uh, respecting or appearing to respect free will and making our lives better, uh, through money and such. Um, could we get to however you want to do it first, any traits that can be uniquely negative and uniquely positive? Yeah, let's do the negative first. 
So negative only traits, and some of these are common sense. They're kind of obvious, but I'm going to go through them anyway just for completeness. So um, things like they're sociopaths, and they act like it. They have identifiable ulterior motives and red flags. So if you analyze their behaviors, uh, what they say, what they do, how they affect you, there are certain red flags in there that are typical of people who are lying, who are con artists, who want to get one over on you. Uh, you know, and you can, you can study that up in itself just by studying how sociopathy and psychopathy works and so on. Um, but these aliens, they, they tend to display a lot of those same tricks. And the reason why it's the same tricks is because whether we're talking about human sociopaths or alien sociopaths, both of them are acting on you, the human, and you as a human have certain uh, inbuilt, probably genetically coded exploits. Okay, There's certain things that work on most people. And so therefore, it doesn't matter if it's demon, alien, or whatever, they're going to use similar tricks on you. So if they act like sociopaths, then you can count them out. Uh, for example, a lot of times they will use uh, cult tactics, tactics that cults use to indoctrinate people and keep them in. And there's a really awesome video on the, on the internet, on YouTube, called uh, like Mind Control Made Easy, like how to start your own cult. And it's, a, it's an art film done by, I forgot his name, but it goes, it goes through like 10 or 12 or whatever different traits that cult members or that cult leaders use to indoctrinate their, their cult members. And funny enough, if you go through that list, you recognize so much of that in the alien contactee field, in the alien abduction field. Uh, and also what certain high-profile disinformation artists use on their on their audiences the cult tactics all right uh for example well or including like malicious lying the omission of information deflection and rationalization things like hostile aliens don't exist they're all good and if you hear about any negative ones that's just the government making it up see things like that maybe it makes sense on the surface if you think about it like um, like, a, okay, well, if aliens are here and they're from another planet, then only if they're advanced enough can they even keep themselves from blowing each other up to make it to the point where they have space exploration, right? So all the aliens that are here right now, they're the ones who made it past that point, so therefore they have to be evolved. But that's not necessarily true. That's one of those disinformation lines because it's easy for a, a cunning enough negative force to take over their own planet without firing a shot if they use deception, infiltration, and subversion. And um, not to get into politics, but nowadays on the world stage, I do think that we're seeing some of that happening. So that can happen. Uh, what else? Negative only traits includes their actions not matching their words. So they say that they are of love, of peace, of light, that they want to increase your consciousness. But then after the abduction, you come back from it. And what are all these bruises doing on you? What are these cuts? And why are your private parts sore? Right? It, it doesn't match. Their words, not only that, but it doesn't match some of the memories that, ab that an abductee might have. One of the cases I remember, well, there's many such cases, but just one that comes to mind is Miriam Delicato. She has a book called Blue Star Fulfilling Prophecy, where she details her personal experiences. Uh, she also did interviews, uh, I think, with Project Camelot or Project Avalon at some point, and that's where I remember this from. But one of her main experiences is where she was driving, and then she had an, an abduction on the road. And she remembers having an encounter with, you know, beautiful, tall Nordic beings, and it's all spiritual and so on. But then when she gets home, she's totally wrecked. She's got soreness down there and other things that weren't part of the memory record of what happened during the abduction. So something fishy is going on there. So, you know, you want to keep that in mind. I think Astral, you got your hand up. Yeah, and you mentioned, um, like, uh, when you were first talking about military abductions and shit, I'll say it Greer, right? Like he always is like all the negative ones are a military, but I wonder maybe if you could pick that apart to where, you know, like the, what's the distinguishment in which you see, or maybe in even your experience or what you've heard in what military abductions, like what's the difference between that and, or experiences in itself in, in authentic with non-human intelligence or extraterrestrials. Okay. Yeah. I'll get into that. I'll add that to the end of my uh, discussion on the unique traits of negative and positive aliens. Cause I keep, I keep like skipping over that. So I'll finish that first and then I'll totally get to that. All right. So just to finish up the negative only traits um, we've got, for example, the biggest one of course is that they act like parasites and they don't respect boundaries. There are control freaks you know, they don't, um, 
they don't practice the law of non-interference uh, in any way, shape, or form, except if they are prevented from harming you by like some sort of protection you have or some sort of law that they're under. Okay, then they want to to extract consent from you. Whereas the more positive beings, they don't. They're not as desperate to try to manipulate you through deception and emotional pressuring tactics to get you to give up consent. So that's another one. And of course, one of the biggest ones is that if one day aliens were ever to show up and reveal themselves, I think I think it's pretty safe to say that the first ones to do so are the interventionists, because, I mean, if they're the first ones, then of course they would have to be, and therefore they're not the ones to be trusted, just based on that. You know, So these are, these are some traits that I would say are some of the more guaranteed negative traits. Now, to finish up with that, how do you tell if an entity is primarily positive, right? Well, one, they don't deny the existence of negative forces on Earth. If they do, you can count them out, because we have just way too much data we have too many experiencers saying that there's something going on. And this ties back into your question, Astral, about the MyLab stuff, because Greer claims that all reports of negative aliens are manufactured by the government through these things called prog- programmable life forms, which are like artificial beings that they grow to make look like greys or whatever, um, to abduct people with, to you know give them harrowing experiences in order to paint the good aliens as bad, or, I mean, all aliens as bad. But the thing about that, though, is... Um, abductions and aliens and the, the war between different alien factions, it goes way back in history. I mean, heck, even just look at the, the Battle of Nuremberg in 1561. Like, why were these things fighting in the skies if they were all good, right? Uh, you can go back even earlier than that to Native American lore about the star people versus the more, like, negative-type groups that are out there. Um, yeah, that's a whole section in itself I'll get into. But so, you know, it's going back to strictly positive traits. How do you tell if something's positive? Well, like I said, they don't deny the existence of negative forces, they don't deny that negative forces can pretend to be benevolent. See, because it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, negative forces exist, um, but they're just hostile, violent things. They're just like things out of like Hollywood movies, like the, the Aliens movie, or, or Predator, or something like that. You know, If that's all you think hostile NHIs are, then of course you're going to be way open to being infiltrated by imposter good guys that don't do that, but that have hostility of a covert nature. You know, using infiltration, lying, deception, pretending to be good guys, right? So you have to take that into account, that if, if a particular source denies the existence of covert hostility of beings that are pretending to be benevolent, then that kind of makes them suspect, because why are they denying it? And actually, you know, if there's one takeaway that I would like to leave people with, is there are three important questions that you can ask any source to kind of get a read on where they're coming from, okay? And these are the three questions. The first question is, are there non-human predatory intelligences on Earth? In other words, are there dark forces or negative aliens, whatever you want to call them? Do they exist on Earth at all? And some sources will say, no, it's all good, okay? Skip them. I write them off, you know, they're, they're done. Question two, do these forces ever pretend to be benevolent? And yes, you know, if they, if they do pretend to be benevolent, then that brings up the third question, which is, how then can we discern between actual benevolent beings and these imposters? So if you ask these three questions to any source, it can be a channeling source, a contactee source, it could be Greer, whatever, you can tell by their reaction, by what they say, um, where they're coming from. Okay? And I, I've done this, you know, I've done this. Like uh, a couple months ago, it's a pretty well-known personality on Twitter. I asked him basically these questions. And the uh, first thing they did was ignore it. I asked them again. They deflected it. And the third time, they banned me, or they blocked me. So, hey, there we go, right? Um, and, and it's because if they do answer the third question about how can we discern between actual benevolent beings and these imposters, if they answer it, if they have an agenda, it's going to be obvious in the answer because they're going to be dancing around certain things. It's not going to check out. You can find holes in it. You can find ulterior motives, right? So you want to get to the point where they answer that question. And if they don't even get to that point, then, hey, maybe, maybe there's something going on. So for me, that's, that's my kryptonite. I like asking these questions to any contactee or personality out there. And if I ever meet an alien consciously, and not just an, an abduction, but like consciously in everyday life, I'll ask them that, see what they say. And I can, I can probably tell their motivations based on that. But um, so, yeah, so getting back to just to finish up real quick on the positive aliens and how you can tell, well, what are the unique traits that they have? Well, 
what they say, it tends to fit with other independent sources. Okay, and they don't they don't necessarily discourage you from um, verifying it. Now they might caution you, saying, "Hey, there's a lot of disinformation out there, so if you do do a lot of research, just beware of the BS." They might say that, but they don't they don't tell you like um, like oh, we are the only source of truth and pay no attention to everything else, right? They don't do that, but you do see that happening in the New Age field where these sources, these these uh, deceptive beings, they encourage their followers to only hang on their words. To not look outside of it, and that once again, that's a cult tactic, right? It's a cult tactic to not um, to discourage people from seeking any information outside the cult. So you got to watch out for that too. What else? Well, what they say, I'm talking about benevolent forces here. What they say, it, it adds something new. Okay, it adds clarity, correction. It expand, it expands on your knowledge, and it it adds something new to it. So it's not just uh, it's not just these these fortune cookie aphorisms that everyone already knows because any being can say that you know a demon could say that a, a sociopath could say that but if someone offers up information that's actually useful and makes you a better person and increases your discernment and uh kind of helps you see through deception then that source it can't necessarily be be negative if they do that and just like lastly this is kind of important but it's it's a tricky thing okay but if you have a very good sense of intuition, then you can sense when something is off, and you can sense when something sounds right. But the catch to that, however, the catch to that is that if you don't have a very solid grip on things, then even lies can sound right. Even lies can make sense. And we see that all the time in politics or in, in uh, academia and scientism and um, in media, for example, where this artificial construct of lies is constructed that's based on, you know, that, that, that appeals to cultural assumptions, that appeals to things that we take for granted um, without ever having questioned it. And it makes sense to us. You know, it makes sense because it's playing to your programming. Whereas with positive forces, and it doesn't have to be aliens, it can be, you know, positive, well-meaning, smart researchers. It can be angels if you're in contact with them. When they say something, it, it feels right, but it appeals to not only your intuition, but also your, your sense of critical thinking. Like, if you really dig into it, you don't find any flaws. Uh, it makes sense, and it checks out, right? So, but, but don't, don't take it for granted that just because something feels right, it is right. You also have to check it out logically. You know, if you want to, you can um, do your research, critically think it, analyze it. You know, truth does not shy away from scrutiny. That is like the law that you can use to deal with these forces, you know, test the spirits. You have to test them. Don't be afraid to stand up to them. I mean, just because uh, they make it seem like they chose you and now your relationship is on thin ice because if you don't obey them, then they might leave you behind and you don't want to be like not special. See, that's why some people don't question their contact experiences. They don't question it because they think they got something special going on and they don't want to upset this, this magical opportunity to be part of something greater. And so therefore they don't, uh, they don't critically think about it. They don't question it. And because of that reason, they obey it, and therefore they are chumps to a potentially deceptive agenda, right? So if they're, if they're good forces, if they speak the truth, then there's nothing wrong with questioning it, looking into it, digging into it, and trying to find flaws in it. And that's the, sort of the philosophy that I take towards everyone and everything. I, I look for the holes in it, what's wrong with it, uh, what it doesn't explain, what it doesn't fit, and then what checks out through all of it is what I absorb into my tentative hypothesis of, uh, of what's going on. Um, yeah, so unless you got any more questions on that, maybe in a moment I can touch on the my lab versus uh, abduction stuff. So, uh, real quick, before we get to that, Tom, uh, just two things. Um, I just wanted to go back to a couple other things you said. They don't play on your ego. They're probably not telling you you're a star seed with a special mission uh, from your star family. Uh, they are not attention seeking. They're more low key and, and subtle. And then I think you said the, the thing that just makes them absolute most sense. Truth does not uh, shrink away from scrutiny. I just, I really love that. Um, what would you say, before we get into the Maya Labs, what would you say to anyone who says you cannot anthropomorphize, oh, I added an extra syllable in there, um, 
the phenomenon. Like we cannot do this. All the things you're saying are just putting human characteristics onto the phenomenon. It's ridiculous. You can't treat them like us. They're just so far above us and so far outside of our understanding. Uh, what you're doing is actually um, ridiculous. What do you What do you have to say to that? Well, I would say that. Funny enough, we are dealing with beings who have two eyes, two nostrils, a mouth, right? Two arms, two legs. They're already partially humanoid. And there's many possible theories about why that is. Part of the explanation is that they are made from our genetics, you know? So they're not even truly alien. They're artificial creations of something that is indeed almost incomprehensible, incomprehensible right? But the fact is, we're dealing, with, uh, we're dealing with a hierarchy of beings that are close enough to us that we can breathe their air, they can breathe ours. And there's hybridization going on potentially and uh, possibly even direct sexual relations interbreeding, like let's say with Nordics. You know, there's stuff in the, in the Rosicrucian tradition about uh, certain humans intermarrying nymphs or sylphs or ele- these other elementals, these non-human beings, and giving birth you know, to uh, what, what do they call them? Like, like demigod-type famous people that have superhuman powers. So we're talking about hybridization going on with that potentially for centuries, if not thousands of years, now that's played into human history. But um, I wonder if Ganga has something to say on this topic, so I'll defer to him quickly and then I'll get back. Um, not on that topic. I was just going to ask, um, with all the, the collected information you have on people asking questions of these entities, is it super prevalent that these entities push back on the relationship when these people ask legitimate questions and and respect, you know, they want respect in the in the, in the fair treatment with their associated, you know, NHI. Do you see that, or is it like an uh, an uncommon occurrence? I would say it's not so. Com- it happens, but it's not that common. Only because a lot of people buy the the excuses or the platitudes that these NHIs are giving. So if someone starts resisting and starts asking questions, then a lot of times the entities will give an explanation for it. And then the person will be like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. But they, but they, only, they only say that because they wanted it to make sense. They were hoping that the entity would answer correctly. You know, they're hoping that the relationship wouldn't be ruined, right? So there's, a, there's an ego investment in there already, uh, a relationship that they wanted to maintain. And so the first pat answer that the alien gives, it's like, you know, they, they, they totally go along with it. Um, but, but yeah, a couple cases I know, they did keep, keep pushing it. Uh, they kept on pushing it. And interestingly enough, it's just like with, a, with, a, with an abusive relationship where as long as you do what they say and are under their control, they treat you relatively well. But then if you do show defiance, then they turn. They do a flip. You know? Then they crank up the manipulation. Uh, and that, that's happened both with negative alien groups, as far as I can tell, uh, but also with demonic type beings that have become like spiritual hostage takers of certain people, like, you know, jacking into their minds and feeding them BS stories. BS stories, I might say, that also include potential sci- science fiction or alien elements. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention earlier is that I do believe that there's a, a problem with non alien uh, occult entities masquerading as alien beings if it fits the belief system of the person. Okay, that happens. That happens, and one of the ways that you can tell it is that, and not a real alien, is that number one, these things are around twenty four seven, like overly attached girlfriends <laughs> or boyfriends, to be fair. Uh, but they're they're always around twenty four seven. They're feeding on your energy. You're getting sick. You're getting tired. You're you, you know they're, you're being drained of everything that you have, and these entities show up usually first, not as aliens. Okay, not as aliens but as like shadowy figures that in some cases I've heard, they ask you for permission to be let in. They ask like, hey, will you let me in? And I know cases where the person said yes. And as soon as they did, that's when these induced hallucinations started up and the person started getting experiences of fantastic voyages with aliens to the other side of the moon or in the galaxy or whatever. Uh, and so they, they, these people, they become experts on a view of the cosmos and what's going on with the world and aliens that is total BS because it's being fed to them by these occult entities that are just making it up to get the person wrapped around their finger. Okay. And then when this person then goes on to become a subject of, uh, alien abduction research, 
Well, now you've got a bunch of BS feeding into the, the abduction data pool, and that makes it even harder to pick out the real signal of what's really going on with abductions. See, that's a problem that I've run into. Uh, it's, not, it's not a problem that I've seen discussed too much, but it's something to be aware of, that not all supposed alien encounters are encounters with aliens. Some of them could be with aliens. Some of them could be with these, these, these uh, artificial hallucination-inducing demonic entities that are only doing it to, to mess with them. And not to mention, uh, when they do that, the, at best they can, like I said, induce telekinetic bruising, maybe some welts or something like that, or maybe throw objects around the room. But they, what they don't have is they don't have actual ships in the sky. They don't have the blue beam technology that levitates someone out through a closed window. Uh, they don't have vehicles that can crash that you know leads to crash retrieval and reverse engineering and all that. So that, that's a whole separate phenomenon um, but there, but there, like I said, there is an occult dimension to the alien thing where it's a, it's, it's a fake, it's a fake alien abduction experience or a fake alien contact experience. So don't lump those two together. There's a separate thing there and you got to pick out that signal from the noise. All right. Thanks, Tom. We lost, um, Astro. I don't know if he's going to come back in, but, um, if you wanted to get to his my labs question, do you remember the details of it? Right. Yeah. So he asked why, well, okay. If I remember correctly, I think he asked, how do you tell the difference between, between military-induced staged alien uh, abductions or real alien abductions. Or, you know, or, how, or actually, you know, the, you know what the bigger question is? The bigger question is, how do we know that the alien thing isn't all a military psyop? And it's one of those uh, skeptic questions that comes up quite a bit, right? Because it's just kind of popular nowadays to say that all the alien stuff is just a military psyop and aliens are programmable life forms and so on. But what I would say to that is, if you look at abduction and contact encounters and what people have reported about the intelligence and the capability of these alien beings, these aliens are extremely telepathic and precognitive. Okay? They've got IQs that are probably, I'm guessing, 300 to 500 easily. Okay? They can shift between dimensions. They, As I mentioned, they can levitate abductees out on a blue beam through a closed window. They can walk through solid walls. And what are we saying that all of that is U.S. made biological robots. I don't think the, the the shadow military has that level of ability. I think they've got something that's sort of on the way to that. You know, maybe they've got portal technology. Especially if you look at military abduction cases, it's not always a case that a military abductee is, let's say, taken out at gunpoint into a black van and drove and driven to some base somewhere. Uh, it's not necessarily a black helicopter outside you know, pulling you up on a rope or something. No, it's, it's a, it's a portal. It's an actual like wormhole or something like that, that opens up in the bedroom and takes an abductee into the underground base. Now that one I've only heard in the past, let's say 20 to 30 years. Uh, but before that, if you go back into the sixties and seventies, that's when you get more into the, Oh, the, the black vans and the black helicopters and such, you know, lifting people out. But they, they seem to have reverse engineered alien technology or maybe technology that was given to them as part of some deal that allows them to perform somewhat on par with the alien entities themselves. But the issue is, as long as you're human, or as long as you, you look human like that, you're, you're going to be missing some of the uh, uh, intellectual and psychic ability that only certain genetics, like let's say uh, a mantis being, would have by virtue of its genetic construct. Okay, So these military groups... If they, if they don't want to be a bunch of mantids walking around in military uniforms, if they want to be human-looking, then they're going to have certain abilities that it limits them. Okay, And these people, they're not even on the level of Nordics, for example. So, so Nordics, if you, if you think about what Nordics are, they could be artificial creations or they could be a genuine, um, let's say, a, a weird advanced offshoot of the human race. Either way, biologically, they're different from us, enough so that they're able to sustain extremely high levels of psychic power that ordinary humans cannot. Okay. And for that reason, these, these military black ops programs, they're limited in what abilities they have. Uh, and therefore what we see, what we, what is reported of alien abilities and powers does not match the capabilities that they have. So that's why I do think that there's a, a functional performative difference between aliens and what they can do and the kind of abductions that they do and the military abductions and what they can do. You know, they might have wormhole technology. They might have uh, somewhat psychic people working for them. They could even have alien hybrids embedded in their ranks. 
but but still, I mean, the fact that they're working out of uh, human military bases using human technology for the most part, like old military equipment, which has been seen quite a bit in these bases, the fact that they use it kind of kind of limits them from um, some of the powers that are being displayed by by aliens. So if you're an abductee and you don't know which one of these you have, well, there's certain nuances that you can pick up on. For example, uh, the alien abduction stuff it doesn't it doesn't involve as much um, like like sexual human trafficking and like psychic psychic remote assassination type phenomena as you would find in the MyLab field. Like with the MyLab field, if you're if you're a military abductee, you're going to be used for just a couple of things. You're going to be used for uh, sexual pleasure of some of these these black ops personnel. Okay, you're going to be used for remote viewing as like a like a remote antenna. And you know, like maybe maybe you've got certain latent psychic powers or something like that in your family, and they can amp that up, and they can use you remotely to remote view you know probable futures or certain targets that they have. So you might be like a primarily like a like a psychic asset to them. Or possibly um, remote psychic assassination if you're powerful enough. Now, there's a lot of nonsense in this field. I think there's a lot of people that claim to be super soldiers with tiger blood or you know ridiculous things like that uh, that I think we have to be cautious of. But there is a core to the my lab phenomenon that seems to be real. And in my case, well, I don't know if I want to fully get that go there, but I'll, I'll just say that. That there are certain agendas that the military has that aliens don't, and vice versa, and these then determine what nuances or symptoms of an abduction you would have that you know determines which which case it is. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so just to sum up this little this portion of it, first of all, Tom, um, what does your night look like? I know you're. I think you're kind of a night owl, but I don't want to overstep on our first space. Hope I hope I hope we have more. Oh, what do your what's your time frame right now? I'm good. So just keep going and uh, I'm good. Okay, awesome. So this is going to kind of just wrap up that first section of how do we tell the difference between positive and negative aliens? And I think it it can be hard sometimes, right? I think the the biggest issue isn't really telling positive from negative. It's telling uh, the difference between a positive alien and when negative aliens are are posing as positive aliens. I think that's where. Um, we really have to be paying attention. And then, um, so from that, I think I would like to get into why, you know, why would aliens be negative? What is this negative alien agenda that a lot of times I'm talking about, other people are talking about, you got David Jacobs throwing stuff out there. You have Carla Turner, Barbara Bothfollick, uh, James Bartley, all of, uh, you know, some of the researchers out there talking about this negative alien agenda, and why would aliens be negative or have a negative ag- agenda or, you know, that kind of thing? Um, before we get into that, there we have a lot of questions and speakers' requests. Um, I would just act that you ask that you be a little bit patient. If anyone on the panel has anything on this particular topic, a discerning positive from negative, um, please uh, address it now. Or Ulrich, if you want to wrap up your question now. Um, before we move into the next segment. And then after that, we can get into um, all the speaker requests we have. Uh, And I have a whole page of questions, um, a couple of which we've already addressed, but there's a ton of other questions out there. Anyone else? Uh, Go ahead, Ulrich. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know where this fits in. I just, I just sort of, I'm I'm interested in how you became so reflective on this topic and how you grew up. It seems like people go through a development where people might be interested in the paranormal and then they have enough experiences where they just know and then they have other questions as in like is my brain just producing this or is this another entity and once they're clear on that they want to know whether they can trust it and I'm I'm sort of interested in like how how, what your psychological development was and like in as easy a way or whatever makes the most sense to you okay yeah I'll I'll try to do that concisely so just real quick so let's see. Uh, I was born in Germany. My dad was an electrical engineer. So my dad, being an engineer, he taught me a lot of science when I was a kid. And he got me really inquisitive about how the world worked. And I was always trying to take things apart and figure things out. So at the same time, as me being really curious about how everything worked, I also had these alien abduction experiences at the same time. So it got me thinking, well, what the heck is going on? And uh, that's when, when I was 12, I got a library card and I started reading all the books that I could on it. Right, so I already started researching when I was still in uh, 
what was it, like sixth grade, I think. Yeah, so I started researching it when I was in sixth grade. And then over the years, I've met so many different people that would share with me their advice, their experiences. Uh, I had a pen pal that I met when I was 15, and he would send me boxes and boxes of books. So me being 15 years old and in high school, uh, in my, my free time, I did nothing but research all of it. Uh, and he, he would also share with me his advice that he learned from all his years of research and experience and gave me a lot of caution about, you know, be careful if you get into free energy research and if you ever develop it yourself because, you know, there are oil interests that will take you out, which is true. Yeah, I mean, that, that happens to, to certain inventors. So I learned a lot from it. Um, but then I went through just an evolutionary phase of falling for certain things like being pro-gray for a couple of years in, uh, in junior high uh, to, to kind of seeing through it the more data I, I gathered. Uh, and, be, and because I'm always skeptical and critical of pretty much everything, including myself, uh, that allowed a self-correction, or self-correction process to occur over time where I kept on looking for angles, you know, how am I being deceived, what, what doesn't fit, could, could, I, you know, could there be a better explanation for this? And so over time, as you just accumulate more experiences and you do more experiments and just test your hypotheses and meet more people, uh, you, you start zeroing in on a picture that even if it's not 100% correct, it's generally in the ballpark. And I find that other people who do a similar process, we kind of end up in a, in a similar, uh, similar plateau of understanding about what's generally going on. You know, we might differ in our small details, but like the general overall picture, I noticed a lot of people agree on it. Just, you know, if they've read enough sources and they've experienced enough and they've really thought through it and they really crunch the, the data, so to speak. So, yeah. And thank, thank you, Tom. And if I can just follow up on that, how, I mean, if you're this curious in the, in the, in the paranormal at an early age, did you keep that curiosity sheltered from the outside world and were you really selective or did it bump up against uh, a reductive rationalism and did it change your relationships? Well, luckily because I was a kid and in school, you know, people, you, you, you get made fun of, you know, you can be called alien boy or, or whatever. But the thing is, as long as you've got a good sense of humor about it and are, are a likable person, then people dismiss it. They think like, Oh, that's just, Tom with his funny idiosyncrasy and you know whatever, so so they would they would tolerate it. Uh, of course, if I if I had done this, let's say in a in an academic environment, let's say I were like a post grad student and I was trying to get funding, I was trying to be in with the with the board of directors of of my institution and so on, then no way it, it wouldn't be possible at all. But but luckily, I've been socially sheltered enough from such professional relations that I didn't really have to worry about it, and anything that I did give away in terms of my beliefs or whatever, people just thought it as funny or interesting or entertaining most of the time. Right. And uh, what about what about your parents? Like when you saw these beings as a child, how did they engage with you re- regarding that? So, so when I was a child, I didn't, I didn't know that they were aliens. Uh, I called them the stone men or the, or the gray men. That's how I, re- I refer to them. So I refer to them as that. And I think my, my parents didn't really they didn't really realize or think or believe that it could be alien. They just thought it was like, like, you know, just me having nightmares or, or whatever. Um, so they're okay with it. Um, my mom, she being from Singapore and Asian culture, they believe in ghosts. So in her mind, if we were being harassed by something, it was just ghosts. And then my dad, my dad was into, he was interested in parapsychology. So even though being an engineer, he was also interested in parapsychology. Uh, and so he, he didn't, he didn't like bash it or downplay it or anything. So I had a pretty free childhood to think whatever I wanted, which I think was helpful in having me maintain an open mind as I got older. And, and just lastly, when it came to picking a career, do you think at some level you got so deep that you had to sort of make your career one and the same thing is, does the phenomenon just become all consuming or is it possible to sort of have a, have a career that has nothing to do with it and still manage time and, and money and responsibilities? Uh, yeah, I think it depends on the person and also on the, on the career. And the reason why I say that is because, so I did, I did four years of uh, electrical engineering and physics. So I double majored in both. Um, my scholarship money ran out at the end of the fourth year and had other things going on, so I kind of left that behind. But one of the reasons why I left it behind, though, is because when I worked at a plasma physics lab, I worked with my plasma physics professor at the University of Iowa, I worked with him, and I worked with various grad students that were working under him. And it gave me a taste of what academia is like. And 
what I realized, uh, and I experienced this even in my fourth year of college doing both physics and electrical engineering, I noticed that you have to give yourself 100% dedication to 100% dedication to that field. Like if you don't believe in it 100%, then you're not going to have the uh, the energy, the the discipline, or um, the motivation to excel in it, right? So me, having studied a lot of alternative physics and fringe inventions and so on, uh, I was always skeptical of everything that was being taught to me in college. So, And actually, a lot of it, I could see through it. I could see what the flaws were. And so that only gave me, let's say, 50% faith in what was being taught to me. And I was unable to split my mind and focus, let's say, 100% towards it while also sharing 100% belief in the fringe. So that was the other reason why I left college is because I couldn't deal with another four years of being in an environment where I had to leave all that other stuff, everything that I knew, I had to leave it behind in order to dedicate myself fully to it. So I figured, you know what, I'll leave college, I'll make money some other way, and I've done that through uh, engineering, consulting, web and graphic design, uh, writing books, and so on. Um, but use my free time then to study f physics the rest of the time on my own, which I have done. So I've got like a little lab here, I've got my experiments, I've got textbooks and my notebooks and so on. So I've done it on my own outside of an academic environment because I don't think I could uh, do it within an academic environment. And that's the reason why I never went back to college is because I couldn't, because it would be a nightmare, you know, having to ignore everything that, that I believe in now just to throw myself into this mainstream 3D, ultimately like an academic control system. So, yeah, so I don't think I'd be able to do it, but I'm sure someone else who, let's say they're a super genius and physics and math comes super easily to them. Yeah, you know, they could, they could probably do it because they only need, let's say, 20% of their mental resources to handle it to get 100% aptitude in that field and still do all this other fringe stuff. But me, uh, I'm, I'm maybe above average, but I'm not like a super genius like that. So I can't do it. Can I push back uh, gently against that, Tom? Is sure. It, is it possible that, um, that, that maybe these aren't even in conflict, having an intuitive mind and having a logical mind, that there may just be something about the thinking that academia tends to groove in the West uh, that is in fact restrictive of even analytical thinking or logic, such as viewing things like a detective versus viewing things like a scientist is supposed to view view them. The the fact that you're, I, I, I've been seeing a pattern in certain people like Chan Thomas, the author of the Adam and Eve story, who is apparently an electrical engineer. There's sort of echoes of electrical engineering, that there's actually something we lost in our scientific development and experiment, that it may have been more technological in its approach towards innovation. Is there something that are hard sciences, specifically physics, electrical engineering, or alternative propulsions that we've lost that is actually causing a, n a narrow or a broader in intellectual st stagnation? Have you been able to like put your finger on it? Oh yeah, totally. Um, it actually goes deeper than even that. Because one of the reasons, or one of the things that I saw, even in, in my third and fourth year of college doing physics and electrical engineering, is that they were using they were using tactics that seemed more in line with indoctrination than education, okay? And uh, w one of my professors, he actually told me that it's a, it's a technique that was developed at MIT, okay? And what they do at MIT is they, they, they call it the fire hose approach. So what they do is they, they take all the new people, you know, they bring them in, and they shoot them with, with, with just courses, uh, homework, knowledge, you know, whatever, it's like data information, whatever, more than they can absorb, right? So it's a fire hose approach, like drown them in it. And the idea being, well, the way that they say it is that, okay, well, whatever sticks, sticks, and it'll weed out a lot of the, the newbies who shouldn't be in this field to begin with. And that's true. But at the same time, when you're confronted with something like that, that demands that much um, resources on your part, you don't have time to question what you're being taught. Because if you expend energy and time to really think about, hey, is this really legit? Like, is this interpretation really correct? Like, what are the flaws in it? Um, if you try to do that, then you don't have enough time and energy to to perform at the level that you're required uh, in these these, uh, these these bachelors and graduate programs. And so, there's a there's a psychological manipulation aspect to it that I don't think is is fair necessarily. It's not honest. It's not organic. And I think the, the end result of it is to create basically organic software or, or organic, yeah, like organic software. So basically people that are smart enough to do their job, but not aware enough to question the job that they're doing. 
kind of a, an allergy to depth to, to really dive deep and take the time you need. Kind of like Einstein said, he had an advantage by it took him longer and it forced him to think more deeply. Or am I mm -hmm. reading into that too much? No, that's totally correct. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, and actually, my, my quantum physics professor, I asked him one time, like, well, what does this mean? Like, what's, what's really going on here? And after something hemming and hawing, he, he basically said, as physicists, it's not our job to figure out like the, the, the whys and the, you know, all the theoreticals about it. Our job is to do the numbers and get the results. That's what he said. I, those were his, word, his words. Now, of course, not all professors share that point of view, right? But I think he was uh, exemplary of the sort of mentality that academics have, which is you get compartmentalized, you get specialized into this extremely little narrow field and it's so narrow that you're the only one that can do that thing. And that's how you gain your worth. And that's how you gain your funding. Because now you're the expert in some really, 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 really long title. <laughs> something. And you write papers that are really arcane on that. And you become valued for your rarity in that field. But in order to even get to that point, you become essentially useless as far as being a lateral thinker, like a big picture thinker. You know, because you're so focused on that narrow little, little topic. And I think that's where they want people. It's just like in the black ops programs where they compartmentalize all the different compartments, you know, all the different departments, and people don't, I mean, people are working on this electronic widget and they don't even know what machine it's part of. They don't even know what it's for. You know, they're only, their expertise goes towards building that and that only. So I think the same thing is happening in a softer way in academia where unless you're blessed with, uh, a multidisciplinary knowledge base like Gary Nolan, for example, you're not going to see a lot of the bigger picture. And I think that's exactly where they want it. And that's why I got out of it because I just couldn't, I couldn't play the part. I didn't have enough resources to play the part and do my own thing at the same time and kind of keep perspective on all of it. And, uh, but however, I do agree with you totally that, that being in this fringe field is not at odds with uh, being into intellectual pursuits and studying physics and science and logic and so on. Not at all. What I'm saying is it's at odds with being part of a uh, academically hostile and psychologically manipulative control system that's probably designed to weed out people who think for themselves. Yeah. And I was not going to go this far because it would sound conspiratorial, but I had this thought and somebody just DM me and they had the same thought. So I'm going to go there. Um, uh, is it a reasonable thing to, to suspect that maybe NHI had an influence on on our intellectual stagnation with regard to the hard physics, let's say post, you know, nuclear weapons or post 1970s? I would say theoretically, yes. And the reason why I say that is because I've traced the history of physics as we know it today, trying to figure out where it went wrong. Okay. And one of the places where it went wrong was in the late 1800s, when Oliver Heaviside, he was a he was, he was a mathematician and electrical engineer and sort of a physicist. But he reworked the Maxwell equations, which have to do with uh, electric fields and magnetic fields and how they interact with each other to produce electromagnetism. Okay? So James Maxwell figured out electromagnetism, and he figured out that not only, was, not only did it involve electromagnetic fields, but it also involved something else, something that if he had followed through with it, probably would have led to anti-gravity would have led to alternative physics that would have opened up pretty much all the abilities that, you know, that, that the black ops have nowadays with their you know, triangle TR-3B ships and so on. But he didn't go there necessarily, but it was still in his papers. Okay? And then Oliver Heaviside, a couple decades later, decided to rewrite Maxwell's theory to make it more compact, more easy to use, you know, better use for electrical engineering. But when he did that, he, he purposely cut out that, that, that mysterious uh, that hidden door that Maxwell had discovered. So, and in fact, if you look up Heaviside's words on what it is, he said that that concept, which was called the vector potential or the scalar potential, he said that the potentials should be murdered from the theory. He used very harsh language. I mean, he had absolute hatred for it. It was irrational. See, there was no rational reason why he had that much hatred for it. And to me, like, what is it? Like, what was it? What, nothing explains that necessarily. But if you know anything about how NHIs or telepathic aliens influence people nowadays, they, they can do it through manipulating emotional biases. So a person can have an irrational bias towards a particular project or person or network or you know something that they, if they didn't have that bias, maybe they would go through with it. And maybe that would lead to something down the line. So if 
a telepathic being can prevent that merely by nudging the impulse of a person, you know, by making them not go through with it, then that can change history. So who's to say whether or not that has actually happened? Maybe it has. Maybe it happened in the 1890s with Oliver Heaviside. And as a result of his work, all of electrical engineering since that time, since the 1890s, has revolved around the non-mysterious stuff. You know, just that's why we still have combustion cars. That's why we still have jet engines. That's why we don't have anti-gravity warp engines. Is because of Oliver Heaviside messing up the theory based on an irrational impulse, which we don't know exactly where it comes from, but very well could have been a manipulation of history. So that can happen. And like I said, if you read William Bramley's book, The Gods of Eden, that's a lot of documentation there about how non-human forces have manipulated history in other ways. So I do think that history is being manipulated in subtle ways, and it doesn't have to be in major ways like aliens landing in D.C. and taking over the government. You don't have to do that. All they have to do is find the, the, the right sources on the timeline and nudge them telepathically or through abductions or through some sort of a, a proxy they have on the ground, you know, some person that leads them astray. It's um, The fact that they can do that at all, if they can, it's, it speaks to our ignorance and our weakness and their power as a result of that weakness and ignorance. Because I think if we knew ourselves better and we knew how to detect mind influence like that, then, then these, these manipulations wouldn't happen. Tom, I cannot tell you how uh, liberating it is to hear those words coming from you. Um, I don't want to push you past your boundaries, but my intuition is telling me you have an idea of what that something else might be. If I'm right, do you mind sharing? Are you asking about what that something else in terms of physics might be? Is that what you're asking about? I assume you're referring to something along the lines of the ether. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean... I did a video on my channel on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash Tom Montauk, uh, there's a video there under the scalar physics section. If you click on that video, scalar physics, like it's called an introduction to scalar physics, that summarizes what I can say. And I use diagrams and little animations and stuff on it. So that's necessary to understand what I would be inadequate to explain right now in, a, in an answer to you. Tom, thank you so much. And sorry to the room, I just... Uh, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to had to finish asking everything. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ulrich. Uh, Tiff, did you have anything? Yeah, um, I was just going to inquire if um, regarding the things that uh, you've stated, how it might apply to like DMT entities or um, specifically, yeah, DMT entities. Yeah. So I haven't done DMT myself. I, but but I know many people who have like DMT, ayahuasca, the, the whole deal. So I've got, I've got a lot of anecdotal data coming at me from people who are in it. So my view on that is when you take psychedelic substances, right? So as we know, it interferes or it, mo it modifies the, the interaction of neurotransmitters <clears throat> in the brain. And the thing about neurotransmitters and neurons is when, when these synapses are, and these, uh, what do you call them, these receptors are activated, depending on the chemical structure, even if, if two chemicals are almost identical except for one little tiny difference, it's going to impact that process differently. You know, not only at the beginning, but at the end of the chain of different chemical processes. And ultimately, that chain is going to interfere with the interaction between the physical, biological body and the uh, subtle energy body, whether you want to call it uh, the etheric body or astral body, the whole like, non-physical side of it. It gets that, that its interaction with the physical body gets messed up or changed in some way when you imbibe psych psychedelic substances. And then also, you know, with through natural processes within yourself. Like when you go to sleep and you dream, some people say like DMT gets activated in your brain. Well, these different neurotransmitters, they affect the physical side of it, but the physical side of it has non-physical effects. So when we talk about psychedelic experiences, we're talking both about chemical effects and also occult or psychic or metaphysical effects. Those two things are happening simultaneously. Uh, and there's also a lot of scrambling. So earlier when I was talking about sleep paralysis and hypnopompic hallucinations, where when you wake up from the state, your, your, your mind is bypassing certain physical censorship filters that your body has, so you're able to pick up things through extrasensory perception. However, also your internal dream imagery is also being projected onto that same visual field, so you get a blending of internal subjective things and external, more like ESP objective things, so you get a mixing of signals. Well, the same thing happens to a higher extent when you're on... DMT or acid or, 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 or ayahuasca or whatever. And 
so the question about DMT in particular, because of its chemical structure, it's going to alter the subtle energy body in a particular way that kind of aims you in a particular direction within, if you want to call it the astral plane or other dimension, something like that. It's going to direct your consciousness in a particular direction. And I think that's why people end up typically seeing similar things when they're on a particular drug, you know, as opposed to, let's say, LSD or mushrooms or really, really, really heavy amounts of pot or something like that. These chemicals are all different. They're going to have different effects, and therefore they're going to uh, project you mentally, consciously, astrally into a different different direction. And that's why with DMT, you get things like the supposed machine elves or, in some cases, even mantis beings. Now, whether these mantis beings are necessarily the same thing as the, the mantids that are seen in, in abduction counters, that's up for a debate. It might be the same. Um, it might be perhaps the brain picking up on, let's say, grays and mantids, but, but it, the information is getting scrambled by the chemical storm that's happening in your body. And so, so unless, we, unless we really, really dig down at the molecular level and also have a similar level of precision in the occult realm, it's going to be hard to distinguish exactly what the difference is. So. Um, the, regarding the DMT entities, just as uh, my own personal experience as somebody who has uh, used uh, DMT in the past, uh, there there's like different classes of entities. Yeah. Uh, miniature, like at one time, five times in a row, I saw like miniature little Aztec clown guys like stacked upon each other to film, um, create one larger being. And they did the same exact uh, dance, I guess. Uh, all five times that I saw them, the exact same thing. And it just blew my mind to revisit something multiple times. And another time it was like, I, I went somewhere else into somebody else's room and there was a being who was like, you know, the typical DMT being with the eyes and the pattern uh, walls and skin. It was yeah. very intense. Uh, but uh, the, these beings that people report, they can, they can repeat. Um, they are, they have people who are going into extended DMT states and, uh, they're mapping out DMT realms. Uh, I mean, these are like, uh, re the fact that we can repeat the, the experience is, uh, what makes me wonder about these entities so much. And is there, um, based on the data that you've, um, looked at, is there a way to discern a positive negative entity in that experience? Or is that just a completely different ballpark well in that experience <clears throat> i mean if you don't know what their origin is or what their true nature is you can always just look at at um the impact that they would have on you and based on that you know based on the fruits of their actions you know based on the end result of it you can tell when if something is relatively more uh, benevolent or not i'm mean, assuming assuming your objective about the impacts like <clears throat> like obviously if they impact you in a way where let's say you become more psychic and you healed of an injury, right? If you're critically thinking, as I mentioned earlier, you can't conclude hundred percent that therefore it's a positive being. But, um, the thing is usually when people encounter these beings, they are told certain things. They're given certain revelations about the nature of reality that then you, you can treat that as you would, let's say a channeling source where, okay, fine. You don't know whether it's legit or not, like in terms of its credibility and its past history, but you can analyze the, the truth value of it and how much it correlates with other existing independent, relatively verified sources of information out there. Uh, so yeah, you can only really evaluate it probabilistically and you can look for ulterior motives and agendas in the, uh, the, the effects it has upon you. So one, one example, I guess would be David Icke, you know, he, he did ayahuasca and he had different experiences. And then as a result of that, he wrote a book. Now, I'm not judging the book. I'm just saying that as an example of where a person is in contact with certain entities, and as a result of it, they had a certain point of view that arose from it, which they then put out into the world through a book. So whenever something like that happens, you have to be very careful about what the entities, what, what their motivations are and how it affected the person and therefore how it affects the world, because that ends up affecting the, the destiny of our planet. So just look at it strategically, like what is the end result of it? Who benefits? Quay bono, right? So you just look at the end result of it, and um, if, it's, if it's fishy, if it doesn't check out, then the entity probably isn't truly benevolent. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, Direct, did you have anything? I think we were talking earlier, Direct, if you're still there, about um, 
questioning entities or I don't know if you're talking about maybe something, is this something you do in remote viewing that you were going to discuss um, in a way to discern the negative versus positive? And then we'll move on to our next topic. Okay. Yeah. First of all, wow. The, the articulation um, that you're capable of and, and it's just, it's just amazing. Our, viewpoints are probably almost 99.9% the same. No, I'll bypass on what we talked about because Tom mentioned those questions that he uses. The point that I was making is if they come all prepared, used to being in charge, we're the subservient one, they can seem centered. But all of a sudden, if you quickly ask them questions, depending on, you know, um, what you want to know or what your criteria they can get off center. They can pull back. They can react. You can feel the uh, effort to, you know, come up with an answer. So he, he addressed that, but I would certainly like to thank you for having him on and Tom. It's like, this is just incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And one thing I'll say on that real quick is that, um, oh, geez, lost my train of thought. It's getting like past two hours. So yeah, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, Tom, do you need a break or, you know, we could always save the topic for another day if you're if you're not feeling it anymore. It's up to you. Oh, no, actually, I am. I am good. It's just uh, <clears throat> I need to get a drink of water. So give me like a minute. OK, awesome. Take All a little right. break. Um, in the meanwhile, um, y'all, please retweet the space, follow your hosts, co-hosts and speakers. And um, I am we're going to just move on to another topic. The topic is going to be. Uh, basically uh, regarding the negative alien agenda because people don't really want to buy into there even being one. So I think it's something we should discuss. Uh, what is this? It, it, to me, it looks like a cosmic chess game. Um, we have a positive side. We have a negative side. You know, maybe there's some neutral side. Um, you might even have different factions working together on each side. I'm not really sure. It seems like that to me. Um, so what is the big picture here? What are these beings doing? What is the point? And then I have some very, um, some, a couple of questions I for sure want to get to. And then our first, um, speaker outside of that is going to be Parsi. And then I'm going to start approving, um, speakers and it's really going to depend on Tom and how long he wants to go. He's on the East coast. I think he is a night owl, but, um, we want to respect his time and make sure he has a good experience in this space with the hopes of, of course, having him back again, um, which would be amazing. Um, Tom, just let me know whenever you're able to pop back on. Um, Ulrich, what do you think so far? Um, I'm in, I'm enjoying this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I really care about like the big picture. So I'd love before we get to Q and A, if, if Tom could sort of just address, a, um, why why he came on to spaces especially if this is his first space like what um you know why why is he here what you know i, I think that's a beautiful question or, or a statement that you give like this is why i'm here um yeah at the very end like what what would he like to see from from humanity at the very end yeah so just save that question and then um yeah so tom has done a lot of um podcasts um, he just doesn't, I think this is his first uh, Twitter space. Um, we could definitely ask him about why that is. I think, um, you know, it's just a different format. It's more of the town square. Um, you get a lot of different personalities um, coming from different directions, which I think is fantastic. I love this format of Twitter spaces. Um, I think as long as we can keep the drama and toxicity down, which we have many of those spaces in UFO Twitter are capable of this. Um, astral being one of them, ours being another, um, where we can just get to the topic and let's have a good discussion and let's hear some questions and let's go back and forth and, and share and exchange ideas with people we would never have had contact with otherwise. So I just love uh, Twitter and UFO Twitter and UFO Twitter spaces in particular. So here we are. Um, Tom, let me know whenever you're back. Um, in the meanwhile, Let's see, Parsi, you're in a different time zone, aren't you? You're way, what, what time is it where you are? I'm going to prove you, Parsi. I might not get to your question yet, but we're going to see where you're at. Yeah, Parsi, what time zone are you in? Or is it super late or super early or where are you at? You're in Australia or something, Parsi? 
All right. Maybe Parsi. Parsi, are you still there? I don't want to hey, hear your friend, question sorry, just I'm here. yet. I'm just, but what time's it? I'm just time? between work. Um, Tom kind of already answered my question. I just wanted to say thanks to him. Um, my question to him was, um, I've been getting that ear ringing nonstop since I've done um, the meditations, and they just keep amping up. Um, they've happened more recently, and even while Tom was speaking, it just went through the roof. So I wanted to ask him, is this something that is like a uh, it's like a sort of a psychic scan or an attack by these um, beings? Yeah, it totally can be. <clears throat> now, it's not always the case 100% of the time that an ear ringing means that you're being psychically surveilled. For example, some people might have an ear ringing if they are sensitive to earthquakes. So prior to earthquakes, there are certain scalar waves uh, that come out of the ground and that can trigger an ear ringing. And one of the researchers, what's his name, uh, Larry Park of Terra Research, he wrote a book um, called something about earthquakes, but he documented about how people can have ear ringings prior to earthquakes and how also at the same time certain magnets would fall off of refrigerators. It's almost like they become temporarily demagnetized by these weird scalar waves that were triggering these ear ringings. And the reason why I bring that up is because scalar waves, those are the things that I mentioned earlier that Maxwell uh, had sort of hit upon and that Oliver Heaviside then wrote out of science and engineering as we know it. So it seems to me that psychic phenomena, it operates partly on that spectrum. It partly operates on the scalar wave spectrum. So if an earthquake can cause it through the scalar waves, then perhaps psychic phenomena also use the scalar waves to some degree to ping a person, to surveil them. Now, in your case, if you're doing a lot of meditations or energy work type exercises, not only are you stimulating yourself to become a little bit more psychic, uh, but also your energy field becomes more sensitive and also pumps more energy out into the environment, which is, starts to attract more entities. So yours could be, if, if that's what it is, most likely it's due to uh, an increased interest by entities, more entities being attracted, and also your entire system becoming more sensitive to their influence. Now, that assumes that it's not just hearing damage or something like that, but... Thank you, Tom. Um, so I did want to kind of get over to um, the bigger picture here. So what do you see as the bigger picture? I was mentioning in the break that it, to me, it seems like a cosmic game of chess. And I feel like I'm, I'm almost a ping pong ball between uh, what I perceive to be negative forces and that what I hope are positive forces. Um, so what do you see as the big picture? You know, what is going on here? We have positive uh, beings doing X and negative beings doing Y. And, you know, what do you see as the big picture? Why is this happening? And what is the end game? So if we, if we look back at a lot of the UFO cases and especially entity contact cases from the 40s and maybe 50s and 60s, a lot of them are quite absurd. You know, there, there are these entities that supposedly were seen, and they've never been heard from again by any other contact case. However, over time, more and more cases started uh, narrowing in on just a set few. And those are the names that we all know by now. We know about the greys, we know about the human-looking human Nordic types, the mantids, and the reptilians. Uh, and of course, there are other ones, but they're not as common, and they don't seem to be the ones calling the shots. So it seems to me that whatever diverging... Uh, various diverse agendas there have been, it started to become increasingly focused on whatever the agenda is of this particular collective that I just mentioned. And if we look at their activities and what they're doing, well, uh, partly they're supposedly engaging in a hybrid breeding program to create human slash gray alien hybrids. They're involved in that. They're involved in grooming different humans to become their mouthpieces to advocate for them, to, you know, put out books and videos and organizations and movements beckoning humanity to call them down, to have them be our saviors. So that's happening too. Interesting. What else is happening? Well, we're also seeing rumors of collusion between factions of our government and these forces going all the way back to the 40s and 50s. We've seen that, and at the same time, what else are we seeing? We're also seeing these exact same government factions building underground cities and underground bases like there's no tomorrow. 
in conjunction, in conjunction with abductees and military my labs, both being conditioned or trained or um, not all of them, but a lot of them being conditioned and trained for end times scenarios. So it's interesting that we have these clues from different directions, different angles, all pointing towards a similar thing, like an overriding agenda, which may be that these negative forces seek to capitalize on a period of cataclysmic chaos in our future coming up. And they probably expect a very large population reduction. Uh, they expect that cataclysms will not leave, um, it won't leave the world as we know it currently intact. I mean, our world as we know it right now is extremely fragile anyway, <laughs> just based on how much we rely on electricity and uh, our supply chains are just in time, meaning there's barely anything saved up anywhere, like in terms of food supplies and so on. Uh, it's almost like it's almost like modern civilization has been rigged to fail, or rigged to implode. Maybe there's a reason to that. But either way, it seems to me that both the government and these negative alien factions are expecting that there's going to be something coming up that is going to fully destabilize the world as we know it. And I do believe that they are preparing to take advantage of that chaos and see it through and establish a new world in their image afterwards. So I think that's what's going on. And that does include also replacing perhaps human leadership with human alien hybrid leadership to act as a liaison class between us and the fully alien uh, NHI collective, whatever they are, you know, maybe they're interdimensional or off world or something like that. But it seems to me that our world is being prepared to be covert or not, not covertly, but overtly fitted into and assimilated into uh, some sort of an, an alien empire of sorts. Uh, Tiff, go ahead. Um, and just food for thought. Um, what I believe is uh, the statement you just made about um, the cataclysm and the reset. Uh, I believe that it's happened before um, and more than once. And it's kind of like the design of things for us. Um, and that information was told to me in a download experience in 2017, um, basically like the Chan Thomas um, a cataclysmic book. Um, yeah, basically that I have in the past. Uh, and so I believe, you know, that these things um, have happened and there's no way in the lifespan of this planet that um, intelligent life hasn't popped up um, where the first time that it has popped up here. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I, too, I do totally believe that too. Because if you do look at historical record, or archaeological record, I should say, there have been cyclical cataclysms going right back in time. And it doesn't have to be pole shift, you know? It can just be major solar flares or, like, suspicious observers talking about the uh, magnetic solar excursion, like the magnetic excursion of the, of the Earth's field, where the Earth's field becomes so diminished that all the solar radiation starts coming in, and that triggers a, a chain reaction of climate and other disasters that, that can be happening. But, yeah, so, so that's another element of the puzzle, which is that this, this cataclysm cycle is a big key component of it. The alien hybridization aspect is a key component. Abductions are, and collusion between our shadow government and these negative alien factions is another big component. And so those, those several components, it's interesting. It's interesting that there are certain people that don't talk about these. They talk about everything else around that, but they don't talk about those things. One example being uh, Jacques Vallée. Okay, I, I like Valet a lot. I like Jacques Vallée. I like his books. I've read them all. I mean, I love his work. However, him being an academic, playing it safe, playing it kind of academically timid, he doesn't really go too much into those more hardcore aspects of it. And sometimes a part of me wonders, like, is that just him being just a, a cautious academic? Or, or is it something to do with the aviary and the, uh, the working group or the Invisible College? Is there something like an agenda going on there to to not talk about the, the most sensitive core of the phenomenon and instead just focus on everything else around it. Like, see, if you've got a big pattern and you've got a core of signal and you've got all this other noise around it, well, if you ignore the signal and focus only on the noise, then it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, the whole UFO thing is just a, a big trickster phenomenon of absurdity. There's no higher, like, evil agenda behind it is just uh, some some sort of nebulous control system trying to control us. Well, yeah, it is a control system, but maybe it's more concrete than he's letting on. Maybe it's more interfaces. Maybe it's more in, um, in harmony with what we know from cataclysm cycles of the past and what that means for our future. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. 
So, Tom, do you see them taking advantage of uh, the cataclysmic cycle? And if so, are, are they going to wait that long? Do you think they'll have control, try to get some control of us before that? And then obviously that means that some of humanity will be saved. We have this whole idea of a harvest. Uh, what do you think? And again, these are just uh, possible you know, futures, probable futures. What do you think uh, this looks like for your average everyday human? Well, I think we're still probably several decades away from anything close to a final world-ending event. And I think the, the, the sequence of world events currently does kind of pan that out. It kind of supports the idea that there is still a process to be had leading up to that. So one of the ways we can tell that there's a process is this whole drive towards, well, towards a, the whole like digital, digital ID system. The whole idea behind the Great Reset idea where we have to cut back on our energy use and get used to eating <laughs> non-regular meat options, right? Well, where, where does that all come from? Is it is it just to <clears throat> is it just to save the planet? Is it just to cut back on carbon emissions, or is that an excuse by these elites to try to get us to be used to a a time period where it's more difficult to you know to source certain resources? Like, are we being prepared for hard times under the guise of merely trying to prevent climate change? Like, what if they already know that change is coming, but they need to get people ready for it without tipping them off that the end is nigh? And so I think they're trying to lock things down. Uh, one of the analogies that I used in my book, uh, Discerning Alien Disinformation, is that it's almost like a storm is coming and a farmer or a rancher is getting is rounding up all the cows and wanting to get them herded into the barn to be locked down so that they don't get damaged or killed or blown away by the storm. So what if society right now is being increasingly pushed towards being locked down through digital surveillance, uh, through controlling where we can go with, uh, you know, electronic vehicles, like self-driving cars, where eventually it can be censored where you can even go. You know, it's just like right now you're being censored from certain accounts on X or certain websites. Well, what if that happens with certain places where you can't go anymore because it's politically unsanctioned, right? Things like that can happen. So eventually, uh, the more locked down society becomes, the easier it is for the power elite to maintain their power when things get tough. Because when you got a society like America, which is relatively unauthoritarian compared to, let's say, Russia or Iran, something like that, um, or China especially. <laughs> if you compare it to places like that, those countries stand a better chance of, of maintaining, of, of keeping afloat than we do because we have so many tensions uh, politically, socially, culturally, right? And, and there's not as much of an iron grip here. However, it seems to be moving in that authoritarian direction. And this has nothing to do with politics. This is just like matter of fact, like what's being done. And I think it's because tough times are coming and they're worried about it and they want to maintain enough control that they can weather the storm and then come out on the other side uh, still on top. And probably, well, on top of the humans, but they're probably going to be under the heel of an alien power structure that, that isn't ultimately good for us or them. And they don't even know it because they're probably kind of short-sighted about saving their own skins for now. And do you see this... Um control before the chaos uh, coming due to this cataclysm? Or do you see something like a, a, either a covert or overt takeover even prior to the cataclysm? I think the takeover, when we're talking about takeover, right, like what do we mean by takeover? Because some will say, well, these alien beings have always been here. They've always been controlling history to some extent. So we've already been invaded. And that may be true. Okay, I don't deny that. But what I'm saying is the level of control can always go deeper than that. It can always go deeper than this this uh, Cold War covert sneaky thing that they've, they've had going on for a long time. And so as they transition between a covert control system, which they seem to have had for thousands of years, towards a more overt system where, once again, like it was back in Sumerian times or even older where these gods were walking amongst men, if they're out in the open again, walking amongst us or, I mean, probably shielded behind embassies and stuff, I don't mean like literally at your grocery store, but when they're out, of the closet, so to speak, to get to that point, there's going to be a transition period. And that transition period can see perhaps more hybrids being stationed covertly throughout uh, positions of power at yeah, deeper and deeper levels of society to manage things as things descend into questionable chaotic territory. But I do want to point out, though, that what I've said about the whole Great Reset and the agenda to lock us down, 
that's not a guaranteed future because that assumes, number one, that the cataclysm will happen soon, like within decades, and it also assumes that these negative alien factions are the only factions that exist amongst the NHI. And it also assumes that the parts of our shadow government or even elected government that's colluding with them, those are the only faction within government. See, what if, what if there are actual benevolent alien forces here? And what if they have proxies or counterparts or uh, agents, you could say, also stationed within government and society to some degree? Then what we're looking at is we're not looking at a certain future where it's going to head in that great reset direction. We're looking at a future of unpredictability, uh, tit for tat, you know, moves and counter moves that lead to an uncertain outcome, which could be positive. It could actually be positive. So I'm not saying that doom is guaranteed. I'm just saying that there are people and there are powers that are heading in that direction that do want to replace our human leadership with hybrids and probably eventually completely genetically reform what it means to be human. But in addition to that, there may be a counter opposition that is active even right now, helping or encouraging, I guess, subtly, maybe even subconsciously nudging the dissemination of information uh, that undermines that particular agenda. So I think if you think about that and you look at what's happening culturally, politically, on the, you know, on the world stage, current, current events, uh, it's not all negative, right? There are signs of hope and there is like a positive trend happening at the same time. And perhaps over time, that's the one that's going to win out. And maybe if we do face some sort of solar cataclysm or something like that, maybe by that point, we will be more aware. Maybe we will have uh, more advanced technologies due to a lot of the suppression on existing free energy and anti-gravity technology being uh, exposed and lifted. You know, Maybe we'll be in a much pos better position to weather it, not as slaves living underground eating bugs, but as free and sovereign citizens on the surface, being empowered by knowledge and being empowered by technology to weather through it and therefore to come out on the other side of chaos to build a new world towards a positive future. Right? So I think we have to keep that in mind, too, that those two things might be going on. The negative future and the positive future are both, um, they're both being seeded and formed and born right now in the present. And as time goes on, I think we'll see a back-and-forth competition between the two that hopefully will lead to the positive outcome. Um, Tom, I, uh, I, I, I like to go deep on the doom, so forgive me um, if I sound fear-mongering. Um, do you feel like it might be existentially imperative to have a fuller and faster, let's just call it exposure of, of, of our broader reality? Um, if there's a conflict, if there are vying or competing interests, one for us to really understand our true nature or master our technology or our psychic abilities, and another one that sort of wants to keep us suppressed and there's a ticking clock, <clears throat> Wouldn't it make sense to assume that there's some either unknowingly or knowingly that there's an aspect of the phenomenon that is against disclosure and in, you know, working through humans and an aspect of the phenomenon that might be more on our side? Doesn't that mean to one degree or another we're at war? Yeah, absolutely. We're definitely in an info war. You can find the info war even within the contactee and abductee field. Now, you know, there's a lot of uh, competing agendas and competing storylines that happen within the contactee and abductee field because, well, partially it's because a lot of the negative alien groups, they seem to be uh, throwing up smokescreen of confusing, diverging storylines in order to hide the real truth that's going on. In other words, if you're not able to fully suppress the truth from coming out, then what you can still do, however, is saturate the field with so much nonsense that people can't even notice that truth when it does come out. That's one of the reasons why there's so many competing viewpoints out there. Um, but related to that, though, is that when, when these abductions, when they, when these people are being manipulated by all of it, they, there's also it seems to be like like a benevolent aspect to the contact phenomenon that counters a lot of the nonsense, that counters a lot of the noise, and. Yeah, I don't want to like fully go down there down there because it would take too long. So. I don't know if you want to ask anything in addition to that that I could zero in on or if you're good. I mean, I mean personally, like I, I don't want to ask you to do anything you're uncomfortable to do, but I, I do feel that this aspect of trust for those who 
go through several abductions or perhaps have several that they can't remember easily without regression, the trust aspect is more difficult when it comes to positive experiences because um, there can be manipulation. I think this is a perfect metric. Like, what is the effect that this experience or the abduction has on you, right? Uh, even for, for DMT, I think that's a great, great metric to sort of start establishing trust. But th it's you can easily see how having something having a positive effect on your life can be absolutely manipulative as well. And um, it, anything that you can sort of give people to, to parse that out would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Well, I think, I guess, returning back to the question of discernment and whether a disclosure is good or bad and what kind of forces are pro and for it, I think the fact that things are shaping up towards disclosure to begin with, which seems to be seems to be driven by the interventionists, okay? the ones who want to make their first move, who want to control the narrative, who want to be in control when it goes down. The fact that they seem to be behind a lot of the disclosure movement uh, indicates to me that they want it to happen for control reasons. Okay? But at the same time, because they are doing it, therefore, if there is an opposition that wants to safeguard us and wants to safeguard our future, they also would have to get in on the disclosure game. Okay, because now then they would have to offer up counter viewpoints or counter information to offset a lot of the deception that's happening. So what's interesting about that is you can view who the figures are. I mean, not, not just figures in politics, but also or in academia, but also in politics, who are for one particular form of disclosure, okay, and compare them to uh, another set of people and what kind of disclosure they are for. And what you will notice is that the first group is for a very limited disclosure that that primarily points, well, it's kind of like the Greer viewpoint, the idea that human governments are highly fallible and that aliens are either benign or neutral or relatively positive for us. And so the disclosure of that would necessarily have to be partial because it would have to deny all the data out there that points towards a negative, a negative uh, agenda, right? Whereas... Yeah, whereas a lot of the positive things that are happening, I don't know. I think I think I think the positive forces would want to counter some of that propaganda, and therefore they're out there trying to encourage more discussion of it and have a more fuller form of disclosure, even at the risk of destabilizing society. So, me personally, I thought a lot about what the effects of disclosure would be, and I do think it will be catastrophic, not just politically or legally, to the you know Department of Justice and or Department of Defense. I mean but also to society at large. However, if, if we are going to go through some sort of alien disclosure event by them, then it would do us well to be prepared ahead of time because if that happens and if we make the wrong decision collectively to go along with them and fully integrate ourselves into their system, I think it would be close to impossible for a very, very long time to get back out of it. So it's better to prevent that from happening before that trap gets sprung uh, and so I think even at the risk of a societal upheaval of, of cataclysmic proportions, I think in the end, perhaps it's better that the 10% live in a free future than for the 90 or 100% to live in a enslaved future. So that's my cynical kind of nihilistic take on it. You know, just the idea that perhaps it would be better to go through societal chaos of disclosure, to have full disclosure. But um, yeah, so that's just my take on it. But I, But I do know the cost of it. And I guess it's just a question of whether we're willing to accept that cost or not. Tom, I don't find it cynical at all. I find 10% honestly quite optimistic. Um, just my personal belief. Um, the, the, um, you've mentioned the Sumerian tablets uh, or the Anunnaki tablets and whether or not they represent a, a true historicity of, of our origins or extraterrestrial beings. There is a story that is told that from my perspective sounds undeniably narcissistic, at least from one perspective, how these beings or these lowercase g gods view us. They like to constantly claim ownership of having created us and then have a um, sort of ambivalent uh, soliloquy on how perfect we are after a couple pancakes of, of failed engineering and then of how dangerous we are. A lot of the dialogue in these in these tablets 
when they talk about humans is almost indistinguishable from how we talk about AI these days. And I want to know whether you think they're that that might be still carrying on in these Sumerian tablets. There's an attempt from Enlil to wipe us out, even through artificial means with several different weapons causing starvation. And he's upset that two out of 600 families survived implications of genetic manipulation to reduce our longevity and even our intellectual or psychic abilities. There, there seems to be an ambivalence of, of cosmic proportions where some want to endow us with more knowledge and even technology um, and, and, and self-sufficiency and not. And I wanted to know, wouldn't that indicate, especially since one of the, the major oaths that is taken by all of the gods in these Sumerian tablets is to not tell the humans about the impending cataclysm, is, is that oath analogous to the part of NHI that is against disclosure? Is this all about wiping out as many as possible, except for those who've been marked for a, a, a post-Diluvian world? Yeah, well, one thing we kind of pick up on from, well, from a lot of abduction and contactee data is that they don't, they don't really value general humanity highly, right? They don't really value us highly. They say that we're, well, I mean, and who can blame them? But they say that we're quite primitive and, and warlike and not that advanced. So what loss would it be for them if so many of us did perish in, in cataclysm cycles? Uh, now, the fact that they do seem to value their own abductees, you know, perhaps the same way that a farmer would value a cow during storm, like that analogy I painted earlier, uh, a lot of times they, they, they do tell people, we're going to come for you, we're going to pick you up, we're going to evacuate you from these disasters, and perhaps you're going to be brought back one day to seed the new humanity. You know, that's one of the storylines that people are told. And, uh, and that's, that reeks of a, of a kind of almost like a cattle breeding type program in a way, where you only take your, your best seed and after the cataclysm you come back and you kind of repopulate with that to create a, a, new, a new stock that's more in line with what you want. Uh, and of course, and that would then would tie into the alien hybrid breeding agenda as well, where they want a new stock of humanity that is more uh, pers- more controllable, uh, perhaps less independent, less rowdy, right? <clears throat> so they're going for they're going for preserving only the part of humanity that is in line with their agenda. Now, the question is: If there are benevolent forces, do they think similarly? Do they look upon the general body of humanity as perhaps primitive? warlike, bestial in a way? And would they too only try to guide and preserve those that are in line with their benevolent agenda? I don't know. That's an ethical question to to really ponder. Because if they are aliens, right, and if they're not just omnipotent forces, then they are going to be limited in their time, in their logistics, in their personnel. So perhaps it is the fact that even the benevolence wouldn't be able to save everyone. So I guess they would have to make a judgment call on who, who they would save. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of, that's, that starts getting to, to weird uh, messianic 144,000 territory. It's kind of, it's, it's a sensitive direction to go into. But I don't know, we just, we just need to think about like what, what is the fate of general humanity versus what is the fate of the smaller portion of it that is valuable to whatever agendas survive, whatever this uh, nexus point or schism is that we're going through. Am I reading too much into into saying that perhaps there's a catastrophic non-disclosure if if we don't if we don't start to understand what these beings are and map out the whole territory that we may lose far more of humanity than enduring the somewhat unavoidable catastrophic disclosure uh, if it's if it's coming from us. Yeah, well, it's a question of quantity versus quality. Maybe, well, hopefully it wouldn't be that choice. But what if it is that choice? What if, it's a, what if it is a choice between do we save billions and billions and billions of people, but they will be under the control of negative NHIs? Or do we try to rebel against these gods and risk utter destruction so that a few of us can live in a freer future? Maybe that is a choice, or maybe that's not even a choice, right? So what if, what if we... What if it gets to the point of resisting, rebelling, or whatever against these negative forces, um, but the consequences are so severe that if humanity regresses back to the Stone Age, 
then there is no positive future because these negative forces can just come back a thousand years later, pretend to be gods again, create new civilizations, and start the entire cycle over again. So in order for us to truly win, it's not just to buck against these negative powers, but it's to preserve and hold on to and you know, rebuild from a positive base that uh, can... That can kindle, I don't know, uh, kindle a new civilization that is immune to the effects of these negative forces because it has higher knowledge, higher maybe psychic abilities, maybe higher technologies as well. Uh, and I think that's really the only way to safeguard the future. And so that's why I am so much an advocate of disruptive technology and disruptive knowledge that can give us the upper hand over the forces that prey on our ignorance and our weakness. See? Because it's with these tools, it's, it's, yeah, it's with these tools that we are able to buck the control system and also to maintain some semblance of civilization through whatever may come. Tom, I could not agree with you more. Um, there is a, a strong view that it is this very taking charge of our own, let's just say, technological prowess that many are arguing that this is how we self-enslave. It's sort of like a psyop and a psyop that's hard to, to overcome. Um, what, I guess my question is, it's in order to figure out what, you know, there's many com competing forces likely, in order to understand what is likely being, being um, tr what, what their goals might be, we kind of need to understand what our utility or what our value is. It seems like we we're unlikely there for a physical biological resource in that case it wouldn't make sense for us to be all wiped out what do you what is your understanding maybe it's different for different uh competing forces but like what is our major utility what is our value are we a threat are we an experiment is this really just about soul harvesting am i making sense mm -hmm. yeah it kind of depends on what angle you come at it from for example if you come at it from the angle of let's say the louche farm theory you know, the idea that Earth is an energy farm for interdimensionals that feed off our energy, and so that's why there's so many wars and suffering and uh, early death, shortened lifespans, people getting sick, and so on. If you believe in that theory, then then in, in a way we're, we're kind of like fattened cattle in the sense that it's, it's pointless to kill us all because they still need some for breeding new cattle. But at the same time, there can also be a slaughter, a harvest, a harvest of energy, right? So that's sort of the ultra-cynical uh, I guess, Gnostic doomsday point of view. <laughs> the idea that humanity's utility is in what life force energy we can, uh, we can supply to these interdimensional beings. But I think that that viewpoint is somewhat simplistic and doesn't really account for everything that's going on. It doesn't account, for example, for the hybrid alien breeding program, which is more than just about energy feeding. It's about uh, control. It's about control of the hardware that our soul runs on. So if they can genetically alter us, uh, in a way that still allows our soul to incarnate into these bodies, then if you go further down the line, what you end up with is you end up with a, what do you call it? You end up with a, with a, a non-physical authority or power or energy source or um, uh, like, like, a, like a sovereign conscious energy, I guess, that you've imprisoned in physical bodies that are more amenable to your control. So maybe our utility then it's not so much in what biological resources we can provide as human beings, but in what spiritual power, uh, what actions we are permitted to do, things that are under our, our control <clears throat> as divine beings, things that we can do that they can hijack or harness by us being complicit with their agenda, by, by being incarnated into bodies that they have engineered. And I think that that has probably happened once before, or at least if not multiple times through perhaps like genetic tweaks of the human genome. And maybe that is why we as humans right now, if you think about it, we're not all that psychic, okay? But we are smart enough to build technology and uh, farm and, uh, you know, put satellites in space and so on and basically surveil ourselves, imprison ourselves, control ourselves. So imagine if the world did turn into a totalitarian global system run by digital IDs and, you know, permanent surveillance and drones everywhere. Well, if you want the cows to manage themselves, if you want to automate the farm, you got to make them smart enough to build that, te that technology to do it. So I do think that aliens have perhaps tweaked us to be dumb enough to fall for their control system, but be smart enough to build the system that we have right now in this world. And if they can modify us further, 
then that would lead to us being capable of more than just, oh, cows enslaving themselves. Maybe now the cows become smart enough to become farmers of other cows in other worlds or dimensions or whatever, if you believe in that extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh, I do think that ultimately humanity is intended by these negative forces to become um, absorbed into their empire and to go and enslave other worlds if they exist. Uh, and that's from an extraterrestrial point of view. If you want to talk about it from a spiritual point of view, then now you start have to start getting into spiritual warfare and the idea that we are divine sparks. Okay, we've got our consciousness is not from here. It's not from this world. It's from a higher divine plane. But we have fallen here, and now these forces, which represent the serpent trying to finish its task, is trying to get us to fall even further down into the darkness, so that light becomes permanently imprisoned. Uh, by the darkness to be fed upon, to be tortured, or perhaps to even be fully absorbed and assimilated uh, into the demonic hierarchy, right? So we've got the Lush angle, we've got the extraterrestrial, strategic, genetic, biological angle, and then we have this angle here of the spiritual warfare angle. angle. And uh, it's just a matter of which one do you believe in, or if you want to combine them in some way. But yeah, these are different theories to think about. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, I kind of look at this uh, hybrid breeding program as the ultimate soul trap. So they're going to genetically modify us to the point that a human soul can be seated inside that hybrid body, but the hybrid, the genetics of the hybrid are going to control the soul and, and make it so that we can't actually, that we, we actually don't even have any desire to choose uh, freedom and independence and love and empathy and all the amazing, wonderful things that make us human. Um, just for a little housekeeping, we do have a list of speakers waiting to come up. Um, we have uh, Science Bob here. I welcome Science Bob. He did have a couple of questions that I wanted to get to. Um, Bob, do you want me to read your questions? Do you want to ask them yourself? And then we no, will go read to them. Tom Tom after that. Okay, please, so I'm going to read, read them. Awesome, uh, Bob. So I'm going to read. Uh, he has two questions. I'll just read the first one. Um, so we don't get confused. Uh, we have Tom Thompson in the room as well. Let's just call him Cortex Zero. And then we'll keep Tom, uh, the guest, as Tom. <laughs> so we don't get confused. All right, Tom, the guest. Um, Science Bob is asking, please give your views and observations about deep underground military bases in the United States being used by the NHI with or without human cooperation. What do you think about that? Yeah. All right. So I have only a few flashes of abductions that possibly take place in human military underground bases. Uh, one of them took place in what seems to be an abandoned subway. Actually, not, no, it's not, not, a, not a public subway, but more like a staging area for an underground base where they would have shuttles that go down into the underground base area, but it was decommissioned, so they weren't using it for shuttles. It was just used as a, um, a place to do certain exercises or teachings or trainings or whatever. And one of them, one of them involved testing out, uh, what was it like? Some sort of highly advanced armor system. And I remember being part of a group of guys, uh, I would say maybe 10 or 12 others, being led around in a trance state by a guy with a battery pack on his hip with a, going to a curly cord, going to uh, a lamp that he was holding in his hand, which where if you pull the trigger on it, it makes two very rapid flashes of light. It's like a stroboscope. Funny enough, I think a year or two later, I was browsing the internet and I came across that exact device. It was a battery pack you put on the hip with a curly cord and this uh, lamp-looking thing with a trigger, which is a, a stroboscope, okay? So... Maybe that was a real memory after all, for all I know. But the point is, yeah, in this underground base, I've only had uh, a few memories of that. And so therefore, most of my information on it comes from other my labs and other people that have experiences with that. For example, uh, my Twitter timeline, I posted an interview recently by William Pollock. He was a contractor for the government. He worked for eg and and some others building security systems for underground facilities. And I knew him personally back in the early 2000s. So he told me a bit about these underground bases as well and, and how they work and that whole entire system. Um, what can I say about it? Well, um, from some of the lore, you find that these, these underground bases often have both military and NHI personnel working in there, often working together, but a lot of times they occupy different levels. So usually the deeper levels are occupied by these non-human beings and then the upper ones by the human military personnel. And depending on your permissions access, you, know, you can go down magnetic elevators to these lower levels to, to interact or work with these uh, NHI beings. Well, one thing I wanted to say about that, 
which most people don't know, is that even just based on physics and mathematics, you can figure out generally where these underground bases are and how deep they are. And that's based on the fact that the deeper you go, the higher the temperature becomes because there's a geothermal gradient that rises with, with uh, depth due to heat coming up from the mantle of the Earth. And the typical figures in that are usually right around 1.3 to 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit per 100 feet. So if you dig down just 10 feet into the ground, that's where you hit that layer that's the same temperature all year round is usually right around 55 degrees. And so if you build a base just, you know, a couple stories below ground, it's going to be pretty cold. You know, you're going to have to have heating to keep it warm. But if you start going down, let's say, to a quarter mile, you're already around 70 to 85 degrees. If you go down to half a mile to a mile down, okay, now you're potentially at 90 degrees, maybe even 100 degrees. So there's a limit to how deep you can go before it gets too hot in an underground base for, well, for efficient cooling or, or whatever. Uh, and so you can, you can imagine that certain alien beings that prefer it warmer, they would therefore choose the deeper levels. Or what they would do is they would choose parts of the planet or parts of America where the geothermal gradient is sufficient that whatever depth they want to be at, that's where they build their base because that's where it's nice and warm. They don't have to have any energy issues or whatever. And, uh, and so therefore, if you look at a map of the United States of the geothermal gradient or how much uh, heat energy is coming up from the ground, you can tell that some places where there are a lot of human military bases, like Nevada, for example, uh, the geothermal energy is very, very good, meaning that you don't have to go down too far in order to maintain it at a comfortable level. Whereas, if let's say you're an alien and you want something very deep so that you don't get discovered, and so it's harder to scan your activities, then you're going to want parts of the country where there's a very low geothermal gradient so that you can go down a mile or two miles or whatever and not be you know, totally roasting your butt off down there. Uh, and, and so, yeah, when you look at the, this map, some of the areas of the country that seem to correlate to rumored alien bases do match up to areas of lower geothermal gradient. And then other ones that are higher match up to American military bases. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting little side project I did once calculating it all and looking up the maps and trying to figure out like how much it correlates with the different underground bases. Uh, one more thing on that. The deeper you go, the higher the air pressure is because there's more air above you from the uh, elevator shafts and so on pushing down on you. Uh, and if you go down, let's say, a quarter mile to a half mile, you're looking at maybe 1.2, 1.3 atmospheres, which just means 1.3 times what the atmosphere is at sea level. And interestingly, that's when you start getting into hyperbaric um, therapy. Hyperbaric therapy, where you live in higher air pressure, and that's been associated with longer telomere lengths, meaning reduced aging. What if there are underground civilizations or bases that are, you know, two miles down in areas with a very low geothermal gradient, and their air pressure is two times what it is on the surface, what if that leads to increased um, oxygen capacity to the brain? What if it leads to increased longevity? And what if they prefer staying down there? Because if they don't, then you know, up here in this worse air pressure, this is lighter air pressure, well, maybe they can't breathe as well. Um, actually, yes, there are some cases. I remember reading in More Encounters with Star People by Artie Clark, Artie Six Killer Clark. She's a Native American professor who interviewed a lot of Native Americans, both on the reservation and off the reservation, who claim that they have had contacts with non-human beings. Okay, It's an awesome book. You guys should check it out. There's like, I think, 24, maybe 30 cases in that book. And you can learn a lot from them. I mean, there's stuff in there about greys, about mantids, reptilians, humanoid beings, government stuff. It's all in there. And these are just you know Native Americans, both on and off the reservation. Well, some of the cases do involve aliens... Um, appearing to have trouble breathing our air, uh, especially the Nordic types. They, they were seen with certain masks on or maybe huffing and puffing when they're out on the surface doing whatever weird, I don't know, like exploring the soil for minerals. or I don't know what they're doing, but they're outside the crafts digging in the soil, and they have trouble breathing. And then, of course, they disappear, probably go into some underwater base, into some, uh, some underground thing somewhere. But that could account for it, maybe. So Anyway, that's what I know about underground bases, the fact that you got the temperature gradient, you got air pressure differences. Um, they can be underground, they can be inside mountains, underwater. Uh, they can be even on the moon, for example, like, what's her name? Niara uh, Isley. She's an Air Force veteran, my lab. I posted her interview, I think, on my timeline at one point, where she talked about different my lab experiences where 
she was it claims that she claims that she was taken to a human base on the moon to be used for for sexual reasons and for mind control reasons and maybe that's true maybe that's not true but it's actually in keeping with a lot of other my lab contacts that i've come across and it points to the fact that these bases are not only underground or underwater but they can also be potentially on the moon or or even elsewhere i mean the moon i think is more plausible than let's say mars or titan or something like that um, or even another solar system like the whole serpo stuff but um yeah, so I think these, these bases are everywhere, and they would have to be in order to shield themselves from other enemy factions and also from us, the public, finding out. So that's the answer to that. And then, Tom, just real quick, hopefully that answered your question, Science Bob, and I'll get to your second question. Um, do you see this as, at times, a cooperation? Um, has your research shown that this is mostly just NHI on their own. I think you already touched on this as likely a cooperation between um, NHI and humans. Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, yeah. I think it's like a Venn diagram where you've got the NHI's on one side, you've got the humans on the other, but the human black ops military, and then in the middle, yeah, you do have overlap. You have overlap not only in the sense of uh, the black ops military having alien-like technologies, like portal technology or anti gravity. Uh, even some psychic psychic powers to some extent, whether it's genetically or chemically induced. Um, but you also have cooperation between the two, according to, to certain accounts. You know, certain accounts where military abductees or even alien abductees report seeing what look like human military in the presence of aliens. Okay. Now, some people could say, well, what if they are just hybrids and uniforms? Uh, what if it's like a psychological, uh, like a psyop? And that very well could be the case. But at the same time, if we look at what technologies the Black Ops military does have, it does seem very alien-like. And is it all just from crash retrievals and reverse engineering? Or is some of it due to shared technology, right? Um, yeah, yeah. so I do think there's an overlap there and collusion to some extent. But of course, it's not universal collusion where every single alien abduction has military there and vice versa. I think they both have their own thing going on. And then they also have shared interests or possible infiltration by the alien element into the human element where, and that's easy to do because if, if that entire black ops field is so compartmentalized, who knows how deep it goes and what base in some remote region has full alien control over it versus another part. I think these things are all possible and I don't think that they are mutually, mutually exclusive, but at the same time, we shouldn't lump all uh, secret military thing into the same category as all being colluding with the, uh, with the uh, NHIs because we, we know that that's definitely not the case either. Thank you very much, Tom. Sure. And then, uh, Bob, did you want to ask your second question? Actually, I might need help with your second question. It was, please give us your views and observations of purported communications between NHI and us. I don't know if you want to maybe clarify that one, Bob, or Tom, maybe you under, already understand it. Yeah, I get it. I, I, do, I do understand it. Um, well, the only ambiguity there is whether you're talking about communications between just humans in general and aliens, which if you're talking about that, then if you count abductees and contactees, that's happening every minute of every day, supposedly. But if you're talking about in an official capacity, like shadow military projects, well, I mean, all of that's classified. So we only get really insider testimony without any proof. Because if you do give proof, well, that breaches, that breaches the NDAs and you go to jail or you get shot or whatever. So we only get insider testimonies and therefore we have to look at some of the witnesses that Stephen Greer brought on during the Disclosure Project. I mean, Greer, for all of his points that we can disagree with, he did do a great job bringing those witnesses on, and we have all the video footage of that. So I appreciate him for doing that. Um, but another example, I guess, would be Dan Sherman. You know, Dan Sherman, he, I can't remember, was he Air Force? I forget. But Dan Sherman, he, he was in the military, and he claims, he claims that he was, um, he was taken aside in the military and indoctrinated into a black ops part of it where he was trained as a psychic to communicate with what he eventually figured out or what he thought was a non-human entity. Okay. And part of the project purpose was not only to transcribe messages from this entity, but to train other psychics to one day form a psychic communication network to allow uh, different underground bases and, and governments to communicate with each other when no other means of communication is possible, not even electromagnetic. And I'm guessing that can only be due perhaps due to a solar cataclysm of some type, which I guess ties back into what we were talking earlier about uh, cataclysms, where there's just too much electromagnetic radiation coming in due to the collapse of the Earth's magnetic field. That kind of supports that idea. So we've got Dan Sherman. Uh, there's some others, you know, and like I said earlier, there's also some hokey ones, I think, like the more the more crazier 
forms of the the you know super soldier type experiences that are, that are claimed. Some of those I do discount, but then there's others like Dan Sherman who I think are more credible, like in the body language and how they frame things, what they remember, what they don't remember, the lack of elaboration on certain parts where their memory just fails. See, the thing about hoaxers is there's no limit to what they can recount because they're making it up, right? So it becomes increasingly fanciful the more it goes on over the years. Like, well, yeah, Corey Good, for example. Um, you know, these these people, it becomes so entertaining that you can get sucked into it, but then you realize, well, if it's that entertaining and so clearly remembered, maybe maybe it's not the truth. Maybe they're making it up. And, of course, as he's admitted, in, in court videos, yeah, a lot of it was made up. So I think that's a, I think that's a big sign of that. I want to make one comment, if I may. Um, uh, I personally witnessed at a fairly large group of people a person completely change their personality and be called out by a well-known experiencer as having transformed right in front of us into a super soldier mentality. And everybody in here will know the name of the person, so I won't say who it was, but it was astounding. Wow. Yeah, it's good to be able to see that for real. See, I don't deny the existence of the whole super soldier phenomenon, but I just, I just do think that um, if you're part of a program like that, their, their security protocols are pretty tight and they use mind control and compartmentalization, and, you know, just like a lot of the alien, and alien stuff does. It uses screen memories and compartmentalization to where when you're out of the program and you're just in your everyday life, it's very difficult to remember everything that happened. So you only get you know flashes here, flashes there. And if you talk about it, there's only so much to talk about because you only have so many puzzle pieces, right? So when we, and there are examples of people with supposed super soldier training who fit that profile. It it seems real, okay? But then there's others who talk about it so casually and so cavalierly, and their attitude doesn't speak of, it doesn't match someone who would be part of that. And so those ones I kind of question more, but the fact that those exist doesn't deny the possibility that real ones exist. And I do think there are cases where, they are genuine. So yeah, the whole super soldier stuff. Yeah, totally. I do think it's happening, but, but be careful about, uh, some of the, the, the question, the more questionable cases. Tom, do you mind? Oh, briefly... oh okay, friends. Thank you for this. Sure. Do, do you mind briefly explaining the super soldier phenomenon just a TLDR? Yeah, the super soldier phenomenon, that's where someone, you know, they, they get vetted probably, you know, in school, like in America, they have that talented and gifted program or, or yeah, gifted and talented program like GATE. Uh, that, standardized tests, and maybe having parents that are in the military. See, these kids, they're already being profiled for certain desirable traits, whether it's physical strength or intelligence or um, social isolation, I guess. If someone is, a, is easily, is not part of a big social circle, then they're easier to isolate and mind control and to, to use for various purposes, like even like mass shootings and so on. Well, these kids... When they're indoctrinated into these programs, they can be given certain training and certain enhancements. They become integrated into it. And it sounds kind of sci-fi, and there are movies that kind of depict this whole super soldier thing. I don't think that's too far from the truth. But just the idea that there are assets that are in our population that act almost like, um, like, like sleepers, like super cells, that can be trained during military abductions for later use. Um, if you use at a later time, whether it's for doing sabotage at a future time when they want to collapse society or after collapse when these people might be, become leaders or some sort of a, an influence upon the survivors that remain in order to be almost like surface level proxies for these forces, these elites that live still underground so they can manage things on the surface while they hide out. Something like that, you know, that's sort of the pattern that emerges when you look at some of these MyLab and Super Soldier cases. You know, just the idea that there are enhanced humans working on behalf of uh, Black Ops shadow government purposes. Thanks, Tom. Um, Direct does not have a hand, so Direct, go ahead. Uh, Tom, I wanted to ask you a question. So this is a sense that I've had in watching this, what I would call fairly exponential proliferation of the um, contact movement thinking in terms of, uh, are you familiar with the the story about the hundredth monkey? Okay. Yes. So whether that story is true or myth or a little of both, whatever, the concept that I'm wondering is in this um, psychic battle, it appears that there is by agreement 
and momentum and uh, kind of a uh, where two or more are gathered, anything can happen. Would you consider the possibility that some of what appears to be recruiting or evangelization of people into these contact groups is to create a broader, more, um, you know, psychic cloud, if you will? Yeah, well, it's known that if you have multiple people that are believers who come together to try to do a CE5 event, you know, try to call down aliens using their conscious powers, it's more, it's more successful if they are doing it as a group than as just an individual. I mean, assuming that they're all believers, because when you've got multiple skeptics in there, then that creates like an anti anti right. field, right? So, so skeptics can, can also can okay. also screw it up, but uh, right, right. But, but the more people you have, the more weird things happen, and, and we see that in other fields too. Like for example, with spoon bending parties, you try to spend bend a spoon on your own, you can't do it. But you go to one of these parties, and all of a sudden, everyone's believing in it, and they're all like hopped up on on, on good energies, and all of a sudden, boons, spoons just start bending <laughs> magically on their own in their hands because there's this. Uh, it's this uh, newly created local consensus reality that all the people's combined consciousnesses are coming together with in order to just set up. So what if that can also happen on a more collective scale with alien disinformation and people believing a certain particular alien storyline? What if that creates, like you said, a hundredth monkey effect that allows these beings, which seem to be on the periphery of consensus reality, what if it what if it alters consensus reality so that these beings then become part of it, so then therefore they can manifest here more easily? What if they can get around certain quantum laws or spiritual laws that otherwise would bar them from manifesting here fully, hundred uh, percent like proof? You know, maybe maybe that's the reason why they haven't done it so far is because there hasn't been enough participation of consensus reality in their reality. Right. Right. So, yeah. It's totally yeah. Well, and my yeah. question referred back to when you were speaking about this convergence, w- will it be this type of being and then the rest will kind of be left aside or, you know, so if I were looking at this myself and there were a possibility of getting momentum by getting believers, their life force, their energy, their excitement, um, c- could they be trying to amass a collective that will tip the the these future events uh, in their favor versus say those of us who who are inclined to you know kind of stand up against it or expose it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. You're talking about when you say events, you're talking about cataclysmic. Events, yeah, or who like, like basically who you know who wins out uh, with the strongest presence on Earth? Could, could that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so regarding that point, there's a there's a, there's an important distinction to make. Okay, the distinction to make is between events that are that are still in limbo, like they're they're probable futures, they're kind of fluid, they're amenable to mass consciousness. Okay, mm-hmm. that that whole thing, that the almost like a, like a Taoist kind of um, fluid reality thing, versus deterministic physical causal processes of events that are they're already guaranteed or yeah. they're already happening and now it's more and now it's more a matter of uh, strategy combat you know uh, influencing decisions through verbal action political action uh, you know things like that so there, there are these two spheres of action there's a synchronistic fluid limbo action and then there's a more like concrete um, deterministic field of it and the reason why I bring up this distinction is that Mass consciousness doesn't. I don't. I don't believe that human mass consciousness has full hundred percent control over reality or over probable futures. I think it has an influence over it. You know, maybe it's twenty percent, maybe it's thirty percent, but a big part of it, big part of what's going to happen, I think, is the result of physical causes that are already underway, like physical trends that are already underway. Underway, and so to answer your question, I think uh, human consciousness might have an influence over it, but it's not. It won't determine it 100, percent you know. So there's there certain things that will happen despite the wishes of the many. Is what I'm trying to say. There's certain things that are already in motion that will have to be confronted, and um, our beliefs about it, you know, our, our hundredth monkey effect, the the morphogenetic field that we create, uh, it might influence probability, but it won't undo certainties. Yeah, no, that and that's very much like uh, remote viewing the future. Um, you'll see certain things that just appear there and and some form of that is going to happen. And then, you know, you've got the variable events. I guess what kind of the root of my question is, what is the purpose of recruiting all these people 
into a collective mindset uh, and then basically in a certain way kind of taking a stance against those of us who you know are willing to see it as maybe you know a mixture of positive and negative so do you like why would they be so interested in getting so many people moved into this this realm of we're having contact oh, okay i see what you mean and i think that partly that comes down to gaining planetary consent for their for okay their intervention which is something that they, yeah, which is something that the allies of humanity talk about the, those yeah. books and many other sources. They they talk about it too. Just the idea that whether you look at it from a, a cosmic, let's say, legal angle, or like um like like a spiritual, metaphysical angle, or even the quantum physics angle. Like, what if the consciousness of humanity does have uh, a say over the way things go due to quantum reasons? You know, some sort of weird quantum resonance effect. And then if we're all focusing on it, and and they can gain our consent that way then it's, it allows them to shuttle us into a probable future that yeah. they have set okay. up, you know, that benefits, that benefits them. Which then, you know, ultimately, it kind of ties into the time travel idea. Because if time travel is real, and these forces are time travelers, or some of them are, then, then because the future is partly open, we're dealing with forces from different probable futures, right? If the future is not set in stone, there's more than one future. And so if they're time traveling, we're getting time travelers from different probable futures. And therefore, their job would be to manipulate us into manipulate us like like a train to go on to their track that leads to their future, which then substantiates their reality or whatever they're trying to create, right? So if you go into the time travel theory, it ties into that, and that's how you would explain that. Whereas if you go along with, let's say, the Allies of Humanity thesis, then it's merely a matter, matter of uh, cosmic legalese, you know, just the idea that we're a developing world and uh, they cannot be interfered with to a certain extent unless they give permission, so, right? so if we give planetary com- permission through some planetary act of democracy, then then that would give them the right, the legal right, to come here and do what they do without these positive forces being able to to intervene. So those two points of view, I think, are maybe they're both true. Maybe uh, maybe it's more complicated than we think, but it's, it's a lot to take in. And a lot so to the consider. multiple futures then would be like the carnival barker trying to get you to come over and play their game. Yeah, exactly. Carnival Barker or uh, even even if like some new business or restaurant opens in town, right? The only way they can survive is to get people to come to that restaurant right. to, to give money and to build it up. So the so these these interdimensional NHIs or time travelers, if they're creating a future that doesn't fully exist yet, that they want us to go into where they benefit and you know they benefit off of us, if they want to shuttle us into that, then yeah, they have to sell us literally yeah. on their business. They have to sell us on their business in order to to uh, make it concrete. That's, to make that's it real. incredible. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time this evening. And then Fringe, I'm going to drop down now so there's a room for others. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for joining us tonight, Direct. Uh, all right, Tom, Mr. Tom Cortex Zero. Uh, just a little Hi, housekeeping. Fringe. I know we do have uh, people waiting very patiently to ask questions. But I also have an entire list of questions of my own and questions gathered from people uh, prior to the space. So we're going we're gonna to be on uh, Tom's timeline and however long he wants to stay. But I will be getting to uh, my list of questions prior to opening it up to other speakers. So if you would like to be patient, that's awesome. If you can't be, I totally understand. Uh, go ahead, Cortex Zero. Hey, 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 friends. Yeah, I was actually supposed to be here earlier, but I seem to be experiencing some kind of like stomach bug or something. So I like fell asleep for a bit, but now I'm up and I saw the space was running. and was like, ah, I got to get to the space. But hi, Tom. Um, I know you and I actually interacted uh, briefly at, like at some point last week because I purchased your book, started reading it. It's really interesting information. And it, it's funny how a lot of what you guys are talking about tonight uh, correlates with... Uh, the YouTube video that I'm working on because I'm in contact with a, with uh, a couple people privately that have told me some things that I'm putting out through videos, and there's certain pieces of information that that have been hit that correlate with what they're telling me too, which is really startling because some of it's bizarre, right? Like there's uh, I have a lot of I have some points that these come directly from the video. It's not out yet, but you know, I guess sneak peek, right? Um, there's these groups. We, you guys are very familiar, I'm sure, with the Collins Elite. And what what I'm being told by, by some of these individuals that I've been in contact with is that over time, uh, the Collins Elite has, like, fragmented into several different factions. 
they share similar beliefs, but they pursue different objectives. Um, and a handful of them have developed in a way that would closely resemble uh, religious groups or even cults in some form and function. Uh, one of the, there's a couple points here that that you guys were talking about that again uh, was was relayed to me by a couple of these people that uh, there's a network of underground tunnels that links uh, these sites where there's hazardous and bizarre experiments going on, uh, not only to establish communication with non-human and non-physical entities by utilizing a combination, get ready for this one, of ancient esoteric practices and modern technology, but that research is for personal gain. Uh, they're seeking methods to either weaponize or exert control over these forces. Uh, these, these, there's a network of underground tunnels that link some of these sites, and these tunnels have been constructed either directly by NHI or with their help. Uh, and remember, of course, David Grush has mentioned potential agreements between certain groups of humans and NHI. Uh, now, that being said, the idea that the human soul plays a role in some of the activities of these NHI, I've been running into that a lot. Uh, especially between when I did my video on the grays and then now, like that in-between point. Uh, when Digby and I did the podcast on Sunday, we had a really cool exchange about that type of idea. And I'll tell you guys what direction that I lean towards. And then, Tom, um, I guess I'll get your thoughts on this because, again, it's 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 very similar to what is being spoken about but it's it's just kind of a, a different a different flavor uh of of the same dessert so to speak it's that let's take the grays we'll specifically focus on the grays the grays this is what i'm leaning towards at least the grays are artificial in nature i don't know if they were ever truly biological Maybe they were, and maybe they don't have that special connection to the source that we do at this point in time. But let's go with they never did. They come here, and for whatever reason, they know that human beings have souls, right? We have a, a connection to something that is very special that goes beyond the atom. It goes beyond our current ability to measure uh, scientifically, there's this aspect of human beings that we know we have, but it's intangible. You can't put it under a microscope, but we all kind of feel it deep down in ourselves. They wish that they had that. They don't, they exist. They're sentient. They're possible. They're far more intelligent than we are, but they don't get to quote unquote die like we do. They don't get to transcend their physical form. They don't get to leave their vehicle. And so because they're fascinated by that, or perhaps on some level jealous of our connection to the Godhead, as Nigel Kerner uh, phrased it in his book, they have decided to figure out a way to connect themselves to that. So it's like you could even look at it if if you've any of you have ever read Lynn McTaggart's uh, book, The Field, if consciousness is a field, right? It it really seems like you could take God and consciousness field, and and they may really just be one and the same thing. Okay, it, it really I lean in that direction that or it's at least a part of that whole. And they don't have the ability to interact with that like we do. So they're tinkering with us, they're prodding and poking and abducting and doing what they're doing. Because they, for for probably uh, you know a handful of reasons, wish that they had that connection. They exist in oh like in a, maybe you know in a mortal form so to speak, but maybe they're at the mercy of entropy. And we're not at the mercy of entropy because when our physical bodies die, technically uh, the consciousness transcends. And you you continue on because energy doesn't get uh, created or destroyed; it's changed. And they essentially are, they're doomed, right? Like if you really think about it, they're doomed because once entropy runs its course, uh, 
God knows what that would look like for them. But for us, it's not the same. So they've decided that they want to try to uh, establish this this connection with uh, you could almost call it like uh, an in, like this this conscious internet, so to speak. Uh, and now we're down here, right? There's we seem to be very much on the verge of actual disclosure. We're right there. And I find it utterly fascinating that while that's going on, we're in the midst of this artificial intelligence uh, revolution, right? So I feel like there's a connection between all of these things. I feel like there's a connection between the uptick in in sightings and interactions with NHI, uh, the advent, the very early phases of uh, what will be the story of artificial intelligence on this planet, and then disclosure. Now, Tom, based on what I've been reading in your book and on your website, uh, I take it that you very much understand a lot about the different religious narratives that can be attributed to all of this information. Uh, I was raised Catholic. I'm not Catholic. I'm, I'm what I would describe as like a spiritual agnostic at this point. And one of the things that I talked about on the podcast that I found really uh coincidental and ironic is that if you take so there's a part in the bible actually where it is said that the fallen angels are jealous of god of uh god's love for man and if you t and i think tom DeLong even spoke about this too at one point that if you if you just switch some words around if you take god's love and just change that phrase to connection to source or connection to the consciousness field or connection to the godhead and change fallen angels to the NHI, all of a sudden you have a phrase that looks like uh, the NHI are jealous of human beings' connection to source. And I'm like, well, that lines up a lot with what I've been reading, what I've been researching, what I've been hearing. Um, and again, I'm not really asking you any specific questions, but I guess – being that you're you're very well versed in this information, you wrote a book, you have the website, you know what you're talking about. That I'm sure that based on everything that I'm saying, there there's obviously an opportunity for you to uh, piggyback off of everything that I mentioned. But I really enjoyed your work, uh, and I would also love at some point to have you uh, on the podcast if you would ever be interested with uh, Digby and myself. I've been I'm almost done your book, almost done, and it's you did an excellent excellent job. It's one of the more interesting reads that I've run into recently. And I just want to commend you on your work. Thank you. And uh, thanks for sharing your interesting thoughts on the, on the phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot in there that it's a lot of food for thought, you know, uh, if there's any addition or improvement that I could make on it, it would be that the beings that you're talking about that envy our connection to source that seem to be lacking something that we have, I think I would uh, I would go further up the chain and look at the mantids and whoever controls them, because if we're talking strictly about the greys, for example, I mean they're always they're always on the bottom of the totem pole, like cleaning up vomit, and, you know, taking off abductee's clothes and putting them back on backwards. So 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 the greys are just uh, they're like the task workers at the bottom. And interestingly, you know, interestingly, if you look at the grey typology, okay, with the the big head and the big black eyes. Well, you got the short drone greys who don't really have a lot to offer. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're not very creative. They're not very individualistic, and they always come in groups because they're part of a hive mind, right? You go above them, and okay, now we're looking at the tall greys. So we got the tall greys. And the tall greys, they got longer arms, they got bigger eyes, and they're, they're taller, of course. And they start looking more mantid like. And then if you go a little bit above them, all of a sudden now you're looking at what are classically called the mantis beings i mean not mantis in the sense that they've got necessarily like wings and hard hard like exoskeleton like our mantis and our mantis insects do but mantis in the sense that they have very long arms and extremely huge eyes like a praying mantis has and so what if they aren't necessarily uh praying mantis beings okay what if they are the penultimate gray what if they are the real gray the real gray genetics that has been mixed with other things to produce the tall greys and the little drone greys. Because if you think about it, what if you take a grey and you take away everything that a mantid represents, what are you left with? Well, you're left with basically uh, something that looks like a, like a human child. 
perhaps even a human fetus. Tom, you just you actually, I don't mean to interrupt you at all, but I, I, I can't help but notice something in what you're saying too, that if you, if you, if you start at the mantid and then you look at it, at your stereotypical gray, like I never even thought of this, but it's almost like you have the mantid race, right? And let's say they don't have that connection to source. And it's like these, this is like, well, uh, these are the attempts by those mantids to try to recreate the human morphology. And these are like various phases of those attempts. And they're like, oh, well, we made this one. This one doesn't have a soul. Let's make this one. Like, it's almost like they're, they're these like leftover experiments that they've decided to utilize in their current work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, whether they're experiments or whether they are intentional products, uh, you know, because you design a product for a specific task, right? right. So, so if, if you need a bunch of <clears throat> if you need a bunch of grays to go abduct someone and, and handle them in a very low task way, then maybe a, a gray drone is exactly what you would need to do yeah. that. You know, you know, little little things that are disposable. I mean, it also kind of reminds me of the way you've got like a queen bee and all like the smaller bees, or like a queen uh, ant yeah. and all the smaller yep. ants, right? Right. That the drones are always a smaller, uniform looking weaklings <laughs> that that have their power in numbers they're the ones you know that's what we see with grace these little bald things that come in numbers um maybe that's what's going on there now of course it's not just mantis and grays there are also often seen let's say nordics and reptilians and a few other types uh, like the whole sasquatch types on occasion so it's not like it's, it's just one monolithic thing of a gray type dna that is trying to explore or capture or feed on our soul or something like that there's other beings there including for example the nordics right so let's let's say let's say that nordics are not just artificial genetic creations like everything else let's say that they are indeed um an organic race then what are they doing working as part of the teams of these mantids and reptilians and such like why aren't the greys going after their dna and their emotions or whatever unless of course they lost them too but if they lost, but if they lost it, then how come they still look relatively human? Like, how come they didn't degenerate into what greys look like or what mantis look like if they were so far gone that they don't even have a connection to soul anymore? So these are some questions that we have to ponder. And of course, there are different theories about what's really going on there. I mean, one theory is that even mantids themselves are just another genetic creation of some non-physical, ultra-terrestrial, likely demonic intelligence. That all these different races, whether it be the greys, the nordics, reptilians, mantids, whatever, um, that they are just uh, biological creations of this non-physical thing to use almost as like pincers to reach into our dimension and to manipulate human consciousness and the planet. You know, that these aren't necessarily even their own organic alien races. They're just creations. So that's one viewpoint. Another viewpoint is that maybe they do come from other worlds or other planets, but but... The fact that they look humanoid with the two eyes and the two arms and so on shows that they must have something in common genetically with us, right? And so if they have something in common with us genetically, then if they do come from other worlds, then that means that there's a link between Earth and there, meaning perhaps that there's some ancient primordial genetic creator race that created different uh, genetic humanoids across different worlds, or it could mean that they originated on Earth but developed technology to go there and live there for who knows how many eons and then eventually came back. So the line between extraterrestrial and non-terrestrial, like or extraterrestrial and terrestrial, it, it starts to blur when you consider the idea that the cosmic neighborhood, it's 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 no different. It's not that much different from different continents. You know, you've got Australian Australian Aborigines there, and then you've got like Nordic Scandinavians in Europe. Well, they're both human, right? But they're they're on opposite sides of the planets pretty much, and they look different. So what if the same thing applies to space? Or, you know, or space is not even real and Earth is flat and you can go down that whole rabbit hole as well, which I don't believe in. But I'm just saying that there are reasons why people believe that aliens are not from other planets. OK, there's just many different reasons for that. And then but then there's also many reasons why they probably are from other planets. So it's still a matter of debate. And uh, I think we have to consider those different possibilities when we think about the individual motivations and origins and nature of the greys or the mantids or Nordics or reptilians or, or whatever. Uh, Cortex, did you have any, did you have anything else there before we go to Juan? Yeah, I guess I'll just, I'll just say, uh, real quick that, uh, again, Tom, thanks for doing the space, uh, with Fringe and everybody tonight. It's a pleasure to finally to get to speak to you properly. 
Um, I should be finished with your book probably by tomorrow, actually, because my day at work tomorrow because of the crazy weather we have going on in New Jersey right now, these huge wind gusts and everything. Not going to be right. running out and doing deliveries, but uh, great work, man, and uh, hope to speak again in the future. Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Hey, Juan, welcome to the space. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Fringe. Um, yeah, my question for Tom, uh, first, before I actually ask him this question, the question, though, um, just want to say, you know, when I came over to UFO Twitter, you know, what it was called back then, you know, you it seemed like, you know, you were one of probably, you, I think you were one of my first follows. Um, one of the first people I followed just because, you know, I saw your, you know, your, your thinking, um, the methodology to your thinking just made perfect sense. So, you know, it's cool to hear you. I don't think I've ever heard you in a, in a space or a podcast. I understand you do podcasts. I'll have to look for those. Um, but my question is two parts. So one is, can you elaborate on what you mean? I think in your book, Discerning Alien Disinformation, uh, you talk about ambi ter terrestrials. Um, if you can kind of elaborate what that is. And then two, I'd like to get your take on, um, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't hear if you, if, you know, what, what your religious background is like. Um, I'm Catholic, and I'm just really curious to know, like, what, what's your take on, like, exorcism, on demonic possession, you know, maybe how that is kind of connected to, let's say, the phenomena. Uh, I know I asked Dr. Pasolka this question as well before. Um, I asked it to a few people at Seoul as well at the Seoul Symposium, but I'm just curious, you know, to know what what your take on on it, on it is. So those two questions. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So your first question, you asked what I mean by the term ambi terrestrial, uh, and that's a term I had to come up with because uh, there's a similar term in other sources, like like some people refer to, let's say, fourth density aliens, but I didn't really want to use New Age terms like that in my book, so I came up with the term ambi terrestrial to describe beings that are neither uh, 3D physical spacemen, you know, like the extraterrestrial hypothesis beliefs, that are neither that, nor are they completely non-physical interdimensionals, like ghosts or demons or uh, non-physical ultra-terrestrials might be. There's something in between that has that, that is variably physical and that has powers that are just simply not possible if you were uh, a complete 3D physical being. So, like, for example, I mean, we, we know that they're not, locked into physicality because they can disappear from our sight. They can walk through solid walls. Uh, there's reports of them entering their ships into solid mountains, that they have bases inside solid mountains without even hollowing them out. It's almost like they're kind of like phase shifted from physical matter. Or the fact that they can move underwater faster than fluid dynamics even allows. These USOs, these you know unidentified submerged objects. Well, a lot of this stuff requires them to somehow be able to detune themselves from our physical reality. And whether that's technology or psychic power or their natural state, I think that depends on which particular being we're talking about. But there's an aspect to the phenomenon that disproves the 3D physical extraterrestrial hypothesis. And I, and I do think that most of us can agree on that, that you know that hypothesis simply doesn't fit. But at the same time, if you discount that, it's easy to... It's easy to jump to the opposite of the end of the spectrum and say that, therefore, the entire thing is just a psychic phenomenon. So when we talk about a psychic aspect of the phenomenon, are we, are we saying that um, they have psychic abilities or are we saying that they're completely non-physical? And in my view, it's, it's neither in both. You know, it's the fact that they occupy this middle ground for which we don't have the science or the language to fully describe it, right? So I, that's why I used ambi-terrestrial, just like ambi in terms of like a like amphibious in a way. So they're, they're amphibious. They're like frogs that could be both in the water and on land. Well, they could be both in our 3D physical space-time environment, and they can shift out into either a parallel space-time or perhaps into a less physical state. Uh, interestingly enough, it seems like abductees can be taken into that parallel space-time as well. So that might be an example of technology, uh, technology doing it. So that's, that's my answer to what I mean by ambi-terrestrial. And your second question was, I think, what was my, what's my religious background or my religious beliefs? So I grew up in a non-religious household. My mom, she was Buddhist. My dad, he was into just parapsychology. He never really mentioned religion. I was baptized Christian. Uh, well, in, in Germany, I guess it would be Protestant. I mean, they call it evangelical, which just means like evangelical, like German, I guess, evangelical Protestantism or something like that. But I've read the, the I've read the Bible quite a bit. Um, most 
actually a good number of the most respected people, like friends that I have, my mom even, uh, yeah, most of my close friends, a lot of them are Christian. So I, I respect it very much, and I, I, do, I do read the Bible. I can, I can quote the Bible if you want me to. So I'm, I'm familiar with Christianity more so than any other religion. But do I go to church? No. Um, do I consider myself uh, like a hardcore Christian? No. But I, I do say that I, re- I respect Christianity, but I don't limit myself to it. And I'm interested also in comparative religion, so studying other belief systems. Uh, so I guess the only real difference between me and the typical Christian is is that they, they tend to base their worldview on, on the Bible as a word of God, whereas I view the Bible in terms of other things. So I view it in context of everything else. I, I guess in, in the old days, I would have been burned at the stake for being a heretic, for, for not fully believing it. But I respect everyone's views, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to find the truth. And maybe one day I'll come around to that if it comes to that. But for now, I do enjoy uh, consulting many different paths. Yeah, I, I guess I was curious, you know, um, what, what your thoughts are on, like, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this concept of, you know, this idea of demonic possession. So, from, you, you know, let's say from a Christian point of view or Buddhist point of view or Hindu point of view, um, do you have any, I mean, do you, what's your take? I mean, is it, how can you reconcile it? Reconcile it, let's say, if you were someone who is, um, let's say somebody like your mom, you said, you know, who's Christian or somebody, you know, who's, who's typically Christian, how, how would they reconcile that um, with what we know about the phenomena? You know, let, let's assume that demonic possession is real, um, demonic infestation, demonic oppression. How do you reconcile that with the phenomena that does not include, you know, these, these types of entities that, you know, I know UFO Joe calls them parasitic, parasitic entities. Um, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, I would reconcile it this way, which is that when we're dealing with demons, we're, we're dealing with a, a particular type of life form with a particular orientation because there are life forms that are like demons in the sense of being, you know, psychic, precognitive, non-physical, uh, being able to be around us invisibly and influence us. I mean, there's, for example, in the, in the Muslim and Persian traditions, you've got the jinn, right? You've got the good jinn, you've got the negative jinn. And to the point where even in some of those countries, they have laws on the books about interactions between humans and jinn. So we, we barely even have any laws here about NHI human interactions that we know of. But they have it in their culture for hundreds of years because it's been a problem in the past. It's been a problem in the past where, I mean, heck, even even in, in Europe during, I think it was during the mid-700s, there was an event where what appeared to be Nordic beings showed up in ships in the skies and tried to, well, they, they abducted people and took them back to whatever realm they came from in order to show them like, hey, you know, we're just, we're, we're, we're cool. Like, look at our, our, our world and this is what your world could be. They brought them back and... uh the people were treated as, as witches and sorcerers, and a lot of them were burned at the stake for, you know, consorting with, with these, these demons. Um, to the point where, I think it was King Charlemagne had to pass laws barring, uh, basically outlawing these beings from being able to interact with humans. Like, so, so even in the West, there have been interactions. It's just over time, as society has gotten more skeptical, these, we don't even think about that anymore. But the, the whole point, however, is that whether we're talking about Islam or um, Europe back in the 700s, there has been known interactions between us and non-human entities. And the fact is, you know, that they're not, they're not all necessarily demons. They seem to be either like parallel humanoids or non-physical intelligences, something like that. You don't have to, just because you believe in demons doesn't mean that other things aren't possible. Because if you think about it, Demons can possess humans, right? I mean, if you're a Christian, you fully believe in that. Demons can possess humans. Humans can be driven by evil motives that are not just their own, but that are um, encouraged or tempted from the outside by demonic entities. So, in other words, you can have people, whether they are parents or uh, leaders of corporations or governments, that are driven by demonic motives because they have chosen that, they have affiliated with that, and they might even be shadowed or possessed by demons. So who's to say, therefore, that aliens, likewise, are not similar? That they could be biological vessels that, either in their history or um, whatever, they are. They have consorted with demons, they have allied with it, or in some way or another, they are carrying out another facet of the demonic agenda, probably at a much higher technical level because they are now physical and they have technology and maybe they have easier access to our world than even demons do, right? So evil should not be limited to just demons. Evil can take many forms, 
It can take forms as humans. It can take forms as perhaps even non-humans. And like I said before, at the very start of this, this whole thing we're having tonight, this discussion, I said that demons occupy, well, that negative aliens seem to occupy the part of the spectrum between humans in the middle and like demons nearer to the bottom, you know, and then of course the ultimate ultra terrestrial negative demonic archons at the very bottom. But uh, yeah, you've got this whole like middle spectrum that's unoccupied. So what is there between humans and angels and what is there between humans and these demonic beings? Well, what if it's demonic biological vessels that have more technology and more psychic powers and everything than, than humans do? And then if you go above it, what if there are benevolent beings that are also, you know, physical or quasi-physical that are part of a divine hierarchy? But of course, once you start admitting to that possibility, then you have to be careful because that's where the benevolent imposters come into view. You know, these, these beings that pretend to be part of this divine alien hierarchy, but they're not. They're, they're deceivers. They're part of the demonic agenda as well. Um, yeah, so I think, I think there's, there's a way to slot it into there and... If someone wants to be even more particular about it, they can look at sources like the Vatican or Chuck Meisler. You know, Chuck Meisler, he's a pretty good guy in terms of reconciling the alien phenomenon with the Christian phenomenon. He, I forgot the name of his book, but his book is worth reading for a Christian perspective of the UFO phenomenon. And I think he, above any other mainstream, well, not mainstream, but like well-known Christian out there, has a pretty good pulse on the alien phenomenon from a Christian viewpoint. But, you know, as far as like just plain old demons go, I think demons are a they're they're independent of religion. Like yes, you know they do care about destroying the soul, destroying God's creation, you know, being anti divine and all that. But but religion is it's, it's it's one lens on this force of nature in a way you could say it's one lens on it. And of course there are other religions that also are aware of demons in their own terms and languages. And you can have someone who is not even religious who still has demonic issues at home because they're still dealing with entities that, um, th that are not constructs of religion, but which religion has busied itself with understanding and incorporating into its, uh, into its paradigm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I actually, um, I glanced at Tom, uh, Chuck, I think his name is Chuck Meisler. Uh, I, I believe he's actually an alleged member of the Collins elite. <laughs> based on the ufo lit um it seems that you know he, he might he might be one of those but <laughs> I, I don't know that for sure obviously uh but yeah thank thank you for all of that um i'll drop down you know uh, but yeah nice nice chatting with you uh, we'll chat again thank you yeah take care thanks thank you juan okay we i'm gonna um get to t these last two questions so tom uh Montauk Tom, how are you on time? Because I have an entire list of questions that we could always save for another day. I'm good, but uh, you know what? I'll, I'll I'll be more succinct in my answers, so we'll try to get through uh, a lot of them. No, I, I mean, there's no need for that. I, I, I want to hear everything you have to say. Uh, Percy was next, and then we'll go to Paul, and then after that, we're going to go to my list. Go ahead, Percy. Hey, so much, French. Um, Tom, I just wanted to say really appreciate everything that you're doing for disclosure movement and just getting people's awareness. I'm going to keep it short. I'm kind of in the middle of my work and I was hearing Tom Cortex speak about um, the soul. Um, I'm a lifelong experiencer. I have a very vivid uh, past life memory being a reptilian um, that actually went through a soul transfer procedure. So I was in a room on, uh, on a bed. I'm going to keep it short. Um, I felt pressure in my temples and I'm looking up and I see there is a short gray with his hands on my temples. Um, I'm looking, I'm struggling to look around the room when I look past my reptilian feet. I see two tall grays. I see a reptilian that's chuckling away and I see a mantid being in a purple cape right in the back, tallest of all, all of them. And I actually remember the memory of them ripping the soul out of the body putting it in container um, and without going into the whole my, my all my experiences what I take from it is it's a battle of the soul that certain creatures that are technologically higher up don't have a soul they're trying to way, find a way to basically control that soul aspect uh, what is your take on that Tom just mm-hmm no, it's a good question. Uh, so you're talking about soul transfer, just the idea of soul transfer, yeah. and we, yeah, yeah, and we and do find that. For, 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I never knew anything about this. Um, the only beings that I ever was exposed to was short grays in my life. And after my regression, I, I found out all this information, past life as an iron, past life as a reptilian, um, and then this whole soul transfer thing. So, sorry, go on. Yeah, so speaking of soul transfer, we do find mention of that in many sources, including, let's say, Carla Turner, right, where, uh, yeah. what was his name, Ted, Ted Rice, you know, the Ted Rice case, where he, he claims that he remembers having his soul transferred into a clone body, and they did that by feeding him this poison that basically killed him and ejected his soul from his body, and then they transferred it to a new clone body. Now, if that happens, well, it does correlate with other claims that these beings can essentially hop between bodies very easily. Like, and that, well, which substantiates the idea that the whole, like, reptilians, Nordics, mantids, and so on, like, those are just meat suits that these non physical energies are hopping between. And uh, for them, soul transfer is as easy as us changing our clothes or our shoes. Like, to them, it's a, it's a reality. Now, why would it be a reality? Well, earlier when I mentioned ambi, uh, the concept of ambi-terrestrials. So if you are ambi-terrestrial and you're, and you're not just locked into 3D physical reality and you're psychic, you're naturally going to, be, you're going to be able to perceive and therefore work with, both psychically and technologically, subtle energies. And that includes the soul. Okay? And that's where you start leaving the field of ufology and you get into uh, occultism, mysticism, esotericism, where you know those fields get into the structure of the subtle energy body and what can be done with it. For example, uh, what was it? Someone recently on Twitter was saying that Werner von Braun said that if you want to know the answer to the UFO mystery, read Rudolf Steiner's book, Theosophy, or something like that. I read that somewhere. I don't know if it's true, but if it is true, well... Theosophy, what does it talk about? It talks about the different structures and functions of the subtle energy bodies. You know, not only the physical, but also the etheric and the astral and consciousness and how that all fits together. So if you had that, that knowledge and you're able to apply it practically, not only would you be able to demonstrate and perform psychic abilities, but you would also then be able to manipulate the soul, including, if you have the technological and psychic power, to transfer it from one body to, uh, to another. Uh, and if you look, for example, in um, the case of like the field of demonic possession, yeah, of course, of course, you can have a non-physical intelligence, in this case, a demon, that can hop from one person to another if both of them are vulnerable. So, no matter what field you look at, you know, whether it's ufology or demonology or um, uh, esotericism, like Rudolf Steiner's material, the idea that the soul is something separate from the body that can be transferred or that can be, that can incarnate into a body that can leave a body and that can, can conceivably be transferred between bodies. Uh, it's all part of a higher, uh, technology or knowledge base that works with these non-physical energies. Right. But here's the thing, just because we're talking about a non-physical subtle energy body doesn't mean that that is necessarily, let's say the spirit, like the, the core thing of us that reincarnates that is connected to the divine right see because a part of the soul might just be another another um it's almost almost like like the base layer of clothing you know like you're wearing long johns and like a thermal see what if there's a part of the soul that is not necessarily the spirit like the thing that um is of divine origin like the god spark within us it could just be another layer just like the nervous system or the the flesh and blood part of our body right it's just something that is more subtle and when aliens work with that, that doesn't mean that they're working with a spirit. It just means that they're working with another component of our being. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. And the reason why I bring that up is because um, it's a whole subject in itself about the connection between NHIs and near-death experiences, for example, or whether you know whether the whole like white light is a gray alien trap, which is it's a theory that I've heard some people believe in. Um, and, and it gets into that. But I think I think the more that you study about the afterlife and the subtle energy body and how that all works. Uh, the better your understanding is of that, the more you can rule out. Like me personally, I do not believe that grays have much to do with the white light at the end of the tunnel after death, even though, you know, there's supposed claims of people seeing it with that. But, but I think that the afterlife process is part of a bigger framework that aliens aren't necessarily completely in control of. Um, it's something beyond them. And, and I say that because, the priorities that aliens have is different from the priorities that we find in, for example, uh, angels, okay, or spirit protectors or something like that. 
See, angelic beings, and, and I'm saying angel in a, in a generic sense, not purely 100% in a Christian sense, but just mean like higher divine, benevolent, non-physical, uh, super powerful energy forms. These intelligences care very much about the, the growth of the spirit and the strength of the soul. You know, the integrity, the, the divine connection of the soul. That's what they care about. They don't care as much about, uh, well, they don't care pretty much at all about like uh, genetic manipulation of humanity and uh, politics and all this kind of crap that aliens sometimes seem to be invested in. So they're, they're operating by a different value system because they're operating by and upon uh, a part of reality that, is, that supersedes the entire alien spectrum, in my, in my opinion. Okay, I mean, aliens, if they're going to be partly physical, if they're going to use technology, if they're going to use vehicles and so on, they're operating within the so-called matrix or simulation or you know, just the physical world. They're operating within that, that sphere. And so they're, they're part of the snow globe. You know, they're, they're part of the props of this thing. And there are beings, there are priorities, there are values that are outside that snow globe that have to do with a part of us that is outside that snow globe. And I'm talking about our spirit, right? So that's why I think that aliens and uh, angels, they have different priorities and different abilities. And uh, so therefore, it's not really necessary to conflate them necessar- you know, necessarily. Thank you, Tom. I'm, uh, it's funny you mentioned Ted Rice because through a bunch of synchronicities, um, I got in touch with James Bartley because of my reptilian experiences. Uh, then with Fringe, Fringe put me onto you. Um, and then I even heard about Ted Rice. So I'm actually in contact with Ted Rice right now. I'm going to try and work on some of my experiences and deciphering some of them. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Okay, we're going to go to Paul, and then we do have uh, quite a few speaker requests. Just please be patient. Uh, We'll go to Paul, and then I'm going to get to a couple on the list. Go ahead, Paul. All right. Thanks, Fringe. Uh, Thanks, Tom, for being here. It's a great uh, pleasure to uh, listen to you talk. Loving this conversation. Um, So I'll I'll try to be brief. I guess uh, first I'll just say uh, I really resonate with uh, everything you were saying about um, kind of becoming the importance of becoming aware of these subtle energies and perhaps like a, an etheric body or astral body and stuff. And uh, I, I, I really agree with that. And I think that, like you said, it um, kind of expands the topic beyond um, UFOs and so forth uh, into just the realm of like consciousness and spirituality and reality and whatnot. Um, so yeah, as a person who uh, tries to meditate as much as possible, and, and I, I practice like my f- own form of astral travel or lucid dreaming or whatever, uh, it's something I think about a lot because, like you know, eventually we are going to die and you know shed this uh, flesh body, and at at that point, I think uh, it's to our uh, it's in our best interest to. to Uh, become familiar with like exist familiar with not identifying with the body and existing outside of the body and and perhaps and and then yeah who knows what who knows what waits us awaits us then you know people talk about the white light being a trick like you said and i also don't believe that but nonetheless I, i think that uh yeah, it's just good to to be aware of these things. And, and the you know buddhists have written about this forever. So anyway, I just really liked that. Um uh, and I, I love your whole ambi-terrestrial concept. Uh, it it almost seems like these beings, some of them, the angelic ones or demonic ones, like they they traverse consciousness itself, uh, much less time and space. So I just wanted to say that. And then my question, I one of the only questions I could think of, or the only question I can think of, it's, it's very simple. Um, do you look at any of these uh, so-called negative entities as uh, almost like scavengers or like what uh, there's a term a necrophage which is like which are like you know creatures bottom feeder creatures that will like eat negative bacteria and sort of like suck out negative physical matter from you know waste materials from from fish for example uh or whatever um but they're not you know they're not parasitic they're not necessarily negative Do, do you think that any of these uh, entities like shadow entities, for instance, could be something like that, something that's not necessarily uh, evil or par- or parasitic, but is like kind of uh, just taking that energy in. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, great question. So when we talk about entities being evil, uh, 
and or whether they were just you know just parasites. Well, the thing is, if you're if you're a parasite on the soul or the spirit, then I guess by definition that makes you evil because that's how we define evil in a way, right? So, but but the thing is, they may be part of a natural order, and if they were only opportunists, which some of them are, like if you're, if you're dealing with like everyday garden variety demons or astral parasites, uh, yeah, they are they do they do act very opportunistically where. It's not like they, they have a, a multi-millennia plan to enslave humanity, like certain negative alien factions seem to do. But they're more like, oh, well, here, here's someone who's weak. Here's someone who has certain latencies that we can amplify and feed on and drive him into the ground you know, for our own sadistic amusement. Uh, they're opportunistic like that. And uh, if, you, if you want to view it from... See, so, so, so if you get into certain esoteric studies like Rosicrucianism or hermeticism or so on their view is that yes exactly what you said that demonic forces are they're they're there to basically show us our weaknesses you know that's kind of the spiritual viewpoint um whether it's true or not or doesn't matter because it's, it's a very practical and functional way of viewing the demonic presence which is that since they feed on your um the part of you that's not your true self, you know, because like if you were fully embodied in your in your spirit in your God spark, then you wouldn't have a lot of these weaknesses. You wouldn't have a lot of these. Uh, you wouldn't be given to the temptations that demonic beings try to induce in people, right? So, so that that's a that's something to consider that if they come after you and you deal with a lot of problems caused by the demonic beings, probably it is due to either something that some vulnerability that you have that you need to look at or maybe something that you've brought on in a way. However, see, however, we can't use that explanation to explain all of it because see, it's one thing for a company to produce a product that meets a demand versus another company that uses evil tricks to create that demand in the first place. So if you have negative beings, <clears throat> if you have negative beings that play the long game, and they set up a system of civilization with the nine to five grind and all the drama and uh, the, the the terrible the terrible healthcare system that we have that gives you medicine for one disease but it creates side effects that creates another disease which creates you know just more and more money for the pharmaceutical system. Well, if you have a system that's so corrupt like that, it's no longer about uh, playing on people's weaknesses. It's about creating those weaknesses in the first place, and that's where you start getting into darkness crossing its jurisdiction or violating its jurisdiction and crossing into territory it's not supposed to be in because it's making things worse than it, than it deserves to be. And for that reason, that's why many sources, and I guess it's kind of plain to see if you really open your eyes, there is divine intervention or a necessity for divine intervention going on. See, divine intervention wouldn't be necessary if there weren't something to intervene against, whether it's our own ignorance or whether it's dark forces crossing the boundaries and making things worse than they need to be. And so if you look at it from the 1,000-mile from the, the view down, what you are really seeing then is you're seeing basically darkness and light in the universe, or at least in our part of the universe. Darkness and light being in a, in a tussle that does not remain static, but fluctuates back and forth. And the reason why it fluctuates back and forth is because it takes time for processes to evolve, you know, for darkness to achieve its aims, and it takes time for the intervention to happen. So kind of moves back and forth, and this fluctuation then drives the gears of, I guess uh, you would call it soul evolution or spiritual evolution or you know, just, the, the, just the gamut of experience that individual beings can have in, in uh, a construct like this. Right? So that, that kind of gets into the big spiritual war aspect in that from the highest perspective, yes, you know, darkness probably does have a place in the universe to teach us the knowledge of good and evil, to teach us the difference between good and evil because when you're confronted with a choice for evil that makes the choice for good even more meaningful i mean that, that is what gives it meaning because if you didn't have that choice to begin with then you would just be god's wind-up robot you know being set in a good direction and then you would just you know follow through with that forever and ever and ever and yes there are beings like higher angels that do seem to be creations of the divine that don't have as much free will as we do who are therefore forever divine you know they're divine in their nature but we we sit right on that fence. We've got this, this free will ability to choose good or choose evil. And so therefore, we are part of a process. We're part of an engine of creation between darkness and light that fluctuates back and forth. And therefore, we get cycles. We've 
get like these, the, like in Hinduism, right? You got the Kali Yuga cycles. You got the Yuga cycles, we got the Kali and all these other different cycles, right? Some are more light, some are more dark. And this process of change, this wheel, creates friction, it creates, uh, ultimately, I think it creates spiritual enlightenment, but through a very, very, very difficult path. Um, because if you believe in the afterlife and you believe that uh, consciousness can exist in a, in, a, in a beautiful afterlife state, you know, maybe even in heaven or something like that, well, if that's so perfect, then why is anything even here? Why is there so much suffering? Well, it's because in a, in a heavenly perfect state, you cannot, there's certain things you cannot gain from that. You can't gain, gain levels of strength. You can't experience glory. You can't experience free will against darkness. You know, there's certain things that make you stronger and brighter as a spirit by coming here that you don't gain in these, these lesser challenging environments. So I do think that we find ourselves in a very challenging training scenario, I guess you could say, like a training environment that is so challenging that it's in some ways it's not even training. It's just pure sadistic, you know, but that's, I think that's the high stakes, high risk game that, that we are playing by coming here. So <laughs> that's getting kind of metaphysical, but I wanted to give like a super big picture perspective. No, that was great. Uh, that's exactly, I was going to say, you really got to the big picture there. Uh, just, uh, wow, a lot in there. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I'm going to get um, to a couple of the questions on my list. Again, if you have requested to speak, please be patient. Uh, if you can wait, great. If not, we totally understand. Um, Tom, you kind of have somewhat addressed this first question already, but I would like to... Uh, maybe just go a little bit further into it with the second part of the question, and that is, why are they so interested in our souls, which has been touched on, but can they destroy our souls? And I think, uh, again, you know, sometimes we use the word soul and spirit interchangeably. I'm very guilty of that myself. I think, Tom, you were actually the first one to school me on the difference between the soul and the spirit, so I appreciate that. But I, I think they probably mean, can they destroy our, our true selves, our higher selves, our spirit, and our divine connection to God? I think I heard you mention something about the demons want to destroy our soul. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. So I had a dream. I had a dream once. Um, it used to be that maybe once or twice a month I would get one of those dreams, like a, one of those revelatory teaching dreams that weren't just regular nonsense of things I had thought about the day before. It was like a, it was a dream that was, seemed to be externally imposed. And, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm pretty cautious about that stuff. And I always try to see the disinfo angle on pretty much everything. But this dream was interesting. Um, I was at a restaurant sitting down eating with two women. Like one was like a, like a Nordic looking woman and one was an a Asian woman. And we're, we're talking, but I think we're talking telepathically. And they asked me a, a riddle. And then the, and the riddle was this. What is the difference, or what, what, what do spirituality and science have in common? And I thought about it, and the answer that came to my mind, which I realized was them putting the answer in my mind, is the idea that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So I said it, you know, and they seemed pleased, and then they went on to elaborate on it, which was that basically there's a part of us, this energy that we're talking about, that comes from outside all this. You know, you could call it the snow globe, all right? So it's this energy that comes from outside the snow globe. And this energy cannot be destroyed or, or ultimately even harmed by anything that's inside the snow globe. And when they, when they refer to what's inside here, they're specifically talking about the demonic and negative alien powers that are here that are part of this construct. Uh, now, when I say part of this construct, it can mean, okay, well, maybe they're just fake, like they're artificial creations of something. Or it can mean that they were real, but they chose to, they chose to give up their divine connection and basically become kings of of a ruined empire, you know, by, by staying here within this place instead of reconnecting with their true self outside of it. But the point is that there's something here from the outside that cannot be destroyed. So that's, it made sense to me. You know, it made sense to me. I think it's possible for us to be, I think it is possible for the spirit to be either cr corrupted or mostly destroyed, but only at our own hands. If we will, willingly choose to engage in such evil acts for such a long time over many, many, many lifetimes, that we become essentially identical to these negative NHIs or uh, demons, you know, the upper level demons and so on. And if you get to that point and you just don't give it up, I think at some point you would suffer some sort of a spiritual entropy where you have such little light left in you that you don't even, you, you can't even go on anymore and you either evaporate or you have to make a choice to convert to the light to have any hope at succeeding further. 
And this is a viewpoint that we find in various belief systems, where they're both religious and also even some of the channeling stuff, like the law of one material. But it doesn't matter which source you look at. You, you, you do find this idea that, yes, there is an immortal core, like an immortal spirit within us. However, either it or something very close to it that surrounds it can get corrupted or can become weaker over time. And so therefore, therefore, we have to be careful about the choices that we make that we never really go down that path towards its uh, ultimate end. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, UAP, Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Fringe and <clears throat> Ulrich. Hey, Paul, you're awesome. I love Paul. Paul's like one of my favorite people on Twitter now, and I yelled at him once and I regret it. And Paul, I love you. <clears throat> Tom, my question to you is about the moon. Um, I recently, I've had a lot of like, um, you know, uh, meditation and uh, just a lot of like, uh, a lot of thoughts about the moon you know, astronauts going there, a lot of stories. Um, you know, you have Ingo Swan remote viewing the moon, lots of remote viewers on the moon. Um, but, uh, you know, I get the feeling like the entities on the moon are not good. Okay. Uh, definitely like in a not, and they're not funny either. That's another thing. Like some aliens, some entities have senses of humor. It's like when the astronauts went to the moon, it was a very serious tone. Don't come back here. If you look at a lot of the moon missions, a lot of them have uh, had problems recently. Um, so how do you, I mean, do you think like there are entities on the moon and your, is your position that these are positive entities? No, I don't think there are any positive entities on the moon necessarily. Well, at least not in the physical and not in the parallel space time and terrestrial sense either. Uh, the only source I've ever, ever heard about anything positive about the moon has to do with the idea of the, uh, well, how do I, how to explain this? So, so basically, I mean, this sounds so, so hokey, but all right. So, so basically ancient, ancient times, right? The Greeks, you got this Greek philosopher named Plutarch. He wrote a book called on the faces of the moon or something like that. And in the book, there's various Greek philosophers that go into their theories about what the moon is and how it works. And, you know, most of it's pretty silly. And then he saves the best story for last which is information that someone got from uh, an, an esoteric mystery school cult that lives somewhere near Greece, but you know, over the water. Anyway, they talk about how after a person dies, um, they don't go straight fully to the afterlife, just like an intermediate realm. And the way that they depict it is that the space between Earth and the moon is almost like an astral holdover region where some of these souls go in order to purify themselves and then be able to uh, move on further and then therefore the moon then is kind of like the final gateway station towards the rest of creation um it's kind of weird that that they would link a physical thing with an astral thing but that theme keeps coming up over and over again in different sources like in esotericism and this is something that Gigi young and rudolf steiner and others have talked about they talk about the moon as this thing called the eighth sphere okay now what they what they mean by that is that the moon the physical moon that we see is essentially, uh, you, know, you know, the same way that the physical human body has, it's just a, a, a foundation or like a seat of a non-physical structure that we call the soul and then the spirit. Well, the moon, likewise, is a physical body that is a seat of non-physical planes or structures that are of a negative demonic orientation. So when occultism talks about the moon as the eighth sphere, they're really talking about the non-physical or astral aspect of the moon that is the home of entities that they don't belong in this creation anymore. Like there are leftovers from some prior stuff that chose not to evolve any further. So they're kind of retro, they're spiritually regressed. And that's how occult, um, occultism views it. It's interesting, therefore, how occultism then ties into different UAP or like UFO lore about the moon, like astronauts seeing reptilians on there and just other weird stuff about the moon. So really just nothing good about the moon that I've heard other than the fact that it's a way station for departed souls to kind of like leave this Earth sphere. But as to why there would be negative aliens on the moon, well, for, first of all, it's always facing in the same direction. So it's easy for them to build bases on the other side of it that we can't see, for starters, okay? Um, or put stuff on the front of it, right? Like, um, who was it? Was it Ed Dames? No, I think it was John Lear talking about that obelisk soul-sucking machine on the moon. Six miles <laughs> high. Yeah. Yeah, now there, you know, the photos do show a weird obelisk, but as to what it actually is, 
who knows? Maybe it is like a weird transmitter station. We've got occultists like or uh, mystics like Gurdjieff, Uspensky, Moraviev, and some others talking about the moon as harvesting the soul energy of Earth. So it's not like John Lear was the first one to say it. There were others who said it. And so there's always been association between the moon and nefarious forces. And we see this even symbolically depicted in movies like The Truman Show, where the director of the entire simulation was stationed in a control room behind the moon in the sky of the dome, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, no matter where we look, there, there's always something nefarious, nefarious about the moon. I'm not saying there's anything, there's nothing good about it. You know, obviously, there's good things about the moon, too, like from an astrological or symbolic viewpoint. But if we look at you, uh, occultism and UFO lore, yeah, it's, it's kind of nefarious, and I really don't know of any positive forces that are there. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Mike, I, I guess that's it. Yep. Um, okay. Go ahead, Mike. No, no, that was great. No, Tom, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Actually, I uh, love that question. All right, Tom, I'm just going to be getting to some basic overall um, debunking type questions, not debunking, but just skeptic type questions. Um, one of the common ones is, if they were negative, they would have destroyed us a long time ago. Could you, could you address that one, please? Sure. Like That pretty much assumes that aliens are hostile in an impatient, violent, and simpleton manner, I guess if you want to call it that. But of course, there are way more sophisticated and covert forms of hostility, like deception and <clears throat> infiltration, pretending to be benevolent. So maybe it's not that they want to destroy us in that way. Maybe they want to use us, right? You can have a farmer using a cow and not necessarily hunting it down like a wolf, right? It's kind of like, because otherwise the logic would be like a cow saying, well, if the rancher were hostile, then he'd have attacked us by now. But instead he's feeding us hay. <laughs> it's kind of like that. So there's many ways that hostility can take place that wouldn't involve violence. So therefore there's no reason for them to really have destroyed us yet if they have something in store for us that fits their negative agenda. Okay, thanks. Um, another one is, we don't know anything, no one knows anything, we can't know anything, uh, we don't have enough data, so all of this is just fear-mongering. We just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that concern. And it's, it's a legitimate concern if if your standards are rooted too much in 1800s materialistic scientific paradigm, right? Because if you go by that standard of the 1800s science before quantum mechanics, before, you know, people realize that consciousness affects the experiment that you're doing, then it's easy to, to dismiss subject and focus only on object and focus only on materiality. So if your standards are that high, if that's, if that's your definition of scientific proof, then, of course, you're going to dismiss abductions. You're going to dismiss contactee stuff. You're going to dismiss a lot of things because you're only looking for the most hardcore scientific proof. Things that are – it kind of reminds me of a, of a toddler that only ever eats spaghetti and chicken nuggets because they're, they're, they're so finicky about what they eat that their diet becomes extremely restricted. And because of that, they are at risk of malnutrition because they're not eating the vegetables or you know whatever is really good for them. So I think the same thing happens with information and data that – if you reject so much of it, of course you're going to suffer from intellectual malnutrition where now all of a sudden you're confused, you don't know what's going on, and, and you, you tell everyone else that they can't know what's going on. I think that if you really want to approach the NHI phenomenon effectively, you can't go by 1800 stuff anymore. You have to go by, not, not by Boolean logic, which is just zero or one or true or false. You have to go by fuzzy logic, which means a probability value assigned to whether something is true or false. So that's why you can look at abductee and contactee accounts and say, okay, well, I can't prove that they're 100% telling the truth, but it fits with a lot of other, other data points that we have. And because it does, all right, fine, it's probably 80% probable that it's, it's true, all right? So you, you, you assign 80% to that, you go on to the next case. Okay, well, that's maybe 90%. There's another one that's 70%. Well, if you've got 100 cases where there are 80 or 70 or 90%, well, that all adds up to, let's say, 99.5% certainty that, yes, abductions are happening. And you can make that deduction, you can make that inference without having to have a, you know, uh, some sort of MIT study on a gray in the lab that they have just to prove that grays even exist, right? So you got you to loosen up your standards a bit, look at more data, uh, dive into anecdotal data, and just put it together in a detective sort of manner in order to really understand it. And that's what you need to do. So 
yeah, if you don't do that, then of course you're going to be confused. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, another one is there's no such thing as good and evil. So there's no such thing as good and evil NHI, only ignorance of having a 5D elevated consciousness. So this is the same argument that everything is just here for our lessons and we should actually thank our abusers uh, for teaching us a lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a line that I've heard in some of the pro gray alien, uh, well, I'll, I'll come right and say it, it's disinformation. It's the disinformation line of thinking. And the reason why it is, is because it ignores uh, the functional reality of how we judge good and evil. See, we judge good and evil, well, all right, societally, we judge good and evil based on, well, based on the golden rule and based also on how, how it affects things in general. I mean, of course, of course, there's a dimension to morality and ethics that comes from the spirit within us, you know, our divine capacity for empathy, for example. The empathy within us, it's not based on social construct. It's not even based on culture. It's based on uh, actual spiritual intelligence that supersedes and transcends physicality. You know, it doesn't matter what planet you're on. It doesn't matter what dimension you're in or whatever. If you're a consciousness and another, another being is a consciousness, that alone sets up certain rules for interaction whereby, for example, if I take your consciousness and stuff it in some dark astral pocket and just keep it there for my own amusement, that's not good. See? It's not even based on human cultural logic. It's just based on the fact that now you're stuck in this astral pocket and you can't have the experiences that you need as a conscious spark of, of light to, to grow, to experience, to learn, to you know, enjoy yourself, and, and, and ultimately for the infinite creator to explore itself in an infinite number of finite ways. That, that process gets stopped when a person gets enslaved or trapped for a very long time. So what I'm saying is there's a morality that transcends physicality that therefore puts a label on what is good and evil in context of the uh, eternal transcendent purpose of life itself, which is for consciousness to experience, to grow in the most efficient and effective way possible. And so if an alien collective wants to destroy humanity, um, the, the peace of, of humanity, the, the, the thing that we have going on here, if they want to turn us all into robotic servants and, and you know, make sure that we become just like the greys for five, 10,000 years, whatever, longer than that, that, how does that serve our evolution? It doesn't. You know, that sort of darkness does not serve anyone because it's, uh, it becomes redundant. You know, after, after your first lifetime as a, as a weird hybrid, you're not going to learn anymore because it's just the same routine every life. You know, you're just being ground to the bone in some totalitarian system. And so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really buy that good and evil don't exist. I think, I think even if you look at it just functionally, there are certain things that are good for us and there are certain things that are not good for us. And the things that are not in our best interest or our well-being can be classified even just culturally as evil. Thank you. Um, uh, how about um, abductions and the breeding program are just... Uh, for advancing our species and for our own good? Well, you have to ask yourself, what is it that we're being hybridized with, right? We're being hybridized with, according to these claims, with gray aliens. Now, are gray aliens awesome? You know, do they, do they have incredible insights? Are they lively? Are they spiritual? I would say no. I think they're the opposite of those things. In fact, if, if, if a human being is hybridized with a gray uh, well, uh, we would lose a lot of our independence. We would lose our capacity for independent thought, for example. Uh, a lot of our emotions, maybe our more social thinking ability. But, you know, because if, if you look at greys and what their behavior is, it's almost like they're ninety percent uh, frontal cortex. You know, like the, the the higher cortex part of the brain and a little bit of the, the reptilian brain, and they don't have anything in between the two. So it's almost like they're super smart reptilian critters in a way. And what, what we want to hybridize with that? See, I don't think so. See, why, if, let's say, Nordics are being cited, why aren't we being hybridized with them instead? Why does it have to be the greys? You know why? Well, the reason is, is because greys are already a slave species. They're already a task worker species that serves these, you know, higher manted powers and their dark ultra-terrestrial powers. So if we are going to be hybridized with the greys, it's because they want to rope us in to their control system. And that is not evolution at all, right? That's not evolution at all. So, you know, 
if there's if there's hybridization going on, then why does it have to be with the the most the most saddest, pathetic little things out there? <laughs> yeah, that's a good 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 answer. Okay. Can I just um, uh, chime in for a second oh, on that? Paul, go right ahead. You can Thanks. chime in at any time, Paul. Oh, cool. Um, I was just going to to ask, like, are there not accounts of people uh, being hybridized with uh with Nordics, for example, I, I I would agree that it's all grays, but uh, I, I think there's at least some some data there, right? No, there totally is. I just mean like, what is the uh, uh, what is the the push behind the negative NHI fa NHI faction? Like, what is it they're pushing in terms of the hybrid breeding program? And it seems to be grays primarily. So when I, when I say like, why aren't we being hybridized with the Nordics, for example? Uh, I'm talking about like uh, their particular agenda. Now, if you look historically, as I mentioned. Earlier this evening, I mentioned even like Rosicrucian sources that talk about hybridization between humans and what they refer to as elementals, like sylphs, gnomes, salamanders, nymphs, and so on, which, interestingly enough, uh, if you look at the description of those beings, the gnomes are described as short little things, okay? The, the uh, salamanders are described as reptilian beings, and the nymphs and sylphs are described as basically human-looking Nordics. So, for some reason... Those descriptions match up. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions from that. But uh, yeah, but yeah, they, they do they do talk about humans interbreeding with Nordics, and and I do, do think a lot more of that is going on of like actual interbreeding between humanoids and humans than we think. Uh, and there are probably kids in school right now who have alien parents or have alien DNA, and they probably don't even know it because they're being raised as part of a human family. And um, Tom, forgive me if I've lost the, the thread here, but I, I was always under the impression that almost all of the greys were biological androids, genderless, not even like an anus or anything. Like how, how is something asexual being hybridized with us? Well, I think it's, I think it's because uh, greys... All right, so when I say like human-grey hybrids, I'm talking in a colloquial sense because if you want to be even more technically correct, I guess you could say we're human semi-mantis hybrids. You know, going back to the theory that greys are some sort of derivative of the mantid DNA, you know, modified with perhaps human DNA, for all I know. So when you talk about these generalist androgynous greys, I think those are a particular genetic creation or derivative. And that genetic base, or the genetic base that they derive from, it's that base that I think uh, is like the, the arch archetypal grey, not the drone grey, but the archetypal grey that, that humans are being hybridized with. So, but then again, you know, I mean, they have the ability to select what genes they want, you know, or what epigenetic expression they want in these offspring. So if they need a human being that isn't, you know, that, that has private parts that can eat and reproduce like normal, then they can do that if they want to. Because, I mean, they seem to have a lot of abilities on, on the genetic front. And Tom, Tom, I've always wondered this. First of all, thank you. That's fascinating. So there's at least like two kind of fundamental different types of greys, one more like biological android, a drone, and then another one that's m more of a being. Um, w when, oh my goodness, I almost, I almost lost my thread here. Give me a second. Um, oh yeah, when it comes to the mantids, uh, there, there was a time on Earth, I, I mean, I think way like pre-dinosaur or maybe, yeah, like, I don't know, let's say 200, 300 million years ago, the oxygen level was like 34%, and it's believed beings like dragonflies were the size of um, small helicopters, maybe, or, or at least like drone size. Um, is it possible that there was some sort of evolutionary advancement or even tampering or manipulation? Those larger insects that had a, a nervous system that was really advanced, and then they, they had an accelerated development, and they're actually smarter than us and, and, and running things from, from Earth times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's, it's not something that you can discount, because like what, what evidence do you even discount that with? It's, it's plausible, it's just, that, it's just that it's one of the many hypotheses that we have on the table. You know? So it's not like we, can, we can't discount it, but we can't also necessarily prove it as the only hypothesis. Um, but I would say that I would say that I, that when, when these beings, let's say, when they evolve, I don't think it's necessary that they would have to evolve in a humanoid direction. Because if we look at, uh, like, an octopus, for example, an octopus compared to certain life forms is actually very advanced. 
Like it's it's incredibly advanced. It's probably even not even from Earth. You know, it could have been some animal transported here from from some other world. But that's an example of an intelligent being that isn't necessarily humanoid. So the fact that it seems to be that we're dealing with humanoid greys, humanoid Nordics, of course, and reptilians and mantids and such, I think it's more likely that they were in some way either derived from human DNA, like something else combined with human DNA, or humans and, and them are derived from some other you know, primordial DNA template. And, and I, I finally remembered my thread. It's about DNA. Considering that they, they have like amazing computational capacity, I'm always confused why many of the abduction experiences uh, include rape when they can like probably build the DNA chain like base pair by base pair with a computer or whatever they use. Is there something about the actual act of, of sex that's required to maybe form a soul? Do you have any idea why, why sex is actually happening? Uh, well, on a side note relating to that earlier when I mentioned the Rosicrucian belief in elementals, well, if you go to the source material on that, this book called the, um, it's called the, the Comte de Gabali, uh, G-A-B-A-L-I-S. Anyway, so in that book, it, it talks about the idea that these sylphs or elementals, that they don't really have uh, a permanent soul, like they don't really have a soul, but they can gain one by intermarrying and presumably interbreeding with a human. So that idea is sort of already formed in uh, lore going back at least to the 1600s, because this book was this book was published in 1670, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that that idea was out there. And as far as like aliens nowadays, well, the whole sexual component usually usually you find it's not well. I don't I don't think anyone has had sex necessarily with a drone, Gray, because that'd be gross and physically impossible. <laughs> but uh, but you know some of these more humanoid gray hybrids especially the hybrids yeah you, you you probably find that in there in these in these uh experiences but as to why that is i think partly it's um i think it's a number of reasons partly i think it's just degradation because some of these beings are kind of sadistic and they engage in that stuff partly i think it's for hybridization experiments and partly it's possibly uh energy feeding as well Th thank you so much tom so, Tom, we'll get to another one of these questions, and then maybe I'll just go every other question uh, to a hand. So these people have been very, very patient. And uh, I, th I see you, sir, Captain. I understand you probably don't have a hand to raise, and you're on a PC. So we'll go with um, these. And there might be a little overlap here, Tom, but um, these questions... Um, They've been asked, so I'd like to try to get to some of them. Um, these medical experiments and the breeding is for our own good. These beings are of such a high consciousness, we cannot understand them any more than our dog can understand when we take them to the vet. And so we might be perceiving these things as nefarious when they're really not. In my book, Discerning Alien Disinformation, I think that's one of the, that's one of the disinf disinfo points that I analyze as an example. And so, yeah, it's, it's totally true that if you take a dog to a vet, they're not going to understand what's going on, and therefore what they think is a terrifying experience is ultimately good for them. See, but here's the thing. Um, how do you distinguish between a dog being taken to the vet and a dog being taken, let's say, to a dog fight and comes back all bruised up and bloodied, right? Well, there's a difference in the end effect and a difference in the ultimate, uh, the, the intentionality behind what's being done during abduction. So you can tell a lot from it. So if a person is being abducted and they come back from it with, uh, well, they come back with a different mindset about things that doesn't accord with logic, critical thinking, or truth, then they've been mind controlled. And why would these higher beings engage in mind control that, um, that basically dissuades a person from being more critical in their thinking, from doing more research, from thinking more clearly? Well, clearly I think it's because these entities that are doing it are, are malicious. You know, they're, they're malevolent. Now, I do agree, though, that the actual alien mind is very difficult for us to comprehend and that a lot of what we see in encounter experiences or even abductions is sort of a, a mask that they put on, uh, a personality mask that they put on in order to, to be able to interact with us in the first place. Okay, But the, the very fact that they use these masks and what those masks do and their effects upon us, uh, the effects upon humanity and so on, there's just too much nefariousness about it. And not only that, but we have reports of aliens 
fingering or pointing blame at other aliens for trying to deceive humanity and take it over. So, so if it's all, and uh, uh, if it's all like some higher consciousness agenda, why would the higher consciousness blame its own self and its own agents as being nefarious deceivers? Right? It doesn't make sense. So uh, clearly, there are positive forces there that that are aware of something going on, and it's it's more down to earth and more grounded than some impossible nebulous situation. Uh, what about just real quick? What about um positive? What do you make of people that claim to have had positive reactions or, or do come out the other side uh, of, of a contact experience or even an abduction, uh, you know, in a, in a better place? What do you make of those folks? Well, I think one example we can point to is Whitley Strieber, because in his book, uh, I think it was especially like Transformation, for example, he tries to, he tries to paint his, his terrifying gray abductions as a kind of spiritual initiation. Um, that they were training him uh, basically to elevate his consciousness and to get over the fear and, and to confront uh, an, an ineffable mystery by almost like transcending his own ego and, and all this like, like, like psychology talk. Uh, my view on that is if you compare these cases with alleged, I mean, if you're, if you're being very picky about it, with alleged cases of actual, genuine, benevolent, positive contacts, then you've got a frame of reference to judge it by, and then you see that it's just a bunch of hogwash, and it's it's baloney. That that it's a rationalization of of a negative phenomenon. See, because here's the thing: like every one of us has the capacity for objective intuition if we hone it enough, and if we pay attention to it, and if we and if we don't confuse it with wishful thinking. And in the presence of let's say uh, a dark entity, whether like a demon or someone who is shadowed by a dark entity, or someone who's like secretly, uh, uh, you know, like a pedo, or, you know, just something like, like, like a dark energy. Well, babies can sense it a lot of times. Animals can sense it, but people usually can't because they've kind of abandoned the, the connection to their inner divine intuition, right? But if you're in touch with that, you can sense easily when uh, an entity that isn't trying very hard to project a benevolent front is actually dark underneath, and you will feel a revulsion and I'm talking here, for example, Whitley Strieber's um, experiences. Because in those experiences, yeah, the Greys were doing typical Grey stuff. And he was terrified by it, and it was actually quite revolting. But they managed to convince him that it was for his own good, you know, that it was, that it was beneficial. And we find that in a lot of contact or abduction reports where the abductee or contactee picks up on something suspicious. They pick up on something being wrong. You know, their intuition alarm bells are going off, and logically it's not fitting either. But the entities then pull one over on them through, let's say, uh, a telepathic induction of uh, some sort of an endorphin dump that makes them feel all warm and gooey on the inside. So all of a sudden they feel like, oh, but then I was immersed in this energy of love and light, and, and I was at peace again, and I trusted them again. Well, yeah, they might as well dumped you know morphine into your blood in terms of uh, the effects of it, the artificiality of it. So... If we talk about positive cases, it's not how the abductee felt. It's not um, even that they survived it or that they gotten certain experiences from it, like healing or psychic gifts. It's ultimately about whether or not the abductee increased in their knowledge of the phenomenon, like objectively, whether their discernment increased, whether uh, it, ha it has a positive ultimate end effect on humanity and humanity's self-determination, right? So all the other tricks don't count for it. And, uh, we have to look at the ultimate end effects and wh whom it ultimately benefits. Thank you. Is that good, Tom? Uh, Paul, you got your answer there? Um, yeah, well, and for the record, do, Tom, do you believe in like a po any positive uh, contact? I missed a lot of the earlier interview. Sorry if you already covered this, but like, it, do you think that any people are having any positive experiences with NHI and so forth? If we could just, because uh, Paul, I'm going to interrupt just because I'm going to actually kind of piggyback on your question. Number one, um, do you is it, are you talking about abductions, Paul, or just contact, or or do you want to clarify that? Um, no, I was being super general. Like even a, a yes or no would suffice. Just in general, contact. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead then quickly, Tom. Okay, yeah, quickly. Uh, I would say yes, and there's a number of sources that you can look into that I think exemplify the more genuine positive contacts. Um, and by studying those, you kind of get perspective on the more uh, negative or the more like fake imposter type uh, encounters. Yeah. And then kind of going with Paul's question too, um, 
if we just look at abductions in general, just the word abducted, you know, it's been really watered down into uh, experiencer or contactee or what have you. Um, if we just look at that word abducted or just even look further into what's actually happening is we have human beings getting taken out of their beds at night um, without question. And it's there's also children involved. Actually, most of us start out as children. Um, and it's, I would say, you know, if something just snatches you out of your bed at night, initially it's going to be against your will. Now, if you're later on, um, uh, giving your permission and thinking it's fine and you're going along with it, great. But at least that first abduction, especially as a child is going to be against our will. And so on the other hand, we have 85% or so of abductees, actually re either initially reporting a, as a positive experience or later on, uh, like Whitley Stryber did, kind of uh, being able to pick out uh, something positive such as, you know, higher psychic gifts or a healing or um, some type of positive spiritual experience. And so you have 85% of abductees reporting a positive experience. Now, if these were human beings snatching our children or us out of our beds, there would be zero positive experiences. So how do we reconcile that 85% of abductees report a positive experience? See, well, here's the thing, though. If humans were snatching us out of our beds, not only would it not be 85%, but those humans would lack the ability to, let's say, impose screen memories or you know, telepathic influences in order to shield the true nature of what's going on during the experience. Like if we're just talking about child kidnappers or something, right? And so when it comes to 85% or 70% or whatever the figure is, I've read different studies on that. As you, as you pointed out in one of your replies on X, even the remaining 15 or 30% negative is a big problem. And we, we can't deny that. So any, any report that's more than you know some outlier percentage of just a couple point something percent, anything more than that is an issue that we have to deal with. But more importantly, though, the question is, on what basis are they saying it is positive? Like, on what criteria? Like, is it is it that they feel good about it, that they had, you know, a couple of gifts or something like that, that they have nice memories of it, that they didn't get eaten? <laughs> I mean, this all ignores the phenomenon of screen memories, telepathic influencing, being remembered only what you're allowed to remember, or thought insemination, you know, where they put thoughts into your mind, and especially, and this is a key one, the disparity or incongruence between what you remember of an experience and the actual after effects, the little clues that indicate something else was done. Because if you think about it, let's say someone gets taken by uh, a military project, like, right? so like, like a military abductee. And not, not even through any fancy black helicopters or anything, but just like the old school van taken to a base somewhere. And they get sat down in a chair, pumped up full of drugs and given hypnotic programming. And they're made to believe afterwards that they had a wonderful experience. You know, they're on this magical adventure with whatever beings. But really what happened was they're pumped full of drugs and mind controlled. So that's technically feasible. And if humans can do it through that method then why couldn't aliens also do it through their even more advanced abilities, you know, whether technology or psychic powers or whatever? And in fact, we do know from abduction accounts that screen memories are used. Um, and a lot of times you can peel back the screen memories to uncover increasingly terrifying details about what actually happened. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no positive contacts. It just means that some of the things that people do believe are positive may not be, especially if especially if uh, a system of, of discerning criteria was not used to, to really look at it. So, so instead of simply asking these people, hey, you know, was your encounter positive? You, should have to go, you have to go way deeper than that. What you should do is you should score each case on a checklist of red flags and green flags. You should look for incongruency between what an abductee or contactee remembers and the after effects, as I mentioned. You should probably give a disinformation score to anything that the entity said to the person. And you should look for any ulterior motives or logical fallacies in that message. And so based on all of that, then, then you can calculate your percentage of what encounters are actually positive. So the only thing that this study or this, these statistics really say is that this is what people believe. And if you think about it, 
that's a problem because if let's say only 10 or 20 percent are positive but 85 percent people think it's positive what does that say about the future of humanity and our ability to discern what forces are positive or negative when they do finally show up one day yeah good points um we do have a couple of hands up. Um, let me get to one hand, and then we'll go back to the list, and we're just going to try to get to as much as we can uh, while respecting Tom's time. He's already been extremely generous with us tonight. Uh, Tom, anytime you need to pull this plug, please feel free. I want you to come back. So I hope you've had a good experience, and I don't want to keep you any longer than you really want to be here, so please just jump in and just say that you've got to go whenever that happens. Um Let's see. I don't know who was first, y'all. So we're just going to go in the order that you're on my screen. And isn't it lovely? Welcome to the space. Um, right now for tonight's space, we are going to be sticking with just questions for Tom. Um, if you just have an experience or story or something you want to share, um, we can do that on our Wednesday night space. So if you have a question for Tom, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have an experience, but I'll wait until later in the week to uh, share that. Um, <clears throat> Tom, my, my question for you, um, and I think you kind of already answered this, giving your opinion on like where extraterrestrial morality lies, um, is that I don't know if you've like ever looked into like a Braxian philosophy and gotten into like the ideas of like Carl Jung, but um, there's like this idea of a Braxis, so like this god who sits above all that's like entirely neutral, um, and that he's not, say, kind of aligned with our morality because morality is kind of a perception of human consciousness and it's something that like is unique to us. Um, and so my question for you is that, do you think that even in like stereotypically, let's like, say like evil entities to so say like reptilians or like mantoids or greys that there do exist like um, outliers in those civilizations who do have good intentions? Or do you think it's kind of like more so that they're all, universally like aligned in, in one thing and like going going along with that um there was this idea that i recently came upon that um grays and reptilians themselves are like fourth dimensional entities who are trapped on the fourth dimension because they have become too closely aligned with their technology and have lost their connection to the original source um so they themselves are actually facing sort of this like apocalyptic scenario where if they don't figure out some way how to like um, elevate themselves that they will become trapped permanently in the fourth dimension and like face destruction because of that. Um, so I know that those were two questions, but I was just interested in your thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So your first question was about, uh, wait, what was it again? Sorry. I had it written down, but I can't read my note. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my first question was about, do you think that um, there exists entities oh, yeah. within these civilizations who are outliers and actually do want to have like good intentions and see positive outcomes for humanity? Right. Uh, I think that would depend on how much consciousness and free will they actually have. So if you have something like, a, like, a, like, a, mm, like an artificial being, for example, that doesn't have a spirit of any sort, then there would be no possibility of it to deviate from its programming because that's what spirit ultimately is. It's, a, it's something that can go against determinism and programming and can always be a source of novelty and unexpectedness, right? So if you don't have the, this, this spark within you, then you're not going to even be able to choose necessarily. You're going to be a, a product of your programming and your environment and your, and your genetics. So if we have, okay, let, let's assume, okay, let's consider like uh, reptilians, for example. If there are different reptilian types, and they are sentient, and they're not just, let's say, clones or something fully artificial, then yes, in theory, they might have their own, there might be some that have their own point of view that might disagree with it. But the problem, though, the problem with that is if they're too small in number and they're too scattered about the reptilian hierarchy, then they can't do anything about it. You know, they'd, they'd have to respect the overriding negative alien agenda regardless of their personal views. So I guess for us, it wouldn't matter too much. I mean, I suppose if they were clever enough, they could. It's kind of like in um, the V miniseries, right? The V miniseries, both from 2009 and also from the early 80s, where it was depicted that there was like a fifth column of reptilians. And they were trying to help humanity, but they had to be extremely careful about it. So I think that's sort of like a Hollywood depiction of how it would occur in real life where 
they're within a telepathic control system where pretty much all their thoughts are monitored. So they'd have to be extremely discreet. And I don't know what they would do. For all I know, they would try to warn humanity in, in very subtle ways, sort of like um, um, the way the allies of humanity channelings are claimed to have originated. Like, like this really small alien group that says, oh, you know, we've, we've watched your world. We see what's going on. And so here's what's going on. Well, maybe something like that. But ultimately, I don't think they would have much organizational power to really do anything about it other than sneak some information out here or there. So that was your first question. Uh, your second question was um, whether greys and reptilians could be trapped in the fourth dimension or fourth density and that they need to do something or else uh, they get trapped there permanently. Well, I think that also ties into the idea of time travel. So let's say that there are different probable futures and those probable futures stem from uh, the current time timeline that we're on, right? So this current timeline that we're on with all our billions of humans and all of our conscious energy, that energy is being projected into the future into different probable futures. So this one gets maybe 30% of it, another one gets 50% of it, and the other one gets the remaining 20% of it. Well, if one of those futures starts getting its energy supply or its uh, validation cut off from the present moment, then it too would be diminishing. Like it would, it would lose its... Um, it would lose its its status or its uh, business model, you know, as a successful business operation as far as like the greater creation is concerned. And then therefore, maybe, maybe that probable future would be subject to entropic catastrophes, things just breaking down more and more and more. And it kind of reminds me of that movie, uh, what was it, that movie from the 80s called Millennium about people from the future where due to some sort of time travel, timeline cataclysms, their future is falling apart. And they have to figure out how to go back in time, take humans from our timeline, and then go off to another timeline to kind of rebuild their world. I think it's a theme sort of like that. But specifically what you're talking about, mm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there, there's too much weight behind that. So I'll, uh, I'll reserve my opinion on that particular possibility. Mm -hmm. Th th thank you so much, Tom. Uh, the reason why I asked that question specifically was I've been working through this book um, called uh, Bringers of the Dawn, Messages from the Plea uh, Pleiadians. Um, and there is a chapter in there that talks about the collapse of the fourth density um, for one reason or another. I, I guess that it's determined that that density is no longer needed. And so the beings that sort of like operate on that plane are in like this apocalyptic scenario. Um, but I do appreciate your perspective because it's given me kind of like a contrarian view on that to challenge it a little bit. So thank you. Sure thing. Okay, let me get to a list question, and then we'll get to the uh, the next hand that's up. Um, and there's a couple variations on this one. And there's a couple things here. Let's see, the frequency of the Earth is raising, so these lower negative vibration creatures cannot survive. Another variation on this is the white hats have kicked out all of the grays involved in abduction, so that is no longer happening. What do you think about that? I mean, as far as I know from people in the abduction and contact field, their activities are still ongoing. Like it hasn't changed as much as you would expect if that were true, you know? But here's the thing, you know, there's a difference between, well, okay, so so let, let's say that it is inevitable that these negative forces fail, right? So let, let's say it's 100% probability that they're not going to succeed in their plan to assimilate us into some Borg-like alien empire, right? Well, if it's inevitable, then in a sense, it has already happened, and it's already happening now because you know the show is pretty much over already. Uh, and I think that's the only way to rationalize that viewpoint. You know, the, the idea that they're not going to win, so they're not winning now, so they might as well have already lost. But as far as the idea that they have all been kicked out of Earth, I don't, I don't see like nothing really correlates with that in my experience or anyone else I know. Okay, thanks. Um, Star Captain, I do see you. Um, let's go to Hollow. What is this? Hollow Cipher. Hollow Cipher, welcome to the space. Do you have a question for Tom? I do. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we got you. Excellent. Thank you for hosting Fringe and Ulrich. Um, perhaps not in such a linear fashion as a typical question, but having the amount of time I've had on hold, I've probably made it more complicated. But uh, I've formed it into a bit of a riddle, and perhaps it will parlay or areas of significance because I kind of want to draw us we're coming to close and I feel like we should try to pull some strings together get the spider web center the nexus just get to the heart of everything get to the center and uh, so here's the riddle what does the temple mount in Jerusalem one the Mayan long count two 
the Schumann Resonance and Geomagnetic Field, 3, and UAP UFO Propulsion, 4, and Consciousness, 5, all tie together. How can we bring this all together to make some sense out of all this? And I'll throw it to you, Tom, if you want to hear my thoughts. Okay, well, he might be gone. So I'll go ahead and take a punt on this. I really haven't thought about how all these things are connected. However, however, uh, the whole Temple Mount thing, I mean, that, that only has major significance because of religion and competing religions, actually. So you have to, you have to ask yourself, what, what are the origins of religion? To what degree has it been manipulated? By what forces and towards what ends? And I do think that any sort of conflict that comes out of it, for example, um, Israel, Iran wars, things like that, not to get too much into politics, but things that are coming up, it could spiral into a World War III scenario, which then would give rise to certain events that would be interpreted from a biblical perspective as a fulfillment of end times prophecies. All right? So we got that. We've got the Mayan long count calendar. Well, the Mayan long count calendar, it started, uh, if I remember correctly, 3114 BC, August 12th or 13th or 14th, something like that. And that was during that was not too long after one of those major flood like cataclysms during ancient times when some of these advanced survivors uh, not necessarily atlanteans but similar groups they went around the world and they seeded civilizations to restart it one of them went over to mesoamerica and uh the whole like quetzalcoatl legend of the white bearded god with who taught mathematics and agriculture and all that so that's that time period that's where their mayan long count comes from and the Mayan long count ended, or ended presumably back in 2012. But you see, according to the Mayans, the Mayan long count calendar it was just really a bookkeeping device for events. It wasn't, it wasn't like a like a synchronistic calendar like the uh, uh, what was it called the uh, Zulkin 52 year calendar or 52 days. I forget exactly how it works. But anyway, point is, I don't think there's too much significance to the Mayan long count calendar ending. However, I think its beginning is more significant than its end. Because the beginning is, uh, it involves higher forces kind of reworking civilization after a cataclysm. And I think that that then pertains to a similar pattern that could happen in our future if we start going down that path. See, the third one, I forgot what you said, and the fourth one was UFO and UAP propulsion and how that ties into it. Well, you know, during the Crusades, the Knights Templars were digging under the Temple Mount. And supposedly they found lost technology and lost knowledge. And they brought it back to Europe, and that's where you had things like uh, the building of the cathedrals using architectural knowledge that didn't exist prior that, to that time, and other things like alchemical production of the stained glass windows and so on. So the certain technology that, technologies that they found under the Temple Mount, uh, which relates, I think, ultimately back to ancient secret societies that probably had alien technology in their possession. And uh, this ties into something I talk about in my book called Gnosis where I get into the role that ancient alien technology seems to have played in human history, including things like the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail, right? Uh, and, and so these technologies, uh, it seems to me that they were abused during ancient times in such a way that it altered the trajectory of history, leading to certain events that are culminating nowadays in everything that we're seeing. You know, everything to do with religion, with the conflicts in the Middle East, with the different secret societies that seem to be pulling the strings nowadays. I think that they're working on agendas that go back thousands and thousands of years that ultimately filter upwards to alien agendas. So it's a, it's a big loop, and I think it's all tied together towards these higher beings and the things that they do to humanity during or prior to, during, and after cataclysm periods. So that's my best answer to <laughs> this little riddle of clues. Do you mind if I just throw in a couple two cents on that? Sure. Um, Basically, what I'd come to is a, uh, I'm about 20 years knee deep into this, and it would appear as though where a lot of emphasis has been put on, yes, the start date and the end date, what has been very well overlooked, it's kind of hilarious, is that no one actually knows what those numbers in the long count are actually designated for other than their hieroglyphics, such as the head glyphs that have been kind of been hacked at over the last hundred or so years, but I found something very interesting that there are subharmonics that were being discussed a hundred years ago between these sort of founding fathers of Mayanology, where one group of, say, a high uh, prestigiously trained astrophysicist 
by the name of Ludendorff. He's actually buddies with Einstein. He actually discovered Mayan counting rhythms within the actual long count. So let's say they're the gears to the transmission and found out that they correlated with these complex synodic beat patterns of planetary alignments, conjunctions, oppositions. And the other guys were like Goodman Martinez Thompson, who is the correlation sort of uh, the professorial effort behind that correlation. And they were at odds with Spindin and Ludendorff for suggesting that the mathematics in the Maya long count could be this advanced because it would rival the Greeks. And they did not like that, let alone getting further down the, the sort of uh, rabbit hole, which is that when you look at planetary rhythms, they in the literature actually have another name for this. It's called planetary gravitational frequencies. And that's where things get interesting because we know there's a musical relationship between the planets. And it turns out there's something also interesting behind dark matter, dark energy, which is that we have this discrepancy in space. And there is this one little question. I'm a little bit of a, a troublemaker, but uh, I saw Nick Pope at a, a recent event and I kind of, uh, I had to ask, I had to ask what the UK defense knew about Potkletnov's work going back to the 90s, because some of the more recent papers by Potkletnov shows that gravity may be traveling at 64 times the speed of light. You know, any one of you could go with your GPT model and ask, try to get it to do a hypothetical for you of what's going to happen when gravity actually turns out to be faster than the speed of light. Well, it turns out you don't need dark matter anymore. What we need is to put consciousness back into the fold. And rather than calling it dark because it's invisible, let's call it some kind of eternal light from centers within these quantum manifolds. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a, that's that's a my, good point. Mm -hmm. That's my take and my kind of what I've actually, the Temple Mount for me wasn't so much political. It was getting into the mathematics in order to design that temple actually had encoded within it some of these cycle counts for whatever reason why would they be tracking complex solar magnetic fields i'll leave that to you guys to ponder Hello, sorry for yeah, the time and thanks for sharing sorry tom i didn't mean to talk over you go go ahead i wanted to sort of riff on on both of you and take a crack at at that uh that question as well okay yeah i was just gonna say like yeah you should uh write a thread on it or an article or something and put it out and let people take a look at it sounds interesting um, Hello, Cipher. Do you mind uh, just really quickly? Is it four or five? Those bulleted, those bulleted ones. Yeah, it's um, UAP was number four. Number five was uh, basically consciousness and how that interrelates to the Schumann resonance, the geomagnetic field, which of course we know is being puppeted by the solar dynamo. And of course, planetary alignments, a lot of people don't know this, it actually pulls and oblate, it actually stretches the interior of the sun's core. And this has been noticed by recent satellites. So anyways, back to you. Um, you, you guys know the first two. Yeah, the, the, the first you know. two is actually the ones I was, I was struggling with. Uh, it's the Temple Mount, um, which is a, a, a pyramid. Yeah, and the long count, yep. And, and then the Mayan long count calendar. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, I think, the the unifying theme for for anybody who's a little bit familiar with um chan thomas's at the adam and eve story the unsanitized one might actually be in 1993 released there's a page in there uh in the very last one that talks about from chan thomas's view one thing he finds across religions is not just of course a flood myth and an origin creation myth but actually a, a myth around UFOs picking people up right around a cataclysm and that he claims that this is so ubiquitous everywhere. Um, what I honestly find ties these, these aspects together is the concept of sort of go back and get it that there's um, that the idea, the, the very provocative idea that we may have that, that if you take a look at humanity and you accept the carbon dating of Homo sapiens sapiens were around roughly 200 to 330,000 years. Um, you end up with a few really provocative ideas if you just combine three. One is there's actually not that much that would remain from our current civilization if we had cataclysmic cycles, six to 7,000 years. Um, our skyscrapers, our cars, our hard drives, absolutely everything would be gone. 
uh, after just two or three thousand years, human skeleton will live around a thousand. Um, so one is the compelling idea that we may actually reach higher and higher evolutionary development in terms of higher complexity, higher longevity. The further back we go in human cataclysmic history and find civilizations, um, the, there's a lot of evidence to su suggest this, or at least some evidence to suggest this, um, so that there's interventional devolution of our capacities, uh, an intentional lowering, meaning what is the best, what, what are some of the best ways, best meaning effective ways to thwart uh, a, a society or a people or a being, uh, to thwart its self-determination, its own agency. I'll let you read it. Ugh. Right. And, and, and so w when you think about it that way, especially when you hear Tom talk about some of these sciences oh, that are developing. Did you write down who else? Well, well, a piece of paper. Kyle, I, have a, I, don't, I don't know if you're muted. If you're, uh, I, don't know. I asked him, I was like, hey, who authorized that? I was like. Um, so what I'm saying is there may be something in our history uh, that is a key to our technological advancement. So I think part of a key to why we're, we still, or at least I I feel we might be enslaved, and this is a new idea for me, is um, an interventional amnesia of sorts, be it us not remembering our past lives or our technology actually being hidden in the harmonics, in these special frequencies, be they 432, these numbers that keep on showing up. 440, I think, is the number of, of minutes in a week or something, the, if you watch Randall Carlson. And we have a, a special interaction that unites all four of these, uh, and that would be the Gateway Papers, um, the Aurora Borealis, and the UAP technology itself, part of pulling zero-point energy out of the ether, may relate, as, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, uh, to the stacking and the uh, harmonic resonance of different media of frequency to achieve an amplitude that is normally not possible uh, to, to maybe even uh, overwhelm the Planck scale or the Planck length of the intersection, um, having electromagnetic waves intersect magnetic waves at a 90 degree angle for electric flux. The stacking of these things just through resonance, just through alignment, they actually connect to the, the temple of the mound because everything relates to the radius of the object itself. So just like the gateway papers need to be harmonically resonant with the sound um, cavity of the body from the sound waves of the heart as they stack on the electromagnetic waves, uh, magnetic waves of the heart as they stack on the electromagnetic waves of the brain, they must also harmonically resonate with the Schumann resonance. And just as the science is on the edge of being understood but not fully for UAP, so is the electromagnetic cycle and the geophysics of Earth that may cause these cataclysms and unlock the crust from the mantle, which has huge existential ramifications. And it seems like we've achieved this knowledge several times and it's been suppressed. So, so I, I, feel, uh, I feel this is really important actually for us to, to figure this out. And I feel it's very dangerous if we sort of self-internalize this unworthiness that we should not be technological. I think, I, I think we should focus on raising our morality rather than questioning whether we're worthy of the technology that we depend on in order to become better people. That's just my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really well said. I mean, thanks for sharing that. I do agree, yeah. I do agree with, uh, with a lot of what you said because, see, the, the thing is, it's not, it's not technology itself that is that is the problem. It's the type of technology and how it's used. Okay. And I'm sure most people will agree with that because, because currently we're dealing with this transhumanist cult that wants us to use, uh, I, I would say poisoned technology. And actually, if you trace this poison technology, like where, where does all this transhumanist stuff come from nowadays? Uh, you can trace a lot of it back to the invention of the transistor in 1947, just a few months after Roswell, you know, they're trying to crack, how to create this transistor technology and they just couldn't get it but it wasn't until until shortly after roswell that oh yeah all of a sudden they demonstrated the first point contact transistor and now your phones and your computers and the, all the computers that run the surveillance digital system hey we all they'll run on billions and billions and trillions of transistors okay so this technology that we are being enslaved by uh that we're being spiritually challenged by it's a particular type of technology it's a particular type of technology that is handicapped 
or cut off from a whole other field of science that is like almost like a metaphysical or magical or some sort of higher hyperdimensional science that has been purposely, I would say purposely and maliciously kept out of public knowledge. And we know that the ancients have had it. I mean, that's why nowadays people cannot, well, mainstream people cannot decode the purpose of the function or the, the construction of the Great Pyramid. Why? Because it's trying to be done from standard scientific and engineering knowledge, which is not at all what was used back then. It's a whole different field. And so people nowadays, they, they think that technological advancement means, um, you know, having even faster computers, having even faster electrical signals and, and going more in the direction that we've already been going. Then what if, what if that's a false path? What if that's a dead end path that was flawed from the very beginning, the very inception of it, right? What if there was a parallel path that even, even if in the parallel path you're, let's say, centuries of development behind where we are right now in terms of just the amount of sophistication that goes into it, it is still way more powerful than anything we have nowadays. Like nowadays, you can take the biggest crane or truck and you can barely lift some of these ancient megalithic stones that they seem to have moved with ease, right? So they were using a different science, a different physics to do it with. They weren't just using huger and huger trucks or cranes and bigger and bigger ropes. No, they were using... Uh, probably some sort of a scalar, longitudinal, gravitational, etheric, some some sort of frequency thing like you were talking about. And uh, our understanding that is the key to solving so much of the scarcity that is leading to our dependence on the control system, you know, by which we are ultimately spiritually enslaved. You know, the, the fact that we have the life that we do with the amount of compromises that we have to make and the amount of stress that we're pouring outwards, all the, the loose that we're generating... Uh, a lot of it does come down to us working with poisoned or handicapped technology. Now, of course, you know if you if you had higher technology that solved a lot of these issues, that's way not at all a guarantee of spiritual evolution. In fact, if you don't accompany this revolution of science with also a spiritual and ethical and religious revolution, like towards a higher, purer form of it, then we're probably going to repeat the myths of Atlantis, where they had all these powers, but they abused it and and ultimately, it led to their destruction. So, uh, I totally agree with you, and I do think we need technology, but of course, technology is not the only kind, or the, not the only thing we need. We also need a spiritual empowerment, and further than that, we also need the right kind of technology, the kind that's been hidden to us since at least the 1800s. And, and Tom, what do you feel is the, the most effective way to, to recover uh, this, this lost technology? Uh, I would say uh, you start with all the fringe alternative suppressed inventions that are out there. And you can go to like rexresearch.com, for example, and they've got a whole list of different weird oddities that uh, most of them just got memory hold. You know, Some of these people, some of these inventors, they got bought out by the government and silenced or killed off or whatever. So there's, there's this whole like field of suppressed inventions where if you look at them, you study them, you start re realizing that they're operating by a different kind of science that's not the science that we know. But because they are relatively documented, you can start to piece together what that, that technology is. And then you can start doing experiments, you know, and then you can start uh, approaching it from that angle. But then you can also come at it from the other angle, which is doing more research into parapsychology and psychic powers and figuring out subtle energies, studying esotericism and mysticism of the ancients and uh, figuring out how they knew it from their angle, right? So you take that and you combine it with this new science that you can sort of deduce from these fringe and suppressed inventions, and maybe then that will, that will lead to a synthesis that is exactly what you're looking for. Thank you so much both for that question, and Star Captain, thanks for being patient. I, I was dying to ask it. Did you have a follow-up on that um, topic? I, I did, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, kind of to piggyback off of what everyone uh, was talking about with like uh, information and like technology, um, do you think that there might be an element um, where some of this knowledge has been like left behind or given to us and it's encoded within our DNA um, and some people are able to access this like kind of divine knowledge that is like so much more advanced than what we currently have? Um, because if I'm sure you, I'm sure you've heard of this, but um, there's some very interesting parts about our DNA that there's this idea that it's like elevating and changing to like its original 12th sequence. And I'm wondering if almost there's like a, if you believe that there could be a potentiality that some people have this advanced DNA already like pre-awakened within them and they're able to access this knowledge from like our maybe our creators or other uh, heightened races. 
Yeah, well, it brings up the question, is it in the DNA or is it in the soul? Because let's say that person didn't incarnate into that body, all right? So, but someone else did and they had a totally different agenda. Would they still be able to recover that information? Um, and as far as it, it being encoded in the DNA, well, uh, one of the things that comes to mind, for example, was the, uh, some of the biblical lore surrounding what tribes could even touch the Ark of the Covenant and operate it. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a tribe of, it was uh, the Levites who were able to operate the Ark of the Covenant. And if some other person tried to operate it, they would get zapped or you know, they would get sick or something because they just weren't able to, to operate it. So maybe there is certain knowledge or technology that is associated with certain DNA. I mean, there's no way I can deny that. However, at the same time, let's say you were one of these ancient um, megalith builders or one of the operators or of the Ark of the Covenant or something. And let's say that reincarnation is real and you're alive nowadays. Well, if you were to search your, your deepest soul memory banks, maybe you'd be able to recover some of that technology, some of that knowledge that you had for back then. And in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be written in the DNA. So whether it's in the DNA or in the soul, uh, maybe it depends on the case, but I would think that primarily it would be in the soul, you know, the soul that you came here with. And, and in some cases it could even be both, you know, like what if it requires a certain soul to be born into a certain body and maybe there is a correlation between the bloodline and the DNA and the particular consciousness that chooses to incarnate into it. But you know, a lot, a lot of families, they might have a couple advanced souls, but the same genetics also has that one black sheep of the family that you know seems to have fallen off the turnip truck or something. So maybe genetics isn't everything. Maybe it is about the soul. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Star Captain, I know you have been extremely patient, and I have one question ahead of you. I'm I apologize, but I have not forgotten about you. I see you here. Hopefully you're going, you're, you know, not at your bedtime or anything. Uh, this question um, is, what do you think about Chris Bledsoe? But I'm actually going to change that a little bit. I don't want to talk about Chris Bledsoe specifically. Um, I'd actually prefer to know uh, what you think and what your thoughts are about the entity he's dealing with and the motive of the entity he's dealing with. Yeah, so I was actually tr trying to watch more videos on Chris Bledsoe earlier tonight because I figured someone would ask about it. So it's kind of funny that you did. But the thing is, I didn't finish those videos. <laughs> so I can't go as far into depth into it as I want to. However, because it does bear some similarity to the, the Fatima um, event, right? Because it's some, it bears some experience uh, relation to that. I do think that I think I do think that we're looking at possibly ultra-terrestrial or, or even just plain old alien... Um, Manipulation of religious beliefs and perceptions. Any anytime someone consciously remembers uh, a, an encounter with aliens, you have to, or with other worldly beings, we, you have to kind of read between the lines, and you have to make sure that it's not like the entity maybe wanted this message to get out for a particular reason, but potentially deceptive, right? So um, you can imagine if Chris Bledsoe existed, let's say. 3,000 years ago, and he recounted a story, and you know it became a big phenomenon, and a religion came out of it. What would we think of it nowadays? Can you imagine all the millions of people that would be part of that belief system nowadays, all because of one entity contacted one guy, and and uh, you know seeded a particular storyline or narrative? So who's to say that something like that isn't being attempted nowadays, like with certain religions or whatever? Um, and so therefore, I would I would be I would be cautious with his case in particular, but. Um, I'm still researching and evaluating his particular case uh, specifically. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, I'll just, I think it's a deceptive entity just looking at the totality of the circumstances. I don't want to comment on Chris himself. He seems like a very kind and gentle soul. And by all accounts, the family is fantastic and uh, all of that. But commenting on the entity, I, I think the entity is pretty deceptive. Yeah, I will say um, one thing. Uh, I will say yeah. one thing. The, the part that I did see, he was talking about how some of his experiences, they would start out with seeing three orbs, for example, and him being led out one night at three in the morning. You know, the number three keeps coming up. And uh, as he was going outside, there were like three shadow entities behind him. And, you know, to me, that's sort of at odds with this lady being a supposedly divine like being and especially the language that she used as well. It's, it seems to play too much into um, a lot of our cultural and religious assumptions about the way things are. So it's like trying a bit too hard, 
And so I, I do think that there's some element of deception there. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 I guess it's up for us to make up our own minds about it. Yeah, for sure. And there's a bunch of stuff out there. I mean, even his own book talks about how uh, she, the lady, admits that she pretty much makes his life hell. And then, um, and I'm just going to be very lightly paraphrasing here, that she makes his life hell. And if he, you know, agrees to spread her message, then she's going to take care of him and his family. And so right there, I'm, I'm out. So, and I'm paraphrasing very lightly. Feel free to read the book on your own, make your own judgments. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, there is another question in the chat, which is, this wasn't a question. It was actually a comment and I'm, I'm going to ask the question. I'm star captain. If you can hear me, go ahead and drop out of the space and come back in and I will let you speak immediately upon your arrival. Um, what do you think about mantids in general? We kind of, we kind of went over the reptilian thing, but we'll just say, you know, these, this, these groups, we have the grays, we have the mantids, we have the tall grays, we have the reptilians. These are the four basic groups that most people, um, you know, talk about. And, uh, most of the other stuff I think is, you know, projection or, uh, what do you think about, uh, mantids in general, uh, benevolent or malevolent, and then do you think there might be any mantids on the moon? Hmm. I don't know about the moon specifically, but as far as mantids in general, I'm not a fan of them. And but I have seen a lot of uh, alien disinformation sources. Uh, one example being uh, Lissa Royale's book "Visitors from Within" and "Prism of Lyra," painting the mantises in a very positive light. Okay, saying that there are some beings they look sort of like insects and. They are our founders, you know, they're the creators of life around here. And you know what, you know what, maybe, maybe the mantids did have a hand in genetically engineering part of the human genome, okay? But that gives them no authority over our soul, over our spirit, and that doesn't mean that they're good. So uh, if we just look at their behaviors, they are very, they're, all the worst traits, like if you're into astrology, all the worst traits of Capricorn is what you would find in the mantids, like kind of stoic and capricious, well, that's, that's where the word capricious kind of comes from. But they're kind of, they're, they're kind of like a, like, like cranky control freak bosses in a way. <laughs> and if you get on their radar, they, they come at you pretty viciously, like, like killing family members and dogs and even you if, if, you know, if they could. So I wouldn't cross them if I, if I could, if I could avoid it. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of them. I don't think there's really any benevolent ones. I could be wrong, but. Not, not that I know of. And, and all, the benef all the benevolent claims that I have seen are from definite disinformation sources based on the other things that are in those sources. So, hey, if they're pitching for the mantids, then mantids are probably bad news. <laughs> okay, so in general, what would you say about, uh, you know, don't judge every mantid uh, by their race. Don't judge every reptilian by their race, et cetera, et cetera. I think we forget that. Um, well, you go ahead. What do you think about just that in general? Well, it definitely applies to humans just because we are so diverse and we're relatively on the fence as far as where we can go. So we're, we're in the middle ground, right? But what happens if you take something and you genetically engineer it or it genetically engineers itself to, to serve a very specific function? Like maybe it breeds out all of its own empathy capability or its ability to feel emotion or what if it uh, increases the, the – what, what if it values – psychopathy you know the the idea that you can be extremely vicious and cunning controlling and intelligent and they take that to a very high level over many many generations who know who knows how many thousands of years and then that end product is is very intentional in its design right so if you then at that point say well don't judge that product by its cover well you're assuming that that cover and that product is identical to humans and that you know they're just as free as we are to make our own choices well what if they're not uh, and i think that by the time you get to that level of power and intelligence and placement in the NHI hierarchy. I don't think there's as much free will left to be positive, but I'd love to be proven wrong. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Star Captain, there you are. Go right ahead. Uh, now I have a hand. Thank you. Um, so you, you, you call yourself a hyper-dimensional uh, counterintelligence, and you were talking earlier about the concept of other dimensions intersecting with ours. So let's say that there's a timeline where we beat ET, and we have actually evicted them from, from the Earth and established cosmic independence. Do you think that some of the MyLab experiences could be explained by as uh, multi-dimensional counter-ET operations, kind of like a cosmic hostage rescue, um, and other operations that might be ongoing um, from a dimension where we might have won? 
uh, into other dimensions where that's not yet the case, uh, explaining some of the my lab experiences uh, that have happened maybe post ET. So maybe um, there, there was one person that's actually explained uh, fringe fringe knows them uh, where she had an experience where something negative was happening and that she was put back together uh, in, in a certain sense. Um, so that there, there might be something to that where um, in a dimension where a positive outcome has occurred for us, uh, that outcome is being extended to other realms or other realities of earth so that across a, a hyper dimensional um version of earth there's no timelines where that continues going forward past a certain point um where that multiversal contact point occurs um and another thought that i had uh was about the the hybridization that you're talking about and and one thing that has always struck me um is that uh there, there was one person in history that uh, had blue eyes that now has led to 780 million people um, that have blue eyes uh, over over 6,000 years. And that any of these uh, abduction experiences could be them trying to create a new uh, breed of, of hybridization, almost like how, how people have created new breeds of dogs that maybe they would try to use for a purpose um, in, in that kind of sense. So like if a grays are trying to, you know, crossbreed with humanity maybe they they see our physical strength and they're trying to you know create a, a version of us that they could control because as we are they can't but they try to you know ingrain some of their own genetics um and and that puts a risk on us because obviously you know one person could then spawn an entire new civilization that's like a a hybridization if they're successful in their their hybridization i posted something up in the nest about um two specific uh types of cases that i think you should look into that are medical conditions um that are both related to the modification of the twist to genome that lead to two conditions that make a person look oddly like a gray and oddly like a reptilian uh very interesting things to look at since you're you're looking into those kinds of topics um what what are your thoughts on the the my lab topics that I, I stated yeah no my lab topics i'll definitely get into that but just real quick on the last point you made about these uh the, the twist two genome uh thing i think you said you talked about well the thing is you know if you if you take an alien genetic trait and you infuse it into a human genome or, or let's say let's say a person's born with let's say one percent alien dna or something like that uh i think if they were to get genetically analyzed the, the analysis would come back like, oh, you have a rare gene mutation, you know, some of these gene mutations we haven't seen before. They would, they would phrase it as a mutation. They wouldn't say like, oh, you've got alien DNA. Well, of course not, because if it can be even infused into you in the first place, then it has to be compatible enough with DNA to be plausibly in there as part of some natural mutation, right? So, so the point is there may be mutations right now that are alien in origin <laughs> or alien-induced, that are just written off as oh poor poor kid he's got this weird genetic disorder where <laughs> where he can he can read people's minds and levitate objects but I'm kidding but you know what I mean these 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 kids could be born right now and uh, we could write it off as just genetic mutations or you know something wrong with the kids like I don't want to say autistic and Asperger's people have alien DNA but just theoretically like what if that were the case you know what if there was some sort of alien mm -hmm. DNA no, behind some sure. of it? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, very possible. Yeah, because it just goes to show that whatever the cause is, society just writes it off as, oh, poor people with this disorder or that disorder. So it could be happening right under our nose where new bloodlines, new humans are being born. And we just think like, oh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, you know, this, this particular disease has increased over the past 20 years and no one knows why. Well, it's because humans are possibly changing. So we have to consider that. Um, earlier, okay, so you're, you're talking about my labs and military abductions or what we perceive as military abductions might possibly be from humans that are from a parallel timeline or maybe a parallel future where they have triumphed over negative aliens. Like, yeah, sure, you know what, that, that's possible. However, uh, there definitely are a lot of my labs where negative things are done, like the, you know, uh, um, gang. I have no, I have no yeah. doubt of that, that there being both sides and there being possibly a time-space war that's ongoing. Uh, I my, myself has, have had experiences uh, through dream states um, of alternate uh, multiversal states, and I've written about them. I've documented them. Um, I've I've written some as ebooks. 
Uh, one, I tried to turn it to a game uh, almost 12 years ago. Uh, I had a 31 and, and back type experience in 2005 where I experienced 31 years in a five hour long dream. Um, and I tried to turn it into a series um, that I've expressed um, through my my research over the last couple of years. And in the last year and a half, I've uh, joined a think tank which specializes in existential risks related to uh, ET contact scenarios. And I actually wrote a book called the uh, Star Captain's Exopolitics Guide, which uh, is kind of an advisory um, for political leaders. Um, and I've also previously run for public office on a pro disclosure uh, platform, uh, faced some censorship and stuff like that hurdles because of it. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been diving deep into this subject for quite some time. So and, and on a research basis, um, but also as an entertainer, I, I make space themed entertainment uh, to advocate uh, through entertainment as well as educational means. Right. So since you are since you are sort of an influential person in your own circles and you've done things and you have this motivation to do it, that that puts a high priority on you by certain beings for good or for bad. And that's for you to to decide. But uh, yeah, but this is what I'm talking about with what what kind of person would be selected by good or you know negative forces for some sort of influence. I mean, this is the kind of influence that I'm talking about, you know, having this drive, having the resources to go out there and do books or speak or influence opinions and so on. Uh, I, I think I think pretty much anyone in this UAP sphere of research that has major impacts or has any sort of impact even because it doesn't have to be major because due to the butterfly effect, you just have to be the right person at the right time to influence someone or influence the, the conversation in order to change the future in some way. So, But if you're someone who exerts any sort of influence, then I do think that you're definitely going to be on the radar of various forces. So it's not surprising to me that that you've had dream experiences and, and other interesting experiences like that. And you're also out there trying to influence opinions and, and uh, make a difference in some way. Well, one of the one of the projects that I do work with on the the Lifeboat Foundation uh, is a, a physical lifeboat lifeboat uh, that's a space arc project, um, and I've actually advanced that initiative uh, quite quite some um, distance since we've uh, since I got involved early last year, um, and it's obviously something very important to the uh, bigger picture of our our civilization. I've actually uh, written a book called uh, The Book of Archism, which is kind of a cosmic philosophy, um, kind of touches upon some of the things you were talking about earlier, where we kind of need a philosophy for outer space. Um, and this kind of looks at that. It's not like, a, you know, it has to be embraced. It's just a kind of opening of a conversation that needs to be discussed on the uh, philosophy of a space arc centric cosmic democracy model that uh, might serve us in the future in a kind of cosmic republic of earth model as i advocate for and, and discuss yeah it's good to be it's good to be forward thinking um one thing i forgot to add is i wanted to mention this earlier in the evening which is that when we talk about benevolent aliens the fact is it, it's, it's very 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 possible that these supposed benevolent forces aren't even aliens right so you, you could have what we call nhis or aliens or whatever that might be unilaterally negative for whatever reason you know and then a benevolent component isn't even alien, but we call it alien because it all looks the same to us. So, and, and the reason why I bring this up now is because you mentioned the idea of, let's say, humans from a parallel timeline or humans from a near probable future coming back. So they may not be alien. They could be human or human-like, um, and they could be exerting a positive influence. You could look at it from that angle. You could look at it from the angle of, let's say, uh, secret societies even. I mean, what if secret societies existed centuries ago that in secret, they develop technologies and psychic powers and so on, such that nowadays, they're, you know, they're flying around in ships and we think they're aliens, but they're not. They're just a secret uh, breakaway group of humans that are, that are influencing us. And it could, they could be from the past. They could be, in theory, let's say, from a probable future. I think it's, it's probably easier for probable futures to come back to their common past than it would be for two parallel timelines to cross into each other just because um, – they're, they're separated. You know, there's no connection between them necessarily. So if you, if you want to talk about potential contacts or abductions by human-like beings that have triumphed over negative forces, I think certain, certain not, not necessarily my lab, but what we would perceive as positive Nordic-type beings might be that.
you know, if you want to go in that direction. And then they wouldn't even be aliens. They would just be humans from, let's say, the future, if you want to go with the, with the time travel hypothesis. I think that's a better explanation than, than my labs because typically my labs, and it, it involves a lot of military equipment and military bases and shadowy mind control projects and such. So I, I would put the benevolent human type stuff more in the what seems like alien sphere, but it could really be a time travel sphere more so than the my lab sphere. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Star Captain, for being so patient. I'm going to get to the list, and then I will go to Majestic. Uh, this is maybe a, a, along the same lines um, as the whole MyLab stuff. And this is a quote from uh, Robbie Graham. The quote is, DeLong acknowledges a tradition of government deception on the UFO issue, but stresses, quote, when you find out why they kept it a secret, you'll be glad they did everything they did. I don't know what this is specifically referring to, but perhaps we have um, some, you know, black projects actually working uh, for the benefit of humans uh, behind the scenes. Uh, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, these these projects are so compartmentalized that you could have some that are responsible for what we know as my lab abductions and, you know, the, the sexual abuse and super soldier breeding programs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then you could also have other compart compartmentalized programs that are not that, that are actually against it, even if they don't even know about it because it's just so split apart, right? So you could have some that in theory would be working with certain alien or NHI, NHI factions that are against other NHI factions that are working with other parts of the compartmentalized system. So you could actually have a, a sort of a cold proxy war happening within the, uh, the shadow government or the shadow military and that that falls down from the different competing alien agendas, even, and that's that's not out of the question. So, and then what do you think about the idea that uh, some of this uh, non-disclosure is actually for our own good, um, yeah, and for our benefit? And the reason they're not telling us is because we just can't handle it. Yeah, well, I can only think of a couple reasons why <clears throat> that would be. One of the reasons is uh, for we, we touched on it earlier when we were talking about the morphogenetic field and people believing in certain things and how that kind of draws it in and then attracts it in, uh, which is the idea that if enough people believed in and even wanted alien intervention, that opens the door to these beings materializing way more easily than they can right now, whether it's due to just cosmic law or some sort of quantum effect where uh, consciousness has to tune into something in order to draw it in and manifest it. So the idea is that that disclosure would bring it into the collective consciousness and therefore open the door to it and therefore keeping a lid on the truth is kind of a way to, to shut these entities out. And, you know, many, many different people have proposed it. There was this one researcher guy, a writer by the name of the Nexus seven who wrote a document called top secret slash demon. And he proposed that idea in there back in 1999, I think. So the idea has been proposed and I guess it's possible, but at the same time, even if that were true, we do have so many criminal elements hiding behind that shield, right? You have so many uh, corrupt elements of government and of the military and so on that hide behind the shield of secrecy to get away with things like human trafficking and drug running and, and worse. Uh, and then they use this as, a, as an excuse to keep humanity in the dark and to continue profiting off of our ignorance. So if you want to get rid of them, you're going to have to have disclosure in, some, in one, one form or another. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's uh, go to Majestic. Majestic, go ahead. Hello there. I, uh, I'm a bit tired, but I'll try my best to get a question out. Um, thanks for sticking with us, Tom, all night. Um, I find you very enlightening. Um, I think you're super, and not not just knowledgeable, but um, very sort of 100% enlightened, able to discern, ask the right questions, etc. So, um, um I'm an experience of myself, but I'll I'll try to get that over to you another time. But um, my question is, um, do you think that um, people that are sort of on the fringe, um, that are sort of developing this, um, well, I, I want to ask basically, do you think we have soul protection? You know, you spoke about family members being um, coming to harm or maybe even dying and pets and stuff. I just wondered if you think we have soul protection. The second question was about the culling of the population. Um, do you think that um, they're, way, they're, they're picking out specific people? If, if that, uh, if that eventuality does come, um, do you think uh, they're, they're just picking out, they're letting 
humanity evolved to sort of over eight billion and they're just picking out the ones they want. Um, that's that's pretty much my question. I'm a bit tired, so uh, I'll leave it to that. Yeah, thanks for staying up. So on your question of soul protection, I mean, just going on my own personal experiences and my girlfriend and my family and so on, I would say 100% absolutely. We, we do have some some degree of protection and it varies from person to person. And it's not because they are uh, more enlightened or more special or anything. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you believe in the idea that people come here with uh, an itinerary of purposes, you know, to be here, I do think the soul, soul protection stuff comes into play because of that. Um, because, because there are certain things that we need to do here or we can do and maybe, maybe even things that we volunteer to do that can only be done if there is some sort of guidance or protection from behind the scenes. Um, because if we didn't have that, considering just the, the sheer level of maliciousness of like demonic forces and certain negative alien groups, if you get on the radar, uh, I, don't, I don't think you would survive that necessarily. And also the fact that these negative forces – that a lot of times they engage in this uh, multi-step process of weakening a person and gaining their permission more and more uh, indirectly. Let's say getting a person to succumb to, I don't know, like depression or um, a gambling habit or drug habit or alcohol or whatever, okay? And the person keeps giving into it and keeps going further down that road. Eventually, they'll get to a point where they're so weak and, and, and so, so darkened that they kind of cut themselves off from their protection and therefore, like vibrationally or even just karmically or free will wise or something. And, and at that point, they can get the, uh, the coup de grace. You know, they can get the, the final blow from these negative forces that have been stalking and tempting and manipulating them for a very long time in order to get them to give up their protection bit by bit by bit by bit. And I've seen that happen with people. I've seen that try to happen with me as well. But every single time it goes to like step three or four, I catch it and then I kind of correct myself. And so that's why I've never gotten to the point where I've completely been knocked out, even though the potential for that has happened many, many times. I mean, already, I almost died in 2010 of uh, a freak series of occurrences that almost killed me off through uh, an illness. But I was able to come back from that, and other things have tried to happen. And my girlfriend, she's had so many near-death, not like tunnel white light near-death, but more like being saved from certain death experiences. So she's had that too, and many people I know have had protection of some type. It's definitely a tug of war happening, but the tug of war depends primarily on us being the fulcrum that decides uh, how much of that protection we uh, gain or give up and, uh, and what we do with it. Uh, oh, and uh, you had one more question about the culling of the population. I do think that, that if, if we take into account the idea that like evil organs work, okay, evil organ, um, she talks about occult interference of human relationships, whether it's aliens bringing people together and breaking them apart or like uh, occult entities like demons or something like that messing with relationships, there is definitely some sort of manipulation of humans coming together, breaking apart, you know, producing certain offspring and not certain, not other ones that is uh, that's non-human in origin, you know? So we're, we're being played, we're being massaged to some degree. And that's one component of it. And of course you have the other component, which is a whole like soul, soul stuff where, you agree before coming here to be with your loved one again in a, in a body or whatever. So, you know, you meet each other again in life. That whole thing is part of it too, but there's also a dark component that tries to mess with that process. And that in turn can lead to certain bloodlines arising or certain bloodlines not arising. And then you can have even bigger things where if these negative forces have their proxies on the ground in politics and government, then certain wars can be engineered that lead to ethnic cleansing, which leads to, the change of the future genetic landscape of humanity, right? So if you view that in terms of time travel, for example, well, that's, that's, that's like competing timelines trying to, trying to prune each other's root of the branch, you know? They're trying to cut each other off genetically by, by changing what people die in mass back in the past. So that's something to consider, too. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I woke up a bit now. <laughs> All right, let's go to Isho. Go ahead, Isho. Um, hey, Tom, uh, I met you 10 years ago on Noble Realms, and I've uh, read most of your articles on your website. I've seen your videos on YouTube, and I've been studying this for like 15 years. 
Uh, in the thread that you have for the space, I put a little bit of a picture there with a couple of topics. So, because I know it's hard to keep up with all these things. So I'm going to read it out from top to bottom, and then you can give us some pointers and comments on what you think about these things. And uh, you can skip something that we've already done because we've already covered some of them. But uh, here it goes. So to negate the negative karma of evil deeds, they tell people ahead of time in fiction and events. Uh, government technology like black operations is like decades ahead of public available technology. The entities who abduct, they seem to use time travel technology and they also erase memories. Uh, there is some government collaboration with alien factions since the Roswell incident. And um, there's a couple of movies in fiction that I find very interesting. You might you also find interesting as well, which would be uh, Men in Black, The Adjustment Bureau, Dark City, The Matrix, Monsters, Inc. And then we have the TV shows X-Files and Stranger Things. I think those TV shows and movies cover a lot of stuff that seems like fiction, but when you look at it, it's like actually alien technology or disclosure in form of fiction. Uh, we have the government uh, utilizing something like a full body teleportation system patent that I also linked in the thread uh, as a picture. Uh, we have faster than light plasma propulsion that is hidden from the public. We got something called Project Solar Warden, which is very interesting. That speaks about how this the the secret government somehow protects our solar system with spacecraft completely off the radar. People don't know about it. And then also the moon bases S dash four S dash seven. And then the reincarnation recycle machine that we talked about earlier. And then the last point is in Hinduism, they talk about celestial beings that comes down in chariots that gives swords, technology and philosophy to humans. In the Old Testament, including Book of Enoch, also talks about celestial beings coming down from the sky. And then we have the bird people in Mesopotamia and South America carved in stone at two different locations. So I'd like to hear what you have to to say about these things. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, French. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, half of that, I definitely 100% agree with, you know, and we talked about some of it before. Like, we didn't really cover so far the idea of, like, free will warning that the uh, – I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but just the idea that these forces have to give us a heads up in some way to kind of gain our permission, and they can do that – by various ways collectively, like, I don't know, even predictive programming or movies or, or um, things that certain politicians say or even bills that are put out and no one kind of protests against it, so it's almost like a form of, of consent. Um, yeah, that's definitely happening. What else? We've got, yeah, the black ops are ahead. I would say I would say by this point, black ops are probably ahead five centuries, just as a, just as a rough guess in terms of their technologies that they have. And partly that results from just uh, technology exchanges and infusions from the NHIs that they're working with. What else? Uh, oh, yeah, and the movies that you listed. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question about, like, where, where do these ideas for these movies come from? And I, and I do know some people in the movie industry who say that they get their ideas from dreams, for example. Right? So some of them get them from dreams. And we know that dreams can be manipulated by beings, <laughs> whether they're discarnate humans or demons or negative aliens or uh, positive beings, you know, whether they're angel angels or whatever, you know, these different forces can manipulate dreams and who knows how much of our culture, how much of our entertainment, music, uh, heck, even certain parts of aspects of religion, you know, some of these, like, like where did the book of revelation come from? That just mystical experience that, that, um, was had in there. Like, what if that was also seated by something like the lady or, <laughs> or some other being, so we know that that happens, and I think modern-day movies are a little different from ancient myths in that they can encode archetypal meanings that if, you, if you're tuned into it, certain movies do have a lot of truth. And the thing about it is these truths are bundled together. Okay, It's not like, okay, you've got a little piece here, a little piece there across all movies, which would be confirmation bias. I'm talking about one movie that has a bunch of clues that all fit all together, and not just movies but TV shows too, like Westworld and Fringe and Dark and so on. They all speak to different themes that seem to relate to reality 
in some way. So you can you can use movies and shows as good food for thought for thinking about what could actually be be going on. Uh, let's see. You talked about teleportation tech. Yeah, teleportation patent. That's yeah. That's what I meant earlier by uh, wormholes and portals and such that my labs use. You know that they don't really use vehicles to come and retrieve you. They just kind of suck you through like a teleportation portal. Um, it's a, which is funny that a lot of times. Alien abductions don't involve that. They just come for you and they take you up into a ship. Whereas here, they're using portals. So it's interesting that they would do that. Something to think about. And you mentioned Solar Warden. You know, the whole Solar Warden stuff, a lot of it ties into Corey Goods material and some of the people that are tied into him. So I'm kind of dubious or doubtful about that. I'm doubtful that it's called that exact name and that is exactly how they portray it. Because I do think there's a lot of LARPing going on in the field, like live-action role-playing, where these people pretend to have that. Or, you know, they could be mind control projects where it's smoke screens being generated by my lab abductions in order to cover up what's really going on. But just in principle, I think it's possible that, yes, the secret government does have vehicles that are out there doing things, but perhaps it's not positive. You know, I don't think they would necessarily have that power and to use it for good unless it's, unless it's merely to protect Earth space from alien groups that they haven't had sanctions with, and which would explain why in some positive abduction, or not not abduction, but contact encounters, the aliens or the beings, they mention how they have to be careful when they show up and where they show up because it's almost like they're being scanned, like they're being watched for, like they shouldn't be there, like they're in um, unsanctioned or, you know, they're, they're, they're illegally in that airspace, which would make sense if that airspace is being controlled by a different enemy alien faction, perhaps even in collusion with the shadow government. And lastly, you mentioned Hinduism and how it describes, oh, okay, right, how it describes beings and chariots in the sky and such and how technology is given to humanity and so on. Um, yeah, that's something I've covered in my Gnosis book quite a bit. Just the idea that alien factions seem to treat humanity as uh, like, like, like pieces on a chessboard. And, or, or even like in checkers. You know, like in checkers, when you get your piece to the far end, then you can stack it, and now it's got like extra power or something like that. Well, I, I think a similar thing happens in history where at certain, certain nations or certain groups at certain times are given uh, certain alien technologies and guidance in order to, for them to then manipulate history. And actually in China, you know, it's called the mandate of heaven. The idea that a particular dynasty gets this mandate of heaven, meaning getting the, ble- the blessings of the gods, right, to, to run their empire for a certain period of time. And then when that mandate is revoked, the empire falls. And then uh, in Hindu, uh, in Vedic literature, you also have the idea of these magical weapons called astras, which are given to certain heroes in order to, you know, win certain battles and therefore influence history that way. But then these weapons then are revoked when, well, they're revoked when the Kali Yuga begins, when these energy cycles start to wind down and these technologies cease to function or they're no longer appropriate to be in the hands of humans, then they are revoked and then, you know, humanity falls into this collective amnesia that gets worse and worse and worse, and that's where we are nowadays. And if the cycles were to reverse, and uh, they deem it critical to once again uh, bring down these technologies, then perhaps that's where we're going into. So what, maybe maybe what we think is like, oh, the, the end of humanity, the alien hybrid breeding project, what if that is just, oh, that's just the beginning of the next cycle, and after that there'll be a next cycle, and there'll be another another cycle? Like, what if that's just part of the natural cycle of things? What if, to us, it looks like the end of the world, but uh, from a bigger picture, oh, that's just phase B of a, you know, a full letter of the alphabet plan from A to Z of different projects that are, that are going on. So, yeah, good, good points, and uh, like I said, I do agree with some of it, and um, yeah, thanks for posting it. So kind of fitting into that question that you just answered, Tom, uh, why are they always looking for consent and permission? And if they can't get it, they'll actually manufacture it. Right, right. Um, Like I said, I think I I sort of touched on this earlier, how there are different angles of interpretation behind it. Like on, from one angle, we, we can look at it from the more spiritual, occult, religious angle, okay, which is that We, as humans, we occupy a certain place, a certain special place in in the the cosmic hierarchy where we have been endowed with free will, and we have a divine spark within us. And uh, if you you go by, let's say, biblical lore with Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, well, we ate from that tree, but we didn't eat yet from the tree of life, right? So we, 
we fell into this 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 world that we're in right now. Like spiritually, we fell into this condition that we are now, but we haven't fallen fully. So we still have a choice to make. And this choice then seems to be like a, a primary spiritual importance. It's almost like a spiritual test of the human consciousness matrix in a way, in whether we want to take the path back to the light, you know, become whole again, or if we want to fall further into ultimate darkness and, uh, you know, take, take, take the final bite of the apple and, <laughs> and fall into, into a spiritual coma of sorts. So if we view it from that angle, then everything that's happening from alien hybridization to take over to the transhumanist agenda, those are all essentially props or storylines that, that play out this, this choice, you know, that plays out the finalization of this choice. Because it's true, you know, if we take the transhumanist route and we keep going down that path, we're going to wind up like the greys and maybe there's going to be no path backwards from, from that. And that way we would be fully fallen and we would be part of the fallen realm where these beings are already, you know, maybe some of these beings are irredeemable. Maybe they can't come back from it and maybe they want us to join them. You know, that's sort of the uh, religious angle on there. Now, and then you can look at it on the other end of the spectrum, which is the more mundane spectrum, which is simply that there are cosmic laws, like laws, like literally laws surrounding uh, the surrounding space of Earth. And I'm talking about the, like the allies of humanity viewpoint, which is that Earth as a developing civilization, like humanity as a developing civilization cannot be interfered with openly unless they consent to it. And we're approaching the legal age of consent, you could say. And we've got all these perverts and creeps of another dimension surrounding us trying to get us when we're barely legal through all this deception. And, you know, we're, we're trying to, we, we need to be more uh, discerning, more careful about it, because if we are going to be born as a civilization into uh, a higher cosmic order like that, then, then of course there will be things that try to thwart it, and they will need our permission to do it if that picture that I just outlined is, is legitimate. So you've got the spiritual angle, and then you've got the more like mundane extraterrestrial angle. And uh, which one it is, maybe... Maybe it's a bit of both, you know, because maybe creation is fractal in the sense that you've got different levels of scale with uh, self-similarity between levels of scales, right? So you've got, you've got your own personal choices you make every single day about do you give in to your dark side or do you try to hold on to your light, right? You've got that. You've got the, the national, the global political aspect of it, and then you can scale that up to the alien scale and ultimately up to the spiritual scale. Like maybe it's all part of the same thing, like... Uh, spiritual choices between goodness and darkness at, uh, at all levels of scale within us and around us and outside of us. Thank you. Uh, Kimball, go ahead. Uh, thanks for interest. This is a great space. Um, I have just been listening the past maybe 30, 40 minutes and Tom, uh, really, really interesting stuff. So, um, what is the what's what's the litmus test then between good? <clears throat> sorry, I'm going through puberty real quick. <laughs> between good and uh, dark, you you just said good versus dark, and we, we there needs to be a litmus test. What is the litmus test? Like, how do you know, how is someone to know between like what is good and dark based on the influences going on? Yeah, that's the sort of the penultimate question that we're dealing with because if we if we don't know that then. <laughs> then our future is pretty much screwed, right? Because because if we so, are being... Do you, do you have any claims as to like what that would be, though? Yeah, like like how do you tell the difference between um, light and dark, you mean? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so... Yeah, so basically, you can you can ask yourself... You can ask yourself whether... Okay, like, sorry, so if you're, if you're dealing with a negative alien force that's coming towards you pretending to be good, okay? What you need to look at, and this is something I covered in, in the very first part of our, our, our discussion tonight... You can ask it, like, first of all, does it does this force deny the existence of darkness to begin with? Does it deny the existence of hostile aliens that are operating on Earth? Because if it is, then it's not going to give you any sort of clues or discernment about how to tell the difference. You know, it's not going to help you discern in any way. Then you can you can ask them, well, then who who is it that they're blaming as hostile, and who is it that they are saying is the good guy, right? And you can you can look at that, and then you can compare that to the available data and see whether it fits, whether it fits a lot of these contact experiences. And if you boil down all the data, you can kind of get a read on where they're coming from. Like, for example, if they say, okay, well, the greys and hybrids are good, but the Nordics are bad, right? That's, that's kind of questionable. And you got another one saying, no, 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 see, it's the greys that are good and the reptilians that are bad, and the Nordics are just reptilians in disguise. 
well, that's kind of hokey too. And you can go down the entire list of permutations of who's good and who's bad. And you, what you discover is that basically what they're doing is these groups are, they're all colluding together, you know, these, these, these various types. They're colluding together and they're spinning various storylines that ensures that in each storyline, there's at least one of them that gets portrayed as a good guy. So that way they can always portray themselves as either the good guy. Like uh, grand narratives, sort of? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like like the, well, they, they they kind of divide themselves into good cop and bad cop in various permutations. And then they see these storylines to different contactees and different uh, different opinion leaders that are out there to kind of like float the idea to see what works best. And uh, But the thing is, a lot of that's false. And some of it might actually be legit. Like maybe, maybe just one of those permutations is actually the correct one that, you know, this, this particular group are relatively benevolent and the other ones are not. And the only way that you can figure that out is by doing a ton, a ton, a ton of research and connecting all the dots and kind of eliminating the possibilities. It's like, uh, that's, there's a, hmm? go ahead. I just feel like that's very futile, right? Cause you're, you're saying these grand narratives have legitimacy and, uh, they're legitimate enough to be like that's how you would decipher between what is good and versus what is dark. Yeah, well, the thing is too, though, too, you can you can also look at what is the end effect that that what they say. Yeah, what is the end, what their, is, what is the end effect of that? You shall know them, right? Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. Like, what is its effect on you, your beliefs, your behaviors, uh, and especially on humanity as a whole? So, what, whatever they say, if they have an agenda, they want you to carry it out. So you have to just kind of like look. At that, and of course, you can look at more like obvious red flags, like if a particular source is acting in a sociopathic way with lying in a malicious way, uh, omissions, deflections, things like that. If they're using screen memory tactics, and um, yeah. if the if, if the experience that you have during an abduction that you remember doesn't match what um, after effects you have in terms of like 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 injuries to your body or bruises or cuts or whatever, then then you know that there's something wrong, because if you're dealing with a with a benevolent force. You're going to come out of it more discerning, more clear, right? You're going to be more empowered, um, more knowledgeable. You're, you're going to come away with uh, every, everything that leads to increased free will, self-empowerment, self-determination, and ultimately well-being. Whereas if you're dealing with a deceptive negative force, then what you're going to get instead is you might get the healing gifts. You might get, you might get uh, psychic powers. You might get financial incentives, whatever. You might become famous. Who knows? You might be featured on Coast to Coast multiple times. But... You're going to lose free will. You're going to lose discernment. You're going to lose knowledge. You're going to lose uh, self determination in the end. In the end, and that's exactly what happens also in the field of demonology and people who make deals with the devil. They make deals yeah. with the devil for for power, right? For money, for fame. But in the end, they get screwed over, and <laughs> and after death, they they yeah they're going to have a rough, a rough time dealing with the afterlife. You know, now that they have a, have a huge credit card bill to pay off and to the demons that helped them out in life. So in a way, the negative alien forces act a lot like the demonic hierarchy, and some would argue that they are demons for that fact. But I would say that um, they share perhaps in a demonic angle or agenda, but it's not like they are literally the exact same demons that haunt people on, on an everyday common basis. That was, that was really impressive. So yeah, uh, okay. basically, you, so when I asked, like, what was the limit test between good and dark, you, you brought up the free will, you know, free agency and free will. Does it deny evil? Um, and then outside of that, it's basically you have like a meritocratic scale only. Um, yeah, if they deny evil, then they, you just throw those people out. Yeah, I guess whole, what, I, yeah. Hmm? what I'm missing is I think maybe like the threat probably, I mean, it, I would just guess it's my, it's a, this is a hunch and it's opinion, but it probably goes deeper than that because. I just like what ultimately are we protecting? Like, what is it about us that makes us human and that is worth um, not being influenced or defiled or, you know, whatever it is, harassed or probed or whatever? But, um, and even then, it's like it, free agency and free will. I totally grok that, trust me, um, that philosophy. But if the phenomena itself is, uh, I think this is why disclosure, you know, may be potentially cataclysmic is like, we've, we've gone through life, all of us there, we've got all these grand narratives, whether you're in the West or the East or authoritarian, you know, liberal, whatever. And ultimately we're going to realize that like 
all of this hasn't even been us. It's been like something influencing us. And so what, what we thought was free will was like us being influenced by something else and same, you know, for good and ill, like when people did terrible things, there were forces influencing them to do that. And we're just going to realize that all, ultimately we're absorbed into all of this phenomena. It's just almost like an extension or a projection of ourselves. And so at, at the end of the day, we may just be lab rats and it's like, what are we, what do you act? What's the, the thing we're trying to protect? And uh, is that not already being accomplished through a part of the phenomenon? Uh, well, if you ask about what is it that, that is worth protecting, you know, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Because, see, it's not enough to just have free will. It, it comes down to what you do with that free will. And, and not to get into a big side tangent, but you have a lot, a lot of these left-hand occult paths where it's all about do what thou wilt, you know, having free will to the utmost max, even, even to the ignorance of the divine framework uh, and ignorance of all, like, uh, laws of ethics and inte integrity and so on. So, of course, free will in itself, it cannot be the ultimate end goal. The end goal has to be what we do with that free will, like what values, what um, intelligences, energies, whatever we align with, right? So, see, but you see, just right there, you sound like the benevolent part of the phenomena, and I'm, I, I want to join with your efforts, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think anyone who finds this stuff logical and kind of resonates with it would be is is participating even just energetically in that already. Um, I mean, the very fact that you can even appreciate ideas like that means that you're, you're already plugged into it in a way. So, yeah, because, you know, because if you think about it, I could be on here saying like, yeah, you know, the best way to, to have success in life is just to rip other people off. And here's exactly how you do it. And if I were in a room of, let's say, like uh, stock traders or something, then, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street types, they'd be clapping their hands because they resonate with that because that's who they are. That's their energy. And in this case, I'm, I'm saying something different than that. And, and you're resonating with it. And I'm sure plenty of other people are too. So that kind of speaks to who we are and what we stand for. And ultimately, yeah, that, that, exactly. yeah, right. And, and so therefore, humanity as a whole has to come to uh, an, its own self-reckoning about what it ultimately stands for. And, and see, the thing well, it's is... What, it's what each, each of us stands for, right? Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, that's what it's going to be. Right, right, exactly. And the thing it's is, like that, yeah. the internet, right? There's there's so much good and bad from every tool we gain, and the whole NHI disclosure thing. There, I mean, it, it kind of depends on how you deal with it, because maybe there's tremendous good that can come from it, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point because the the kinds of challenges and catalysts that we face, uh, they aren't they, they they still preserve the idea of free will in the sense that we can choose how to react to it. We can choose how to uh, how to work with it, and in some cases, for example, the whole UAP phenomenon is is it's pushing certain people towards worshiping these creatures, these these beings, and giving up their own free will and giving up their own like spiritual sovereignty and kind of wanting the transhumanism, wanting to become more like Greys, thinking that Greys are the most spiritual thing ever because because they listen to Tibetan music and love strawberry ice cream, like that Hero Vote Live cover up live show from the eighties, if some of you old folks remember. Um, but yeah, we, we have to decide on a collective level and individually. And actually, the collective is the uh, the sum aggregate of individual choices, right? Yeah. So, right? I mean, so, it's all it's all just us, though. That's the point. And I, I'm not trying to be like a edge lord here or anything. I just think in the future, maybe like this. Uh, I think you guys, everyone, we all mean well, and we want the best, right? We're, but I think that this is going to be a parody of humanity. All of this, because all of it ultimately is us. And so, I mean, I. Yeah, it could be. Well, it needs to be from our perspective. Yeah, see, it needs to be from our perspective because you, you could you could say like, oh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, good and evil don't exist, but that's irrelevant. No, if, they do, no? but it, it's it's not about talking about it. It's just actually making the changes in your life you know you need to make. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like big big changes start with small changes, uh, especially when you go forward in time and and utilize the butterfly effect where little things now have big ramifications later. So, so that's why the choices we make every day um, deal with our own internal uh, sense of discernment about what thoughts and feelings and beliefs come from what part of us versus other thoughts and feelings. Because, you know, we are, we're, we're, not, we're not unified beings here. We, we definitely have the biological programming side, the social programming, you know, our own ego shadow issues. But then we also have the sense of reason, empathy, compassion, intuition, uh, just, just higher consciousness in general. And the thing is that uh, a lot of people out there, they're not, 
they're not thinking about it. Maybe maybe they've been programmed by the materialistic culture, the paradigm, you know, the uh, transhumanist idea. I mean, once you don't even believe in any sort of higher divine whatever, then you're you're kind of setting yourself up for failure because because if if you give in to nihilism and you think that there is nothing higher and life is solely what you make of it, then you you've already lost the battle in a way because you're starting out on not even on the wrong foot but on no feet. And see, and that is the fallacy of the left-hand path to think that um, I'm doing what I want, like 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 do what thou wilt is a whole thy law. And if you go by that, the problem is you're not differentiating between what part of you wills it. Like, what is it within you that is willing it? It's more than one thing. It can be a dark thing. It can be a higher positive thing. But these, these, these people, they're not differentiating between that. In fact, they are identifying with and rationalizing their own ego, id, shadow, shadow impulses, right? And so they're making that, they're conflating that with your true free will, with who you truly are. And then they're saying that, that is the ultimate thing to defend and, and so on. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're given into so many different logical fallacies. And humanity as a whole will have to come to a realization about that and basically dig within themselves, make the choice, and align with that higher part of themselves. And therefore, by proxy, everything outside of us, that is also part of that higher thing. But you're, you're kind of talking about it as though it's like something to, to come, such, some like awaiting judgment where I'm, I'm saying that it's like – what we're doing right now and what we choose to do, right? Well, yeah. See, because if you look I at it from, uh, I'm not trying to like. Hmm? I just no, no. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Totally. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not like um, it's not like a thing where where we hope for it and we try to be good and one day we're going to get rewarded. I'm not trying to paint it, paint it in that sense. Well, but uh, yeah, go ahead. the choices that we sorry the choices that we make right now in our life have an impact on the future. So the future is a natural outgrowth of what we're doing right now. And so I totally agree with you that what we're doing now matters and we'll have um, – it, it, it is happening right now, but it's not complete right now. See, it still has higher orders of self-organization to achieve on a planetary civilizational scale. And that is still coming because if you just look around, if you look at the news, if you look at your neighbors and whatever, your family, you can see that it's not there yet. But the seed has been planted and it is growing. It's just not yet born fruit is what I'm trying to say. Um, I, I'm new to like this whole, I'll, this will be my last little thing. I'm just, I'm new to kind of the, I guess, ontologically shocked part of UFO people. And I'm just, I guess I'm a parody of myself at this point, because I'm trying to make the best of, of whatever I have uh, experienced myself. And I'm kind of still top, like talking in hypotheticals, you know, and Tom has been really good at like, meeting me at that level but i know fringe has uh experiences that are a lot more like physical and visceral and like not so hypothetical right and so i do you for, i just want to know what fringe thinks about like what i'm saying like i don't know if there's any way she can make the best of like her experiences and like use that to make the world better maybe there is though i don't know um i think i kind of answered this the other day kimball in a space you were in so well, I will not um, provide any excuses for the behaviors of any of the beings, beings I've dealt with. Um, I can look back and uh, see that I think I did experience it for a reason, and I can definitely learn some lessons from it and so forth. So I can kind of turn whatever they did to me into something that I can use for my own personal growth. Um, I think that if I had not experienced such extreme negative from the non-human intelligence, maybe I could have been influenced um, like so many experiencers are influenced into excusing the behavior, into glamorizing it, into saying, you know, we just don't understand them. They're just so high above us. You know, we can't understand. It's like taking the dog to the vet. Uh, no, no, <laughs> none of that is true and none of it is okay. And I think if I hadn't experienced such extremely negative um, things with non-human intelligence, I could have ended up being one of the, you know, 70 to 85 percent who try to rationalize it. And, and, you know, it's our egos we're protecting. When we uh, glamorize these negative um, interactions, uh, it's our own egos that we're protecting. And, you know, a lot of this is mind control. A lot of it is manipulation. 
You know, they're coming at us with these screen memories. You don't get to remember Jack of what happened up there. If you do remember um, and try to tell somebody, you know, they will go so far as to punish you or, or to influence, um, you know, what you say and what you're telling other people. I specifically got punished for speaking on the negative side of the phenomenon. So um, to, you know, get back to your original question, um, I think it did happen for a reason. But I'm not going to say thank you to the NHI for teaching me my lesson because there's no good and evil. So hopefully um, that wraps it up, Kimball. Hopefully I answered your question. Um, Thanks, guys. Great space. Kimball, I, lo I love your question. And Tom, uh, for me, this, this question or this, this matter of self-determinization is extremely like sensitive and, and controversial. I want to make it really clear I'm not here to offend anybody or even in, imply anything about religious texts, but how self-determination is viewed, whether it's viewed as psychopathy, as in you do whatever you, you want, whatever your impulses are telling you, or healthy psychopathy, which is really just courage. Are you willing to go against the grain and be, be almost independent of what, what other forces might be telling you to do and are you are you able to follow like your your truer calling? These might be diametrically opposed, and they can still appear indistinguishable. And this revolves around, I think, the conception of the devil, or Lucifer, or whatever you want to call it. The same orientation you have to technology, it can be amoral and used for self determination, or it can enslave us and in, in, uh, through through our own addiction to it. Um, I think, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but like, is this not a major sensitive issue? Because when we look at, you know, things like secret cabal societies, you know, Freemasons, whatever, if we only look at it through one lens, we don't know where the PSYOP is happening. In other words, if, if every act of self-determination appears as bad because we're just following our impulses, then we have a vilification of, of courage and going against the grain as well. Do you also see, let's take religion out of it, but is there a cultural psyop where we confuse what is actually diabolic and what is actually healthy, agentic self-determination? So in my opinion, uh, going back just to pick an example from history, uh, the Gnostics, okay. So there's certain, I mean, not all Gnostics, but certain Gnostic sects, they were, they're looking at the book of Genesis and they actually put the serpent on a, on a pedestal because they felt that the serpent was providing the gift of free will and self-determination to Adam and Eve, um, away from this uh, tyrannical uh, you know, Yahweh figure that was lording over them and keeping them basically imprisoned in a state of naivete and vulnerability. Um, I don't agree with that, okay? Just to put that out there, I don't agree with that. And the reason why I don't agree with it is because it's not that simple. And it's not that simple because, as I mentioned just now to, to Kimball, we have within us at least two diametrically opposed uh, aspects of our being, right? We've got the false self, which is made up of all of our social programming, our biological programming, everything about us that is really not based in free will. And then the other part, which is based in actual true, genuine free will. But the thing is, uh, here's the irony of it. The irony is that the part of us that is the, the true origin and source of free will, which is our spirit, is it's I believe it's naturally good. I, I believe it's naturally divine. But in order to realize itself as such and to put it into practice, it, it needs uh, the choice of the opposite. So it needs some sort of a resistance in order to uh, strike a match against, to light that fire that it has within itself latently. You know, it's just like a match, right? You need a bit of friction to strike it. And so when we face these challenges in life, um, as bad as they are, if we stay true to ourselves, that's how we gain knowledge and strength, right? Um, but just as Fringe said, just because we can get good from darkness does not make the darkness good. Like there's no good in darkness. However, uh, to quote Goethe, uh, in his play Faust, okay, the devil comes up to Faust and yeah, the devil comes up and, and he basically says, you know, he's asked like, who are you? And the devil says, I am he who eternally wills evil, but forever does good or perpetually does good. In other words, a force that genuinely wants to rip down spirit, but in doing so provides the opportunity for spirit to assert itself 
and to become self-actualized in, in, in the face of that, that sort of friction. Right? So we have this New Age fallacy, which is that since darkness has a purpose within greater creation, we should respect darkness, right? And, and if, and if uh, some sociopath or something wants to do something, then we should respect that because that's their will and they're part of creation. But that totally and completely misses the point of darkness in the first place, which is to act as a, a kind of friction or, or counterweight to goodness, you know, to, to help spirit become self-actualized. And so the only way for darkness to fulfill its true purpose is to be fought, is to be recognized, to be fought and overcome. And just like weights in the gym, you know, the weights in the gym, they serve no purpose unless they're picked up and heaved up and down. And that's the only way you become stronger. And you can't say like, oh, this weight is too heavy, so let's, uh, let's, let's get a machine to lift the weights for you. No, you can't do that because <laughs> that defeats the very purpose of them existing, right? So darkness, I think, has to be recognized, has to be fought, and has to be overcome. And that's how it fulfills its cosmic purpose for us. And if you or if, if a certain being chooses the dark path, then yeah, they're gonna they're gonna get the long end of that stick. They're gonna get beat over the head with it by themselves. And one day they will come around, you know, just like a prodigal son, hopefully, and they will return back to the light. And they'll have learned from it, from you know, their own misery and misfortune on that path. So they gain something from it. And then meanwhile, we gain from uh, kind of testing ourselves against that resistance. So I think that's the only way the darkness has a purpose, and therefore, you know, it has to be has to be recognized and fought and overcome. Yeah, and I don't disagree with any of that, and I'm not arguing for or against a certain religious interpretation. All I'm asking is, do you agree that there's incredible semantic confusion, obfuscation, and it's easy because Satanas itself means the resistor, and as we resist the darkness, often in society we get viewed as the resistor, right? In fact, it's very confusing that there's a bringer of light and the lord of darkness who's the same one. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Like as we resist away, like when we do something courageous, there's often great resistance from the outside. We're often viewed as something um, defective, not defective, like when you defect from something, right? Like some, like a traitor or rebellious. It's very, it's very difficult um, sometimes when to do the right thing and not be vilified for it. And semantically, it seems these con concepts are 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 deceptive, right? Illuminati, uh, enlightenment, er, many of the terms that are associated with intelligence are associated with, with diabolical concepts as well. It feels like there's somewhat of a psyop to, to vilify a stretch towards more knowledge and more self-determination. That's all, that's all I'm sort of asking. Yeah, right, of course, you know, um, knowledge and self-determination, like true self-determination is the enemy of any authoritarian regime just by definition, right? Exactly. Uh, right, yeah. and, and and so so just to kind of sum that up, uh, I mean, the only thing I can really say on this is ultimately, in the end, you know, rebellion to a false god is obedience to a true god. Thank so, you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank thank you so much, Sean. Uh, Isho, go ahead. I was thinking a holo cipher could uh, have this one because I had the last one, so I'll just wait this one out. Okay. Perfect. Uh, holo cipher, go ahead. Oh, hey, I'm still thinking about how to tie a lot of this together, and I was wondering if uh, Tom had thought about <clears throat> whether there were certain cycles that could be optimized for consciousness experiments, whether that's unifying our minds for, <clears throat> say, specific levels of protection or specific levels of engagement, and even potentially whether some of these cycles could be used to obfuscate humankind's ability to perceive the truth because as we look in history we haven't exactly had an honest historical record in fact if we have ancient civilizations that go beyond the ice age or what they call antediluvian um there's obviously certain people that are i don't know profiting whether it's psychologically or actually financially from keeping part of this past known to us and I'm going to just throw in one perhaps new data point here to this, and it's an interesting codice called uh, Chimel Popoca. Apparently, it's one of the only codices that's actually not written through, like, say, conquistador hands. And it indicates, uh, interesting, uh, this is uh, via uh, Abbey uh, Borburg, and he shows in uh, that some of the earlier 
chronologists who were looking at this didn't actually evaluate some of these codices. And after it was photographed in 45, it disappeared. And I think this is the reason why. It details 43,000 years, uh, which is very similar to the King's List in Egypt, but it details 43,000 years of where there was four previous ages that actually had been, say, cataclysmic cycles. And this, in other contexts, had been simply decoded as a much shorter period of time, which were a sort of massaged by... That was totally my fault, y'all. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know. Where did it cut me off? It was only a few seconds. Okay, so basically I'm just getting to these ancient historical records that actually indicate that we have actually have record going back. And it's interesting how very few records whether they're actually written records or let's say like those reeds that were found in the, I think it was the queen's chamber, chamber uh, shaft. Whenever we have something that actually could be consolidated to prove ancient historical antediluvian record or otherwise, it's always so weird that they disappear. So I want to get back to like what Tom might think about discovering cycles that regulate consciousness and how we might be able to optimize them, say, if we could discover how they work and root into our kind of fragmented and semi-broken Gregorian calendar. Uh, well, I do think that there are numerous, numerous cycles that are impinging on us at, at any point in time. Uh, I mean, even, even if you just look at astrology, for example, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, there are certain probabilistic patterns that get amplified by certain astrological configurations. So, you know, certain days there'd be more prevalence of miscommunication, another one more for accidents or whatever. And, and if you're observant and you know a lot of people, you can spot these patterns uh, happening simultaneously to, towards multiple people. Like, I don't know, like, uh, I was like three, four weeks ago, there was a huge increase in accidents and injuries I noticed with people, for example. And I forget what, what sort of alignment that correlated with, but it was interesting. But anyway, um, on, a, on a more like long scale, we have not only the yuga cycles, but we also have the precession of the equinoxes and the various astrological ages that happened. For example, we've been in the age of Pisces now for over 2,000 years, and depending on what source you go by, we are either in or we are moving into the next age, which is the age of Aquarius. And now, if you look at it, uh, history and the correlation between these astrological ages and what happens during that history, you find that new religions arise and new historical trends arise and cultural trends that correlate very strongly with the archetype of that astrological sign. So since we are moving, supposedly, into the age of Aquarius, there are positive and there are negative traits of Aquarius that can manifest. And I forget exactly what they all were, but they have to do with, uh, on the one hand, you know, on the positive hand, we've got humanitarianism, knowledge, networking between people, um, just, just a more like heady, eccentric, spiritual, humanitarian influence. But then on the negative side, you also have uh, condescension, you know, elitism, um, hive mind stuff, and uh, transhumanism. So interestingly enough, those kind of mirror, in a way, the competing negative and more positive NHI agendas. On the one hand, you've got the more like, you know, transhumanist, hive minded greys, and uh, even, even the more like capricious mantids up at the top. And then on the other hand, if you want to take these accounts at their word, you got benevolent beings that are more into the positive aspects of Aquarius. Now, perhaps, you know, perhaps that's more like what Jacques Vallée was talking about, which is that it's just some sort of ultra-terrestrial intelligence that is playing on our cultural expectations and, and so on. So maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just playing on what we expect of the age of Aquarius, or, or maybe not, right? But, the, but there no, there's no doubt that there are cycles, including especially disaster cycles, because you mentioned 43,000 years ago, or a 43,000 year period. Well, I know that 43,000 years ago, that's when we had the Las Champs magnetic excursion event, which killed off a lot of the Neanderthals because there was a lot of ultraviolet radiation raining down, seismic activity, and volcanoes going off, and so on. So there was a lot of bad stuff happening back then. And these disasters, they tend to happen every 6,000 years and every 12,000 years. So, yeah, we've had about another three or four cycles since then. So it kind of correlates with what you're, what you're talking about. And unfortunately, if you go by that cycle and the way it's due or the way that it, it goes, we're due for another one, you know, at some point, who knows, in the next hundred years, if not sooner. So how can we use that? Well, we can use it by preparing for it, for starters. 
and we can use it by capitalizing on the archetypal energies that are um, that are basically by going by astrological patterns. These archetypal energies that kind of determine what has more momentum behind it in terms of probabilistic success. So, if this were me, if I were preparing for the future, I would prepare not only for the cataclysms, but I would also throw my weight into the positive aspects of Aquarius. So things like humanitarianism and spirituality and uh, a higher level of positive technology and so on, um, which, which seems to be the way that things are actually going. So that's pretty much the best that I can answer your question for now. Are you familiar with uh, Michael Persinger's work with geomagnetic field changes and how that affects like consciousness and yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and and the mag- the Earth's magnetic field has declined. Was it forty percent or sixty percent since the Middle Ages, and it's actually accelerating. And it's it's hard to say whether. Well, I mean, some studies do indicate it that it is having a psychological effect on us. So, for all we know, the weaker the magnetic field gets, the bigger the increase in things like uh, insanity and dementia and, and violence and so on. And and maybe, and maybe higher forces know this and have timed their political maneuvers to be in, in touch with that. Uh, Isho, go ahead. Okay, so it's really great that Holo Cipher brought that up about history and what's found in the Egyptian chambers and stuff like that, because uh, my follow-up question would be something relating to that. And so we've been, we've been kind of beating around the bush when it comes to the topic of ancient history, and one key to this jigsaw puzzle could lay in kind of you know discerning the positive and negative EBEs and aliens uh, people are in contact with in either spiritual kind of channeling or in the so-called abduction realm of things. And so I've managed to study this for years, and there is something passed down in the 33rd degree doctrine of Freemasons that are part of their, uh, you know, the curriculum that they learn. And I've kind of boiled it down to two different theories, and I would like to hear Tom's idea of this a little bit. Uh, The origin of humanity is either that we were put on this planet to get gold for the so-called Anunnaki deities, and we've been doing it for so many years, and we've forgotten our origin, and we were inherently created by them to do that form of slavery. That's why we find excavations in different places like South Pole, Antarctica, and in deserts in Africa. Like there's these huge excavations before we even invented like excavation machines. The second theory is that they crash landed on Earth many thousand years ago. They couldn't get off the planet. And they devolved into, well, they they came up with a plan to essentially create a subservient race that would help them invent space technology and make them be able to go back into space. And that ties into Library of Alexandria that was originally not burnt down, but helped humans reach space. And that's kind of where all the whole tall Nordic thing comes from, because humanity became a spacefaring civilization. But then using time travel technology and the time matrix, they were able to reset the population civilization back to pre Uh, Alexandria, Library of Alexandria story time, and then they burned it down, and then they forced us into the Dark Ages with the Vatican and uh, the whole ban on science and witchcraft and stuff like that. So what do you think, Tom? Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you heard about this before? Yeah, well, you know, the the idea that humans were created to mine gold, like a lot of that you find in the the Zechariah Sitchin material, right? Like, that, that was his interpretation of the of the Sumerian tablets, and you know, there's there's a lot of criticism that he gets about his interpretation of it. So it may be true, it may may not be true, but there's no doubt that these mines, these ancient mines, do exist, and not just for gold, but for other materials too. You know, um, and and people who've analyzed photos of Moon or Mars, they've seen what seems to be evidence of mining activity there as well. And who knows if those were human slaves or some other beings or robots or something that created those, but. Humanity and Earth seems to have had a long history, and some of that does include various genetic projects or modifications for different nefarious NHIs um, using us as, as a natural resource, you know, probably for labor and for, for other uses. So, 
yeah, did you want to like say more, say a little bit more on that? Yeah, so I was going to say in terms of the whole positive and negative uh, dichotomy of like trying to figure out whether or not some factions are nefarious or if they're supporting us, one thing that I've noticed is this theme that there are the factions that support our sovereignty and freedom as our own species, our own, you know, galactic neighbors of, of our solar system, and that we are slowly making it into the Star Trek age of things. And then there is the other faction who would presumably be the Anunnaki, Demiurge, Watchers, Archons, who keep us enslaved and in chains and prevents us from realizing our true sovereignty. And so that's kind of how I discern between two factions of, say, Star Seeds, New Age, Old Age, you know, the whole Mesopotamia stuff, the Dead Sea Sea Scrolls, uh, the, the Sumerian, and all that stuff that happened back then. So, you know, you have a comment on that as well? Yeah, I generally agree with that uh, criteria for discernment. However, uh, there there is a high probability that a perverted version of that will be um, <clears throat> that will be tested on a perverted version of that one day. Okay, and what I mean by a perverted version is this: Imagine if one day uh, two different alien groups show up in the skies and they have different messages. One of them says that you know humanity, you guys. Technology has kind of wrecked you. You kind of need to go back to a simpler life, and we're not going to give you any technology because you're probably just going to abuse it, and you're not going to be any happier necessarily. Maybe we'll give you very a few minor things, but but nothing crazy. But most most for the most part, we're just going to give you spiritual guidance and wisdom and so on. All right, and then you've got the other group which says, okay, we're willing to give you plenty of technology. We'll heal your cancer. We'll give you free energy technology. Whatever you want, we're going to give it to you, uh, but you're going to lease it from us. And we're gonna we're gonna determine how you use it. So, if you're willing to sign on the dotted line with your blood, then we're gonna hand over these things, and you just do what we say, and everything will be fine. So then, imagine you get these two NHI groups that are saying this. Imagine what if uh, how how would they how would they compete against each other? Okay, imagine imagine if the latter group that's willing to give all this technology points to the other group and says, "Look at these guys. They want to keep you in the dark. They don't want you getting off Earth." They don't want to give any technology to you, right? See, what they want to do is they want to keep you primitive because they are the controlling, enslaving Anunnaki. And meanwhile, we, we are the ones who want to liberate you. We're the ones who want to give you all the gifts of technology and medicine and, and, and everything else you want to know. Um, but you're going to have to do it under our, our direction. Well, uh, the latter group, as good as it sounds, that is sort of the, uh, the, the serpent, once again. You know, that is the Trojan horse that can give technology that instead of liberating us, it actually makes us worse because it makes us addicted to that. And it kind of puts us on a pathway towards transhumanism and what we think are genetic upgrades, which aren't, which are actually genetic downgrades or uh, genetic uh, shock collars, I guess you could say, that lead us in a direction more and more and more into what these aliens already have, the greys, the mantids, the reptilians. They already have that going on where, you know, you have these genetic modifications and being plugged into a system and you're assisted by, by technology and so on. But guess what? You're cut off from any sort of divine light you have within yourself. See? And so you can have these two opposing NHI groups, one that sounds like it's given us and promising us the world, which is actually evil. Right. And then you have the other one, which sounds like they are trying to keep us in the dark, but they're actually the good guys because they're looking out for us. It's kind of like a mom or dad saying, no kid, you're not going to have that ice cream because you're going to become a little fatty. Okay. It's kind of late. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, um, Sometimes these parents look out for their kids, and we have to kind of distinguish between that and an actual, like, tyrannical, demiurgic, keep humanity truly in the dark spiritually as well as technologically. So what you're saying is it could be a good cop, bad cop situation of double deception where an evil faction plays both sides, and no matter which one we pick, it will be damn if we do and damn if we don't kind of situation. Well, um, what I'm saying is you can have positive NHIs, like truly benevolent NHIs, and you can have negative NHIs, and either one of them or both of them can have two aspects to them. Okay, Either one can have one that's like pro-technology, in a way, or like pro-liberation uh, and so on, or anti-technology. Because if you look at just like the negative NHI factions, they want to keep us down. Yes, they do want to keep us on this planet, it seems. They do want to keep us in the dark. But at the same time, they also want to feed us technology to, quote, liberate us. But they're not really liberating us. They're poisoning us. So they're giving a false version of liberation, while at the same time also wanting us to be enslaved, right? Whereas the, uh, the, the positive beings, if they exist, 
they can also give us knowledge and help, but it's, it's, it's only in a way that would increase our self-determination and survival during challenging times, while at the same time, they might also deny certain things to us in order, you know, for our own good. Like, if you really think about it, it would be for our own good. Because, I mean, if you think about all the technology that we have nowadays, how some of it, I mean, it's more distraction, it's more spiritual harm than it is actual help. So, so when, whatever happens, you, we can't just automatically say, oh, these guys want to give us technology and these guys don't. So, so therefore, the first ones are the true liberators and the second ones are trying to hold us down. No, you have to really think about the nuance of, of what they truly want on what conditions, toward what ends, what type of technology, right? So you have to really think through it and then you can make that determination. Tom, along those lines, does that also extend to nuclear technology? It's contextual. It's not like a straight yes or straight no. The nukes we have, whether they're in space or here, they may help us defend against uh, NHI or they may cause self-destruction. Uh, you know, I don't think nukes are necessarily that effective against NHI because, I mean, it, it depends if nukes also affect other dimensions because they could just phase out and not even be affected by the radiation from it, you know, for the physical force of it. So, so I'm not sure how effective they are. Um, but nukes are indeed very, very convenient for orchestrating a World War III scenario where they can step in as the saviors with you know, something that's so, of such, such an existential threat that they can say, okay, you guys really blew it. You know, your leadership is just totally incompetent and corrupt, and now we got to step in for your own protection to help you guys out. But of course, they're only stepping in to take over the place because they created that sickness in the first place through the seeding of, of, of uh, you know, Trojan horse technology like Roswell and transistors and so on. And maybe, maybe nuclear technology is uh, along the same lines. And uh, along with like the babies with matches story, we're grooved with that for decades. Maybe they even set one off or we set one off, make it look like another enemy. We launched World War III. All of that sort of falls along those lines. You don't think that they're an actual threat and that's why they're sort of encouraging disarmament? Well, I don't think they would be uh, necessarily a threat to them, but I do think that, <clears throat> well, see, here's the thing. If we're, we could be in a threat to them in the sense that if we kill ourselves off, then we're kind of hurting their livestock, right? They, they don't want yeah, the cows to kill each other. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so they would want to discourage that. But actually, it's not that they want to discourage it. It's that they want it to be used strategically for their own purposes. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Tom, uh, how are you doing? It's I can't even imagine what time it is there right now. Uh, it's, it's it's actually fine because I feel like I might as well go for a record. Yeah, I, I did a podcast with Johan Tengra like a couple months ago, and I went four hours in one, five on another, and so that was like a record for me. And uh, but but I'm I'm all about breaking records, so let's keep going. All right, Tom, we, I we do. I have uh, you know, I guess we can go as long as uh, you're good. I have a few more questions on the list, and then um, we can start going to the hands again. Um, on this, uh, and the thing I said to Kimball, I want to get your opinion on it. Why do we try so hard uh, to excuse? I mean, we come up with every excuse in the book for these aliens. We glamorize them. We're worshiping them. We can't wait for them, you know, to show up. Uh, is it that we just want to see the good side? Are we speaking to our own value in some way? Uh, what are what are your thoughts on why we do that just as a species? Um, well, I think we naturally defer to authority. It's uh, part of the social structure. So anything that's perceived as authority kind of gets a free pass to, to do certain things. Like, um, I mean, like we have a leader or, I mean, I think it goes back to childhood where, where mom or dad had certain authority and certain things we just have to, we just learn to accept, right? As opposed to someone who's on an equal level with us where we're a little more critical of them because... You know, I wouldn't do that if I were in your shoes, right? That sort of thing. But we, we, we think that because aliens are, have more technology, that therefore they're more advanced. And if they're more advanced, then they know better than us. That, that's kind of like what the crux of the issue is, so, is that we think that your humans, a lot of people think that they know better than us. And therefore, um, they're in a position to, to make that call. And uh, I mean, one example, like I said, was Whitley Strieber and his gray experiences. As terrifying as they were, and as much as the grays lied, and as much as it was totally screwed up, uh, in the end, through their help, he came to a rationalization of it. I mean, some good came of it, obviously, like it did for, for you and your experiences, but that doesn't mean that these particular forces are good. Um, but, but the fact that they seem to have more power and more intelligence, it's, it's easy to, to conflate, as I mentioned earlier, it's easy to, conf to mistake in, um, intellectual power and psychic power for, uh, you know, for, for spiritual authority. 
And uh, that's, that's one of the mistakes that we're making. So when these beings show up and they put signs in the sky, right? You know, like, like the Bible says, if they display miracles and so on, it's easy to win over a lot of people if they don't have a lot of discernment because they're not thinking through it. They're just thinking like, oh man, magical powers and, and high technology, look how advanced they are. They must clearly be ethical. They must clearly be superior. And therefore, um, we should defer to them as, as our authorities. And I think that's sort of the card that some of these negative NHIs will be playing in the future. You know, be playing on this, on this naive cultural assumption of getting that all mixed up. Oh, thank you for that. Um, Isho, you and uh, Hollow Cipher decide which one of y'all was first. Uh, he can go first. I'll wait. <laughs> all right. Um, I want to kind of pull it back to, I think, maybe some old school uh, topic for uh, Tom there, because the first time I heard about him, I mean, Montauk, the name is self-explosive, but correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but there is some history in, in your roots about uh, – some knowledge about how the grid works, sort of the sacred geometry, the intersecting, let's call them temporal dimensional topologies that are intersecting here on this earth. Well, from my position, if you could have a solar algorithm to predict the coupling between the sun and the earth, what I call geohelio coupling, you could actually also see then how these sites that are these grid points are actually dilating. And there's a really interesting book. I'm curious if you've read it. It's called The Seed of Knowledge and Stone of Plenty. And these guys go around with USGS-grade magnetometers and electrostatic equipment and ground current measuring devices. And they basically have determined that key points in the year at these sacred sites, there's an amplification of unusual energy. And, of course, we've seen the traditional... Uh, uh, kind of typical rites there on equinoxes, the uh, the local indigenous population will bring their corn seeds up to the top of the pyramid. And what um, these guys that wrote that book found is that the seeds are slightly electrostatically altered and it produces a superior uh, sort of uh, phenotype. And this gets into this whole area of ge geomagnetobiology and how our phenotype is actually being tweaked. Like we were talking about the Lachamp period. And there's a great paper out by uh, Jet Villetti from the University of Florida talking about all, how the UV ozone modulation via the sun creates this whole dynamic of mutation of our species. And uh, maybe you could just rift on a little bit of that and see where it takes you. Well, we have uh, people like Philip Callahan. Maybe you've heard of him, Philip Callahan. He, he was a, I think he's an insectologist, possibly. But anyway, he, he he discovered that a lot of these stone towers in Ireland, that they were most likely some sort of a resonant structure that beamed um, fertility-enhancing energy waves into the surrounding countryside in order to help plants grow better. Okay, uh, and, and, he, and he tells you how you know you can take any sort of diamagnetic material like aluminum oxide, which is found on sandpaper. And you roll the sandpaper, well, first of all, you corrugate it, so you kind of fold it back and forth until it, like, into folds like an accordion. And then you bend it into a tube, so it's like a, like a fluted column on, on a Greek building, okay? And you just set that up in your garden or uh, near some plants or something like that, and it'll help them grow way better. So these Irish towers were some sort of a energy-emitting thing, right? Well, um, obelisks function in a very similar way, like Egyptian obelisks. And actually, Egyptian obelisks, I, you know, being a nerd, I... Uh, I took their measurements and their materials and I fed it into COMSOL, like a physics simulation program, to figure out what are their natural resonant frequencies. And guess what? It, it, was, it was all the different Schumann resonance frequencies. So the height and the material of the, uh, of the different obelisks and stuff, they, they were resonating with the Schumann resonance. And not only that, but a friend of mine discovered that if you take the speed of sound through limestone and a little bit of granite and you feed that into the height of the Great Pyramid, that ends up being 7.8 hertz which is the, the base Schumann resonance frequency. So, yeah, all these ancient structures were resonant in their own way and uh, tied into earth grids and, and probably etheric energy fields of the earth and so on. But, you know, as far as, like, charging seeds with geomagnetic energy or electrostatic energy, I think, so I haven't read that book yet, but based on my research, I think even more fantastic things were going on in ancient times. For example... Uh, I would go so far as to say that there was a time period where using certain technology, certain methods, certain sacred sites, people could literally manifest food out of the ether using their thought energy through portals, okay? 
And we find that myth also in the Middle Ages with the Holy Grail myth, where the Holy Grail knights could simply hold their plate out before the, the Holy Grail, and whatever they thought of, as long as it existed in the real world and it was plausible, it would manifest on their plate and they would eat it. And where else do we hear about that? We also hear about that with the Ark of the Covenant, with the, man with the manifesting of manna from the heaven, and also the quail on the desert. Uh, and so there are these different stories of stones of plenty or objects of plenty that would materialize food. And I, I, I take them more literally than perhaps these authors did in the book. And that I do think that thought forms or uh, things from the, the non-physical plane can be materialized to some extent. And that it uses the same technology that NHIs are using when they materialize ships here using whether, whatever their 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 hyperdimensional technology or conscious powers are. I think that, that technology that they're using to a high art might have existed in ancient times to manifest more practical things like food, for example. So, yeah. Oh, uh, Kent, welcome to the space. Yeah, hi, French. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, I find it a fascinating subject. Um, I sort of try to look at it through the best lens I can with the information I've had over my lifetime. But, you know, when... When we look at whether or not it's good or bad, um, I, I just a very simplistic way of me putting the way I sort of think is this: that if something has created our existence, or if something that has the ability to observe our existence is in the play as it seems to be, it sort of doesn't make sense that it would be so single focused. It would be more sort of broad perspective. And, you know, if we're looking at good or bad, you know, I, I posted it down below, my personal opinion. If there's an alarm indicator of a, of a society or a civilization that's about to self-implode, uh, the earth would be candidate number one. And I think that's why there would be an interest in trying to help us see the folly of our own endeavors. You know, we, we are destroying our planet very well, very efficiently by ourselves. We don't need help from ET, but we could do with some help to understand what we're doing and why we shouldn't and why we should appreciate what appears to be a very magnificent design and creation. So, you know, for me, I don't think we should, you know, too easily see things as negative until we fully understand the full perspective because I've never seen anything that's been attained to ET that humanity is not always doing to, or already doing to itself tenfold. So I just try to sort of think, is there something we can get from an experience from beyond our planet? And to me, that would be that humanity could have another look at itself and say, hey, maybe we're not such a good example of an intelligent species after all. That's just my opinion, though. I don't offend anyone. Yeah, no problem. I mean, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah, it, it, that is definitely a viewpoint that we that we find out there. And some of these alien beings themselves, they espouse this particular viewpoint, saying that humanity is pretty much a mess. And we we're trying to do our best to to raise you through different methods, including genetic manipulation, because evidently being being a little bit too simian, you've got impulse control issues. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to try to fi fix that with a, a bit of calm gray hybrid genetics. But uh, I don't know. I mean, if, if you really dig into the abduction phenomenon, uh, we do find that a lot of these negative powers, it, it, they engage in things that are really not excusable. You know, there, there are things that are objectively sociopathic and manipulative, right? So, so perhaps what you're talking about might apply to some groups, but I think the majority of negative NHIs are would not be in that. And, and for reference on that, you know, I would point to anyone to Eve Lorgan, John Keel, William Bramley, Charles Fort, David Politis, Morris K. Jessup, people like that who have done a lot of research on uh, some of the more nefarious side of the, the alien contact and abduction and, and presence. And as I mentioned before, you know, violent hostility isn't really the only form of hostility. There's also subtle and covert forms of it, including deception, mind control, uh, infiltration, and pitting people against each other, uh, arrain, you know, it seems to be that despite humanity's flaws, despite our greed, despite um, this, this a lot of the dark stuff that's that's going on behind the scenes. And any any time I, I look at anyone who is just left to their own devices without a lot of demonic, what what appears to be demonic manipulation, you know, based on the classic symptoms of of 
hauntings and so on, they seem to be doing pretty well in life and they don't want to start wars or fights or anyone with anyone. But, but it's, it's only when dark energies really come over them that fights break out and things turn really dark. So I do think there's an artificial amplification of our natural dark human tendencies uh, and that it tries to blend itself into our faults. You know, it tries to masquerade as us so that in the end it can blame us for it and therefore pose themselves as the solution. So, yeah, you want to go ahead? Can. Yeah, um, yeah, we, yeah, because we we had a lot of we've had a lot of discussions on this sort of stuff over the last couple of years in UFO Twitter. We we were um, one of the things I was putting forward was this interactive link between us and the phenomenon that it's like a two way valve where either we're pushing it on pushing it forward or they're pushing it forward. But the thing that you know, like Semi Van and and John Keel and a few others, Jacques Vallee, have conveyed is that. You know, this seems to manifest itself through your belief system. And I, I took that theory a little bit further and said, you know, I think if it can influence us, I don't think it can actually per se put thoughts in our head. Um, what I was saying to the, the guys, I was just ladies and gentlemen that I discussed it with one night was that I think it can like exaggerate ideas of our own, like peripheral thoughts. If you're having a bad day and if you have a peripheral thought that's a negative thought, my my postulation was that it can magnify that and make it worse, if you know what I mean, to sort of manipulate a situation. But the question I keep asking myself is, why would a phenomenon with that amount of control, that amount of invasive ability, be so non-pervasive? And why does it only seem to manifest in a small group of people? And usually people who are experiencers or people who've had traumatic events, it seems much more common there, you know? It... I've always linked it. I think one of the key things we need to investigate is the conscious link. And that seems to be where a lot of people are looking at now is intent, trying to understand its intent, if you know what I mean. Sorry to take a lot of time, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we're, when we're dealing with this phenomenon, we uh, one of the things I talked about many, many hours ago is how there's not only the, what seems to be alien-type beings, like NH, just regular NHIs, but there also seems to be an occult component to it, uh, which is separate from it. And I'm talking about either discarnate human entities or astral parasites, demons, you know, that the whole occult phenomenon, that, that whole occult sphere. We have that, and then we have uh, a related sphere, which is more of the, I don't want to call them extraterrestrials, but I, I used the term ambi-terrestrials earlier because that's what I believe they actually are. It's like biological beings who have the ability to vary their physicality between our world and uh, some parallel space-time or something like that. So we, we have at least two general classifications of negative beings that are active. And some of the more occult aspects of it, those are the beings that would, I mean, they're, they're the ones who kind of busybody themselves with our thoughts and trying to manage and trying to in, induce, uh, you know, negativity and, and fights and depression and suicide and so on. They're doing that, but they, they do it because they're more ubiquitous. Because being occult entities, they're not limited by logistical limitations, like the number of personnel you have, you know, feeding them, having a certain number of vehicles or whatever, or the energy to produce them, right? And so a lot of these more physical or semi-physical NHIs, it seems to me that they're more limited logistically in their supplies and where they can be at any particular time. So that's why they are not everywhere necessarily, or at least not as much as the occult entities are. Uh, and actually, you know, if you if you include discarnate human souls that are earthbound amongst some of the negative uh, occult forces, well, if you think about how many people die every day, and a certain percentage of them might be sticking around for a while, and they weren't nice people in life either, well, that's a lot of people that can be everywhere that people are, because that's where people die, right? So I think the occult component is way more prevalent than than the alien component, and that's why the alien component only really focuses on the certain number of people that matter to them right so because they're they're efficient they're very efficient they go for people that they think are little pivot points on the timeline that they can influence in order to influence the future and in order to uh accomplish their own agenda whether it's positive or negative so i think i think that's why it doesn't really happen to everyone but i do think however that given that people underestimate or they're not very conscious of the the level of subtle manipulation that can happen with the alien phenomenon I do think that it is more prevalent than a lot of like mainstream UFO research, researchers might give them credit for, because it, because they're thinking, oh, you know, not everyone has seen orbs, not everyone has seen uh, metallic ships in the sky, not everyone has seen greys, but 
there may be more people that are indeed being at least telepathically influenced by uh, alien powers who find it in their interest to do so without necessarily contacting those people or abducting them or giving them bodily marks through abductions and such. Um, yeah, but, but I do think there is an occult component that is more prevalent and that might be being confused with some of these negative alien activities. Yeah, I, I know he's just got his hand up, but just a quick response. Um, but I do liken it to the old Tom and Jerry cartoons where he would be faced with a decision and he had his little devil model on one side and his little angel model on the other. And I can't help think that the things we used to call the voices in our heads that gave us hints towards doing the right or wrong thing are now the evil aliens that implant thoughts in our brains. You know, it's it seems to be a progression of a similar phenomenon. Right, yeah, and of course we have our own natural organic thoughts and emotions as well, but it's just, you know, when something really strong comes on that, that has no continuity to the thoughts that came before it, uh, and it doesn't really correlate to anything you've seen online or in your life or whatever, uh, you, you got to question that, especially, especially in the intentionality behind it and what it's trying to get you to do. Because I remember, I remember being a kid and what it felt like to get thoughts in your head that didn't feel like your own and that try to push you towards doing something like putting your hand on a hot stove. I, I did that a couple of times because I felt that it wasn't just a curiosity. It was almost this weird pressure that came over me and I put my hand on the hot stove. And of course I got burned really severely and, and uh, it was, it was not a, not a good day, but yeah, certain, certain people at certain times are more vulnerable to these kinds of influences. Yeah. Kent, go ahead. Uh, you, you just reminded me of a story when I was doing an investigation of a guy who had his hand mauled in a in a chain lift, and he literally told me that he knew that he he knew that he was going to get really badly hurt, but somehow he felt this attraction to stick his hand in there. Uh, I, it just reminded me immediately of it, um, and I just wanted to let you know that was really interesting. Wow, yeah, yeah, especially if you get into the field of demonology and possession, uh, it's it's amazing how much certain people can be controlled by by external powers. Well, I've, I've, I'll, I'll shut up, I promise, but I have been in a situation where I was watching myself do the things that I, yeah, I, I've been in that situation where my consciousness was aware of the what was happening, but didn't have as much say over it as it used to the minute before, if you know what I mean. Thank you, Kent. Uh, Tom, what do you think about this idea that only negative people or negatively vibrating people have negative uh, alien abduction experiences and that if we just raise our vibration, then every, then that will go away. Um, I do, um, and I'm talking about actual alien abductions, not necessarily, you know, the beings that are just uh, hanging around feeding off of fear and such. So when it comes to that, the, the, the thing that I noticed is if you have abduction experiences going on and um, if you have these ex abduction experiences and uh, they're, they're relatively in the background, if, okay, if you focus on them a lot, you think about them all the time and especially with an attitude of fear and paranoia, then what they're doing becomes even more prevalent in your everyday conscious waking state life. It kind of bleeds into that more. But let's say you were to, uh, as the new agers say, raise your vibrations what will happen is, okay, it'll, it'll fade out a little bit from, well, even in some cases a lot from your everyday waking life. But what happens during the night when you're unconscious doesn't really change. It, it still goes on. And so what that really says is that the, one of the reasons why these negative alien abductors are so uh, covert sometimes, I do think that they are dealing with either a, a quantum free will issue or a metaphysical free will issue or something to do with that where as long as they can erase a person's memories or be really covert about it, they can get away with more than if they didn't. Maybe it's just a strategic thing, or maybe it's a time travel thing. Maybe uh, the more they affect us in a conscious way, um, in, a, in a way that they don't want, then the more it affects the future. So therefore they lose our lock on the past or something like that. You know, We can come up with all kinds of different theories about why that might be. But I did notice that that's the only time I've ever noticed consciousness having an influence on level of abduction activity. Uh, I believe that the abductions themselves don't necessarily change, um, but the amount of everyday nonsense that they engage in or that falls out of it during you know, your, your waking state, 
that seems to be influenced by it. Um, and maybe that has to do with consensus, reality, and how much our consciousness pulls into our waking reality. But as I said, when you're asleep and you're unconscious, all bets are off, unless you do some sort of protective prayer beforehand where you actually get the intercession of actual divine beings that might protect you from it. But it's not as simple as simply raising your vibrations and making it all go away. Raising your vibrations might make the more conscious stuff go away, but not necessarily the, the hidden side of life, which still continues as always. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's go to a new speaker, and then I'll get to the other hands. Ashila, welcome to the space. Hi, friends. Uh, uh, yes, Tom and everybody. Um, now, I was a rather positive person, and my experience, um, although now today moved on, I'm a lot stronger. It did make me a lot stronger from then. But from, say, going back to my childhood, I've had loads of missing time. Um, um, I did see what I would have called ghosts appear, like uh, w both family and total strangers, basically. But my own experience happened in um, July of 2016. And this was at 3 o'clock in the early hours of the morning. Um, now, however, I did see a craft beforehand. I've seen a craft twice, a uh, luminous uh, oval shape. Didn't do any harm, just ho hovered above me, didn't make a sound, nothing. So, yeah, but my own experience was uh, this entity came through my, this was just before I said my, no, I said my prayers, and then it just came through my bedroom mirror, um, and this was a reptilian. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of always kind of puzzled me as to why something like this would happen to myself. You know, as I say, and it kind of paralyzed me, you know, so I couldn't move, but I could open and close my eyes. That was all I could do, really. Couldn't scream out, couldn't get up and run. Um, and I was fully awakened at the time. You know, it would have been nice if it was just a bloody dream, but it wasn't. It was real. Um, uh, as I say, I never even knew these things even existed. So, yeah, it's not a very nice experience I didn't think um, and I was taken to somewhere kind of underground I do believe um, there was loads of other uh, of these reptilians and there was uh, people who were being kind of what the only way I can describe it kind of were being led into a kind of like an old coal mine sort of shaft with a light at the top uh, you know, but there was a, like a light down, like a tunnel type of thing. And they were walking as though they were in some form of trance. Um, and these were like military uh, reptilians. I couldn't make out the badge whatsoever, but there was a badge on their... It was like they were wearing like, uh, you know, like a bodysuit or something. Or That's the only way I can make it out, uh, basically. Um, and then there was myself. And other women were lined up and there was all these reptilians facing us. Um, not very nice to look at, to be honest with you. Um, this, uh, an awful stink from them. I, I can still smell it to this day. Um, it smelled like rotten eggs and stink bombs. Awful smell. Um, loads of missing time again I've had. Um yeah, and then I was back in my room again. Um, I do know bits and pieces, um, but I don't know everything. Um, I am more spiritually connected, um, but back then I wasn't. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I've been shown different things in, you know, the sky. Like I, I was shown a, an absolute, what looked to be a massive spaceship just floating in the sky. Uh, I don't, I don't know why I was showing it, because I can't even explain it. Um, I've been showing rocks uh, falling down from the sky, these massive grey rocks. And then the sky all that up, uh, I've seen balls of like clear light fall from the sky and vanish into the ground, so I can't even explain that either. And I, I know it sounds crazy and bonkers, but yeah, these things are bloody real. And yes, I have shared my story throughout the years. Like, I did have a photograph of it uh, way back 
and I put it up on Facebook when I'm because I, I, I was on Facebook basically. But uh, yeah, Facebook banned me, and uh, this is back years ago, and I couldn't get the photo again whatsoever. Like, so yeah, there's an awful lot of things <laughs> that I, I do believe goes on, but yeah, I would be more positive even then I was, and yes, um, I kind of did have a wee bit of a breakdown after what I had been through, basically. Um, but as the old saying goes, you climb the three, and, you know, you either sink or, you know, or whatever, and I preferred to rise, so yes, and I do expose a lot of it. So I do know there's a connection to the spiritual realms, you know, as far as I personally, in my own opinion, of course, I believe this was more inner dimensional. That's me, you know. Yeah, and the tall whites and the grey spars, I know they're humanoid. Thank you, Sheila. We appreciate hearing your story. Um, I was actually having a couple questions for Tom from your story, but do you have any questions for Tom? Um... No, I can't, as I say, I kind of know bits and pieces, and I was listening to Tom and Great Space Fringe. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me the voice. Um, I kind of know bits and pieces myself, and you know, and I have exposed an awful lot of different things. That, as I say, um, these spiritual entities, you know, like well, they fallen angels or whatever kind of have their own type of craft and they do fool people let me make it a, let me make it clear um the reptilians i do believe they're interdimensional and there's all shapes and sizes of interdimensional entities here they've been here for thousands of years and as i say they also have their own crafts and stuff so you know <laughs> that's what it is i suppose <laughs> just keep exposing them <laughs> Yeah, keep it up, Sheila. Um, we we need people like you um, exposing exposing uh, them and, and telling your story and uh, making it safe for other people to tell their story as well. Um, Sheila, I don't know if you um, know that we have a space on Wednesdays um, for experiencers uh, to share their stories. If you want to pop into that space, we would really appreciate you. Um, just from your question or, or from you telling your story, Sheila, I was going to ask Tom, um, Tom, what is the relationship between reptilians and ships? Because I don't think we hear a lot about reptilians being on ships. We hear about reptilians mostly being in underground bases and such. Have you heard of reptilians being on ships? Yeah, I do believe that. Eve Lorgan, um, some of her research involves reptilians that are, that are seen on ships. However, they don't seem to be, I, I, I don't think I ever remember hearing a story of someone being on a ship where it was nothing but reptilians. So that's interesting. They're usually seen in the company of others. So perhaps they're like guests, or they're not even you know they're not they're not the primary occupants of the ships, but uh, they're they're attending an abduction for their own reasons. So for most of the cases that I've heard, yeah, it's not just underground bases, but some of them, if not all of them, do seem to be interdimensional to some degree, <clears throat> more so than even the greys. Like to me, if I if I had to give one description of what the, the majority of reptilian cases sound like to me it sounds almost like they are uh genetically engineered vessels for uh demonic consciousness so imagine if you could take a demon and house it in a biological body and give it interdimensional abilities to me that is a pretty decent hypothesis of what some of these reptilians are just based on their behavior right because you don't you don't get these these sadistic sexually crazed grays for example and even even the alien hybrids, as sexually uh, charged as they can be, they're not as violent and sadistic as even the reptilians are. So, uh, the modus operandi of a lot of these reptilians, based on descriptions, fits more what demons are like if they had physical bodies. So, if, if there's any if there's any alien that is going to be fingered in a lineup for being a demon in a in a body, it would be the reptilians. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting because I've described um, these reptilians I've dealt with as demonic and reptilian at the same time. And um, I think that confuses people. And I've actually seen these very same beings um, 
on what I perceive to be a ship and also what I perceive to be underground. So it gave me some confusion on there. So thanks for that. Um, let's go to, okay. Who's been holding longest? Does anybody remember? I know it's not Kent. So let's go to Isho. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Tom, I wanted to continue a little bit with what we talked earlier, because I've been giving the chance to speak three times now. So I was kind of round up with this kind of question. It's about putting all the eggs in one basket kind of idea. And so all of us here are most likely very concerned with what's going on in society, what's happening with the politicians and what's happening with, say, the World Economic Forum and the people implementing a form of pseudo communist, fascist, tyrannical, authoritarian regime on everyone. And if you've been following China for a while, you can see that it's very... I would say Holocaust 2.0-esque, very nasty. And there is a movement online that goes by the, the letter Q and all the people that follow the whole Q movement. And I've been following them for four years. Uh, and I've also been on their Telegram uh, channels. I've seen the information they're disclosing but we were talking earlier about this whole good cop bad cop routine like kind of you know who is the good guys and bad guys in terms of, of the aliens and when i look at this movement i see a lot of people jumping on a bandwagon trusting it completely without doubt they are promising a lot of miracles like resurrecting dead people and med beds and treatments for cancer and stuff like that but when i look at what they're actually doing it's like nothing is actually happening they're not really disclosing anything no one is getting arrested the people from that <clears throat> island is uh, roaming freely uh, philanthropists like bill gates is it has free reign to do whatever he wants together with the chairman of the world economic forum and i'm thinking like should we put all the eggs in one basket when it comes to this whole q movement are they trustworthy have you been following them have you seen what they're promising and what they're talking about because a lot of them claim to be part of the majestic 12 a lot of them are talking about aliens like the galactic federation they are actively quote helping us and so on forth but as we talked about earlier you know is this another red herring is this another you know psyop or or, or what's going on so i would like to hear your idea about that but that's my last question for tonight yeah, well, all right, so so this topic is way bigger than we can even get into here, so I'll just be brief, and I'll say a couple things on it. Uh, number one, uh, what you're talking about with the med beds and um, the, the, the Galactic Federation stuff, that's not, that's not anything that's in the original source material, okay? So you have to separate the source material from everything that's been glommed onto it by grifters and, and LARPers and so on. So there's this whole, like, crazy component that, that has built itself around it, um, that if you just ignore all that and you just look at just the source material, that that can cut away a lot of confusion. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what about all this noise? What about the surrounding all these grifters and larpers and perhaps even disinformation? What is up with that, right? Is it is it uh, is it some sort of another uh, opposing government psyop to counter a, another psyop from a different faction of the government? Very possible, you know. Is it is it just a bunch of grifters capitalizing on it? very, very possible. So I think it's a mix of all, all these things. And in terms of the original source material being a PSYOP, uh, yes, I, I do think it's a PSYOP, but not necessarily a negative one, because I do think that it might actually, in fact, be part of the disclosure process. Because if you think about it, if there is collusion between negative NHI factions and elements of the government or the shadow military, whatever you want to call it, if there's a collusion between the two, then that human component of it, it's not just isolated and underground basis. No, it's its actually part of, um, it's its doing things in the world. Like if you consider the Michael Herrera account of being, of seeing basically people in black uniforms loading cargo containers, which probably had bodies in them into UFO, like an artificial you know, anti-gravity U.S. government ship or something like that. Well, that that's an example of black, black ops, human smuggling and gun running using anti-gravity technology, right? So if you're going to have disclosure of aliens, like fuller disclosure, like honest, more full disclosure, we can't do just the alien component. You would also have to disclose the corrupt human component that has been feeding into it using its technology, colluding with it, right? 
And so I think that's where that original source material that you're talking about fits into that. I think if you look at just it and what it tries to expose and what it tries to get people to research, it's getting people to research that element of it, the human element of corruption that ties into it. And uh, yeah, that's as far as I'll, I'll go on that here. Yeah, and then the whole uh, the white hats are coming to save the day thing is obviously an issue with all of that stuff as well. Um, let's see. Uh, Hello, Cypher. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I know we're not supposed to be sharing experience, but I'm trying to keep with the topic title still. But uh, there was an interesting thing that happened when I was working up in the Arctic. I knew about some of the lore about these supernatural sort of creatures that they believed in. I'm not even sure if I can pronounce it properly because the Nukti Tuk is nearly impossible unless you're really good at linguist um but it's like an ijult and they're supposedly shape shifters of sorts so i had um met a friend out there who had been living up there for a while and he took me to some of these sacred spots and uh i got an interesting message when i was uh Kind of just pulled one of these spots and i was just told to kind of shut up and sit down and listen and i saw some pretty weird stuff that i know is not at all this is not mainstream fodder i'm just going to throw this out there but uh this is the last known civilization today that's still using hieroglyphs and maybe that's the analytical overlay here but it uh appeared very interesting that in these supernatural characters, they take children, which is kind of weird, um, a weird proclivity for a supernatural being to do. Um, so it doesn't exactly sound benevolent, but who knows? Um, what I found interesting is that this set of beings were blue skinned. They were tall ish looking. I couldn't get a fix on it. I didn't at the time, I had no idea what to make of it. So I had a particular channeled reading through somebody that I have sort of gained to trust. I mean, I still, you know, grain of salt. I have read a lot of the fantastic trans material out there, like Ra and uh, Seth and that sort of thing. Casey, of course. And um, there's something going on at the Arctic, man, with this uh, Inukti took language, this last hieroglyphically used uh, language that's really fascinating if you ever get the chance to listen to somebody run through the vocal range of the vowel structure it's literally mind-blowing but uh, what came out of this when i went to this trance reading is i asked like what's this connection between this et group and this inukti took hieroglyphic using group because as far as we know they got hieroglyphics they developed it there's no story that i'm rifting off that says they got it from aliens and yet in this channeled reading they said actually these supernatural beings that they referred to were actually part of this visiting group and it was them that mentioned this connection with arcturus and that's the first i've ever heard of it so i'm just wondering if anyone else has heard about this connection and if this is a standalone the only interesting thing i could say to complete this thought is that they gave me this is pretty rare but in the trance channeling they gave me a rare name like it, i know there's lots of skeptical people out there but just just check this out i've never heard this uh person who does the channeled reading for me break into another language particularly in took which is as again it's pretty hard language to fake because it involves like african kind of pops and clicks and they said a name in trance that had to do with the Arcturans' name for our planet. And they said it was, uh, uh, let's see if I can remember how to say this properly here, uh, uh, Octonuk, if I'm saying that remotely close. But I couldn't actually reproduce it with one of the local natives. Uh, who knows Inuktitut very well. He happened to be a Star Trek fan, so it's like we got along really well. And uh, I couldn't say it right, so he didn't know what the hell I was saying. I, I got into the audio recording, and I played it for him. I'm like, listen, just check this out. And he hears the actual, the guy in the in the transmediumship saying the name. And he goes, oh, yeah, okay, I know, I got it. And he writes it down on a piece of paper for me. And I go, well, what does it mean? And he goes, coming home. And I was like, you got to be shitting me. 
Like the the chances of that. Anyways, I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't know whether they're benevolent or malevolent. I just thought it was very interesting that we clearly have seeding. Uh, I don't know, call them builder races. I know this is like a pop term that's been thrown around, but it seems like I don't know if we've gotten anywhere with this discussion. But it seems like if we're partly seeded, partly genetic hybrid, partly, you know, I don't think it's just Anunnaki as a cold one-stop shop. I think there's more dis to discuss around our interconnections with a genetic type experiment. And I'm wondering, Tom, what you think about all this. So, yeah, you know, yeah, it kind of reminds me of a, a book by Dolores Cannon called uh, "The Legend of Star Crash." It's uh, it's based on her hypnotic regressions of some people, and she she was hypnotically regressing a client, a woman, and in the middle of it, all of a sudden, some other entity takes over. Uh, I mean, probably a nefarious entity, but who knows, right? But it, the entity seemed to be it was it was pretending or opposing, or actually was her higher consciousness recounting a past life where she or someone she knew was uh, basically part of an, a, a small alien group, a small alien group that crash landed somewhere, I think, in Alaska, something like that. And they sort of integrated with the local native tribe there. And uh, so the whole book is the story of that that came out through these sessions. And it's, it's really interesting. The, um, I mean, even, even if it ends up being fiction, it's still really interesting to get their perspective of how these, these alien beings would interact with a local native tribe and integrate with it. And what the perspective is of Earth, you know, like there was one part where they were looking up at our moon and marveling how big it is because there's no other planet they knew that had a moon that large relative to, to, to the planet, which is true. You know, if you look, look at all other planets in the solar system, none of them have moons that are this large. Uh, so which speaks to the anomaly of the moon itself. And it'd be ironic if uh, you had one group of aliens marveling at a mystery that's actually caused by uh, another group at some other, some other point. Um, but regarding your thing particularly about Arcturus and this particular language and so on. That's really interesting, you know. Um, thanks for sharing that. And uh, I do look forward to looking into that more. Kent, go ahead. Yeah, um, oh, I've said too much already today. I just wanted to mention, I, I, I love coming into the spaces and hearing all the different stories. I just think it, it behooves us to get to a point where, where at least the governments are acknowledging that these phenomena are real. And so people can actually come forward and we can get better descriptions of you know, whether it's malevolent, benevolent, or whether it's a sort of spectrum of all of the above. It, you know, we, we need that sort of, I know people don't say we don't need the governments, but we do need some level of, you know, official engagement so that people can get money for research. People can get money to, you know, psychologists will be interested in studying it as a real thing instead of a delusion. So I just wanted to say, you know, I'll, I'll sit back and listen, but... I just think all of these stories, all of these theories behoove us to, as a community to make sure that we get this officially acknowledged as reality and then we can try and understand which reality it sort of really is. I, I know it's a ramble, but... Yeah, 100%. I totally 100% agree with you. that. And see, here's the thing. Uh, if you want to get to the point where humanity can have enough discernment to not get totally taken in by, de by deceiver aliens, you can't even get to that point of... The consensus is that aliens don't even exist, right? So you have to get that initial acknowledgement at least. You know what? Of all the different types of disclosure that are possible, if we get a government disclosure that says, yes, they are real and they are here, and that's all they say, I think that would have the, the most amount of positive impact with the least amount of negative impacts as far as uh, destroying society. So my, my bet is that that's probably the way they're going to go initially. It's just uh, do a very timid, uh, limited form of disclosure, which will be good for us because hey, as long as the internet is still up and they haven't yanked that, then we'll be able to discuss it, right? We'll be able to get more people interested and engaged in combined resources in order to figure out what's going on. Because otherwise, you know, to get to the point of discernment, there's like eight or nine questions that a person has to get past to even get to that point. Like, is there something anomalous going on? Yes or no? Is it intelligent? Is that intelligence non-human? Is the non-human intelligence, uh, is it all just one thing, like some ultra-terrestrial hypotheses, believe, or, or is it actually different factions? And if it's different factions, well, are some of them hostile? And are these hostile forces pretending to be benevolent? Finally, at that point, can you get to the point where you can say, okay, well, uh, yeah, so then how do we discern between the genuine and the fake benevolent ones? 
So yeah, if you don't get to that point, then that question's not even going to come up and people are just sitting ducks uh, for when that day finally comes and they have no choice and no ability to communicate with one another because let's say the internet is down or there's been some sort of an EMP attack and there's no electricity anymore, then we are kind of sitting ducks, like I said, because we should have been having that discussion beforehand, right? So the sooner the better, I guess. Uh, Lyra, welcome to the space. Do you have a question for Tom? Um, hi, guys. This has um, been a really great space to listen to with some really different perspectives. And um, I've not um, heard of Tom before, sorry to sound ignorant. Um, but, yeah, it's been interesting to kind of listen to your take on things as well. And um, just your outlook is, um, yeah, I, um, I'm Aboriginal from Australia. So um, I was sort of, I've been listening for some time, but it was something that um, Holly said that, just kind of got me interested where I sort of wanted to say, but um, when he was talking about the tribes in <clears throat> Antarctica, um, some of those stories kind of reminded me of our own cultural stories and, um, you know, having words for Alpha Centauri and things like that, things that we should not have had knowledge of. And, and um, you know, and that came from the dreaming, which is basically similar to shamanism and, you know, reaching that, level of initiations and culture and things like that I think someone brought up you know pain and trauma and that's basically a precondition for the next level of enlightenment to some extent so um yeah I just found it quite interesting we did also like we have stories of things that um you know to be cautious of that will take babies and stuff like that and and kids as well so um and these stories, it's interesting when you look at the root of how they formed. So basically it would be usually someone, either bad thoughts, um, calling on for assistance and someone helping in some way or, um, you know, you could be doing evil things and then, you know, um, you're allowing yourself to be basically open and and that entity kind of coming into your space and then, you know, you either hone it or you don't. It's something that, you know, if you were to take, be taken over, you then sort of people talk about the Karachi man in our culture. And so the Karachi man, yes, we see him as a boogeyman, but he's not actually a boogeyman. He is a witch doctor who has either, <clears throat> well, it depends as different things. So the witch doctor, you have a Karachi man and then you have Featherfoot. Um, so the Karachi man is the law man. Um, the witch doctor is the one that is a seer, if it's a female, witch doctor, if it's a male. Um, and then we would have Featherfoot would be basically when the Karachi man has been taken over by the spirits or a witch doctor, then they become Featherfoot and that's when they're basically stealing kids and things start to happen in that realm. But um, I just wanted to ask, when you spoke about different factions and things like that, um, because I'm of the belief of inter interdimensional, things are always there. It's just whether we're open to them or not, depending on where you are. A lot of our spiritual connected areas lay on ley lines or very much so magnetic areas. And so... Um, colonization basically connected a lot of our areas with trauma. So they put literally put missions, which are similar to reservations in America, um, on our spiritual connected areas. So I think that, you know, there's a massive attack happening here as well. And they want to, like, they're trying to rewrite our history here now. And, and um, I'm sure that uh, most cultures over the world could say our history has been rewritten, but they're literally rewriting our stories and telling them wrong. And it's, um, you know, this is books from the 80s I'm talking about. And so it's, yeah, so when you speak about different factions and interdimensional, do you sort of feel like there's stuff that is coming here and it's separate or things that are sort of always here? I think for the most part it's always been here. But even, even amongst the forces that have been here, there are different uh, classifications of beings, right? We have the more occult beings, which a lot of uh, native people are familiar with because they deal with the spiritual realm and they're not locked into 3D physical reality like a lot of the West is due to our materialistic paradigms. So they're way more open to it and they're more psychic, usually more intuitive. Uh, my mother, for example, she's from Singapore and her mother was originally from China, but she lived in Singapore and uh, she was extremely psychic. Uh, extremely psychic and she was a shaman 
So she was totally in touch all the time with spirits and was able to communicate with them and help people out with their occult problems. So some of that got passed down to my mom, uh, my mom who was kind of psychic, and then a little bit of that then got passed down to me. Um, so I don't really consider myself a psychic, but I think it did help in making me more open to experiencing and therefore being able to think about a lot of these paranormal issues. Now, back to, back to your question, uh, regarding different classifications of beings, right? So some of them seem to be more, uh, I don't want to use the word spiritual, uh, but I mean spiritual in the sense of non-physical rather than like uh, divinely oriented and, and good and benevolent, right? So there are beings that are, are spiritual beings that are non-physical, is what I mean. And, and those are the ones that are more common, and they're the ones that are more commonly experienced and therefore understood. Whereas some of these alien powers that we've been discussing tonight, they seem to be smaller in number, and they seem to be more uh, focused in who they contact and what their agenda is. Uh, now, unfortunately, just as a lot of the, the colonizers have attempted to erase native history, in some ways that's a microcosm or like a trial run or uh, a pattern that could, re could repeat itself on a global scale for humanity as a whole, should the alien uh, hybrid breeding program succeed and basically take over the planet and uh, replace our leadership with their own hybrid leadership. I think a lot of our culture will be erased at that point and we'll be gradually assimilated into their, their particular alien empire. So did you want to follow up uh, with a question on that, Lair? Um, yeah, I just, just wanted to add, so like you're saying sort of the benevolent, but also the other, and I do want to say that we also have like rituals and, um, you know, different spiritual um, calls that we do for different um, other beings. And so the government's actually just taken one of our ways of calling on the Pleiadians and literally just pumped it across the nation. It's actually quite, <laughs> it's insane how that's happened over here. Um, but yeah, so like a lot of our, um, you know, we're calling on different spirits, different areas have different spirits as well. They have different names. So, and it depends on what area you're into, what type of spirits, you might have water spirits. And so, yeah, and also at the same time, um, when something can happen, extreme murder, death, things like that, it can create spirits as well. Yeah, right. Uh, if you yeah, if you study that sort of thing, or if you're into occultism and, and the way everything that works in that sphere, uh, the concepts that you're talking about are completely familiar, right? But it's just it just uses different terminology. But it does, doesn't matter what country you're in, what tribe you're part of. If you're you know some some Western Rosicrucian person or some psychic shaman in Singapore, right? You, you all start experiencing the the other side of life, and uh, you, you come to your own ex uh, pattern recognition about it, and you give it your own name. But uh, the names may differ, but ultimately it all ends up being the same phenomenon. Thank you, Lyra. Uh, Valentine, go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? Hey, nice well, to see you. If it's morning where you are, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I got nothing else. <laughs> yeah. but go ahead. So I'm relatively new to this whole topic. Uh, but I have been interested in it for a long time. Just to give a little background, I am born and raised Catholic. I believe in God. I would say that I see myself as a good person and a rational person. Uh, and like I said, I have kind of have a, a skeptical mindset. But the only part that kind of resonated with me is the part of regarding like having malevolent entities either pushing dark thoughts or something like that into your brain to be uh fully transparent it's like i'm not like constantly thinking of things but i'm like every once in a while you may get the flash of like doing something bad to people that you would never ever in your million years think of doing you know something to you and i'm i'm wondering is that believed to be like an entity trying to push a dark thought into your mind or yeah, well, see, here's a, yeah, yeah, right. So it, it can be, and and the way you know for sure is uh, that the probability of that being the case goes up the more persistent it is, and the more alien or foreign it is to your natural stream of consciousness. Because sure, uh, maybe you saw subliminally an ad for a horror movie, right, and it did something to your subconscious, and now you got a certain violent thought in your head. Okay, well, maybe maybe that's the case. But if that were the case, then how would that explain, let's say, getting nightmares and your kid seeing a shadow figure down the hallway and your cat freaking out? You know, you know what I mean? Once you start getting an actual uh, demonic presence going, you start getting other symptoms that indicate something more than just a psychological reaction is going on. So in your case, uh, if, it, if it was like a one-time thing, eh, you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But if you start getting more things, then, then do look out for that and uh, 
uh, if you need to, like contact someone or research the subject to, to kind of mitigate it before it really blows up. Yeah, uh, in the case that I'm talking about, it's, it's been maybe something that pops in very rarely, like maybe once, uh, two, three months or whatever. It's, it's not like a persistent thing, but it's like, I wonder if other people experience a thought like that. Like, and you, and you know that that is definitely not the person that you are and you're rationally aware of what's going on. Oh yeah, totally. I've had that and I know others who have had that. And for them, if they, uh, if it got more frequent and they didn't watch themselves and they let it go, then, um, if they let themselves go, then yeah, it, it does get worse. And in some cases for people that are vulnerable to it, either through a lot of drug abuse or maybe latent schizophrenic tendencies, it can really get bad. Right. So you do have to nip that in the bud before it gets really bad. Thank you. For, thank you. Kent, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I just met, wanted to mention a synchronicity with Lyra just then. She mentioned the Featherfoot, and uh, my a friend of mine's son-in-law was Ted was from Northern Territories in Australia, and him and his wife when she went up there, um, he told her all about the Featherfoot and and the stuff you said, Lyra, was just really sort of sparked me. It just wow, it was it was exactly what she said. Um, so I just thought I'd, I think that was interesting, but. I wanted to mention to Tom the um, Deepak Chopra book, uh, Synchronicities. After I read it, it made so much sense to me, if there's any rhyme or reason, reason to sort of life, that this synchronicity thing was real. And we, I just literally had one with Lyra. And um, I, I was just going to say, what do you think of, you know, the sort of the concept that without sort of, you know, doing injustice to Mr. Dr. Chopra, um, the, the concept was that, you have coincidences or synchronicities in your life for a reason and you can either take a, a positive aspect from it or a negative or a neutral aspect from it but that if you choose the positive aspect if you see it as a a glimpse to a better future or a an epiphany that sort of thing that you can use synchronicities to better your life in a very in a very positive and rapid way um and I I just wanted to quickly you know finish that with um that for me in 2000, I was virtually at sort of zero after being quite a successful businessman. I'd, I'd lost everything. And then, but through that same concept in 2017, I retired. So for me, synchronicities, understanding them and sort of using them for want of a better word to, to help, um, have really sort of helped my life. I wondered what you thought of that sort of concept. Uh, well, synchronicities are have been a part of my life for for many years, and I, I did a I did a, as a scientific of a study as I could of it by logging it all and, and correlating it and seeing what the patterns were. And so, the end result of that, I actually put into a uh, an interesting YouTube video called uh, I think it's called Synchronicities: uh, Seven Different Types in Quantum Origins, something like that. It's on my YouTube channel, so if you go to youtubecom slash Tom Montauk. Uh, should be up there near the top somewhere. Anyway, um, so with synchronicities, the, the main thing I wanted to, to bring up on that is some synchronicities simply cannot be attributed to confirmation bias, and it cannot be attributed either also to, let's say, uh, alien manipulation or even, even demonic manipulation. Some of it seems to be too subtle, too elegant, and involving too many elements um, for it to be that. And, I mean, and in fact, negative entities do try to... Uh, sometimes to do something like synchronicity, but it is faked. It's like artificial. And to give you an example of that, uh, for example, let's say let's say that negative entities want to get you uh, into a, a cult. And, and this is an example that I cite in my video. So imagine negative entities want to lure, lure you into a cult where the cult leader has been taken over by one of these entities so that therefore you can be abused and fed upon and your life made hell, all right? How would it do that? Well, it could do it by... For example, telepathically dropping a thought in your head of a particular image, let's say a symbol or a color, you know, something like that that relates to the cult, but you don't know it yet. You don't know that that's what it means. Well, the next day you're walking and you see a book just left on the sidewalk, and the book is written by this guy who happens to be that cult leader. Wow, weird, like who left that book there? And then that exact day, um, you get an email from a person you haven't heard from in five years, and this person mentions something that relates to this cult, Okay. So all of a sudden you realize, wow, what if this is a sign from God? What if this is the universe trying to get me to read this book and get interested in it and maybe reach out to these people, right? I mean, this sounds kind of contrived, but it just it kind of illustrates the point that through telepathic manipulation and, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Just, just through telepathic manipulation, it's possible to create artificial synchronicities 
that aren't good for you. But then again, you know, there are genuine synchronicities that don't involve multiple people coming at you and, and trying to convince you to go down a questionable path that goes against your intuition, right? And so you have to kind of differentiate between the two. And genuine synchronicities, well, there's really no ulterior motive payoff to it when you think about it. It's not trying to convince you to do something that goes against your intuition. Most often, and actually, it, it merely gives you a heads up or it gives you a confirmation of something that you already intuitively and logically uh, feel deep down. Like, you know, if you're making a major life decision and you go ahead and make it and you feel good about it and you go outside and, you know, there's this magical double rainbow or something at that exact moment, well, maybe that's a sign from the divine that you're on the right path, right? Because it doesn't go against what you know and what you feel. Uh, whereas if something is trying to be forced on you, like a, like a sleazy used car salesman trying to do a sales pitch on you, but it's really these occult entities trying to convince you, well, in that case, don't go along with it just because it's miraculous and you can't explain it in a material way because, you know, it might be negative forces. So check out my video sometime when you guys got time. Um, and I, I kind of go into how to differentiate between the different types of synchronicities and uh, how to make use of that in your life. Uh, hello, Cypher. Go ahead. Um, I'm just actually preparing the question. Maybe uh, Valentin wants to go. Oh, boy. There is preparation of a question. I cannot wait. Valentin, go ahead. Yes, yeah, just another follow-up question regarding like Scientology. I've read vaguely about it, and I, I believe they have a uh, relief of either different entities that kind of play a role into a person and uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I think, I think Scientology for the most part, it's a mix of science fiction and it's a mix of knowledge and techniques that L. Ron Hubbard gained from his association with uh, basically black ops elements, you know, secret society, black ops elements. He, he kind of took that knowledge and then he wrapped it up and he packaged it as his own new religion in order to, uh, man, this probably sucks for any Scientologists that are listening, but yeah, so it, it basically created a new religion that ultimately ended up being a, another control mechanism that these, these uh, government shady military intelligence groups could use for recruitment and mind control. That's my personal view on it. But as far as like the ideology of it, uh, you know, even, even if something is science fiction, a lot of times it borrows from other fields. So I think the elements of it that are legit or that seem right, it's not because Scientology is, is good and legit. It's because it borrowed from legit sources. So that's what I attribute it to. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a fan of it. All right. Uh, let's go to a, a list question um, while Hollow Cipher is working on his um, question. Uh, how do you see disclosure unfolding? And then uh, just right now, as we see it right now, do you see the ones pushing for disclosure as the positive side and the ones um, trying to stop disclosure as the negative side? Uh, I think the ones that are trying to stop disclosure, I think there's both some positive and some uh, negative elements to it, and they, they're they doing it for their own reason. And likewise, for the ones that are pro-disclosure, there are ones that are more positive and ones that are more negative for their own reasons, right? So it's almost like you've got four different possibilities, one, you know, two on the pro and two on the anti. Now, the ones for the pro-disclosure, uh, and, I'm, and I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this happening. So I do believe that David Grush, for example, whether he knows it or not, he is part of a, of a more um, positive disclosure element only because he's getting into topics and he, and he specifically brings up topics that are normally taboo. And they're definitely not looked upon well by uh, some, of these, uh, some of these negative alien abduction groups you know, based on their disinformation that's been put out over the years. It kind of goes against that narrative. Uh, meanwhile, there's another pro-disclosure group that seems to be more in line with the alien disinformation that's been put out for, for many years. So I think uh, on the pro-disclosure front, watch for at least two different groups that are kind of competing back and forth, you know, and uh, both both for disclosure and anti-disclosure. But I think as time goes on, it's going to become more clear which one wins out. And ultimately, uh, it's, it's hard to say because so much is up in the air right now. And so much depends on which political powers uh get into office, if at all, even if there is an election, right? I'm not saying there will be or won't be, but if there isn't an election, then this won't even matter. But if there is, then whoever remains in power or gets in power will have a pretty big influence on, um, will have a pretty big influence on the way disclosure is going to go. Because you could, I'm, I'm trying not to get political, but you could that, almost, okay, you could, you could, okay, you could almost say that there are, I don't know, it's like a, I can't even voice it, but basically, 
it seems to me that certain political groups, you know, the whole like the, the groups that are aligned with the whole Great Awakening idea, right? And then there's other political groups that are aligned with the Great Reset idea. And the whole populist movement with tr- the Trump stuff and the MAGA and so on, on the surface, it seems that they are pushing for the Great Awakening movement aspect of it. And part of it does seem to involve uh, having a fuller disclosure, especially dealing with negative aliens, uh, that element of it, uh, especially the, the rogue military groups that have no oversight that have been colluding with some of these negative alien groups. And I think Grush will be, uh, will be more uh, forthcoming about that kind of stuff, plus you know other whistleblowers that will come. But right now, I don't know, honestly, uh, I think it's a little bit too early to tell which way it's exactly going to go. So to me, um, I'm seeing a couple of different competing disclosure factions, each moving on their own front uh, towards it, you know, like like for example, like why is it that Obama, with his Netflix production crew, is producing a series on the Betty and Barney Hill abductions? Like why is he getting in on that? And then at the same time, you've got other people on the other end of the political spectrum also pushing disclosure, right? So there, there's different political angles that are both pushing disclosure, but um, in alignment with their own agendas. And it's because certain NHI agendas seem to be aligned with certain political agendas more so than others, that therefore we get this diversification of different human groups that seem to be playing into different alien agendas. So what if different current events are actually just puppet shows being put on by competing alien agendas? What if, it's, what if these are actually ultimately proxies for different NHI agendas, good or bad? Um, and I do think that if you look like long term, like long term, if you look at uh, the Trump agenda, the people that are backing him, uh, going back many, many decades, you know, back uh, to Werner von Braun and JFK and uh, the Philadelphia experiment and so on. You're, you're basically talking about a group of American elite technocrats in alignment with factions of the military industrial complex that are behind a lot of it. And there's really no telling what potential alien groups they are allied with. But if you take seriously the the theory that our government did make deals with them, like the Granada Treaty in the in the 1950s, for example, what if the entire government? What was the, what? What if parts of the government didn't go along with that? You know, what if some of them wanted to have relations with certain alien groups over others, but then um, the majority faction of the military industrial complex went out and made deals with other aliens, like Greys and the Reptilians, in exchange for technology, for permission to abduct the citizenry? Okay, well. If the entire government or the entire uh, shadow military back then wasn't aligned with it, it's potentially possible that some of them have still been active over the decades. Uh, not only the Collins elite, but others like them that are perhaps more reasonable. And they could still be active today and could still be playing a hand in current events. Which is all to say that what we see in the news, what we see on television going on in the world, for the most part, it's just, uh, just a shadow play on a cave wall. And what's really going on are things that we can't even know about because it's all classified and could all be playing out different types of alien agendas that we don't really know. So that's uh, sort of complex, but wanted to get it off my, my chest. Yeah, could I offer some <laughs> something on that, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Well, I believe in the last congressional uh, testimony about this issue, we've had some pretty good experts. But what I disliked about that testimony was the last expert said he couldn't talk a lot about certain issues. So for most of his testimony, he said he couldn't talk about it. One wonders why he was even there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Good point. If I, if I can sort of extend, uh, I'm sorry, really quickly, uh, Fringe, if I can sort of extend your question, and we say we apply it just to NHI, right? So if there are NHI influencing pro-disclosure and influencing against disclosure, can you apply the same question there? Um, and and include in that, if if um, let's say a, a, a cataclysmic cycle is more on the order of fifteen to twenty years away, in other words, a, a, a potential disaster is part or intrinsic to what would have to be included in disclosure. Can we apply that same metric, um, or or would there no longer be a four grid matrix? Would it just be uh, two? Um, let's see. Well. The, the anti-disclosure group is not going to win out only because, like you said, if there if there is like a some sort of a global event, uh, a timetable that that neither the government nor these these uh, non-human intelligences can control, you know, some sort of a global disaster cycle, then then everything, the entire timetable is hitched to that. You know, it's it's always hitched to the thing that they can't control. The timetable that they can't control is the one that they have to arrange their own timetable relative to. 
So I think a disclosure or something like it, it has to happen sooner or later. Uh, and, and then the later would, would mean some of these beings just showing up and doing their thing, you know, like, like screw consensus, screw secret government treaties and deals about keep, keeping secret. They're just going to go for it. And, and that would be the most catastrophic disclosure of all because up until that exact moment, people are not going to be believing in it and therefore not researching it and therefore not even entertaining the question of discernment. Um, so, so in that case, it's very interesting you say the timetable is going to determine what the NHI would have to do, right? A cataclysmic timetable that's natural. But why would they have to disclose? Why couldn't, why couldn't we just have a failed disclosure resulting in an apocalypse? So getting back to it, um, why, why would they have to disclose in the first place? And, and I think the reason is, is because they want to manage the chaos and they want to decide what comes out on the other side. They don't just want like blank depopulation and total chaos, uncontrollability, because then anything could come out of that. Um, and, and if we know anything from abduction and contact accounts is that they are control freaks. They're control freaks about the future by managing information, managing perception about them, right? So when we're heading into this, uh, like, a, like, a, like the rapids in a river, when we're heading towards that, they want to manage it as best as possible, as well as the government. You know, the government is always in the business of trying to maintain control. And uh, they do it for both altruistic and non-altruistic reasons, right? Altruistic would just simply be, we don't want anarchy. We don't want people being eaten by cannibals because there's no food anymore because the supply chain collapsed, right? They, they don't want that. So they want to manage things as, as, as good as possible. Uh, and likewise, with these NHIs and what they perceive as their livestock, they want to manage it. The storm is coming. They want to lock them in the barn, uh, you know, get them ready for it, to weather it, and then come out on the other side and, uh, you know, uh, put, the, put the cows back on the pasture. So I think that's what they're doing. And they, they don't want uncontrolled chaos because it leads to unpredictability and therefore loss of leverage. Tom, that's really interesting. Um, I, I don't want to have like a, a debate or try to persuade you. But I've, I've honestly had this fairly recently in the last year, and I think other people have, not specific to NHI, but in general, it seems like the entropy that we're seeing is would be naturally occurring, but is being artificially accelerated by like 20 years. And, you know, I know, I know we're not supposed to, to talk about COVID, right? But as an example, the result of of COVID has been accelerated deglobalization, for instance, right? Um, and it's also resulted in accelerated, let's say, uh, devaluing of the currency, whether that was the, the goal or not. And so we're seeing entropic forces that that are more entropic than they would normally occur naturally. Um, is there maybe, or are you open to being open-minded over the next few years that perhaps the control that they're after is post cataclysm at a maximally reduced population, save for the ones that are meant for the metaphorical or literal arc, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't, isn't there, isn't there room for this idea? Because what I'm seeing, for instance, in the election, I'm expecting maximal amount of fuckery on both sides that they're, that we're trying to, that they're trying to cause divisions within the democratic party within the Republican Party, between the parties. I'm even seeing it in UFO Twitter, and I'm not saying it's NHI, except for possibly the speaker who just entered this room. But I'm seeing sort of like an accelerated entropy that looks more directed away from control um, and more towards distraction from maybe the thing that we should be paying attention to. I'd, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really disagree with that. And um, personally, I don't consider my beliefs to be in contradiction to that or anything I've said to be in contradiction to that. So uh, I appreciate you bringing up that thought. And uh, I, I do agree with it for, for the most part. Um, now, as far as like whether they want more control or less control, uh, like I said, if you want to have controlled chaos, if you want to if you manage the chaos, you have to kind of enter into it early. So I think exactly, that's why. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's yeah. So, so that's why you need a head start on deglobalization. That's why you need a head start on uh, a depletion or a reduction of energy use, uh, calorie consumption, right? Now, my, my personal view on this is that there are at least two solutions or two, I guess, two factions. I'm not saying one's good and one's bad, but I'm saying there's just two philosophies to how you can shuttle humanity through uh, a, a global crisis, which could last decades. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be something cataclysmic like a pole shift. It can just be 
uh, I don't know, like like uh, increased seismic activity, super volcanoes that uh, prevent food from growing for two years because you know it's too much a- ash in the atmosphere, or some sort of magnetic field collapse, you know, something like that that can go on for for quite a while. If you have something like that, I think there's just two ways that you can get people through it. One, you can treat people like animals, and basically lock them down like cattle. You know, you chip them, mind control them, uh, digital surveil them, right? You get them locked down so that they can't move, and therefore they're kind of uh, like, like tranquilized and strapped to a table while we, while we go through it. And that's obviously the route that WEF and other associated groups and factions have, you know, because to them, if they're, be, if they're transhumanists, if they're materialists, then they're not going to have faith in humanity, and they're not going to believe in any sort of spirit that they need to protect, right? They, they see humans as, a, as either useless eaters or as like a natural resource to exploit, and that's how they're going to treat us. They're going to treat us like cattle. Meanwhile, if you have uh, if you have a philosophy that has more faith in humanity, then I think the alternative would be to empower humans with new knowledge and new technologies that can, for example, like a, like, like let's say some sort of a limited free energy technology or fusion or something like that, or some sort of a, a decentralized power source that can be put in each community. Well, if you do that, then you take care of a lot of the issues that are associated with these cataclysms, like. A disruption of the electrical grid, or some sort of an oil, an oil crisis that that shuts down all our factories because you know the supply the supply trucks run on petrol and they can't or on, on gasoline and they can't get to the factories. So there, there's a lot that we can still do using new knowledge, new technologies that would uh, harden our system against this crisis, and then we can make it through. Unfortunately, to get to that point, uh, you would have to. Well, first of all, like with some of these suppressed inventions, there's so many vested interests that are keeping them suppressed, right? That are killing off inventors, that are um, taking new inventions and putting them behind national security gag orders, right? You go to patent some new energy device and you get a gag order, and if you don't obey it, you, you, you get shot in the head or something. So that's been happening, and you can blame it on the deep state or on the shadow military, whatever, but that's been happening. So you have to take that element out of it first before you can liberate some of these uh, suppressed inventions and, and suppressed knowledge. So if you want that solution of empowering humanity to get it through those times using that method, you can only do it by sort of uh, neutralizing some of the, uh, the more corrupt aspects of the human power structure. And, and, you know, by proxy, therefore, a lot of these negative alien power structures as well that are supporting them. So in a way, that kind of goes back to the, uh, the, the, uh, the competition or war between opposing NHI agendas. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's not aliens versus aliens, maybe it's an alien versus divine thing. You know, what if, what if angels are actually part of the equation too and are helping certain people in subtle ways to try to get humanity onto a more positive track? But, you know, to be honest, I think, I, I, th- I, do, I do think that the ones, the, the beings that are most invested in our future are the ones that are closer to us. Angels being a little bit more distant in terms of, you know, the, the type of being and, and their priorities. I do think that if benevolent aliens exist, then they would be the ones that would be most involved in what I'm talking about here as a second solution, as opposed to the more great reset solution where, like I said, we're all underground strapped to a table eating bugs, you know, trying to, trying to get through this mini ice age or something like that. <laughs> wait, wait, just to clarify that you're saying the ones maybe not most invested, or maybe that is what you're saying, but you're saying the mo- ones with the most tangible, positive intervention would be the ones that are biologically closer to us like Nordics? Yeah, I would say so just because, well, um, well, okay, just for, for one reason only, which is that Nordics can way more easily exist in our society and our government and our power structure. I mean, and you also got like gray alien hybrids. So maybe the gray alien hybrids are trying to mimic that, you know, maybe they're trying to get a piece of the pie as well. But it, it seems to me that there are, I mean, you, you can go by certain contactee accounts. Like Jordan Maxwell, he talked about uh, a girlfriend that he had back in the 50s whose father was able to not only summon three UFOs, but was able to, you know, tell him a lot about what different alien groups there are and what the agendas are and telling him to watch out because there are negative ones that, that, you know, have, have a, have a bad design on humanity. Well, these types, they consistently come up as humans and not necessarily, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed Nordics, but, but just humans that could fit into our society and that can stay here for a very long time. That can raise families that can, uh, have government jobs or whatever, almost like, uh, like, like agent, uh, agent, well, like sleeper agents in a way of some force. And maybe they're time travelers, maybe they're not even aliens, maybe they are some sort of uh, breakaway civilization, for all I know. But there seems to be some sort of a human-like benevolent force that's here that um, may have a hand in government policy 
and also cultural shifts and uh, cultural trends. And uh, if they want to look out for the best interests of humanity, I think they would do it through the liberation of disruptive knowledge and disruptive technology and uh, any, any sort of means of upping our discernment, you know, like increasing our discernment of the negative alien agenda. So maybe that's what's going on. And this is sort of what you meant by neutralize. Is, is that correct? If there's like a, a severe infiltration of like uh, corporate contractors or, or in a government? Right. Yeah. Because neutralize, um, if you see, see, here's the thing. If there are lots of um, infiltrators of a negative sort in our government, in our military, and let's say you are a positive alien faction of some sort or a time traveler faction, you wanted to take them out. There's really no way you can just go in guns blazing and take them out because that's going to disrupt a lot of things. It's going to blow your cover. It's going to raise a lot of questions. You know, it might have some sort of a premature disclosure element to it, right? But if you can work within the system and you can uh, use parallel construction to to uh, bring evidence to light that implicates these rogue factions, like, for example, the corrupt elements of the FBI and the CIA and Department of Defense and so on, if you can do it plausibly then you can neutralize them without yet blowing the disclosure cover or, disclo- or you know, blowing your own cover of what you're trying to do. So I do detect a possibility. But can I ask you something very quickly, Ehrlich? Uh, is it confirmed, though, that the FBI, the CIA, and what did you say was the third one? I think you said uh, Depart- one, Department of Defense. Department of Defense. Are, did you, is it confirmed that they're corrupt? Well, it depends on who you believe, right? Because there are, there are sources that say it, but if those sources are not of a political orientation that you that you value highly, then you wouldn't find their claims credible, right? So ultimately, we will have to see until the courts decide what the truth actually is on the matter. Yeah, Tom, th- thank you so much. And this is just another confounding factor, right? Not completely different from the semantic confounding of, you know, benevolent or virtuous self-determination or psychopathic or narcissistic self-determination where you're kind of implying uh like a platonic a plato noble lie right like enough uh enough anonymity or or cover to not blow your cover so that you can then transparently expose the truth we're, we're dealing with with multiple layers of things that can be confused for the for the exact opposite is that a, is that a fair read Right, because if we think about benevolent forces in a very simplistic way, then that's how you arrive at the typical New Age view that you know they are these 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 gallant uh, space hotties that are here to to help us, you know, um, help us in, in a very obvious way where we're like almost like in awe of them and in worshiping them, which is the opposite of what I think genuinely benevolent forces would want to do. I think they would try to keep as low of a profile as possible and get the job done without exposing themselves and without interfering with our development as much as possible. So if they're mindful of it, then I don't see a reason why they would necessarily have to just, you know, burst themselves on the scene and be portrayed as heroes and have to give media interviews and, and, and become, uh, become a big, big, uh, altering factor of our of our culture like popular culture like that just that just takes on too much nonsense too much risk and doesn't really have a uh, payoff for anyone right so so i think they look at their options and they look at what what's the most amount of good that we can do with the lowest amount of profile and unfortunately if that's the way that they go then then in, in a way it, it also discredits their existence because there's not enough evidence of it because they're not trying to to do a, a tap dance routine on on, on the world stage so and unfortunately, when I talk about benevolent forces, I always have to say, like, if they exist, because the proof of it, even though the proof of it is there in my own personal experiences, and, you know, if you sort through all the data and put all the pieces together, it's there. It's not as there as the obvious presence of hostile NHIs. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this And, and it's, it is not an unreasonable take to at least hypothesize there may be a full infiltration. By full, I don't mean 100%, but 100% in all of the, the power positions that have full leverage from CIA to corporate contractors. There's enough time that there could already be a full infiltration and we may, maybe we shouldn't even be trying to leverage government exposure and just focus on, on creating the society we, we want. That's not a crazy idea to have, right? Right, yeah, because I don't. I mean, personally, I'm not waiting for government disclosure. Like, I'm, I'm, ideally, it would be great if it were done responsibly by genuinely, you know, good people in the government. But 
Um, partly, I think it speaks to a fallacy of depending too much on authority for truth and for action and so on. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, one of the best disclosures that could happen is some simply admitting that, yes, aliens are real and they're here, right? Cause, and, and then they shut up at that point, right? Because as, as soon as they just say that, then we have more credibility and we can, we can bring these discussions into a wider sphere and get more people on board and therefore uh, get society more prepared about how to deal with it. But uh, until that point uh, where we're having, having weird discussions late night on X, right? I mean, that's, that's where we're kind of limited for now. <laughs> Uh, Fringe, tell me how, how you want me to help you manage the room. I don't know what order we're in. I know, I know Benno, and we've got some new speakers in here. I, I will I will be any kind of enforcer, so if we have another you know, NHI uh, entrance, I'll take care of it. But uh, let me know how I can help. I think Hollow Cipher has been waiting with his formulated question. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> I was actually looking for a quote in a... Uh... Uh, a series of Taoist yoga books by a, uh, supposedly the last living Chan master, uh, Lu Kuan Yu, goes by the English name Charles Luke. Um, he's got some interesting stuff that I thought was more pertinent, and I was looking for a quote um, more pertinent just towards the internal, let's call it, uh, dark versus the light side that often we see portrayed in global mythology as a sort of one deontological light figure versus a dark figure. And I think while it's important that we're externalizing internal processes, I think it's also important not to forget uh, some of the sort of distilled wisdom of these previous uh, masters of sorts who came before all these distractions kind of overwhelmed us. But uh, one of them that I was looking at, and I'd never really heard this before in like the literature, so I thought it was very interesting that and I forget, I couldn't find the exact master in the exact period, but this is all part of like the Chan sort of uh, dynasty, uh, sort of goes in the proverb of mm, single cleaver, single chop, uh, in that you cut right through all of the BS and get straight to the core of things. And uh, one of the things this Chan master sort of emphasizes is that early forms of enlightenment come as indications that you've essentially been believing in false truths. In a sense, you break through your own mental barriers that have been confining you within your own paradigm or lens of perception. And uh, as much as I wanted to find the exact quote here, I think there's a, a, a good little proverb here I want to read out real quick. It's just a paragraph. Um, and this comes from the uh, a sutra, actually, of um, one of these masters here, if I can find Tinte school. Um, and he says here, um, he's, he's describing the, the state of mind necessary to break through. And he says, in utter serenity, the bright light penetrates, penetrates the reaches everywhere while shining stillness encloses the great void. Then contemplating worldly things, they all appear as nothing but illusions seen in dreams. And, I don't want to get too uh, prosaic with all this, but I do want to kind of cut to the chase with some of the sort of, um, we were touching upon Grush. It's kind of like we went from angels and demons over to Grush, and I had like all these things I was kind of formulating to catch up with everything we're talking about. But uh, um, I think one is getting back to a previous comment as to why Grush, let's say it like this, how he was allowed to say certain things or that certain things were vetted with him through his contacts who were all like these legal military advisors. And one of the things that they believe you need to know about most is that there was a crash in 1933 in Magenta, Italy, which clearly supports the breakaway, let's call it philosophy at this point, that uh, albeit we have a little bit of evidence pertaining to some of these breakaway groups, nothing super substantial other than to say that if there had been collusion between Italy and Germany, we have some programs that are going back. And it seems we're doing this two-step, one-step constantly where we get, we seem to go two steps forward and then we're pulled back by some kind of psychological operation that we've, I don't know, been marinating in since the dawn of time where, you know, one person, it's funny too, because I'm going to some of these conferences and you have, intelligent people like Richard Dolan, who says, nope, there's definitely no way we have this technology. And to me, 
using the single cleaver, single chop, I would go to him and say, hey, like, how much have you been debriefed on classified programs? And that should give you an idea of where you're able to at least stand with regard to the program, whereas somebody just down the way from him, David Hatcher Childress, who's published a lot of stuff on the German programs, he's like, of course we could have this stuff. So I think it's all pretty hilarious, like the discrepancy between sort of the public researchers where we're sort of willing to admit. And I think Grush is kind of sort of pulling us back to a baseline of saying like, like let's just start it somewhere near the beginning because to give you an idea of how far we are down the road now, we should at least have some context to how far this is going back in time. And, uh, then we can but can maybe... I quickly ask you, so it's the Dharma, right? That is the alien concept, or is it the 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 people who created the Dharma? I'm really confused. Is it the Dharma or is it the uh people who who create the concept? As per like what is Dharma you mean, or what do you mean? No, no, you you mentioned it, right? I was just confused. Are you referring to the philosophy is itself is alien? An alien philosophy brought to earth, or are you saying that the people who created it were the ones who were the aliens? Um, I was using the Dharma as a way that the monks used to clear a path towards the core issue. So, for example, maybe we're being managed right now through sophisticated psychological means to distract us through dangling the proverbial carrot of what's the next thing they're going to leak, keep you on your toes, hoping and wanting more. It's like the slow drip, drip, drip that we've been told is more than likely the way they're going to do this. And instead of us kind of just going, whoa, 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 what's at the core of all this is a new energy. It's a new philosophy. It's a new science so that connects. the new energy is, uh, is a thing that is from out of this world, correct? Mm, energy in terms of what? Quanta? Consciousness? What do you mean? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm a little confused now. W which part is the part that is not from here? So I think I think Holocypher used the term Dharma partially in the classical Hindu sense as it handed in as in handed from above and not so much self-determined. Right. I think I think that's sort of how he meant it. And tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, Holocypher. Um, I, I don't I don't actually delineate that it came from above because I think that's uh, as Buckminster Fuller pointed out, it's not up and down, it's in and out. So the inner dimensions, the inner centers within us is what connects us to this. Um... Yeah, I mean, you, you were kind of using it not not in a pejorative term, but more like top down rather than self-determined. Right. It shouldn't have said above. But, well, I but like self-determination, too, because it does put the scope of perception in your hands in terms of like I was saying that the Dharma master referred to the first stages of enlightenment as figuring out you've been lying to yourself. Well, that's, isn't that, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that self-determining that you're taking the, the research into your own hands to prove like, Hey, was there a ball bearing plant where the allied forces were about to attack and a bunch of these Foo Fighters came out to defend it? Well, that's 100%. a kind of yes or no answer. And if it's yeah. yes, then we've got some interesting things to discuss. Like, huh, who's yeah. flying around in these things back in the, 40s and where could that be now and where could our society be now if we were able to harness this wouldn't we all be in a better situation yeah i think it was just the term dharma because it could truly be interpreted in in either way right i think it could correct me if i'm wrong i think that he just didn't know what through what lens you were meaning it well i think the lens is to try to find to a way to cut through all of the bs that is being shoveled on us right now. Is it this? Is it that? How do we actually ask ourselves? So I think it actually is the self-determining process because it's going to be up to us. Hopefully we're not going to depend on somebody else uh, to like at the end of the day, it's going to be us kind of going through the narrative in our mind to lead us to the next step to where we take but, but action. Can I quickly go, ask this sure. Dharma is important to this, right? And so, uh, the gods of Hinduism, they're the ones who created it. So are the gods the the ones who are the part of like this, this extraterrestrial consciousness? 
Jimmy, I think he meant it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, as uh, self-determining. You can view Dharma both from the self-determining oh. perspective or from a top-down perspective. Right, right. So I think at the end of this, we have, I mean, let, let's look at it this way. If we are coming to a culmination point where we could potentially squeeze out one thing out of these dark black ops, saps, USAPs, if we could just get one thing out, and it probably have to be pretty practical, they're not going to let out their best toys. I mean, I think we should all agree, um, and this kind of brings me back to a book I'd read many, many years ago at the beginning of my search, which uh, for uh, the sake of reference was uh, originally called Abduction of the Ninth Planet, and then they retitled, the Australian guy retitled it, uh, Teobian Prophecy. And the nutshell of it is he's taken to several other planets who all admitted we've gone through what you, you're going through now, where basically governments and corporations have taken over the planet, and we all had to stand up and go into a global protest uh, where we all say this is enough. We know you guys have hydrogen technology and other technology that could free us out of this BS of anthropogenic causes, lying about the sun's role, just so many things like even younger drafts being a asteroid event. Well, if it's asteroid, there's nothing there for consciousness. If it's a solar event, you already know that the solar events cause geomagnetic influx, which causes DNA changes, consciousness changes. There's a lot more there to bite into. So we need to discern through self-determining what is beneficial to us versus what's just another hook line to veer us off from our really direct path. That's what I'm using the Dharma methodology for is stay on the path. Don't get pulled with all these little, you know, tauntings of technology. And is it, uh, you know, element 115? Well, that's impossible to make and impossible to utilize unless you're this alien set of beings whereas if you talk to insiders we've all heard enough and maybe tom will pipe in on this one is that there's a mercury drive this goes all the way back to the piranhas and the vedix and mercury and of course it's being found under pyramids in mexico it mercury is easy to get and easy to counter rotate magnetic fields and so maybe lazar is part of this steering us away again off of the straight path, making it next to impossible to reproduce. So I think we need to stay focused. And if Tom has something to chime in on anti-gravity and uh, take it from all these different avenues and little carrots dangling to steer us <laughs> off the path, and maybe he can bring us back onto it. Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, uh, I was I was driving just like two days ago. Two days ago, thinking about Element 115 and exactly what you said, how it doesn't really fit. Um, I mean, okay, look, maybe it's possible, but it doesn't really fit any physics I know, not even the fringe scalar physics stuff. It's kind of a, a an outlier in itself. And so it got me thinking, well, what if Lazar either was part of it or or he himself was uh, almost like a, like a unwitting PSYOP agent, right? Because... When he was in these programs, he had memory loss. It's, it's part of the security procedures to, to be part of it. And uh, you go in there, you do your job. And actually, you know, there was an Apple TV show called Severance. And the idea being that you get to work at a corporation in, in the lower basement levels. But in order to work there, the security is so tight that you get a chip implanted in your brain. And when you go down the elevator to go to your job, you switch into an alternate personality that has no memory of your life outside the job. And when you leave your job, you lose all memory of exactly what was going on inside that base. So that is how security measures are most likely done. You know, it's it's a, it's, it's a borrowing from alien techniques, you know, where an abductee, when the abduction starts, a lot of times they, they're in their regular waking, like, human personality. But then when the aliens come, they do a certain trigger move. Uh, well, technically, it's some sort of a psychic activation that happens in the person. The person switches over into a uh, an otherwise compartmentalized part of their consciousness. And then the entire experience, uh, including what's taught, what's trained, what's programmed, takes place in that alternate personality, right? And so when the person is brought back and switched back off, that stuff gets turned off, gets uh, spun down in that part of your, your spiritual hard drive. So you have no access to it. Um, and so I think something like that is definitely going on not only in the alien field but also in the government field and and so therefore 
what Bob Lazar claims to remember may not actually have been what he what what he actually witnessed while on the job. You know, he could have been specially selected for this sort of uh, psyop to begin with through artificially induced screen memories, you know, or some sort of uh, artificial telepathy or something like that. And and we we kind of see that a lot actually. I think that's why we get a lot of a lot of the more hokey. Uh, super soldier stuff and earlier we, we were talking about super soldier programs and how I said how there's an element of it that's, that seems really uh, not credible but then there's another element that's smaller that's more credible but all these people who have these really vivid and fully detailed and, and going on and on and on and on memories of their time in the super soldier program and so on well maybe that was part of a, of a psyop where they were part of a program but the program was to load them up with these false memories so that they can go out there and and seed all this noise to confuse the, the research field because the aliens do that too with uh, false screen memories and seeding false storylines and so on right? psionics as well uh-huh yeah yeah exactly so they they have these technologies and they do these methods and so therefore we see a parallel between what goes on in these black shadow military programs the techniques that are used in there for security for technology you know for retrieving abductees and what we see also in the alien abduction field so it's not surprising therefore that with Bob Lazar, for example, he would have either false memories or something where he believes it, but maybe that's not actually what happened, right? Now, getting quickly into the subject of anti-gravity, you mentioned mercury drives. And you know, I was going to mention the mercury beneath the pyramids in Mexico, but you mentioned it first. Yeah, they, they got pools of mercury there. There's a bunch of mercury in the pyramid in uh, China, I believe it is, uh, one of the pyramid tombs of one of the emperors. There's a huge river of mercury in there, allegedly. Um and mercury has been found in other strange places as well. So that was probably part of the ancient technology because with mercury, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. I don't want to fully get into the physics of it, but for example, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Joseph Farrell. Oh, God, I forgot his name now. But, but talking about the, the Nazi die Glocke, you know, right? You know, the, that technology using spinning mercury, for example, as a, some sort of a weird uh, anti-gravity uh, time warping device. And But see, that's just one technology, and there are other forms of anti-gravity as well, like uh, the Byfield-Brown effect, where you're using high-voltage electricity to charge capacitors to an extremely high voltage, which has effects on space-time itself, right? Uh, you can do that. And they got Podkletnov's work with superconductors and uh, very high current impulses. So I'm, I'm familiar with all that stuff because I study it all the time, <laughs> like, like the nerd that I am. Um, yeah, so there are different possibilities for how to do it. And if we're going to get any crumbs from supposed insiders of the government, uh, I'd be wary about it because, like you said, maybe their false leads to just kind of send us, send us barking up the wrong tree. So what should we be doing, Tom, um, if, we want to, if we want to say, like, oh, forget campaigning for the government? Because that's where I'm at. Like, I don't want to, you know, send out another tweet and say, please, you know, do your job. Like, what, what should we do instead? I make the joke that uh, the more you know about aliens and disclosure, the, the more you're a prepper. <laughs> because it seems to me that we're, we're kind of careening off the edge on, on this whole thing. And uh, and then if, if you know anything, you, you would kind of kind of uh, circle the wagons and get ready for a rough ride. Because there are different competing agendas. And you know what? Maybe some of these forces don't even know what the heck they're doing. They're just doing something desperately because the future is so chaotic they don't even know. And, but they're trying their best, and that's not going to go the way they want. So either way, uh, things are going to hit the fan in one way or another. And, and, and so if you, if you advocate for a disclosure without being worried about uh, your light staying on, then I'm not sure you fully understand disclosure. <laughs> thank you. Benno, thank you for being so patient. Benno, go ahead. Hey, great space, guys. Um, just first of all, hello, Clip. He mentioned uh, Fable and Prophecy or Journey to Night Planet or The Golden Planet. That is a great read. If anyone hasn't read that, uh, Michel Desmarque was, a, was a, a French national Australian who went missing for 10 days, um, essentially claims he was abducted, wrote a book about it, and very interesting read. Um, but he talks about the concept of humanity being at like a phase, like a 500-year window um, where when you split the nuclear atom, if you're a violent species, then you're pretty much going to kill yourself. Um, but if you get past that 500-year window with peace, then you basically have become an inter interplanetary, like become accepted into the, like you're peaceful. Um, and he essentially um, says that these aliens took him on a ship. I mean, he went past planets that were just like Earth 
um, where they had split the nuclear atom, had world like nuclear war with each other, and where very few had survived, and they become sort of um, the DNA had become sort of from the nuclear fallout, the radiation had mutated the DNA where ants were as big as horses, and the people were like struggling. Those that survived were struggling to breed. And but look, it's an interesting book, great book. Um, I actually just wanted to actually ask Tom a question. Um, just because I, I love the way your mind works, Tom, and thank you very much for the space and everyone that's in a great space. Tom, what are your views on, I sort of look at like this planet here, right, and I think there's a bit of obfuscation around sort of like Antarctica. I don't want to go on about Antarctica, but I think it's an intriguing place, but I'm not a flat earther, but I believe that they're, they're hiding something and because for the simple fact you just can't get a clear video with all the technology we've got in 2023, there's just not one clear video of Earth from space. That's just a simple thing, I think, and, and that the blurring out of Antarctica and whatnot. So I guess what are your thoughts on sort of, do you think that this planet potentially could be bigger? We're sharing with another species, like we're sort of zoned in perhaps, but do you agree that there's some, some sort of, sort of there's a bit of hiding going on there? It seems kind of pretty obvious. I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I kind of joke that I'm not a flat earther. I'm more of a fake earther <laughs> in the sense that our reality has something funny going on with it, you know, whether it's a collective dream or a simulation or uh, some sort of uh, a little uh, a toy model universe that God has created, you know, that the rest of the universe doesn't really exist, something like that, right? So there's these different possibilities that, that go on. And, and but, but, you know, I, I do believe that Earth is uh, a globe, like a spheroid, and that's just based on me having math and physics knowledge. So I can, I can look at the evidence of it. I can look at the data. And if I wanted to, I could calculate it myself. And uh, if you're like a ham radio operator, you can send radio waves and up into the words the moon and bounce it off the moon to the other end of the you know the opposite below the horizon. It's called moon bounce, and you can calculate the time it takes for that wave to propagate and therefore how far away the moon is, which kind of contradicts how far away it's supposed to be according to the flat Earth model, right? So these different math things that you can do to kind of prove to yourself that Earth is like a globe spinning. However, even as even if it is a globe spinning there can be many, many funny things that are going on, right? There, there could be sections of Antarctica that are off limits to the rest of the planet because it might as well be another planet based on different kinds of beings that are there, the bases, the activities that are going on. Uh, and, and you know that there's something funny going on there because we've had famous people rushing to Antarctica for no reason whatsoever that, that they would reveal. We had John Kerry, we had the, the uh, Pope. Like, like, what's the Pope doing in freaking Antarctica, right? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, and so people have been down there for, for some reason, most likely either some sort of a new archaeological or technological discovery or uh, a certain meeting that they're having with off-world NHIs. Like, if, if you're going to have meetings like that, what better place to have it than Antarctica? Because there's no one around for thousands and thousands of miles. So that's a very good place to hide a lot of your stuff, you know. Uh, at least the air is breathable, <laughs> unlike the moon. So uh, I think it's, it's a convenient staging operation for a lot of secret, nefarious uh, activities. And, and so... That would be one reason why it's so off limits, right? I mean, we get different reports by different people, like some pilots that were alleging that they were flying scientists into there, and when the scientists came back, they were totally shell shocked from what they had seen, and they wouldn't even talk about it. So, who knows what actually went on there? Um, well, of course, we can go back in time to the Admiral Byrd expedition and the claims surrounding that. So, yeah, there's there's funny things going on there, and pretty much in in other remote locations. Like if you think about it, the vast territory that oceans cover the earth right now and so much of it has been unexplored not only on the surface but also underneath the bottom of the ocean that you would think that uh basically these these offshore international corporations would be tied in with that you know maybe that's where a lot of these non-governmental organizations that are deeper than black maybe that's where they're operating out of they could be operating out of the oceans for example uh, you could have the navy being the branch of the military that has the most amount of NHI contact, for all we know, because they're the ones that can go to any point in the ocean and interact with stuff that's out there for certain meetings. So, yeah, there's a lot to it, but I, I don't, I don't think that the Earth is necessarily bigger than it is. And as far as like satellite imagery of um, Antarctica, I mean, okay, look, when they, when they do a satellite imagery, right, they they take these these uh, these straight strips of photographic or video imagery, and then they have to like paste it together into a whole image. And that's a problem when you're dealing with a sphere because the, the very axis of the sphere, like the very bottom or the very top, it gets, gets really distorted. So that's how the skeptic would explain it. But as we talked about, with so many weird things happening in Antarctica, uh, it's no wonder that they would blur parts of it because 
uh, they don't even allow people to fly over it. So why would they suddenly show it on a satellite? Uh, Aaron, welcome to the space. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm a bit new to all of this, but I, I was just wondering when, when I was younger, um, my mum was a partner to a, a guy called Timothy Wiley, who wrote a lot of books about angels and extraterrestrials. Um, and one of the books he based a lot of his stuff off was the Urantia book. Have you heard of the Urantia book? It, it's like a structure of all the... Um, it, it was a book written apparently like it's a structure of all the the extraterrestrials um and their dynamics through the whole universe and it was written in a very short period by one guy and the book's like a, it's so thick i've seen it from my mum and it's so dense it's very hard to read um just wondering sorry that was my dog um tweeting its toy just wondering if you'd heard about the Urantia book and what credibility you 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 give the book. Thanks. Oh uh, yeah, I have heard of it, and I used to have a I, ha I used to have a used copy of it too. So I've looked through it. I've tried to read it, but to be honest, I couldn't make it through there because the amount of uh, uh, of trivia and detail about things that cannot be that I couldn't verify that don't really relate to anything was just so so voluminous that I you know I couldn't really make it through. So um, I've, I've seen something like that done in other channeling sources where it's just page after page after page of complicated trivia. And it's to such an extent that it makes me suspicious. Like, what is the point of this? You know, it's not really giving any practical advice, any wisdom necessarily in those pages. So is it just for our edification or our information about what's going on? Or is there something more nefarious to it, which would be, for example, uh, getting someone spinning their wheels studying these pages for days and days and most of their life without it really doing anything, especially not when you've got better sources that are out there that cut, cut to the chase more, right? Uh, and actually, on the Urantia book, if you dig into who the author was and the circumstances of its, of its channeling, some people did claim that there could, be, it could have been some sort of like a government psyop aspect to it, you know, but that requires further research. So personally, I don't consider myself a fan of it. From the parts that I read, it wasn't as useful as as I had hoped, and compared to some of the other channelings that I had read, it, it wasn't um, wasn't that practical either. So no, no, no. I found it very dense and and um, um, decipherable as well. But um, so uh, Timothy Wiley lived in I don't know if you've heard of him. He lived in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, and he seemed to think that some UFOs would hide in clouds up there and also in the mountains. I, I don't know. And um, he, but when you say channeling, because um, that may relate to higher beings, he wrote on um, angels as well, angels and extraterrestrials and dolphins, sorry. And um, he, he thought dolphins were a higher form because they could, float in the sea and speak with like they could impregnate um cuttlefish with sonar that other dolphins could read and because they're in that space they could actually be in other planes like um like almost ethereal planes like angels or extraterrestrials or or so forth um when I, with 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 when you're saying the channeling, we we had some South Africans that were part of my stepfather, which wasn't this guy, and they would channel these higher beings. And this lady, I went a couple of times to a lot of um, tapes and recordings, and they would come down and speak like um, like what what the earth was supposed to do, what humans were supposed to do, and the higher powers and so forth. And I went to one. It, the room went very cold, and this lady really just 
changed. And when she came out, she was totally drained, completely drained. And there was like different higher powers that came and talked through her. Have you heard of anything like that at all? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm quite familiar with channeling. Not that I've done it myself, but I've attended some channeling just as a, as a witness. And uh, I've, known, I've known a channeling group. Uh, I wasn't really chummy with them, but I knew them. And, and so I'm familiar with the different facets of it, and especially with uh, some of the more questionable aspects of it. There's a good book by Joseph Fisher called uh, The Siren Call of the Hungry Ghosts. Uh, Joe Mergia has uh, kind of highlighted that book quite a bit. But anyway, um, so that, that book, this guy got involved with a channeling group, and uh, the medium manifested this woman who claimed to have known this person, or the, this, the author of the book, and a past life in Greece. And basically, this guy got led on for such a long time uh, and that eventually he, he went to Greece, or actually he, he tried to research whether this was actually true, and he found out that the story didn't add up. And then after the book was published, I don't know what happened, but he eventually committed suicide. So I, I don't know if if, uh, if the experience just weighed on him so heavily that he couldn't take it anymore or what, but channeling does have quite a dark side to it, potentially. When, when, I was, when they were doing it, they had to provide a lot of white light because the person is very open and then dark, they're very open, dark things can come in. So they need a protection around them. I don't, I don't, that was what I was sort of um, advised of at the time to a degree. Yeah, and that's quite an important thing to do. But uh, as good as it's important to do, it's not always a guarantee that what is, what is coming through is benevolent. And really the only way that you can tell if something that comes through is benevolent is if the message fully checks out. Like you, you just tear it apart, you analyze it, you test the spirits. And uh, if, if you find that it checks out, I mean, not, not just checks out according to your own assumptions, but because you have to be you have to be very discerning about it. And discernment is a combination of uh, intuition knowledge, experience, and critical thinking. So if you combine those, then you've got a little bit more of a background to tell whether the source is true. Because a source can, can give you all sorts of platitudes. It can sound high and mighty. But in the end, if the message is neither novel, meaning original and, and, and true and, and useful, and like true and verifiable, then, then ultimately what's the point of it, right? Because it might just be an entity leading you on with platitudes just to keep your attention and to, to build a little following around itself for pleasure or for energy and, and so on. Um, and so from all the channeling that I've looked at, it's, a, I would say most of it is questionable to some extent, but at least some of it is useful in terms of food for thought, in terms of the ideas that are coming through and the, the kind of paradigm it presents. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the, the casual channelings that I've seen, they all fall into a pattern of, of saying nice things, but it's not necessarily new things. And if it's new, it's not necessarily true because it, it repeats a lot of true stuff that's old or it repeats a lot of new stuff that's false. And, and it's kind of, it's kind of hoping that you would be lured in by the, by the true, but old stuff in order to swallow the false stuff. So that's why I have to be very careful with channeling, uh, not, not even just in the protocol of how it's done and so on, but just in the message itself, you know, it's, it's a good exercise for critical thinking and actually, you know what? I don't think there's a better exercise for critical thinking than to analyze channeling sources and try to try to find those logical fallacies and what the ulterior motive is. You know, second to like alien disinformation, which I wrote a whole book on. There's one other thing. So I found this quite scary as a concept that um, there there are beings that will feed off your energy in a in an ethereal realm. And try to make you take drugs or drink alcohol because they feed off it, um, and they they get the buzz off you doing that, and therefore they they I don't know how they influence you, but it was that was like this is going back a long time, so I've just dropped in on this site. So, but um, yeah, I found that quite a scary concept do you do you have any um idea about that thanks yeah we, we kind of touched on this earlier in the evening but that was quite a number of hours ago so i'll kind of repeat what we were talking about there 
So basically, we're talking about discarnate uh, entities of some types, and some people would call them demons. But in addition to demons, I would also say that there are likely uh, discarnate human souls who are remaining earthbound. You know, for whatever reason, uh, maybe they didn't want to go into the light, or they just um, they were very troubled, or maybe they got taken in by demons because they kind of uh, believed in that. Anyway, see, so you've got this combination of dark discarnate human energy forms as well as what we would call demons who may or may not have been human at one point you know they could they could be their own thing they could even be alien you know some dead negative alien for all i know but there are these these malevolent powers that are around us and only if you are highly intuitive or sensitive or empathic or psychic or in some way or clairvoyant you know only then can you perceive them directly uh, your pets can see them um, quite easily sometimes uh, and, and some kids can see them. So these things exist, and they are around us. Uh, I don't think that there's a demon in every home, but it's it's quite common, probably as common as, like, I don't know, rats or spiders, something like that. And they, they exist, and yeah, they they have nothing better to do than to try to screw with our lives and feed off our energy and cause drama, cause fights, and just kind of spiritually wear people down for what? Maybe just for sadistic sport. Maybe they have a beef with the divine, and they just want to screw with with <laughs> fragments of you know. They, they want to screw with God's children because they, they've got some sort of vendetta against uh, God or something, or or maybe they're just in it for the energy feeding, you know, or to wear people down spiritually. To where when the person dies, they're so weak and confused that they can then be led astray from the light and be taken into the darker realms. And actually, there was a movie or a documentary that came out called After Death. We we watched it in the theater like a month ago. It was actually pretty good, but well, one of the accounts in there is something. Is this one of the guys? He's, he's quite famous now. He's, he's known in the near death experience scene. But Howard Storm, he recounted an experience where he died in a hospital due to a, a very bad uh, stomach infection, I think. And he he was out of his body. He went into the hallway, and there were these dark beings that were beckoning him to to follow them. And they started crowding around him, and they kind of shoveled him on because he was confused and he, he was in a very bad state. But he was led into darker and darker and darker realms until eventually they kind of pounced on him and were kind of ripping him apart. And then he reached out to the divine, and I think it was Jesus or a God or some sort of divine figure heard him and, you know, reached him and pulled him out of it. And ever since then, he's been on this uh, very positive trajectory in life, trying to teach others about spirituality and, and being a good person. When, he, when before this point, he was one of the most, uh, he, he, was a, he, was a bad, he was a bad guy, like to his family and to his kid and everything, to, to, to where... Afterwards, when he changed to this nice person, they couldn't even recognize him anymore. And uh, they, they kind of disowned him because it turns out that they were addicted to his old way, like the, the dramatic, uh, abusive way that he was. It's kind of, kind of a sick pattern. But the point is, yeah, there are these beings that are around that can meddle in our lives. Um, and if you want to look at it from a higher perspective, I guess they are there to highlight our weaknesses. But it's not like they, it's not like they want to do us a spiritual service. If any, I mean, they definitely want to, to drag us down into the mud as much as they can. But if you're in control of yourself and you, you, you make consistent, good spiritual choices, then you can use these as highlights of what your weaknesses are. So that's pretty much the only good spin I can put on it. But otherwise, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're a pain in the ass, to be honest. And if I could invent or discover some technology that could fully banish them from a home, I would definitely try to install them in every home because I don't think these things deserve to be around. I mean, they, they've made life on earth more hell than it deserves to be. One thing I'd heard about was when you pass over to, to look for people that you've loved, there'll be someone there waiting for you. I mean, it might not be available to everyone if they're, if they're I'm sure someone's, most people have had someone that's cared or loved for them at some stage and they will be a, uh, carry you sh through that gray. Oh, Teddy, stop it! Um, carry you through that gray realm to the better place. So um, I don't know if that helps anyone, but that's <laughs> something I'm holding on to. That when I do pass, maybe I'll look for for someone that's um, loved me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just focus on on the highest spiritual positive good that you can that you can focus on uh, after you die, whether it's loved ones, whether it's uh, God, whether it's higher angels, something like that. If you just focus on that concept, then 
mentally, uh, in, in New Age parlance, you would say vibrationally, you would resonate with that uh, more so than the, the dark stuff. So you would kind of gravitate towards that because, you know, I mean, in the astral state, you don't, you don't really have shoes and feet, right? You're more like a floating point of consciousness. So you're moving where your consciousness is directed. Now, uh, not to get too far on a tangent, but nowadays it is quite popular to question the white light and to question that entire process and to believe that the, the, the loved ones that you see when you die, they're just part of the trap. But I would say, um, based on research involving discarnate entities and entity attachments, it's usually the case that these earthbound souls are ones that didn't go into the light. So, sure, you know, you might uh, escape the trap of the light, but guess what? Now you're you're basically earthbound, and what are you, what are you going to do? You know, what is there to do? You're basically spiritually homeless. So sometimes, perhaps the the only way out is through. And so I think if you just focus on the highest good then uh, you're, you're, you're in a better conscious state to, to deal with what comes after that. Yeah, well, I heard some people that have really traumatic deaths, they become earthbound and can become sort of ghosts or they, they become stuck in, in sort of this realm rather than passing over. But, yeah, I'll, I'll, there's someone with his hand up, so I'll, I'll step down. I won't talk again. I'm sort of taking over a bit. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Tom, uh, we are headed to our, well, we've just completed hour nine. Uh, we have Hollow Cipher with his hand up, and then we could either end it or uh, go to problematic, probable futures and final deception scenarios. Totally up to you. Uh, let's go another, uh, let's say, 20 minutes. All right, Hollow Cipher, go ahead. I feel like we've entered the final round of this, so we might as well go for broke here or, you know, hell Mary pass to the end zone. Um, let's go down. I know Tom's got technicalities. We barely have tapped, so I'm going to attempt to tap some of those and merge with the hard consciousness co questions that come up in physics circles, holography circles, how we could be multidimensional or multifrequential and how those tie into quantum tunnel states within the electrons that are in the synaptic fields. So whether it's an electron as a particle or a field, it doesn't matter because there's a type of quantum entanglement with a symmetrical side of another sort of dimensional universe or gateway that we seem to access and part of the reason i was bringing up dharma before is because we know that people who are practicing deep meditative states call it a dharma state call it a deep gamma state or a high gamma state the fact is i want to kind of hone in on this as a form of uh well what they call in the literature corti cortical coherence it means brain heart coherence and there's something about this that I think we have to master to, again, cut through all the BS and hone in on the answers we really want, rather than sometimes the ones that are dangling that seem like the easier ones. And in sort of remote viewing parlance, we see this as contextualized, at least, um, within the vernacular of remote viewing. We see this with front loading versus blind loading. And this sort of denotes the layer of... Uh, slipperiness that we experience when we're trying to grasp something within the mind. And I know there's a form of where we can achieve this coherence through, call it a quantum tunneling, through a gamma state. Um, I spent some time with uh, Dr. Persinger, who was studying this up at the Laurentian Labs up in Sudbury, which, as many of you know, or you've maybe heard, Ingo Swan had performed... Uh, an experiment of remote influencing where he influenced the neutrino detector up there. And so it kind of, I hate to use this as an example, but in the Roland Emmerich 2012 movie, they, I think they did have, you know, and movies always start off at a good note or a good foot. And then they sort of veer off into like gobbledygook. But the beginning of 2012, you remember what they were saying was that the sun was causing this, this particle heating within the core and so it makes me think, well, if consciousness via Ingo Swan can affect these particles, I mean, he, we definitely prove this 
um, through repeatable experiments. Um, this was, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the references in some of Ingo Swan's books. Um, but uh, I, I think Tom's going to be able to take this. I'm, I'm going to volley the ball towards him, and I think he's going to be able to run the Westerway down here on the field. But there's a connection here I'm striving for with the sort of coherence to get to the target of what we're looking for, because I think this is helpful for everybody who's actually trying to answer their own questions. It's one thing we got Guru Tong here with his big nerdy brain, and he's helping us a lot. But I think at the end of the day, we all need to learn how to feed our own family with the fish. We need our own fishing techniques. And so right now we're all fishing into the cosmic stream of life. And the question is, can we do this in a coherent way so we're not just scattered photonic light so we can hone in on that laser beam? Is there certain times in the calendrical year? Is there certain places on the grid on the Earth that we can sort of harness these focal points, these magnetic windows that allow us a sort of state of bliss, coherence, gamma state, somnambulistic state? Um, and I'm volleying over to you, Tom. Take her. Well, wow. what, what a complicated question. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, just so many different facets to, to what you're talking about. Uh, you started off talking about the, the, the what do you call it, the, uh, the, the quantum delocalized electrons and the brain synapses, for example, and, and how that ties to other things. So let, let me get to your last question last and tackle some of the earlier things that you were talking about. For example, uh, sun particles affecting the, the core of the Earth. Uh, there was a study by, what's his name? Was it out of Princeton, I think? But basically, they, they, were, they were looking at the neutrino flux from the sun and how it affects radioactive decay on Earth. Okay? And, and they're, they're hypothesizing that radioactive decay actually isn't fully random. It's actually influenced by neutrinos, like neutrino flux from the sun. And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about, okay, well, that's interesting because the core of the Earth, the mantle, a lot of it is heated by radioactivity, like radioactive decay. And so when you've got these neutrino flux changes from the sun... Uh, they would alter radioactive decay in the Earth, and that would lead to temperature changes, which would lead to uh, changes to the convection, which then could lead to upheavals on the surface in terms of crustal movement. Right, so that's a sort of a weird connection there, um, not really connected to anything, but wanted to mention it since you brought it up. What else? You talked about the synapses and uh, some sort of cohesion or coherence in the brain. I think we were talking about gamma waves. So gamma waves. As, as you know, they're 40 hertz oscillations, uh, uh, 40 as in the number, not, not like fourth dimension. So 40 hertz oscillations in the brain where it involves the entire brain having uh, delocalized uh, collective coherence in terms of its electrical activity. Okay? And this is in contrast to regular brain waves, which are more localized. Like I know the hypothalamus uh, has a lot more theta brain waves than other parts. And, and so you've got different frequencies and different parts going on at the same time. They're not very... They're not very coherent. Um, but then you've got these gamma waves, which do involve this massive coherent effect. And then the question is, well, how do you get distant parts of the brain all cohering at the same time? And the theory is that it, was, it did involve some sort of a, a macroscopic quantum state okay, that allowed these electrons in different parts of the brain to interact with each other in a collective way, kind of like what happens in a, in a, in a plasma so a plasma is like a gas. Well, it's not a glass. It's it's a it's a charged cloud of of, of uh, particles. You know, where you've got electrons here and you've got nuclei there, and they're not really bound in, as an atom. They're kind of like ripped apart. So you get this 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 cloud of gases, and if you pulse it at a certain frequency, it enters into a collective oscillation. So so something like that could be happening in the brain, and it and it involves long range quantum interactions. And any time you have quantum phenomena happening, you start getting weird stuff. Because the whole idea in quantum physics is that you can have interference between a particle and an alternate parallel timeline version of itself. And that's how you get the double slit effect, right? You get, you get uh, the electron being sent towards two little slits cut in a board, and it has a choice of going through slit A or through slit B. But what actually happens is if you don't really observe the experiment, you find that the electron goes through both slits in parallel universes and interferes with itself. So there's an interaction between parallel universes. And so when your brain enters into this 40 hertz quantum oscillation, it's possible that that's when you are able to tap into um, alternate timeline versions of yourself, you know, maybe some that are more novel. See, because here's the thing. If you're operating strictly within your own linear timeline, 
you're only operating in a uh, predictable A after B, you know, C after B, you, you're like a like a step by step way into the future, like dominoes falling. It's a deterministic causal chain. And if you want to be original, if you want to come up with an original thought, you have to deviate from this chain of dominoes into like a like a branch, okay, like like a parallel branch that is um, not as rigid, you know, not as controlled in, in such a manner. And so, therefore, I think gamma oscillations might be able to allow you to have information bleed in from things that are outside this uh, particular narrow track 3D space-time timeline thing that we've got going on. So I think that's what's, go what's going on with, with gamma there. And lastly, you asked about can one utilize certain times of year, uh, certain places on Earth to do this? And I think that, yeah, I mean, that's probably what some of these ancient megalithic structures were designed to do, to basically have certain rituals at certain times of year uh, that allows the people that are there to um, amplify consciousness and coherence and energy in, in such a way that, you know, it, it leads to very anomalous effects. One of the things I mentioned earlier is even the possibility that they could have amplified their thoughts into material reality. You know, like you, you think of bushels of corn or something and, and all of a sudden a portal opens up and corn starts pouring down from the sky, which isn't unprecedented because even in occultism, in the old days with uh, mediums and such, you know, maybe some were faking it, but uh, some do do claim to have materialized objects, whether it's ectoplasm or stones or something or a little jewelry or, or whatever. Um, and there's other people like Tom Bearden, who uh, he's a scalar physics researcher. He uh, wrote about weird experiences that he had uh, in one case where he was with some other researchers and they were doing an experiment on thought focusing. And they were able to materialize a thought form, and it was and it was so frightening that he didn't even just describe what it was, but it freaked him out so much that that it could happen. So there does, like I said, seem to be a a, a, a technology or a method of translating thought into reality uh, directly. And like I said, you know, that's probably yeah, what Eric, certain. Uh... Eric Davis, actually, uh, I don't know if you did you read that uh, report that was uh, I don't know either leaked or released, declassified about the uh, teleportation. Uh, I think it was a Navy-backed study uh, titled uh, "Teleportation." It was published uh, or authored by Eric Davis, uh, and it discussed like high-speed cameras showing kids and different. I, I think there was definitely examples out of China showing kids. Uh, under high speed camera uh, observation, teleporting objects through solid uh, walls. Oh, so yeah, I yeah. That, yeah. Did you read that? Well, no, okay, no. So I didn't read that particular report, but I read the, um, what's it called? The, the, the Journals of Somatic Science from China. They got translated into English by, I think, the CIA. There's PDFs of these, these uh, journals of somatic science out of China in the early 80s. And in there, they've got multiple, like numerous reports of super psychics. And see, the thing about China is it's got a huge population. It's got a totalitarian government that surveys everything or surveils everything. And so they have a better chance of picking and finding who the super psychics are versus in America where, you know, it's, it's a lot more free and it's, it's not as much surveillance as there. So they had access to these super psychic children who, and, and you know, not just all children, but some adults too, who were able to do that. Yeah. And they did it on high speed film. They showed a guy being able to insert uh, like plastic objects, pills, whatever, into a sealed glass bottle through the side of it without actually breaking the side. It's almost like he shoved it through the fourth spatial dimension into the inside of the bottle. And that's just one of numerous examples. I mean, there's even, there's even crazier examples like this one girl who was able to teleport flowers from outside the field in the school inside and it was perfectly cut as with a knife. And they asked her, like, how did she do that? And she said she, she visualized a knife just cutting the flower and, and bringing it here. So, you know, there, there are certain people who have some, some part of their consciousness is tied into, I guess you could call it the demiurge or some sort of uh, the collective subconscious that generates reality. And it seems to me that they're able to access that and, you know, almost like alter the matrix programming in a way. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what I was reading. And I guess uh, getting back to, I think, just a, a little bit on the uh, the nature of what I was trying to get at, which is we were talking about, uh, essentially, um, I'm thinking we were talking about multidimensional creatures and whether they're actually justified as angels and demons. I mean, as our mathematical prowess expands and, and or physics prowess expands and we start to examine these multidimensions as actually plausible different living domains for slightly different organism-based 
cellular frequencies and that basically is it possible to have existences on multiple layers it's like extremophobes at first we didn't think that was possible at all and then later we find out in fact there's organisms living right around heat vents on the bottom of the ocean you know and so i think it's sort of like that that we're and but there's actually we have good evidence like in monroe certainly dovetailed a lot of this castaneda with his if this is anything legit about his discussions with don juan which i'd love to think there is there's certainly a lot of indications that there's a supernatural multi-dimensional world out there and then the whole montauk experiments kind of make you wonder like what they were tapping into with all those experiments right montauk oh yeah yeah totally yeah and actually you know the show stranger things on netflix was based on the montauk story you guys, you guys no didn't... doubt yep 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 so if there's anything that proves multidimensionality from the ancient world, manifestation of thought or anything like this, do you think there's anything like the Mitchell Hedges skull, um, any, any device or anything you've heard of that you could think about that would be a manifestation of this high tempered civilization of spiritual renaissance from our past? Is there anything that comes to mind? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant for starters. <laughs> okay. The Ark of the Covenant, you know, that that's like one of the most famous examples. And th I mean, that's one of the central features of my Gnosis book. So, so okay. my my latest book, which came out in 2022, was about the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and alchemy, and how these are all derivatives of the same common science, which is merely uh, sort of physics that is augmented by etheric and astral energies. So, which is uh, essentially what I believe alien technology is. They use psionic powers to control matter, and therefore their technology involves both matter and the subtle energy fields. That's how they, that's how their technology works. You know, that's why their devices that they use, the, you know, their handheld devices, they look so simple. Is because they're not made of like gears and moving parts and wires. It's made of uh, sort of a physical substrate with a very complicated uh, etheric energy structure that's laid over it and that you know works with it. But of course, we can't see it if we're not psychic. But they can see it. And so I think that's how their technology works. And I think that some of that stuff fell into human hands in the past, probably under their direction. Uh, and one example being the Ark of the Covenant. So just the whole history of that and how it's changed history kind of shows how perhaps alien technology has altered humanity through uh, good use and also through, through bad use. And I, and I think later on, the, the myths of the Holy Grail kind of uh, speak to that same technology as well. So do you think it's possible that, um, this is just a quick question, you can answer yes or no if you want, but uh, do you think it's possible that these aliens, and this kind of speaks to an experience I had that really freaked me out, but uh, do you think it's possible that some of these advanced uh, UAP, let's refer to the alien ones because I really doubt humans have this, but it would seem, and I'm, I'm curious what you think, or do you think, Tom, that... Uh, they have the ability to take this technology and say penetrate part of what you might call a dream dimension. Uh, yeah, so and they don't. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and actually, if you get into let's say James Bartley's research in the abduction field, he talks a lot about these things called virtual dream scenarios, where uh, technology is indeed used by by even even certain black ops human factions to control dream stuff and you know uh, but how do you prove that right you, you can have a manipulated dream and someone can say well it was just a crazy dream that you had but i myself have had dreams that seem manipulated uh, including by black ops stuff because with me and my sort of background in, in my labs as well like personally i do think that's an element that i've got going on but that's possible and you don't even need technology because if you are a discarnate entity or, let's say, an alien visiting a person in their bedroom and not even abducting him but just being in the room, uh, just using telepathic power, you can jack into a person while they're sleeping and jack into their dream state because you can read their mind, you know, you can write to the mind, so therefore you can control the dream state. Um, and not to say that everything that shows up in a dream from outside of it is nefarious because I do think that, I mean, heck, we can probably even be visited by our departed loved ones in dreams, right? And it's not like they have 100%. technology to do it. Yeah, and they can do it just through mental connection to you. So real deal uh, you know, inception, eh? Real deal inception movie in life. They really oh yeah. did hit that one out of the ballpark there. That was a good one. Any exercises you can think about um, for us to practice the? Do you have anything that uh, stands out for you? And then I'm gonna say thank you very much uh, for your 
awesome discussions and uh it was a very good pleasant evening morning so thank you sir keep going yeah yeah thanks thanks for all your great questions too um exercises well let's see me myself i, I do there's just two things that have helped me the most okay one of them is simply getting uh, a notebook and in the notebook you just work out all your thoughts it's not necessarily just journaling in a linear way like oh this is dear like dear diary this is what happened today no it's not like that it's more like um, you read a book, you watch stuff, you experience things, you, you kind of reflect on the, the mysteries, the incongruencies, the anomalies, the paradoxes, and you really kind of work through it, brainstorming. And then whatever you brainstorm, you analyze it for flaws, right? And you kind of put it all together and you try to figure out what's going on. And you kind of boil it all down in this session into a couple concluding statements about what you got out of this. Like what, what is your tentative conclusion for now? And, you know, this method doesn't really fit everyone because some people just love to, let's say, go for a walk and ponder things. But I like to do that, too. But the thing is, imagine trying to go for a walk to do math in your head. Like, how much math can you really do in your head when you're just on your feet just walking? You can't really do that much. But if you've got pencil and paper, you can write it all down. You can survey it. You can get it off your mind, down on paper, and look at it and to kind of work out the issue. So I think the, the notebook thing leads to a, a deeper level of contemplation. And when you really work through it, then... You, you avoid the, the fallacy of being way too vague with your impressions. Like, for example, you come across a book, you read something, and you're like, eh, this feels kind of off. And some people just kind of leave it at that, right? But what if you explored it? Like, you ask yourself, why does it feel off? What is actually wrong about it? Can I actually figure that out and, and boil it down to be able to explain it to anyone exactly why it's off and then they can like go through the book and and see exactly what you're talking about if you can complete the loop if you can actually get to that point then it's like you, you're going as deep as you can and you're using both logic and intuition and your background and it's a good exercise overall just for for working out your brain okay so that's one and the other one that i like to do is take a simple 15 or 20 minute power nap um except as you dip in and out of sleep during the power nap Use that time to do something positive, like positive intentions for the future or a prayer or uh, some sort of a meditation. I find that it's way more effective to do it in a laying down state as you're dipping in and out of sleep versus trying to do it the old school way where, you know, you're, you're sitting on a hard floor on a little cushion and with your back ramrod straight, you know, because I think that method worked better for people in old times before electricity, before artificial lighting, where they were already very, very relaxed to begin with. And so therefore nowadays, with us being kind of wound up and being exposed to all these screens, uh, I think we need a little more assistance in being able to relax more so than they, they used to be able to. So I find that power naps are good anyway. And you know what? If you don't accomplish anything during it in terms of prayer or visualization, no big deal because a power nap in itself, it's, it's, it's short enough to not screw with your sleep cycle uh, when you go to sleep that night, but it's long enough that if you nod off just a little bit, even just for a couple seconds, your brain's going to reset. You know, there's certain rejuvenating hormones that your brain releases during it. And your mind clears and you just have way more energy and clarity to do what you're going to do for the rest of the day. So people who come home after a long day of work and they're kind of tired, you know, too tired to even like read and contemplate these things, well, if they just spend like 15 or 20 minutes to reset their brain, then now they can get more value out of the remaining uh, time of their day. So you use that, you know, to do positive things, to to kind of condition yourself and reset yourself inwardly and then and then I would recommend the notebook method just to keep track of your thoughts and uh, keep accumulating database or collection of, I guess, wisdom treasures that you get through all your contemplation. And then over time, it's nice to kind of review it and see what your thought process has been. And and because uh, it's easy to think a lot of things and forget what you're thinking about a couple days later. And then you just end up going in, in circles, you know. But if you have it down in a notebook on paper, then you can keep a consistent progress and build upon it. And, and that leads to not treading as much water. Yeah, you're right. If you hit REM, uh, according to the sleep experts, when you hit REM, you can actually produce uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived uh, neurotropic factors. And that's part of also uh, potentially the downside of sitting too long is that it actually slows down the cerebral spinal fluid. So it's good to keep moving. Maybe the conclusion of this conversation is we need some kind of table so we can do math while we're walking. Hey, bud. <laughs> <laughs> good one. All right, you guys, we are coming up on nine and a half hours. If you are waiting to speak, please accept my apologies. We're going to go to one last question. Um, just kind of wrap up the topic. Uh, Tom 
uh, where do you see uh, the negative alien agenda going and maybe unfolding in the next few years? What should we be watching for? Uh, you know, internet going down, electricity or what have you. Uh, so what do you think um, might be one of the first signs that things uh, are kind of coming together on their side, on the negative side? Uh, well, I think a lot of their activity is going to be playing out on the world stage in terms of uh, current political events. I'm talking about uh, proxy wars, uh, you know, things like that, uh, things involving Russia versus NATO and, and, uh, and China and Taiwan and so on. And the reason why that matters is because it can, lead to, it can lead to a big enough conflict that it would justify their intervention, or, or at least them positioning themselves as the superior option to uh, a corrupt and failed human leadership. That, that's what I think is going to happen. Now, in conjunction with that, I do think we're going to get more government disclosure, like drip feed. But I do think that the alien disclosure aspect is going to happen in exact lockstep with disclosure of political corruption as well. Okay, So I think we're going to see uh, disclosure happen on both fronts, both the alien front and the political front. And they're both necessary to each other. They're both part of the same agenda ultimately. But uh, at the same time, I do see world events uh, heading towards quite a bit more uh, conflict because it would serve their interests for our leadership to be portrayed as uh, bumbling fools, which we're already seeing with uh, the current administration, right? So I think more of that and just more of the conditions being set up to portray these aliens in a, in a positive light. Now, one thing I should point out is, if you guys have probably noticed this already, that even with like David Grush, for example, whenever they talk about hostile NHIs, they're always talking about hostile in the sense of violence. Because there's no way to really even bring up the conversation yet of hostiles pretending to be benevolent. Okay? And that would also add a lot of confusion and fear to a public that's already confused about, hey, what, we got aliens going on, right? So um, I don't know if they'll ever get to that point of talking about deceivers. Uh, and if they don't, then that's a very dangerous situation because now you have people believing that, yeah, okay, there, there's some negative aliens out there, but they're the ones that are harming military personnel and and killing people and such. So therefore, if aliens show up that aren't that, that promise peace and prosperity, then they have to be the good guys. And that's like one of the major deceptions we'll have to watch out for because uh, that seems to me to be the, the primary Trojan horse that they'll pull. Um, now, if we don't go for that, they always have the option of just trying to starve us out by doing almost like a scorched earth kind of move or just, you know, we're just waiting for the cataclysms to, to finish us off and, and just kind of sweeping in after that. It's, it kind of depends on how bad that gets, but some things are definitely up in the air. And like I said, that the main thing left to watch out for is a certain particular alien group being framed in a positive light that does not deserve it. So uh, out of all the disclosure things that could be happening, that's the one to watch for. And that's the one to not fall for. Yeah. And interestingly enough, we were talking about the Chris Bledsoe case earlier in the evening and, um, the intelligence community seems to be taking him very seriously, and he saw some type of an event. It was um, actually Science Bob who mentioned this in one of my spaces. Chris saw some type of event uh, that involved a nuclear exchange, and the aliens actually showed up and stopped it, um, you know, part of the whole savior, savior thing. Aaron, are you trying to speak? Um so, yeah, that would be interesting and would kind of fall in line that they're going to – one of the scenarios is for them to show up as our saviors and kind of try to save us from ourselves type thing. Yeah, and they've been, uh, they've been kind of cultivating the information field to, to make it be that way, right? So that's what we'll definitely have to watch out for. And, you know, anything that they could do or want to do, um, they would have to preface it or they, they would have to preface it uh, within the information community of abduction research and so on. They, have to, they would have to see that – with the, um, the intellectual, cultural, ideological beliefs that would support that when they finally go for it. So we can kind of detect what they're up to based on what narratives that they're pumping out, right? So if you kind of keep your finger on the pulse of that, then maybe you get an idea of the general timing and, and nature of it. And, and I do think a limited nuclear exchange is possible uh, with them intervening as saviors. But we'll see. Uh, Usually they have multiple plans, like backup plans, so that might be their plan A, and they could have a plan B and a plan C. Um, and so we can't hitch all of our, our bets you know, on just that one possibility. I'm sure there's others that we have to watch out for too. 
Um, James Bartley just requested to speak. I cannot turn him down. Um, yeah, let's do it. It, it looked like it might have glitched a little bit. James, if you want to try to request again, I can um, approve you because James and I are very rarely um, in a space at the same time because of our time differences uh, from where he's at. But it, he hasn't requested again. So let's see, James. Oh, there he is. So I definitely cannot close the space with James Bartley on the floor. So let's see if we can get him up here. Real quick while we're waiting, uh, Tom, is there any supplements uh, you uh, like to enhance your neurocognitive capabilities with? Uh, well, just the basic ones, like nothing, not, not any of the extreme nootropics, but I'm talking about like uh, just the simple things like creatine, taurine, B vitamins, uh, what else? Alpha lipoic acid and, you know, a lot of the antioxidants and such. Um, and, and just like whole foods, right? So, so nothing too extreme because I found that certain drugs that are too extreme, they, they create a high, but then they create a crash, right? So I just want, I just want to bring myself to an optimal level of uh, homeostasis, like neutrality. Any like herbs like uh, ginkgo? Or... Hello, Cypher. Just real quick, let me butt in here. Uh, James, you're not connecting. So I got your speaker request, but it's not going through. So you might have to um, drop out of the space and come back in. You might just have to request again. We can try again, see what happens. I'll stick around to see if uh, James can, can make it in here because uh, it'd be great to hear from him too. Um, Ulrich, I don't know if you can see, oh, he just dropped back down to listener, but maybe next time he pops up, if you could, um, try to add him as well. And then, uh, then hollow cipher, you're, you're welcome to continue on that conversation. We'll give it a couple of minutes to see if James can get back in. Oh, I'm just, uh, fascinated. Um, my, I spend quite a bit of time trying to find the sort of perfect quote unquote soma mixture. And I find it's. I'm I'm on 100% on par with your first items for sure. I've got all that in the cupboard. Uh, L-glutamine I've added to the mix just because it's one of those amino acids that has amazing abilities to repair. And I generally tend to think as we get into more geomagnetic storm activity, all the indications are is that it produces a like a cortical response that's in the form of a stress hormone that we call kind of the fancy term is it's a key to 17 steroid. It's produced from the adrenals and to mitigate that, I mean, certainly exercise and all the typical meditation, yoga, all that stuff is good, but, uh, because also brain derived and it's part of the hip pituitary adrenal axis, which is like a kind of a biotransducer antenna, and it needs to be lubricated. The brain's two thirds in net weight of uh, the omega-3 fatty acid and content, and you can't make that. So you're being stressed by these very subtle electromagnetic field um, pulsative patterns. It's actually causing, it would be like fluctuations on your microprocessor in your computer. It does not like it. And it starts throwing up errors and you know, we can mitigate that with a little bit of uh, about a 300% dose increase of omega fatty acids, whether it be fish or uh, vegetarian base. So I just want to throw that in and see if uh, Tom's got anything else. Uh, Real any quick, uh, Hollow Cipher, if I can interrupt. Um, Ulrich, yep. can you try um, approving James next time he tries to come in? Uh, all three ways I'm trying to approve him, it's not um, connecting. Uh, yeah, so... It's not just omega omega three fatty acids, right? It's uh, it's actually other fatty acids too that that help quite a bit. And uh, one thing I like to stress to everyone is to check out what your what your dietary fatty acid profile is, because different oils and different fats have different fatty acid profiles. And there are certain ones that, for example, uh, stearic acid and palmitic acid, which are found quite a bit in uh, saturated like beef fat, for example. If you get too much of that and not enough of the others, it can actually be highly inflammatory. Right? And, and inflammation of the body can lead to also inflammation of the neurons, which can lead to neural degeneration. And that's what we don't want during this time period. So an easy way to fix that is, in addition to just uh, other sources of omega-3s, is to also get more olive oil and uh, some walnuts in your diet. Because walnuts, see the thing is, walnuts, yes, they have omega-6s in them, like linoleic acid, but, but, 
it's a small enough quantity that it gives the body what it needs. Like the body cannot really live without linoleic acid. It needs a little bit of it. But, and, and the problem is if you eat a diet that's completely devoid of it, let's say a diet entirely of coconut oil, then you're going to be very low in certain fatty acids that your body needs for optimal functioning. So, you know, diversify your fats, uh, try to get it from olive oil, uh, butter, from omega-3s, walnuts, whatever, and, uh, and then you should be good to go. Uh, James, you might have to just exit the, exit the space altogether and then try to come back in and we'll see if Ulrich uh, can approve you. So, Tom, can you speak to any of the supplements uh, that were used, uh, whether they be nootropic or otherwise, that they had found success upon in the MyLab programs? Oh, specifically in the MyLab programs, I'm not too sure because that's sort of a, an esoteric aspect of it, you know, because we don't know what people are being injected with or, or what, they're, what they're using necessarily. So I honestly don't know. Okay. So do you have any uh, insights onto some of the psychotronic aspects that they've been using? Uh, psychotronic in terms of manipulating human consciousness, like for negative purposes, or what? Well, we know that it's uh, you can do both, right? It's a double-edged sword. You can use it for obviously cognitive enhancement through such well, some of the things that Persinger was doing was uh, like basically circular sweeping of magnetic fields with the solenoid hockey helmet that he had, which oh, right. had circumcerebral magnetic stimulation. And again, they were trying to replicate, remember, the God experience. That was his goal. And when I sat down with him, he told me, because I left him this crazy message on his voicemail, and he was the only professor that really got back to me. And I said, you know, I'm pretty sure this, uh, this ancient calendar that I've been digging into has actually the prerequisites for understanding geomagnetic field anomalous conditions that he was studying. And he was trying to reproduce in lab a sort of geomagnetic storm that was causing either these young girls and... I think it was Marmor on experience, sense presence of, I'm not sure if it was the Virgin Mary or something like that, but these are all holographic kind of template overtones that are being produced by the mind through your own sense of, you know, whether it be traditional training or um, your parental uh, model that's been kind of entrained to you since you were born. But we have projected outcomes in our holographic real that seemed to open up and uh being in one of these towns in canada that has a geomagnetic or heliosensitive region where the zero magnetic field axis runs approximately through my birth town which was in winnipeg and we experienced auroras coming at around the 2003 period right down to the ground and when that kind of stuff is happening i notice especially coupled with full moons um, that there's this dynamic uh, effect. And Persinger was the first one who pointed out to me that a full moon uh, actually is a disturbance in the geomagnetic field structure and causes basically, you might say, a ricochet effect within the, because within the, you're compressing the tail and that causes a Schumann relay effect, which, um, you know, I think the training that what goes into shamanistic capabilities, as we saw in Burke's book, uh, the seed of knowledge don't have plenty. They found that the shamans had actually flagged out areas that they later proved were magnetic anomalies. And so one of the experiences I had in brief was just uh, during the full moon, like I experienced something that was actually splashing around in the river and it made the craziest um, animal call. And first of all, I've never, ever heard anything in that river. Second of all, it was like three in the morning on a full moon night. And fourth of all, I mean, I don't know what would be wrestling around in the water like that. But then when that screaming, I couldn't duplicate it with my voice because it had both low tones and high tones at the same time. But it was just, I couldn't even believe it was real. But then I looked over at my cat and my cat actually was arching his back and all of his hair was standing on end and he was tweaked. And I just looked over at him, he looked at me, and I was just like, I ain't going to check out what the hell that is. But it seems that the combination of this magnetic field telluric pressure actually unlocks potentially either a different dimensional overlay, like the opacity changes on the layer, or there's some kind of memory hologram that's rebooted from the core. I don't know if you got a thought on this, but I'm just trying to hack out where or how this kind of dimensional bleed through occurs and see mm -hmm. if you know anything about that. 
Well, you're probably familiar with the with the uh, Hutchinson effect, like John Hutchinson, that inventor. Absolutely, yeah, 100. Right. So, so, so he invented a device called the Ghost Machine, and what it was is a combination of different Van de Graaff generators that put out a very high voltage DC uh, electric field, and various Tesla coils that are operating independently. So what you get then is you get this high voltage DC field saturating a room or whatever, and then you get these uh, uh, AC electricity fluctuations on top of that that are also very high voltage. And the combination, you know, the ways that these wave patterns would interact, sometimes they would cancel out, uh, sometimes they would add, sometimes they would add to the DC field, but um, it did strange things where uh, if he's telling the truth, it, it altered the laws of physics, where it caused, for example, metals to become like jelly, to, to jellify. And for, for other things to, it's, it's almost like, like a poltergeist effect that he was replicating using these technologies. So it seems to me that something similar could be happening uh, on a global natural scale, for example, where you, as, as you mentioned, these telluric energies. I mean, when you have uh, an aurora, right, you have uh, charged particles from the sun being sucked into the magnetic field and channeled downwards towards the ground. And it ionizes the air and creates the colors. But, but the, the whole point is you have uh, massive currents coming in towards the Earth. And uh, that's very, very similar to Potkletnov and his gravity impulse experiment where he fired a beam of electrons at a superconductor, okay? And the superconducting disk somehow converted it into a gravitational impulse. And not only that, but uh, at distance, it could knock a hole into a brick wall. And then behind it, behind this uh, gravity disk impulse, it was almost like an inverse gravity, but not anti-gravity, but like an inverse gravity that caused... Um, I think metals to jellify, just like in the Hutchinson effect, right? So there, there's this uh, this interesting science or physics that isn't known in the mainstream, which I guess you could call it scalar physics, which uh, I have a website, scalarphysics.com, which uh, gets into to, to some of the science behind that. But the point is that I think natural phenomena can replicate some of these things, and it can lead to very strange anomalies, like thinning of the veil, uh, dimensional effects, and so on, and... And so what you described with uh, the full moon and the thing in the water, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that it, uh, that it opened a portal of some, some, some type. Yeah, I actually have that paper by uh, Podkletnov uh, and uh, Giovanni. It's uh, from 2001. It's called the Impulse Gravity Generator based upon charged, uh, I believe it's yttrium barium copper oxide in superconductor nice. with composite crystal structure. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was actually the question I asked Nick Pope is what the UK uh, defense, whatever program part of the government he was from, getting back to what I was talking about earlier, uh, what they knew about it. And he did this funny little two step, one step because he was being recorded by Gaia. This was a gram and I basically put him on the spot. I was like, what do you know actually about this? And I, I guess they're well trained on how to answer these things just in case somebody brings it up. And apparently the UK did do a cover story on it. He referred to me uh, a project called Greenlight, Project Greenlight, and then Project uh, – this is all like public, so I, I can't imagine he told me anything that was not on the public ledger. And the other one was uh, – uh, what was it? Uh, something tank like uh, – Invisible tank, something like that. Yeah, invisible tank. It made me think of Philadelphia, and I was like, oh, yeah, I bet you this is kind of tied in with what they were trying to do with the Philadelphia experiment and trying to achieve supposedly radar, and then all of a sudden with this you know, uh, advanced uh, Tesla coil discharge system, they end up you know, breaching through the dimensional doorways, which – you know, we've seen obviously in Stranger Things, but uh, getting back to what you said there about um, Hutchinson, um, he did say on uh, Art Bell and Coast to Coast, he, he did drop a few interesting hints. And we do know that Lockheed and a couple other, um, you know, uh, basically engineers that are from these contractor groups, they're not the same as an academic engineer. They have a completely different set of rules. And when they came up and visited him, he, he said this on the Art Bell interview. He said, you know, basically, they are aware of stuff. This isn't laughing matter for them. They take it actually quite a bit more serious. And they had actually seen this before. And as uh, David Wilcock has pointed out, the work of Dimitri from Russia, he kind of specializes in uh, tornadoes, I believe, were shown to where objects could fuse. Um, one into into another of different materials uh, and densities, and there's that means there's something going on 
with the impulse uh, within these tornadoes, right? So I'm sure oh yeah, yeah, totally. That. Yeah, I, I studied tornadoes for a week trying to figure that out, like what was going on logically with the rotation of charges and everything, you know, to to create that effect. See if I could deduce some sort of physics principle from it. But uh, yeah, you mentioned the Philadelphia experiment where. Uh, not only did they use Tesla coils, but they used rotating magnetic fields. So they had these coils at right angles to each other, and they're rotating them very, very quickly. And when you rotate a magnetic field, you create an uh, electric field at right angles, and weird things happen where you know charges get swept up in it, and those charges then produce other electric or electromagnetic fields that do weird things to space-time. And actually, you mentioned Podkletnov, for example. Podkletnov, one of his later uh, developments was... Well, he, he didn't say he did it yet, but he said he was going to do it. He said that there's many ways to do the Podkletnov effect, and one of them involved rotating magnetic fields. So it seems to me that even back in the 40s, in 1943, with the Philadelphia experiment, they were already doing it, right? And that was that was a long time ago. That was like uh, 80 years ago. Um, and so by the time we hear about such things, um, it's, it's already sort of old news in, in the black ops community. Uh, Tom, we have an update from James. So, Day, I thought I was going to have Tom and James in this space at the same time. It's not going to happen. He's accidentally uh, declined access uh, for Twitter and his microphone. So he's kind of stuck. Um, so he's not going to be able to make it up. And we are quickly approaching 10 hours. So if you've requested to speak, um, please accept our apologies uh tom what time is it there you're three hours up ahead of us yeah right? it's yeah it's sweet. uh it's, it's 5 48 in the morning and i usually go to bed right around six so it's good oh all right so it worked out perfectly um tom thank you so much you have been absolutely amazing you have the patience of a saint ask i don't even know how many questions you answered um i really hope that this was a good experience for you uh, because i'd love to have you back at the first opportunity so thank you so much um, I know this was your first, uh, Twitter space and, um, I really appreciate you joining in. It's like a town square, you know, versus the podcast. So being able to, you know, get all these people from all over the world at the same time and taking questions and all of that is just, I just think it, it's an amazing forum and I just really love it. And I thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys too, for all the great questions and for, for sticking with me for all these hours. Uh, yeah, I had a really good time, and I'll definitely be back in the future. Awesome. Uh, Ulrich, you are an absolute trooper. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you to Tiff, uh, to everyone who came up and spoke today, and for all of the questions, for all of the listeners. We couldn't have done it without you, and we are, what, 10 minutes shy of 10 hours. So, Tom, thank you so much for all of your time. James, thanks for popping in. I wish we could have heard from you, but I'm sure uh, we'll end up doing this again and we'll, we'll end up at, this, up at the same time um, in the same place. So thank you all very much again, and we will hopefully see you all very soon. Good night, everybody. Good night, Tom. Good night, Ulrich. Good night, James.